Last week, United Airlines joined JetBlue as the first major U.S. carriers to require flight attendants wear masks. Still, no such requirement for passengers and other employees. I do hope that it gets to the point where if you are not willing to wear a mask, you can't travel. Same as if you didn't bring your driver's license. Earlier this month, on my way to Seattle for an assignment. I boarded the flight, and as expected, the situation's pretty empty. But on the return, a stark contrast. More passengers, many without masks, and no guidance on how to safely social distance. Across the country, similar stories. The Association of Flight Attendants is now pushing for all leisure travel to end until the virus is contained. They're also demanding legislation mandating masks for crew, employees, and passengers. Just asking flight attendants to wear a mask is not enough. Uh, But the bottom line is it reduces your risk of getting infected on the airplane if everybody is wearing a mask. United Airlines released a statement recognizing for flight attendants social distancing's challenging, saying they've added masks on flights to ensure attendants have one mask each per duty day. Delta's CEO says masks are encouraged. Our frontline staff are encouraged to wear them. We do have masks for customers if they don't bring them. American Airlines with no mask requirement for passengers or crew. Their website notes the CDC does not require passengers to wear masks. We know we're playing a vital role in the infrastructure. This weekend, the U.S. Treasury Department released billions more in aid to U.S. carriers. Airlines considered critical, but the workers feeling unprotected. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. The speculation, rumors and confusion continue to grow out about the health and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after he reportedly hasn't been seen in public for almost two weeks. U.S. officials say he may be ill after undergoing surgery. South Korea says Kim is alive and well, while North Korea state media, well, they've been completely silent. To help us sort all of this out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry joining us live in London. Cal, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Philip. So the rumors were that he had some kind of cardiovascular issue, maybe a surgery. That all started on April the 15th when Kim missed what would have been his grandfather's 108th birthday. That is a national holiday. He is the man who founded North Korea. So that is what started all of this speculation. Now, adding to the rumors is this satellite footage, satellite images showing The train of Kim Jong-un in the eastern part of the country in the town of Wosan, that is where he goes on vacation. It is an elite part of the country. There were some rumors that he had actually penned a few letters to the United Nations thanking them for doing some construction in that area. All of this really serves a point to show that we still don't have a good grasp of what is going on inside North Korea. When you look at the coronavirus and how that is spread across Asia, the WHO begging the North Koreans for information, not getting any. It gives you a sign of how that country really still remains a mystery, adding to the mystery this morning, the Chinese saying they believe that Kim is well, that he is doing fine, that he is in that eastern part of the country, probably taking some time off, guys. Philip, Corey? A lot of secrecy out there. All right, Cal Perry from London. Thank you, Cal. Let's turn it to a check of the weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb on your Monday. Janessa, good morning. Happy Monday, you two. Good morning, everyone. We continue to see a storm system that's barreling actually across the northeast. You see my banner. It says winter radar, and that should not be the case. But we do have winter weather that's running through northern New England, also interior New York. We are seeing winter weather advisories, unfortunately, for these sections of the country. And that'll last until your early morning hours before more rain starts to push in that area. Also watching our next big severe weather weather risk that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow for the Southern Plains. So pretty quiet starts to the week, but that severe weather will ramp up by tomorrow afternoon into your evening. This will be kind of a wet week with accumulation from Ohio Valley to the Northeast up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather start of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So warm air is still for Grand Rapids to Chicago. We're seeing that warm front push up towards the north, 62 degrees today. But if you need the heat, man, going to be sweating in Phoenix today, triple digit territory. We're late April, Phoenix, 103 degrees. So records going to be shattered this week across the southwest. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. All right, I want you to check out how this town came together to celebrate a very special birthday. We have such great neighbors, and uh, I get a tear up here, but I don't care. Uh, 
kids, I know a good old man cries once in a while. Darn right. <laughs> that is a renowned trumpeter, Bobby Baird. He's performed for presidents and international crowds, so it was only fitting for his neighbors to salute him on his 90th birthday. He got a few notes as well as a parade. The caravan of cars was so long, Baird says he lost count. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. It's beautiful. Ninety-nine year old Captain Tom Moore, he has broken two Guinness World Records and he achieved that record for the title for the most money raised by an individual charity walk by raising over thirty-four million dollars. Yeah, the World War II veteran also became the oldest person to reach number one on the UK music charts with his hit single You'll Never Walk Alone. Moore says he is honored to receive the recognition and is thankful to those who donated. So not only did he raise the most amount mm -hmm. of money, he then followed it up with a number one hit single. I mean, he's he's having an incredible time right now. I, yeah. I, there are the Royal Mail, which is the equivalent to the Postal mm -hmm. Service here. There on his birthday is coming up this Thursday. He'll be 100. They're going to have a special postmark just for him. That's perfect. He deserves yeah. it, right? Yeah, there we go. Collect. All right, as this virus spreads across the country, it is disproportionately killing minorities in poorer communities. Steve Patterson takes a closer look at why. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads to every corner of the U.S., these are especially dark days for communities of color. COVID-19 is an opportunistic killer, most dangerous to people with underlying conditions, like Ravi Terman, who beat uterine cancer 10 years ago. I actually didn't find out I was positive until after I came out of the coma. Ravi spent 10 days on a ventilator at University of Colorado Hospital, but survived. If you do get the diagnosis, you can beat it. It is beatable, despite the fact that you may be black or you may have pre-existing conditions. African-American and Hispanic communities have been hit hard by the virus because hotspots like New York, Chicago and New Orleans have outsized minority populations. It isn't genetic. That's nonsense to say it's genetic. Dr. Anthony Fauci joined a popular urban radio show to explain genetic. the particular danger to, to listeners. African-Americans have a higher degree of hypertension, obesity, asthma, all of those kinds of things that are preconditions that if you do get infected, you wind up having a worse outcome. The threat is now spread from city centers to the most remote areas, like the Navajo Nation, which has seen more than 1,200 cases per capita that would be the third highest infection rate of any state. When one family member um, contracts or, or is exposed to the virus, they have the potential of exposing most, if not all, of their family to it because of their close family structure. Roughly 50 people have died here, and with the elderly at elevated risk, an entire culture is at stake. Some of our oral traditions are going to be lost because of COVID-19, because those are the keepers of the stories, the keepers of our histories and, and our cultural practices are held within these uh, older populations. A pandemic that knows no race or color or class, yet threatens all of them. Oh, thanks to Steve Patterson for that reporting. In today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for a gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down by more than a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have volunteered to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor says they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers will kick off Tuesday at noon. Where we kick off another week on Wall Street where small businesses will get another crack at the new batch of government stimulus, plus a whole lot more. CNBC's Jeff Cutmore joining us now on that and some novel ideas on just what to do with the millions and millions of dollars worth of expired beer. Jeff, please explain. Uh, I don't think you want to drink it, Philip. Let me just talk you through the market story first, and then I'll tell you about the beer. So the market's likely to open in positive territory. The early look at the U.S. futures indicate a good start to the session here with European markets higher at this point. And that would obviously follow on from what was a, a weaker close. Uh, we were 1 percent down on the Dow and the S&P last week, even though we saw Friday's close positive for both of those markets. Big issue for the week, 
50% of S&P companies report first quarter earnings this week, so we'll be watching the earnings and we'll be watching very closely the Federal Reserve meeting Wednesday to see if there's any fresh stimulus announcement to tackle coronavirus. Talking of tackling coronavirus, Boston Beer, and let's get on to the beer story. They've had about $5.8 million worth of beer and kegs returned because restaurants and bars are closed. Now, instead of just pouring this down the drain, the company planning to recycle that by turning it into ethanol to use then in hand sanitizer, which would be a very useful thing to put into the market right now, given that clearly it is difficult to sell some of this beer in bars and restaurants. Just one point to finish on, while we're talking about beer, Nielsen out with some numbers about how we're all managing this crisis. Apparently beer sales for the week ending April 11th up 11.5%. So it seems some people are choosing to drink their way through these lockdowns. Back to you. A lot of people making that choice. I don't judge them for a minute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just don't drink the expired beer. That's right. I didn't. I never let it sit in the fridge long enough for that to happen, so I wouldn't know. I don't know. Not a concern. <laughs> it's not. Jeff, thank you so much. I got two questions for you really quickly. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, sanitizer will be sudsy? Nick? It could be, but whatever. If it works, it's all good. I'd and say. do you think they'll hop right on it? No, look at and her. Look at her. <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. Let's give you your regional update. You're seeing a major spike on Saturday, but that's just because we had more testing across the Northeast, been consistent at about 4%. We'll be right back. You know, boredom in quarantine has a lot of families getting creative. Parents are reconnecting with their young adult children by reenacting their past. Jose diaz Pilar has more. It's called I'm Just a Kid Challenge, inspired by the 2002 song by Simple Plan. I'm just a kid. Families are reenacting old photos on the social media platform TikTok, often with hilarious results. This was then. This is now. An easy balancing act then, a much bigger challenge now. For the Metcalf family outside Atlanta, now with three kids back home, making these new memories has been a blessing. The grocery bill has doubled, of course, but it, it's fun and it's a great time to kind of reconnect, a great time to bond again, talking about things that we probably wouldn't have because we've had like short sessions with them since they all went to college. Reuniting over family activities, and making TikTok magic. We had the staircase right there and uh, uh, trying to get everybody to squeeze in tight like they were when we originally took it was a little difficult, but outside of that, uh, a great shot, I think. Tom Craig used the time home from Virginia Tech to recreate this snap with his dad 20 years later. Good thing dad still had the same shirt. I just kicked up into a handstand and, and he held me up. It took a couple of tries. Yeah. It took a couple of tries. No, I never fell on my head. He's pretty strong. A similar challenge for the fully grown Swagger sisters in Pennsylvania. It took like a couple tries. After a couple of tries, I think we got it. So it pretty it matched pretty good, I think. Creative ways to pass the pandemic. This has just been a great a great distraction during a, a you know trying time for everybody. And reflect on old memories. Because at the end of the day, no matter how grown up those kids get, for parents, they'll always be just their baby. Always. All right. Thank you to Jose for that story there. Okay. Speaking of music, after dropping a new single just days ago, the Rolling Stones living in a ghost town tops the charts. All right, it's the sound of the times. The song is number one on iTunes in 20 countries. It is their first number one hit in 40 years. Yeah, they haven't put out any new music in about eight years. Now, if we can just get the concerts back, then we can get to see the Stones on tour. It's been on my bucket list my At whole life. At least a virtual concert for now. Something, something. Have a great Monday. Thanks for waking up with early today. I'm Corey Coppin. And I'm Philip Mena. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. 
There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker for not following international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. It's Monday, April 27th, and we're being warned that social distancing will last through the summer as many states begin to ease restrictions on local businesses starting today. The White House works to set the record straight on coronavirus guidelines as members of the task force hit the Sunday shows and President Trump takes to the Twitter sphere. Then to the millions of missed milestones from graduations to proms and everything in between. How to talk to your teens as we kick off our Monday. Early today starts right now. And good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. With summer just a few weeks away, can Americans keep up this social distancing? That as state and federal leaders continue to debate when and how to reopen their states. Here's what you need to know at this hour Start to start off your week. The top health officials say that the number of new cases has reached a plateau. There are now more than 972,000 Americans infected and close to 55,000 people have died. The White House says social distancing will be the norm for the next few months. Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator Dr. De- Dr. Deborah Burke said that the current ways of testing will work through the spring and summer, but the U.S. needs a, quote, breakthrough on testing to reopen. Faced with a growing backlog, the IRS is bringing back thousands of employees. The initial wave includes 10,000 employees at locations 10 nationwide. Employees were told to bring their own face masks or face coverings. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is back on Downing Street. After being hospitalized in the ICU by the virus a few weeks ago, he will now be leading Britain's response to this. Johnson has yet to reveal a plan for lifting the lockdown. Boston is targeting some of the hardest hit areas. They are partnering with the Massachusetts General Hospital to test 1,000 residents for antibodies. They'll focus on areas in East Boston, Roslindale, and Dorchester. We are beginning a crucial week as more states start the process of easing restrictions. In California, the warm weather had people hitting the beach this weekend. People not quite social distancing there. Beaches and parks have seen and been some of the first spaces to reopen. But now more businesses are considering opening their doors. For more on this, we're joined by NBC's Sam Brock. Sam, good morning. Corey, at movie theaters and restaurants all over the state of Georgia, a question this morning to open or not open. It's something that many states are weighing right now as they try to figure out how to revive their stagnant economies. As more states across the country prepare to open their doors for business, the stark warning from a top White House coronavirus official. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another as we move through these phases. Dr. Deborah Burks contradicting a suggestion from Vice President Pence that the coronavirus could be behind us by Memorial Day. Dr. Burks also says she's concerned about states coming back online without meeting federal guidelines of two weeks of declining cases. We're doing hand sanitizers for all of our guests. In Georgia, restaurants and movie theaters have the right to reopen, like Jay Christopher, with at least five locations offering dine-in services. We've got sanitizers for the table, different buckets that we use for top tabletops as well as chairs. And then we also have tables X'd off, which means you can't sit there, and we're seating every other table in the restaurant. But most owners we spoke with are not, like Anthony DiNardo of Atlanta's famed Henri's, who's keeping seating areas empty. I think people are going to wait and kind of take a wait and see approach um, and see how things progress over the next week or two. And I think everyone will make uh, a decision that's based, that's best for their own business. Instead, he's donating lunches to first responders and sticking to takeout. As for movie theaters. We have 1% of Georgians tested, if that. Uh, We're nowhere in a state where anyone feels safe going into an indoor space and being around a bunch of other people. The Plaza Theater in Atlanta hasn't been closed for more than a few days since before World War II. I have 10 employees who are relying on me and this theater for their livelihood. 
but I'm not going to try and make them choose between their livelihood and their lives. Across the U.S., 18 states are opening shop doors or watching a stay-at-home order expire. In Tennessee, restaurants have the green light, though Nashville's busy city center remains bare. The NBA is allowing teams in some states to practice, and states like Colorado are getting more creative with curbside retail. But there continues to be some defiance. We're not hiding anymore. This Louisiana pastor defying house arrest for ignoring stay-at-home orders, preaching to his congregation anyway. Rules broken as others looking to reopen the right way. Back to theaters and the largest one in the entire country, AMC, with 600 plus locations, says it may not be opening again until June or July. As for this historic theater behind me in Atlanta, they don't have a timeline to reopen, but they are going to be doing private screenings for first responders with their families in groups of 10 or less starting this Friday. Corey, back to you. All right, Sam, thank you. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis. That's the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. And today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. It comes after a string of controversies for the president. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has more. Often at the president's side. But Dr. Deborah Burks is in an uneasy position. I think I made it very clear and how I interpreted that. Distancing herself from the president's public brainstorming. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And Opining about would-be remedies fuel. involving UV light and Blue disinfectant on, chemicals on, that are harmful if ingested. ingested. Two governors said their state's poison control hotlines lit up after the president's comments. By injection inside or or almost a cleaning. I also made it very clear, and so has Dr. Fauci and everyone associated with the task force and their clarity around this is not a treatment. But Burke says move on from that controversy to focus on COVID-19's puzzling unknowns, like strokes in some younger victims. We should be having that dialogue about this unique clotting that we're seeing. From health to hardship, the Paycheck Protection Program, round two. Tomorrow morning will be open for business. Taking new applications with an additional $322 billion to help small businesses retain their workers. The original fund was quickly drained by high demand, leaving many mom and pop style owners empty handed. We've been applying for the PPP loan. Um, have been told we're in a queue. In Phoenix, Cindy Dash hopes for a second chance to save her Changing Hands bookstore that had employed 60 workers. We had to start laying off a third of our employees, and these are colleagues and friends and family, and that has just been devastating. The money going out in these two phases is expected to keep paychecks flowing for an estimated 60 million Americans. The Treasury Secretary expects this next batch to go quickly as well, but he said getting the money out in communities to keep people on payroll is exactly the point. Philip? All right, Kelly, thank you. While cases of coronavirus continue to grow in the United States, some states are looking past the pandemic and restarting their shuttered economies. Happening later today, the governor of Texas is expected to release more details on a plan to reopen the Lone Star State's businesses following COVID-19 restrictions. Here's NBC's Priscilla Thompson. Well, Philip and Corey, the governor here in Texas has been teasing that upcoming announcement for the past week. He's mentioned the possibility of massive reopenings of businesses here. Everything from restaurants and movie theaters to retailers and nail salons, even churches. But the thing to remember is that Texas is a very large state. There are more than 250 counties here. And while some have seen outbreaks, there are others that don't have any cases at all. And so he has said that he's going to be very focused on a county by county basis in terms of looking at solutions for how to begin to reopen this economy. Now, I also spoke to a number of business owners who tell me that they are very excited about the prospect of reopening, but are also going to be looking for that timing on Monday. And that's another thing that we're going to be watching very closely. Not so much what his announcement is going to be in terms of if that stay at home order will lift and if those businesses will reopen, but the how. What is the timeline going to be and what are the safety measures that are going to be put in place to ensure that another, if another outbreak happens, the city and the state is prepared to handle it? Yeah, that'll take about two weeks. Priscilla, thank you. 
The speculation, rumors, and confusion continue to grow about the health and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after he reportedly hasn't been seen in public for almost two weeks. U.S. officials say he may be ill after undergoing surgery. South Korea says Kim is alive and well, while North Korea state media has been completely silent. To help us sort all this out is uh, NBC's Cal Perry joining us now live from London. Hi, Cal. Good morning. Hey, Phil, good morning to you. So what happened, really, the thing that set this all off was on April the 15th, the North Korean leader missed what is a national holiday. It is the commemoration of his grandfather's birthday. He founded the country. It was the 108th commemoration. He hasn't missed it since 2011 when he took over. That's what started this speculation, both in South Korea and in the United States, when we heard from some intelligence officials. Now, Pouring cold water on all of this is recent satellite images of the leader's train, with at least what is believed to be his train, an 820-foot train in the eastern city of Wosan. That is an elite area where we know that he goes on vacation. So those satellite images leading many people to believe that the rumors were not true. They were cardiovascular rumors. There was a rumor that he had undergone surgery. But as you said, the South Koreans, specifically this morning, again saying that they don't believe that there's anything wrong with them, that North Korea has not changed their posture. North Korean state television as well, continuing on with their normal programming, something that you would not expect if the dear leader, as they put it, um, had fallen ill or had died. All of this goes to show that we still know very, very little about what happens inside North Korea. The WHO was hoping for some coronavirus information out of that country. It is just an information blackout, guys. Philip. Corey? Yeah, almost impossible to get any accurate information on that we can rely on here. All right, Cal Perry, joining us from London. Thank you, Cal. All right, let's turn to your Monday forecast. Let's get a first check of that forecast with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Hopefully you are staying dry this morning because we continue to be in this wet pattern across two thirds of the nation. And it's really a spring pattern that continues to set up. We'll be dry for one day and then another storm system starts to make its way in. So you can start to see the snow that is already falling across northern New England with winter weather advisories currently in place for interior New York all the way into the Pittsburgh area where we could see possible possibility of at least an inch of snow with that wet pattern going to continue to stay in place for at least the next 24 hours. Let's look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So still warm air across Grand Rapids. That's that warm front lifting. We're still in the lower 60s and the heat really continues to build. We're seeing excessive heat alerts across portions of the Southwest. Completely different weather pattern happening across the southwest with temperatures near 100 degrees this week, guys. Hard to imagine in this corner of the country. Yeah. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Uh, kids in New York are helping to lift the spirits of first responders. Handwritten letters and drawings, they were all delivered to the Levittown Volunteer Fire Department. Children of all ages joined the Letters to Our Heroes campaign to say thank you. The first responder said that these words of encouragement go a long way during this difficult time. The youngest letter they've received from a two-year-old. So sweet. Talented kids. A special moment from St. Louis, a hospital staff gathering outside to cheer on a police officer who was discharged after a month-long battle with coronavirus. He left the hospital and walked straight into the arms of his wife there. First priority right there. Well, millions of students are missing out on rites of passages because of the pandemic. While families across the country have found their own special ways to make their memory special for their kids, it's hard not to think about what should have been. Sarah Dolliff looks at how students are coping. Amelia Leahy's senior year has been cut short, her prom dress going unworn. The dance is off. So is the rest of lacrosse season. I was about 50 saves away from breaking a 20-year-old probably record. She understands why, but is disappointed. Because it's been such a big, impactful part of my life and such a good part of my life that I don't want to see it as over. It's not just seniors. Coronavirus is canceling rites of passage for students of all ages, like saying goodbye to friends and teachers, moving to new grades or schools, parents facing tough questions about what's to come. 
not being able to give answers is very difficult. It's, it's very hard. The first thing is to answer honestly. Dr. Melissa Gilliam, an adolescent behavior expert at the University of Chicago, says parents shouldn't be afraid to say, I don't know, or use storytelling to get at the emotions driving questions. You can say, you know, this virus, this pandemic, it reminds me of another story of what it feels like to be really scared. And this is how I managed it. Playing games or puzzles gives teens and kids the chance to open dialogues. While we play something or do something, we're focused, we're together. And it's often in those moments that these questions arise that may not otherwise or have a space to happen. Families can recognize or recreate missed milestones. Kayla Grace McSwain's family brought prom to their front yard. I'm so excited that my parents did this for me. Making those memories in unexpected ways. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. Okay. A couple of things. I don't know if I would describe the test as beautiful. Unless your idea of beauty is having a cotton swab tickle your brain. Also, when he said everyone can get a test, what he meant was almost no one. But until then... Weeks after Dr. Anthony Fauci jokingly said that Brad Pitt should play him on Saturday Night Live, the show delivered. The actor hosted the second stay-at-home edition of SNL and kicked off the show's cold open as Dr. Fauci. This was the impersonation we never knew we needed. You know, Dr. Fauci deserves to have someone like Brad Pitt. (laughs) His interpretation of him, I love it. So good. (laughs) And the little bit at the end there that you saw, watch it all the way through. It was a really, really good little ending. All right, the NFL's first ever virtual draft brought the stars of tomorrow to the league, but it also brought donations to COVID relief efforts. The league announced its draft-a-thon raised more than $100 million over three days. That'll go to various charities like American Red Cross, Meals on Wheels, and the CDC Foundation. 99-year-old Captain Tom Moore has broken two Guinness World Records. He achieved the record for the most money raised by an individual charity walk, raising over $34 million. The World War II veteran also became the oldest person to reach number one on the UK music charts with his hit single, You'll Never Walk Alone. His achievements have earned him the front cover of Guinness World Records 2021. He says that he's honored to receive the recognition and thankful to those who have donated. We cannot get enough of it be so great. Thursday is his April 100th birthday. There you, go. there you go. Hi everyone, I want to keep you updated on our regional growth rate of COVID-19 and please do not be alarmed by this graph. You're seeing a major spike on Saturday. The good news about this, we had about 47,000 people get tested in New York City compared to 25,000. So we saw that increase in the cases Saturday, but we've been pretty consistent for the last five days, guys. Sure have. All right, Janessa, thank you. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen how the power of music can connect us all. And this weekend, two big stars led their own sing-alongs. NBC's Kate Snow has the story. In San Francisco, a crowd, or what passes for one in the time of coronavirus, gathered at a statue of the legendary Tony Bennett. I love you, San Francisco. Let's sing our song. He had called them there to pay tribute to the city's healthcare workers, tirelessly fighting the pandemic. The loveliness of Paris seems somehow sadly gay. San Franciscans came out or stayed in to join the song. Terribly alone. And for you could hear the love letter to the city at Grace Cathedral, inside fire stations, and outside once bustling cafes. Working musicians, deprived of a stage, joined in. And the voices of the San Francisco Opera brought it all together. Ringo Starr of the Beatles wanted people to come together too. For those of you missing singing together, I've got good news. So we say love to the sun. As the animated film Yellow Submarine played on YouTube Saturday, 70,000 people tuned in to sing along to Beatles hits. Young girls getting into character. Ringo 
sharing this Buddhist monk's rendition of the chorus. And in a time of crisis, there's really only one thing we all need. Just the best. Celebrate it. Music helps us celebrate, heal, remember, forget mm -hmm. all the feelings. The next one I want from Tony Bennett, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come? I don't think I've heard that yet. So here we go. Good one. I got that on deck. All right. Animal Control. In South Carolina, they had their hands full. They had an aggressive alligator. Check it out here. The snappy gator was biting at the fire pit in a family's home as a crew tried to ease it away. Animal Control, they had to hose the big guy down with four security guards guiding that gator back home to his lagoon. You can Ooh. see the gator choosing the stop drop and roll method to get home there. As quickly as possible. All right, stay safe on this Monday. Thanks for watching. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. Coming up on the Today Show, Magic Johnson is live to talk about ESPN's latest hit Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. A major week ahead kicks off today with restaurants in Georgia opening up, a plan for New York to get moving again, and the strategy to increase testing on a massive scale. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one okay. another as we move through these phases. The White House Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator predicting some form of social distancing will be needed all summer. As the Vice President is pushing for a Memorial Day opening up, but are things moving too quickly right now? We'll introduce you to some medical students who were rushed through graduation and fast-tracked right into hospital hot zones. What's really behind the medical mystery surrounding the condition and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un? And our Dr. John Torres and the new high-tech house calls being treated without ever leaving home. Early Today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. It's Monday, April 27th, and the beginning of the first week back to work for some Americans. As more states ease coronavirus restrictions, the U.S. will likely pass the 1 million mark for confirmed cases early this week. We are currently at more than 970,000 confirmed cases as of this morning, and nearly 55,000 souls have been lost due to COVID-19 in this country. New York, where the virus has taken a devastating toll, could be begin a gradual reopening next month. Governor Andrew Cuomo says some low-risk construction projects and manufacturing jobs could resume May 15th. The plan will only move forward if the number of hospitalizations keeps declining. The last patient on board, the USNS Comfort, has been discharged. The Navy hospital ship was sent to New York to help relieve stress on the medical system. It's expected to return to its home port in Virginia by the end of the month. The spike in cases may be easing in some hot spots, but social distancing will likely be the new normal for at least a few months. White House Coronavirus Coordinator Dr. Deborah Birch says the U.S. needs a breakthrough on testing before rules can be relaxed. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has a hopeful prediction for the summer. He believes that as more businesses reopen in May and June, the economy will rebound in July, August and September. Many governors agree that the key to getting people back to work is widespread testing. We're seeing many states ramp up their efforts to get testing centers to some of the hardest hit and most underserved areas. And for more on this, we are joined now by NBC's Kathy Park. Kathy, good morning. 
Philip, good morning. The good news is that the virus appears to be slowing down in some hot spots, but we also track some troubling trends this weekend in places like Maryland. Meantime, here in New York, testing is at the forefront and pharmacies will now be playing a bigger role. The outbreak isn't slowing fast enough in Maryland, which marked its deadliest day Saturday, bringing the death toll near 800. We have dramatically uh, flattened and lengthened that curve and lowered the numbers, uh, but unfortunately that, may, that means we we're also a little bit behind and now those numbers are coming up. Massachusetts remains in its surge, with cases topping more than 54,000. Death notices stretching 21 pages in the Boston Globe reflect the growing number of victims in the battle against COVID-19. And out west, a troubling trend. NBC's Steve Patterson is in Los Angeles. COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in L.A. County, and communities of color are disproportionately affected. There's a toxic mix of underlying health conditions, a higher percentage of essential workers, and lower availability to testing. Testing deserts are something the state health department director says she wants to fix immediately by opening up dozens more sites. In hard-hit New York, the governor issued an executive order expanding the reach of COVID-19 testing, giving all frontline workers priority access, setting a goal of 40 30,000 daily tests and unlocking 5,000 pharmacies as testing locations. We're going to authorize all the independent pharmacists in the state to be collection sites for testing. Some of them have already been doing it, some of the larger national chains, but if uh, your local drugstore can now become a collection site, People could go to their local drugstore. In the Bronx, where infections per capita top all other boroughs, this neighborhood pharmacy is waiting for the state health department to roll out the rules about getting tests and administering them to New Yorkers. Say myself, I want to come to your pharmacy and get tested for COVID right now. Can I do that? No. We're waiting for that guidance and we hope it's forthcoming. Public health experts say New York is proving to be a strong leader by laying out an aggressive strategy, but it's not enough. We're going to have to make diagnostics for COVID-19 as available as, say, a pregnancy test or a drug kit at, say, uh, a pharmacy. Dr. Anthony Fauci reinforcing the need for ramped up testing as states make plans to reopen. Right now, you know, we're doing about 1.52 million per week. We probably should get up to twice that as we get into the next several weeks, and I think we will. Right now, some of the major chains like CVS and Walgreens have testing available for those who qualify in places like Connecticut, Michigan, and Oregon. Here in New York, the governor's office says that they're still finalizing some of the guidelines for these independent pharmacies, and those guidelines should be issued soon. Philip? All right, Kathy, thank you. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis, spurring the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. And despite warnings from health experts, some states are barreling ahead with plans to reopen. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. Now, Tracy, several states are loosening the restrictions today. Hi, Corey. Good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, several states like Tennessee reopening restaurants. Uh, we saw several last week. About a third of the states uh, are reopening or easing restrictions in some way starting this week. Some say they are not ready yet. And the federal government is urging caution, saying that any reopening needs to happen gradually. Each state is different, and the reason we made the guidelines and gating criteria very specific was also, and I'm sure a lot of people have missed the asterisk, and it's said to look not only statewide, but also county by county. The policies are working. We're now looking at a relatively short period of time, 14 days of decline. If you don't have 14 days of decline, nobody would say, uh, be reckless and open anyway. Now, there is growing pressure on these states. We're seeing protests. We saw them over the weekend in Nevada from people who want to go back to work and also pushback from some governors like Michigan's governor on the suggestion from Senator Mitch McConnell that states having financial problems should declare bankruptcy instead of waiting for a federal bailout. Corey? Thank you. 
From the classroom straight to the front lines, some courageous med students who graduated early have fast-tracked their way into hospitals to help aid in the fight against coronavirus. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. Good morning. It's about 6.30 and I've just gotten to the hospital. They are the latest recruits in the coronavirus battle. Placing my mask. I'm ready to go. It's a little uncomfortable, but... It's worth it. New doctors, 30-year-old Bronx native Kathleen Lozada and 25-year-old Olamide Omideli from Houston. If you look at this chest x-ray. Two of the fourth-year students who graduated early from medical schools to serve. You know, once we took our oath before, you know, joining our class and being a medical doctor, I think we agreed to step up whenever the hospital, you know, had a need. I couldn't have imagined where I would be now. It was like a surreal feeling, honestly. Graduation. Sinai, early graduation will start in 90 seconds. Was virtual. <laughs> but the crisis at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is all too real. Four days on the job, how many of your patients have died? So I think we've had maybe three or four patients pass away in the last four days. How are you dealing with those deaths? It's really hard. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really dealing with them yet, you know, uh, it's it's challenging. There's really not enough time in the day to really, really think about and reflect about the deaths, which is tough for sure. Savoring the little victories. I was able to get my patient an iPhone charger, so we are charging her phone now. Hopefully she'll be able to FaceTime with her family in the next couple of hours, um, which will be really nice for them. At New York Presbyterian, Peter Novak is researching patient data associated with coronavirus deaths from home. The purpose of the work I'm doing is still the same, and that's to help patients uh, in whatever way I can. Satisfaction hard won. Today was actually a good day on our unit. Um, we didn't have any patients pass away today, and we were able to discharge two of them, so I'd consider that a really good day. Baptized by fire, ready to help save more lives. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. All right, let's get a check of your Monday forecast. The NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb has a look at your day ahead. Hey, good morning, you two. So brave of those new doctors. Uh, just so happy that they're getting out and helping people. Let's take a look at what's happening weather-wise. You're not smiling about this weather if you're across the Northeast. We're in a spring pattern. You'll see dry day, then rain and storms. They will continue to pop up for the rest of the week. But this morning, we are talking about winter weather advisories that are sparking across interior New York, also northern New England, where they could see up to at least one to three inches. Also watching the severe weather threat that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow afternoon across the southern plains. But look at this widespread of rain up to one to two inches across the Ohio Valley into the northeast. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So still warm air across Indianapolis, 64 degrees drying out for Ohio to the Columbus area this afternoon. If you need the heat, get to the southwest El Paso today, 94 degrees. Looking for vacation weather, need to get to the southwest, excessive heat advisories in place in that area, guys. All right. We can just get this uh, coronavirus restrictions to lift and we can be on our way. These days. <laughs> All right. All right, Janessa, Great. thank you so much. Uh, in today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for uh, a gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down over a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have volunteered to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor saying they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and the Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers kick off Tuesday at noon. I Distance is no mark for patriotism. Well, a moment of unity from New York, a four-year-old boy bringing his family and his friends together, even strangers together every day to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. 
I mean, while there is a cloud of speculation that just continues to grow around the status and health of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, rumors have been swirling over the last week or so about the 36-year-old after he reportedly disappeared from public view after undergoing surgery. North Korea has been silent. South Korea says Kim is well, and U.S. officials say that he may be ill. Uh, to help us sort it all out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry. Cal, good morning. Hey, Philip, good morning. So you can add China to the list of countries that are silent on what has happened to Kim Jong-un. Now, all of this started on April the 15th uh, when the dear leader, as he's called in North Korea, missed the most important yearly celebration, that the birthday of his grandfather who founded the country. This would have been his 108th birthday. Now, there has been some satellite imagery released of what we believe to be the train of Kim Jong-un, an 820-foot luxury train in the east of the country. This is in the town of Wosan. This is where uh, the, the Kim Jong-un goes on his sort of vacation. There was some letters put around uh, in the area that were believed to have been written by him, which is sort of adding to the idea that maybe he's fine. Now, South Korean TV this morning has said that they believe he's probably fine, that this was a rumor. But it just goes to show you, Philip, even in the year 2020, how little we know about North Korea and what's happening inside North Korea. For example, the WHO has been looking for any information that they can get on the coronavirus, no information coming out of North Korea and no information as of right now on the leader of North Korea, though it does appear as though those rumors are starting to subside. Philip. You inside that little box there, <laughs> but we heard you loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Cal Perry, thank you so much for the update. Stop with my fam, I can't get out. Selfies, so don't even ask. Staying in the house in an underwear mask. Only bet my dog with a baseball mitt. Baking my own bread, and it tastes like stuck with my family. Saturday Night Live did it again. They brought fans some smiles from self-quarantine. This time, comedians Adam Sandler and Pete Davidson teamed up for that really funny duet there they put together <laughs> uh, with the help of their families, of course, and they ended it all with a special thank you to first responders. All right, let's stay on this train here. Dave Chappelle helping raise over $100,000 for struggling comics during the coronavirus pandemic. The comedian, along with Bill Burr, Whitney Cummings, and many others teamed up with the famous Los Angeles comedy venue, The Comedy store for a live three-part podcast benefit. Chappelle reunited with some of his former Chappelle show co-stars during his segment. The money raised helps benefit to support those comics tied to the venue as well as staff with the venue. So that's great. Those are uh, some of my favorite comics we just saw on the board there. there All in go. one space. Bill Burr, Dave Chappelle, my favorite, Neil Brennan, uh, who's underrated, helped create the mm -hmm. Chappelle show. Uh, I can't wait to find that podcast. I actually had trying to send somebody a link uh, to me so that I can see it. Two things now on your list. Saturday Night Live, if you haven't seen it yet, and now that Chappelle special. I've, I've checked that one out, so now I just need that podcast. All right, there is a family in Arkansas who did not let this pandemic stop them from adopting their son. It was done completely online. A two-year-old Jaden found his friend ever home with the Wenicke family. They'd been already fostering Jaden for a year now. They decided to officially adopt him as their own. Even though their court hearing couldn't be held in person, they finalized his adoption over what else these days, a Zoom video call. I love how more and more people are just not letting the social distancing and, and having to stay at home stop them from being able to live their best lives. We got to keep doing something. Keep it going. Uh, this next one, talk show host Andy Cohen is speaking out after he says he was told he could not give plasma because of his sexuality. Cohen, who recently recovered from COVID-19, said in a video posted to social media that he wanted to donate his plasma for antibody trials, which would be used for people who have the virus. Well, he went on to say that he was first told by the program that he sounded like a perfect candidate. But the 51-year-old says he was then told he could not give the plasma after revealing that he's gay. FDA restrictions currently only allow gay men to give blood after abstaining from sex for three months. Hi hey everyone, we continue to watch our regional growth rate and you can see a big time spike happen on Saturday. Please do not be alarmed. We're seeing an increase in cases that were being reported on Saturday for New York City. Also about 47,000 more people got tested compared to the last few weeks where we've only seen about 25,000. So that is great news and we continue to be very consistent in our region. Guys. More testing, more testing. All right, Janessa, thank you. 
coronavirus is helping to usher in the future of medicine. With so many routine medical and dental visits off limits now, doctors are finding new ways to treat their patients. Dr. John Torres has more. With hospitals across the country, now the front lines in the battle against COVID-19, fear of catching coronavirus is keeping other patients away. And now, more than ever, they're turning to health care consultations of a different type. It's Dr. McGee. How are you doing? It's called telemedicine, virtual visits on computers, even smartphones. It's not new, but the advancement and availability of technology has pushed it into overdrive. We've done over 5,000 visits over the past Uh, over the past month. That's up from just 20 a month before COVID hit. An astonishing increase for Dr. Michael Main and his colleagues at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to do is to innovate. Their priority, protecting both their staff and vulnerable patients like 89-year-old stroke survivor Carl Hines. Having any problems with uh, chest pain? No. And at a time when medical resources are stretched thin and so many of us are staying home, these routine virtual visits are a lifeline for heart patient Gail Collette. Have you had any episodes of those palpitations? Uh, Well, actually, I did. Checking in about medications, symptoms, and solutions. I thought it was very beneficial and very reassuring. Reassuring for doctors, too, like New York City primary care physician Arthi Reddy. Get up. Staying connected with her patients from a desk in her boy's bedroom. She says figuring out which in-person visits can and cannot wait during the COVID crisis depends on each patient. Right now we are holding off on any screening, um, colonoscopies, mammograms, even yearly blood work. Um, if, unless the patient's presenting with something concerning, we're not doing those. But what can't wait? Visit your doctor or the ER if you have shortness of breath or signs of a heart attack or stroke, a broken bone or large cut that won't stop bleeding, and problems with a pregnancy. And even though most dentist offices are closed for routine procedures, there are exceptions. Anything with pain or anything that uh, decreases the quality of life you know, for the patient, and so obviously infections, uh, abscesses, severe decay, uh, any broken teeth. Handled with care? in taking extreme precautions. We're not just protecting the patients and the community, we're also protecting ourselves. There you are. Thanks to Dr. Torres for that report. You know, as, uh, as unprepared as we were for this, mm-hmm. I'm just grateful that we live in a time where we're able to do something like this and this technology is adapt. available. It yep. is interesting. Thanks for starting your week with Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Menick. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Today, more states will begin loosening restrictions on businesses, parks, and other locations as demand for more testing grows. To air travel, where flight attendants are calling for a temporary ban on vacation travel, saying their lives are at risk in the age of coronavirus. And then we will take you back to the future for a group of families who are getting creative to recreate some favorite family photos. It's Monday. Early today starts right now. With that, we say good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. With summer just a few weeks away, can Americans keep up social distancing? That as state and federal leaders continue to debate when and how to reopen their states. Here's what you need to know to start the week. Top health officials are saying that the number of new cases has reached a plateau. There are now more than 972,000 Americans infected and close to 55,000 people have died. 
The stay-at-home order was no match for the sweltering heat in Southern California. Thousands of people packed the beaches in Ventura and Orange counties. Further north in L.A., beaches are still closed. Officials there opened cooling centers to help beat the heat. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is offering some optimism. Mnuchin says that the trillion dollars in government spending will pay off and help spur growth. As states continue to reopen, he expects the economy to bounce back from July to September. A community comes together to honor a fallen soldier. 34-year-old Marine Gunnery Sergeant Diego Pongo was killed in Iraq. Coronavirus restrictions stopped his family from holding a funeral, so residents of Simi Valley held a drive-by parade instead. California Governor Gavin Newsom is helping the nearly 6 million seniors in the Golden State by launching a program that delivers three warm meals to at-risk seniors every day of the week. Participating restaurants will get reimbursed. About one-third of all states have already begun easing restrictions or are planning to. But the White House says social distancing will be the norm for the next few months. Here's Dan Sheneman. In Georgia, there are open for business signs in many windows, including nail salons and barber shops. I mean, we clean up after every chair, every customer gets out of the chair. We wear gloves. Nearly 20 states are allowing shops to open their doors or allowing stay-at-home orders to expire. In states where restrictions are still in place, protesters continue to plead with authorities. I believe the quarantine should have applied to the sick, the elderly, those at risk, those that take care of them. And it would have left a lot more money and supplies to take care of those people instead of all of us, you know, scrambling just to keep a roof over our heads. Vice President Mike Pence suggested social distancing could be over by Memorial Day. But a top White House official disagrees. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another as we move through these phases. Dr. Deborah Burke says she is concerned about states opening before meeting federal guidelines of two weeks of declining cases. She also hopes there will soon be a better way to test Americans. We have to have a breakthrough innovation in testing. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly trying to detect the actual live virus. But Dr. Burks warns such a breakthrough may not happen for months. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis, spurring the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. And despite warnings from health experts, some states are barreling ahead with plans to reopen. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us now with the very latest. And Tracy, several states are loosening restrictions today. Yeah, members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force are concerned uh, that some of these states may be moving too fast. About a third of our states, as you noted, will be easing restrictions at some point this week. And the federal government is urging them to heed the guidelines, wait until these cases drop 14 days in a row and not to reopen too soon. Each state is different, and the reason we made the guidelines and gating criteria very specific was also, and I'm sure a lot of people have missed the asterisk, and it's said to look not only statewide, but also county by county. The policies are working. We're now looking at a relatively short period of time, 14 days of decline. If you don't have 14 days of decline, nobody would say, uh, be reckless and open anyway. Now, some of these states trying to hold on financially uh, with business pretty much at a standstill and pushing back, though, on Senator Mitch McConnell's suggestion that states declare bankruptcy instead of waiting for a federal bailout. Back to you. That's a big decision for those companies to make. All right, Tracy, thank you so much. Airline employees are sounding the alarm. They say their lives are at risk and they're now calling for a temporary ban on vacation travel. Here's Erin McLaughlin. Flying in the time of COVID-19, empty planes, falling prices, and an industry in crisis. The flight attendants it depends on, vulnerable and feeling forgotten. We are risking our lives too every time we come to work. This week, United Airlines joined JetBlue as the first major U.S. carriers to require flight attendants wear masks. Still, no such requirement for passengers and other employees. I do hope that it gets to the point where if you are not willing to wear a mask, you can't travel. Same as if you didn't bring your driver's license. Earlier this month, on my way to Seattle for an assignment. I boarded the flight, and as expected, the situation's pretty empty. 
But on the return, a stark contrast. More passengers, many without masks, and no guidance on how to safely social distance. Across the country, similar stories. The Association of Flight Attendants is now pushing for all leisure travel to end until the virus is contained. They're also demanding legislation mandating masks for crew, employees, and passengers. Just asking flight attendants to wear a mask is not enough. Uh, but the bottom line is it reduces your risk of getting infected on the airplane if everybody is wearing a mask. United Airlines released a statement recognizing for flight attendants social distancing's challenging, saying they've added masks on flights to ensure attendants have one mask each per duty day. Delta's CEO says masks are encouraged. Our frontline staff are encouraged to wear them. We do have masks for customers that they don't bring them. American Airlines with no mask requirement for passengers or crew. Their website notes the CDC does not require passengers to wear masks. We know we're playing a vital role in the infrastructure. This weekend, the U.S. Treasury Department released billions more in aid to U.S. carriers. Airlines considered critical, but the workers feeling unprotected. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. The speculation, rumors and confusion continue to grow out about the health and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after he reportedly hasn't been seen in public for almost two weeks. U.S. officials say he may be ill after undergoing surgery. South Korea says Kim is alive and well, while North Korea state media, well, they've been completely silent. To help us sort all of this out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry joining us live in London. Cal, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Philip. So the rumors were that he had some kind of cardiovascular issue, maybe a surgery. That all started on April the 15th when Kim missed what would have been his grandfather's 108th birthday. That is a national holiday. He is the man who founded North Korea. So that is what started all of this speculation. Now, adding to the rumors is this satellite footage, satellite images showing the train of Kim Jong-un in the eastern part of the country in the town of Wosan, that is where he goes on vacation. It is an elite part of the country. There were some rumors that he had actually penned a few letters to the United Nations thanking them for doing some construction in that area. All of this really serves a point to show that we still don't have a good grasp of what is going on inside North Korea. When you look at the coronavirus and how that is spread across Asia, the WHO begging the North Koreans for information, not getting any. It gives you a sign of how that country really still remains a mystery. Adding to the mystery this morning, the Chinese saying they believe that Kim is well, that he is doing fine, that he is in that eastern part of the country, probably taking some time off, guys. Philip, Corey. A lot of secrecy out there. All right, Cal Perry from London. Thank you, Cal. Let's turn it to a check of the weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb on your Monday. Janessa, good morning. Happy Monday, you two. Good morning, everyone. We continue to see a storm system that's barreling actually across the northeast. You see my banner. It says winter radar, and that should not be the case. But we do have winter weather that's running through northern New England, also interior New York. We are seeing winter weather advisories, unfortunately, for these sections of the country. And that'll last until your early morning hours before more rain starts to push in that area. Also watching our next big severe weather weather risk that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow for the Southern Plains. So pretty quiet start to the week, but that severe weather will ramp up by tomorrow afternoon into your evening. This will be kind of a wet week with accumulation from Ohio Valley to the Northeast up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So warm air is still for Grand Rapids to Chicago. We're seeing that warm front push up towards the north, 62 degrees today. But if you need the heat, man, going to be sweating in Phoenix today, triple digit territory. We're late April, Phoenix, 103 degrees. So record's going to be shattered this week across the southwest. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Ooh. All right, I want you to check out how this town came together to celebrate a very special birthday. We have such great neighbors, and uh, I get a tear up here, but I don't care. Uh, kids, I know an old man cries once in a while. Darn right. That is a renowned trumpeter, Bobby Baird. He's performed for presidents and international crowds, so it was only fitting for his neighbors to salute him on his 90th birthday. He got a few notes, as well as a parade. The caravan of cars was so long, Baird says he lost count. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. It's beautiful. 
99-year-old Captain Tom Moore, he has broken two Guinness World Records, and he achieved that record for the title for the most money raised by an individual charity walk by raising over $34 million. Yeah, the World War II veteran also became the oldest person to reach number one on the UK music charts with his hit single, You'll Never Walk Alone. Moore says he is honored to receive the recognition and is thankful to those who donated. So not only did he raise the most amount mm -hmm. of money, he then followed it up with a number one hit single. I mean, he's he's having an incredible time right now. I, yeah. I, there are the Royal Mail, which is the equivalent to the Postal mm -hmm. Service here there on his birthday is coming up this Thursday. He'll be 100. They're going to have a special postmark just for him. That's perfect. He deserves yeah. it, right? Yeah, there we go. Collect. All right, as this virus spreads across the country, it is disproportionately killing minorities in poorer communities. Steve Patterson takes a closer look at why. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads to every corner of the U.S., these are especially dark days for communities of color. COVID-19 is an opportunistic killer, most dangerous to people with underlying conditions, like Ravi Terman, who beat uterine cancer 10 years ago. I actually didn't find out I was positive until after I came out of the coma. Ravi spent 10 days on a ventilator at University of Colorado Hospital, but survived. If you do get the diagnosis, you can beat it. It is beatable, despite the fact that you may be black or you may have pre-existing conditions. African-American and Hispanic communities have been hit hard by the virus because hotspots like New York, Chicago and New Orleans have outsized minority populations. It isn't genetic. That's nonsense to say it's genetic. Dr. Anthony Fauci joined a popular urban radio show to explain the particular danger to listeners. African-Americans have a higher degree of hypertension, obesity, asthma, all of those kinds of things that are preconditions that if you do get infected, you wind up having a worse outcome. The threat is now spread from city centers to the most remote areas, like the Navajo Nation, which has seen more than 1,200 cases per capita that would be the third highest infection rate of any state. When one family member um, contracts or, or is exposed to the virus, they have the potential of exposing most, if not all, of their family to it because of their close family structure. Roughly 50 people have died here, and with the elderly at elevated risk, an entire culture is at stake. Some of our oral traditions are going to be lost because of COVID-19, because those are the keepers of the stories, the keepers of our histories and, and our cultural practices are held within these uh, older populations. A pandemic that knows no race or color or class, yet threatens all of them. Oh, thanks to Steve Patterson for that reporting. In today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for a gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down by more than a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have volunteered to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor says they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers will kick off Tuesday at noon. Right, we kick off another week on Wall Street where small businesses will get another crack at the new batch of government stimulus, plus a whole lot more. CNBC's Jeff Cutmore joining us now on that and some novel ideas on just what to do with the millions and millions of dollars worth of expired beer. Jeff, please explain. I don't think you want to drink it, Philip. Let me just talk you through the market story first, and then I'll tell you about the beer. So the market's likely to open in positive territory. The early look at the U.S. futures indicate a good start to the session here with European markets higher at this point. And that would obviously follow on from what was a, a weaker close. Uh, we were 1% down on the Dow and the S&P last week, even though we saw Friday's close positive for both of those markets. Big issue for the week, 50% of S&P companies report first quarter earnings this week. So we'll be watching the earnings and we'll be watching very closely the Federal Reserve meeting Wednesday to see if there's any fresh stimulus announcement to tackle coronavirus. 
Talking of tackling coronavirus, Boston Beer, and let's get on to the beer story. They've had about $5.8 million worth of beer and kegs returned because restaurants and bars are closed. Now, instead of just pouring this down the drain, the company planning to recycle that by turning it into ethanol to use then in hand sanitizer, which would be a very useful thing to put into the market right now, given that clearly it is difficult to sell some of this beer in bars and restaurants. Just one point to finish on, while we're talking about beer, Nielsen out with some numbers about how we're all managing this crisis. Apparently beer sales for the week ending April 11th up 11.5%. So it seems some people are choosing to drink their way through these lockdowns. Back to you. A lot of people making that choice. I don't judge them for a minute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just don't drink the expired beer. <laughs> That's right. I didn't. I never let it sit in the fridge long enough for that to happen, so I wouldn't know. I don't know. Not a concern. <laughs> it's not. Jeff, thank you so much. I got two questions for you really quickly. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, sanitizer will be sudsy? Nick? It could be, but whatever. If it works, it's all good. I'd and say. do you think they'll hop right on it? No, look at her. Look at her. <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. Let's give you your regional update. You're seeing a major spike on Saturday, but that's just because we had more testing across the Northeast, been consistent at about 4%. We'll be right back. You know, boredom in quarantine has a lot of families getting creative. Parents are reconnecting with their young adult children by reenacting their past. Well, said Diaz Pilart has more. It's called I'm Just a Kid Challenge, inspired by the 2002 song by Simple Plan. I'm just a kid. Families are reenacting old photos on the social media platform TikTok, often with hilarious results. This was then. This is now. An easy balancing act then, a much bigger challenge now. For the Metcalf family outside Atlanta, now with three kids back home, making these new memories has been a blessing. The grocery bill has doubled, of course, but it, it's fun and it's a great time to kind of reconnect, a great time to bond again, talking about things that we probably wouldn't have because we've had like short sessions with them since they all went to college. Reuniting over family activities, and making TikTok magic. We had the staircase right there and uh, uh, trying to get everybody to squeeze in tight like they were when we originally took it was a little difficult, but outside of that, uh, a great shot, I think. Tom Craig used the time home from Virginia Tech to recreate this snap with his dad 20 years later. Good thing dad still had the same shirt. I just kicked up into a handstand and, and he held me up. It took a couple tries. Yeah. It took a couple tries. No, I never fell on my head. He's pretty strong. A similar challenge for the fully grown Swagger sisters in Pennsylvania. It took like a couple tries. After a couple tries, I think we got it. So it pretty it matched pretty good, I think. Creative ways to pass the pandemic. This has just been great a great distraction during a, a you know trying time for everybody. And reflect on old memories. Because at the end of the day, no matter how grown up those kids get, for parents, they'll always be just their baby. Always. All right. Thank you to Jose for that story there. Okay. Speaking of music, after dropping a new single just days ago, the Rolling Stones' Living in a Ghost Town tops the charts. All right, it's the sound of the times. The song is number one on iTunes in 20 countries. It is their first number one hit in 40 years. Yeah, they haven't put out any new music in about eight years. Now, if we can just get the concerts back, then we can get to see the Stones on tour. It's been on my bucket list my At whole life. At least a virtual concert for now. Something, something. Have a great Monday. Thanks for waking up with early today. I'm Corey Coppin. And I'm Philip Mena. You're watching NBC News Now.
The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. It's Monday, April 27th, and we're being warned that social distancing will last through the summer as many states begin to ease restrictions on local businesses starting today. The White House works to set the record straight on coronavirus guidelines as members of the task force hit the Sunday shows and President Trump takes to the Twitter sphere. Then to the millions of missed milestones from graduations to proms and everything in between. How to talk to your teens as we kick off our Monday. Early today starts right now. And good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. With summer just a few weeks away, can Americans keep up this social distancing? That as state and federal leaders continue to debate when and how to reopen their states. Here's what you need to know at this hour start to start off your week. The top health officials say that the number of new cases has reached a plateau. There are now more than 972,000 Americans infected and close to 55,000 people have died. The White House says social distancing will be the norm for the next few months. Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator Dr. De- Dr. Deborah Burke said that the current ways of testing will work through the spring and summer, but the U.S. needs a, quote, breakthrough on testing to reopen. Faced with a growing backlog, the IRS is bringing back thousands of employees. The initial wave includes 10,000 employees at locations 10 nationwide. Employees were told to bring their own face masks or face coverings. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is back on Downing Street. After being hospitalized in the ICU by the virus a few weeks ago, he will now be leading Britain's response to this. Johnson has yet to reveal a plan for lifting the lockdown. Boston is targeting some of the hardest hit areas. They are partnering with the Massachusetts General Hospital to test 1,000 residents for antibodies. They'll focus on areas in East Boston, Roslindale, and Dorchester. We are beginning a crucial week as more states start the process of easing restrictions. In California, the warm weather had people hitting the beach this weekend. People not quite social distancing there. Beaches and parks have seen and been some of the first spaces to reopen. But now more businesses are considering opening their doors. For more on this, we're joined by NBC's Sam Brock. Sam, good morning. Corey, at movie theaters and restaurants all over the state of Georgia, a question this morning to open or not open. It's something that many states are weighing right now as they try to figure out how to revive their stagnant economies. As more states across the country prepare to open their doors for business, the stark warning from a top White House coronavirus official. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another as we move through these phases. Dr. Deborah Burks contradicting a suggestion from Vice President Pence that the coronavirus could be behind us by Memorial Day. Dr. Burks also says she's concerned about states coming back online without meeting federal guidelines of two weeks of declining cases. We're doing hand sanitizers for all of our guests. In Georgia, restaurants and movie theaters have the right to reopen, like Jay Christopher, with at least five locations offering dine-in services. We've got sanitizers for the table, different buckets that we use for top table tops as well as chairs. And then we also have tables x off, which means you can't sit there, and we're seating every other table in the restaurant. But most owners we spoke with are not, like Anthony DiNardo of Atlanta's famed Henri's, who's keeping seating areas empty. I think people are going to wait and kind of take a wait and see approach um, and see how things progress over the next week or two. And I think everyone will make uh, a decision that's based, that's best for their own business. Instead, he's donating lunches to first responders and sticking to takeout. As for movie theaters. We have 1% of Georgians tested, if that, 
uh, we're nowhere in a state where anyone feels safe going into an indoor space and being around a bunch of other people. The Plaza Theater in Atlanta hasn't been closed for more than a few days since before World War II. I have 10 employees who are relying on me and this theater for their livelihood, but I'm not going to try and make them choose between their livelihood and their lives. Across the U.S., 18 states are opening shop doors. We're watching a stay-at-home order expire. In Tennessee, restaurants have the green light, though Nashville's busy city center remains bare. The NBA is allowing teams in some states to practice, and states like Colorado are getting more creative with curbside retail. But there continues to be some defiance. We're not hiding anymore. This Louisiana pastor defying house arrest for ignoring stay-at-home orders, preaching to his congregation anyway. Rules broken as others looking to reopen the right way. Back to theaters and the largest one in the entire country, AMC, with 600 plus locations, says it may not be opening again until June or July. As for this historic theater behind me in Atlanta, they don't have a timeline to reopen, but they are going to be doing private screenings for first responders with their families in groups of 10 or less starting this Friday. Corey, back to you. All right, Sam, thank you. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis. That's the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. And today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. It comes after a string of controversies for the president. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has more. Often at the president's side, but Dr. Deborah Burks is in an uneasy position. I think I made it very clear and how I interpreted that. Distancing herself from the president's public brainstorming. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And Opining he, about would-be remedies you. involving UV light and disinfectant chemicals that are harmful if ingested. Two governors said their state's poison control hotlines lit up after the president's comments. By injection inside or or almost a cleaning. I also made it very clear and so has Dr. Fauci and everyone associated with the task force and their clarity around this is not a treatment. But Burke says move on from that controversy to focus on COVID-19's puzzling unknowns like strokes in some younger victims. We should be having that dialogue about this unique clotting that we're seeing. From health to hardship, the Paycheck Protection Program, round two. Tomorrow morning will be open for business. Taking new applications with an additional $322 billion to help small businesses retain their workers. The original fund was quickly drained by high demand, leaving many mom and pop style owners empty handed. We've been applying for the PPP loan. Um, have been told we're in a queue. In Phoenix, Cindy Dash hopes for a second chance to save her Changing Hands bookstore that had employed 60 workers. We had to start laying off a third of our employees, and these are colleagues and friends and family, and that has just been devastating. The money going out in these two phases is expected to keep paychecks flowing for an estimated 60 million Americans. The Treasury Secretary expects this next batch to go quickly as well, but he said getting the money out in communities to keep people on payroll is exactly the point. Philip? All right, Kelly, thank you. While cases of coronavirus continue to grow in the United States, some states are looking past the pandemic and restarting their shuttered economies. Happening later today, the governor of Texas is expected to release more details on a plan to reopen the Lone Star State's businesses following COVID-19 restrictions. Here's NBC's Priscilla Thompson. Well, Philip and Corey, the governor here in Texas has been teasing that upcoming announcement for the past week. He's mentioned the possibility of massive reopenings of businesses here. Everything from restaurants and movie theaters to retailers and nail salons, even churches. But the thing to remember is that Texas is a very large state. There are more than 250 counties here. And while some have seen outbreaks, there are others that don't have any cases at all. And so he has said that he's going to be very focused on a county by county basis in terms of looking at solutions for how to begin to reopen this economy. Now, I also spoke to a number of business owners who tell me that they are very excited about the prospect of reopening, but are also going to be looking for that timing on Monday. And that's another thing that we're going to be watching very closely. Not so much what his announcement is going to be in terms of if that stay at home order will lift and if those businesses will reopen, but the how. What is the timeline going to be and what are the safe 
safety measures that are going to be put in place to ensure that another, if another outbreak happens, the city and the state is prepared to handle it. Now that'll take about two weeks. Priscilla, thank you. The speculation, rumors, and confusion continue to grow about the health and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after he reportedly hasn't been seen in public for almost two weeks. U.S. officials say he may be ill after undergoing surgery. South Korea says Kim is alive and well, while North Korea state media has been completely silent. To help us sort all of this out is uh, NBC's Cal Perry joining us now live from London. Hi, Cal. Good morning. Hey, Phil, good morning to you. So what happened, really, the thing that set this all off was on April the 15th, the North Korean leader missed what is a national holiday. It is the commemoration of his grandfather's birthday. He founded the country. It was the 108th commemoration. He hasn't missed it since 2011 when he took over. That's what started this speculation, both in South Korea and in the United States, when we heard from some intelligence officials. Now, Pouring cold water on all of this is recent satellite images of the leader's train, with at least what is believed to be his train, an 820-foot train in the eastern city of Wosan. That is an elite area where we know that he goes on vacation. So those satellite images leading many people to believe that the rumors were not true. They were cardiovascular rumors. There was a rumor that he had undergone surgery. But as you said, the South Koreans, specifically this morning, again saying that they don't believe that there's anything wrong with them, that North Korea has not changed their posture. North Korean state television as well, continuing on with their normal programming, something that you would not expect if the dear leader, as they put it, um, had fallen ill or had died. All of this goes to show that we still know very, very little about what happens inside North Korea. The WHO was hoping for some coronavirus information out of that country. It is just an information blackout, guys. Philip. Corey? Yeah, almost impossible to get any accurate information on that we can rely on here. All right, Cal Perry, joining us from London. Thank you, Cal. All right, let's turn to your Monday forecast. Let's get a first check of that forecast with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning. Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Hopefully you are staying dry this morning because we continue to be in this wet pattern across two thirds of the nation. And it's really a spring pattern that continues to set up. We'll be dry for one day and then another storm system starts to make its way in. So you can start to see the snow that is already falling across northern New England with winter weather advisories currently in place for interior New York all the way into the Pittsburgh area where we could see possible possibility of at least an inch of snow with that wet pattern going to continue to stay in place for at least the next 24 hours. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So still warm air across Grand Rapids. That's that warm front lifting. We're still in the lower 60s and the heat really continues to build. We're seeing excessive heat alerts across portions of the southwest. Completely different weather pattern happening across the southwest with temperatures near 100 degrees this week, guys. Hard to imagine in this corner of the country. Yeah. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Uh, kids in New York are helping to lift the spirits of first responders. Handwritten letters and drawings, they were all delivered to the Levittown Volunteer Fire Department. Children of all ages joined the letters to our Heroes campaign to say thank you. The first responder said that these words of encouragement go a long way during this difficult time. The youngest letter they've received from a two-year-old. So sweet. Talented kids. A special moment from St. Louis. A hospital staff gathering outside to cheer on a police officer who was discharged after a month-long battle with coronavirus. He left the hospital and walked straight into the arms of his wife there. First priority right there. Well, millions of students are missing out on rites of passages because of the pandemic. While families across the country have found their own special ways to make their memory special for their kids, it's hard not to think about what should have been. Sarah Dolliff looks at how students are coping. Amelia Leahy's senior year has been cut short, her prom dress going unworn. The dance is off. So is the rest of lacrosse season. I was about 50 saves away from breaking a 20-year-old probably record. She understands why, but is disappointed. Because it's been such a big, impactful part of my life and such a good part of my life that I don't want to see it as over. It's not just seniors. Coronavirus is canceling rites of passage for students of all ages, like saying goodbye to friends and teachers, moving to new grades or schools, parents facing tough questions about what's to come. 
not being able to give answers is very difficult. It's, it's very hard. The first thing is to answer honestly. Dr. Melissa Gilliam, an adolescent behavior expert at the University of Chicago, says parents shouldn't be afraid to say, I don't know, or use storytelling to get at the emotions driving questions. You can say, you know, this virus, this pandemic, it reminds me of another story of what it feels like to be really scared. And this is how I managed it. Playing games or puzzles gives teens and kids the chance to open dialogues. While we play something or do something, we're focused, we're together. And it's often in those moments that these questions arise that may not otherwise have a space to happen. Families can recognize or recreate missed milestones. Kayla Grace McSwain's family brought prom to their front yard. I'm so excited that my parents did this for me. Making those memories in unexpected ways. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. Okay. A couple of things. I don't know if I would describe the test as beautiful. Unless your idea of beauty is having a cotton swab tickle your brain. Also, when he said everyone can get a test, what he meant was almost no one. But until then... Weeks after Dr. Anthony Fauci jokingly said that Brad Pitt should play him on Saturday Night Live, the show delivered. The actor hosted the second stay-at-home edition of SNL and kicked off the show's cold open as Dr. Fauci. This was the impersonation we never knew we needed. You know, Dr. Fauci deserves to have someone like Brad Pitt. Yes. His interpretation of him, I love it. So good. <laughs> and the little bit at the end there that you saw, watch it all the way through. It was a really, yeah. really good little ending. All right, the NFL's first ever virtual draft brought the stars of tomorrow to the league, but it also brought donations to COVID relief efforts. The league announced its draft-a-thon raised more than $100 million over three days. That'll go to various charities like American Red Cross, Meals on Wheels, and the CDC Foundation. 99-year-old Captain Tom Moore has broken two Guinness World Records. He achieved the record for the most money raised by an individual charity walk, raising over $34 million. The World War II veteran also became the oldest person to reach number one on the UK music charts with his hit single, You'll Never Walk Alone. His achievements have earned him the front cover of Guinness World Records 2021. He says that he's honored to receive the recognition and thankful to those who have donated. We cannot get enough of it'd be so great. Thursday is his April 100th birthday. There you go. Hi, everyone. I want to keep you updated on our regional growth rate of COVID-19. And please do not be alarmed by this graph. You're seeing a major spike on Saturday. The good news about this, we had about 47,000 people get tested in New York City compared to 25,000. So we saw that increase in the cases Saturday. But we've been pretty consistent for the last five days, guys. Sure have. All right, Janessa, thank you. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen how the power of music can connect us all. And this weekend, two big stars led their own sing-alongs. NBC's Kate Snow has the story. In San Francisco, a crowd, or what passes for one in the time of coronavirus, gathered at a statue of the legendary Tony Bennett. I love you, San Francisco. Let's sing our song. He had called them there to pay tribute to the city's health care workers, tirelessly fighting the pandemic. Seems somehow sadly gay. San Franciscans came out or stayed in to join the song. Terribly alone and forgotten. You could hear the love letter to the city at Grace Cathedral, inside fire stations, and outside once bustling cafes. Working musicians deprived of a stage joined in. And the voices of the San Francisco Opera brought it all together. Ringo Starr of the Beatles wanted people to come together too. For those of you missing singing together, I've got good news. So we say love to the sun. As the animated film Yellow Submarine played on YouTube Saturday, 70,000 people tuned in to sing along to Beatles hits. Young girls getting into character. Ringo 
sharing this Buddhist monk's rendition of the chorus. And in a time of crisis, there's really only one thing we all need. Ah, oh, just the best. Celebrate it. Music helps us celebrate, heal, remember, forget mm -hmm. all the feelings. The next one I want from Tony Bennett, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come? I don't think I've heard that yet. So here we go. Good one. I got that on deck. All right. Animal Control in South Carolina. They had their hands full. They had an aggressive alligator. Check it out here. The snappy gator was biting at the fire pit in a family's home as a crew tried to ease it away. Animal Control, they had to hose the big guy down with four security guards guiding that gator back home to his lagoon. You can Ooh. see the gator choosing the stop, drop, and roll method to get home there. As quickly as possible. All right, stay safe on this Monday. Thanks for watching. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. Coming up on the Today Show, Magic Johnson is live to talk about ESPN's latest hit Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following internet national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. A major week ahead kicks off today with restaurants in Georgia opening up, a plan for New York to get moving again, and the strategy to increase testing on a massive scale. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one okay. another as we move through these phases. The White House Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator predicting some form of social distancing will be needed all summer. As the Vice President is pushing for a Memorial Day opening up, but are things moving too quickly right now? We'll introduce you to some medical students who were rushed through graduation and fast-tracked right into hospital hot zones. What's really behind the medical mystery surrounding the condition and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un? And our Dr. John Torres and the new high-tech house calls being treated without ever leaving home. Early Today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. It's Monday, April 27th, and the beginning of the first week back to work for some Americans. As more states ease coronavirus restrictions, the U.S. will likely pass the 1 million mark for confirmed cases early this week. We are currently at more than 970,000 confirmed cases as of this morning, and nearly 55,000 souls have been lost due to COVID-19 in this country. New York, where the virus has taken a devastating toll, could be begin a gradual reopening next month. Governor Andrew Cuomo says some low-risk construction projects and manufacturing jobs could resume May 15th. The plan will only move forward if the number of hospitalizations keeps declining. The last patient on board, the USNS Comfort, has been discharged. The Navy hospital ship was sent to New York to help relieve stress on the medical system. It's expected to return to its home port in Virginia by the end of the month. The spike in cases may be easing in some hot spots, but social distancing will likely be the new normal for at least a few months. White House Coronavirus Coordinator Dr. Deborah Birch says the U.S. needs a breakthrough on testing before rules can be relaxed. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has a hopeful prediction for the summer. He believes that as more businesses reopen in May and June, the economy will rebound in July, August and September. Many governors agree that the key to getting people back to work is widespread testing. We're seeing many states ramp up their efforts to get testing centers to some of the hardest hit and most underserved areas. And for more on this, we are joined now by NBC's Kathy Park. Kathy, good morning. 
Philip, good morning. The good news is that the virus appears to be slowing down in some hot spots, but we also track some troubling trends this weekend in places like Maryland. Meantime, here in New York, testing is at the forefront and pharmacies will now be playing a bigger role. The outbreak isn't slowing fast enough in Maryland, which marked its deadliest day Saturday, bringing the death toll near 800. We have dramatically uh, flattened and lengthened that curve and lowered the numbers, uh, but unfortunately that, may, that means we we're also a little bit behind and now those numbers are coming up. Massachusetts remains in its surge, with cases topping more than 54,000. Death notices stretching 21 pages in the Boston Globe reflect the growing number of victims in the battle against COVID-19. And out west, a troubling trend. NBC's Steve Patterson is in Los Angeles. COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in L.A. County, and communities of color are disproportionately affected. There's a toxic mix of underlying health conditions, a higher percentage of essential workers, and lower availability to testing. Testing deserts are something the state health department director says she wants to fix immediately by opening up dozens more sites. In hard-hit New York, the governor issued an executive order expanding the reach of COVID-19 testing, giving all frontline workers priority access, setting a goal of 40 thousand daily tests and unlocking 5,000 pharmacies as testing locations. We're going to authorize all the independent pharmacists in the state to be collection sites for testing. Some of them have already been doing it, some of the larger national chains, but if uh, your local drugstore can now become a collection site, People could go to their local drugstore. In the Bronx, where infections per capita top all other boroughs, this neighborhood pharmacy is waiting for the state health department to roll out the rules about getting tests and administering them to New Yorkers. Say myself, I want to come to your pharmacy and get tested for COVID right now. Can I do that? No. We're waiting for that guidance and we hope it's forthcoming. Public health experts say New York is proving to be a strong leader by laying out an aggressive strategy, but it's not enough. We're going to have to make diagnostics for COVID-19 as available as, say, a pregnancy test or a drug kit at, say, uh, a pharmacy. Dr. Anthony Fauci reinforcing the need for ramped up testing as states make plans to reopen. Right now, you know, we're doing about 1.52 million per week. We probably should get up to twice that as we get into the next several weeks, and I think we will. Right now, some of the major chains like CVS and Walgreens have testing available for those who qualify in places like Connecticut, Michigan, and Oregon. Here in New York, the governor's office says that they're still finalizing some of the guidelines for these independent pharmacies, and those guidelines should be issued soon. Philip? All right, Kathy, thank you. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis, spurring the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. And despite warnings from health experts, some states are barreling ahead with plans to reopen. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. Now, Tracy, several states are loosening the restrictions today. Hi, Corey. Good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, several states like Tennessee reopening restaurants. Uh, we saw several last week. About a third of the states uh, are reopening or easing restrictions in some way starting this week. Some say they are not ready yet. And the federal government is urging caution, saying that any reopening needs to happen gradually. Each state is different, and the reason we made the guidelines and gating criteria very specific was also, and I'm sure a lot of people have missed the asterisk, and it's said to look not only statewide, but also county by county. The policies are working. We're now looking at a relatively short period of time, 14 days of decline. If you don't have 14 days of decline, nobody would say, uh, be reckless and open anyway. Now, there is growing pressure on these states. We're seeing protests. We saw them over the weekend in Nevada from people who want to go back to work and also pushback from some governors like Michigan's governor on the suggestion from Senator Mitch McConnell that states having financial problems should declare bankruptcy instead of waiting for a federal bailout. Corey? Thank you. 
From the classroom straight to the front lines, some courageous med students who graduated early have fast-tracked their way into hospitals to help aid in the fight against coronavirus. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. Good morning. It's about 6.30 and I've just gotten to the hospital. They are the latest recruits in the coronavirus battle. Placing my mask. I'm ready to go. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's worth it. New doctors, 30-year-old Bronx native Kathleen Lozada and 25-year-old Olamide Omideli from Houston. We look at this chest x-ray. Two of the fourth-year students who graduated early from medical schools to serve. You know, once we took our oath before, you know, joining our class and being a medical doctor, I think we agreed to step up whenever the hospital, you know, had a need. I couldn't have imagined where I would be now. It was like a surreal feeling, honestly. Graduation. Sinai, early graduation will start in 90 seconds. Was virtual. <laughs> but the crisis at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is all too real. Four days on the job, how many of your patients have died? So I think we've had maybe three or four patients pass away in the last four days. How are you dealing with those deaths? It's really hard. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really dealing with them yet, you know. Uh, it's, it's challenging. There's really not enough time in the day to really, really think about and reflect about the deaths, which is tough for sure. Savoring the little victories. I was able to get my patient an iPhone charger, so we are charging her phone now. Hopefully she'll be able to FaceTime with her family in the next couple of hours, um, which will be really nice for them. At New York Presbyterian, Peter Novak is researching patient data associated with coronavirus deaths from home. The purpose of the work I'm doing is still the same, and that's to help patients uh, in whatever way I can. Satisfaction hard won. Today was actually a good day on our unit. Um, we didn't have any patients pass away today, and we were able to discharge two of them, so I'd consider that a really good day. Baptized by fire, ready to help save more lives. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. All right, let's get a check of your Monday forecast. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb has a look at your day ahead. Hey, good morning, you two. So brave of those new doctors. Uh, just so happy that they're getting out and helping people. Let's take a look at what's happening weather-wise. You're not smiling about this weather if you're across the Northeast. We're in a spring pattern. You'll see dry day, then rain and storms. They will continue to pop up for the rest of the week. But this morning, we are talking about winter weather advisories that are sparking across interior New York, also northern New England, where they could see up to at least one to three inches. Also watching the severe weather threat that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow afternoon across the southern plains. But look at this widespread of rain up to one to two inches across the Ohio Valley into the northeast. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So still warm air across Indianapolis, 64 degrees drying out for Ohio to the Columbus area this afternoon. If you need the heat, get to the southwest El Paso today, 94 degrees. Looking for vacation weather, need to get to the southwest, excessive heat advisories in place in that area, guys. All right. We can just get this uh, coronavirus restrictions to lift and we can be on our way. These days. <laughs> All right. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Uh, in today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for a uh, gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down over a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have a volunteer to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor saying they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and the Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers kick off Tuesday at noon. Distance is no mark for patriotism. Well, a moment of unity from New York, a four-year-old boy bringing his family and his friends together, even strangers together every day to recite the Pledge of Allegiance.
I mean, while there is a cloud of speculation that just continues to grow around the status and health of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, rumors have been swirling over the last week or so about the 36-year-old after he reportedly disappeared from public view after undergoing surgery. North Korea has been silent. South Korea says... Kim is well, and U.S. officials say that he may be ill. Uh, to help us sort it all out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry. Cal, good morning. Hey, Philip, good morning. So you can add China to the list of countries that are silent on what has happened to Kim Jong-un. Now, all of this started on April the 15th. Uh, when the dear leader, as he's called in North Korea, missed the most important yearly celebration, that the birthday of his grandfather who founded the country, this would have been his 108th birthday. Now, there has been some satellite imagery released of what we believe to be the train of Kim Jong-un, an 820-foot luxury train in the east of the country. This is in the town of Wosan. This is where uh, the, the Kim Jong-un goes on his sort of vacation. There was some letters put around uh, in the area that were believed to have been written by him, which is sort of adding to the idea that maybe he's fine. Now, South Korean TV this morning has said that they believe he's probably fine, that this was a rumor. But it just goes to show you, Philip, even in the year 2020, how little we know about North Korea and what's happening inside North Korea. For example, the WHO has been looking for any information that they can get on the coronavirus, no information coming out of North Korea and no information as of right now on the leader of North Korea, though it does appear as though those rumors are starting to subside. Philip? You inside that little box there, but <laughs> we heard you loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Cal Perry, thank you so much for the update. Stuck with my fam, I can't get out. For like two months, been on my couch. It's quarantine in my house. I'm done with selfies, so don't even ask. Staying in the house in an underwear mask. Only been my dog with a baseball mitt. Making my own brand and it tastes like shit. Saturday Night Live did it again. They brought fans some smiles from self-quarantine. This time, comedians Adam Sandler and Pete Davidson teamed up for that really funny duet there they put together <laughs> uh, with the help of their families, of course, and they ended it all with a special thank you to first responders. All right, let's stay on this train here. Dave Chappelle helping raise over $100,000 for struggling comics during the coronavirus pandemic. The comedian, along with Bill Burr, Whitney Cummings, and many other teamed up with the famous Los Angeles comedy venue, The Comedy store for a live three-part podcast benefit. Chappelle reunited with some of his former Chappelle show co-stars during his segment. The money raised helps benefit to support those comics tied to the venue as well as staff with the venue. So that's great. Those are uh, some of my favorite comics we just saw on the board there. there All in go. one space. Bill Burr, Dave Chappelle, my favorite, Neil Brennan, uh, who's underrated, helped create the mm -hmm. Chappelle show. Uh, I can't wait to find that podcast. I actually had trying to send somebody a link uh, to me so that I can see it. Two things now on your list. Saturday Night Live, if you haven't seen it yet, and now that Chappelle special. I've, I've checked that one out, so now I just need that podcast. All right, there is a family in Arkansas who did not let this pandemic stop them from adopting their son. It was done completely online. A two-year-old Jaden found his friend ever home with the Wenicke family. They'd been already fostering Jaden for a year now. They decided to officially adopt him as their own. Even though their court hearing couldn't be held in person, they finalized his adoption over what else these days? A Zoom video call. I love how more and more people are just not letting the social distancing and, and having to stay at home stop them from being able to live their best lives. We got to keep doing something. Keep it going. Uh, this next one, talk show host Andy Cohen is speaking out after he says he was told he could not give plasma because of his sexuality. Cohen, who recently recovered from COVID-19, said in a video posted to social media that he wanted to donate his plasma for antibody trials, which would be used for people who have the virus. Well, he went on to say that he was first told by the program he sounded like a perfect candidate. But the 51-year-old says he was then told he could not give the plasma after revealing that he's gay. FDA restrictions currently only allow gay men to give blood after abstaining from sex for three months. Hey everyone, we continue to watch our regional growth rate and you can see a big time spike happen on Saturday. Please do not be alarmed. We're seeing an increase in cases that were being reported on Saturday for New York City. Also, about 47,000 more people got tested compared to the last few weeks where we've only seen about 25,000. So that is great news and we continue to be very consistent in our region. Guys. More testing, more testing. All right, Janessa, thank you. 
Coronavirus is helping to usher in the future of medicine with so many routine medical and dental visits off limits now. Doctors are finding new ways to treat their patients. Dr. John Torres has more. With hospitals across the country, now the front lines in the battle against COVID-19, fear of catching coronavirus is keeping other patients away. And now, more than ever, they're turning to healthcare consultations of a different type. It's Dr. McGee. How are you doing? It's called telemedicine, virtual visits on computers, even smartphones. It's not new, but the advancement and availability of technology has pushed it into overdrive. We've done over 5,000 visits over the past uh, over the past month. That's up from just 20 a month before COVID hit. An astonishing increase for Dr. Michael Main and his colleagues at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to do is to innovate Their priority, protecting both their staff and vulnerable patients like 89-year-old stroke survivor Carl Hines. Having any problems with uh, chest pain? No. And at a time when medical resources are stretched thin and so many of us are staying home, these routine virtual visits are a lifeline for heart patient Gail Collette. Have you had any episodes of those palpitations? Uh, Well, actually, I did. Checking in about medications, symptoms, and solutions. I thought it was very beneficial and very reassuring. Reassuring for doctors, too, like New York City primary care physician Arthi Reddy. Get up. Staying connected with her patients from a desk in her boy's bedroom. She says figuring out which in-person visits can and cannot wait during the COVID crisis depends on each patient. Right now we are holding off on any screening, um, colonoscopies, mammograms, even yearly blood work. Um, if, unless the patient's presenting with something concerning, we're not doing those. But what can't wait? Visit your doctor or the ER if you have shortness of breath or signs of a heart attack or stroke, a broken bone or large cut that won't stop bleeding, and problems with a pregnancy. And even though most dentist offices are closed for routine procedures, there are exceptions. Anything with pain or anything that uh, decreases the quality of life you know, for the patient. And so obviously infections, uh, abscesses, severe decay, uh, any broken teeth. Handled with care and taking extreme precautions. We're not just protecting the patients and the community, we're also protecting ourselves. There you are. Thanks to Dr. Torres for that report. You know, as, uh, as unprepared as we were for this, mm-hmm. I'm just grateful that we live in a time where we're able to do something like this and this technology is adapt. available. It yep. is interesting. Thanks for starting your week with Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Menick. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following internet national maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. Today, more states will begin loosening restrictions on businesses, parks, and other locations as demand for more testing grows. To air travel, where flight attendants are calling for a temporary ban on vacation travel, saying their lives are at risk in the age of coronavirus. And then we will take you back to the future for a group of families who are getting creative to recreate some favorite family photos. It's Monday. Early today starts right now. With that, we say good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. With summer just a few weeks away, can Americans keep up social distancing? That as state and federal leaders continue to debate when and how to reopen their states. Here's what you need to know to start the week. Top health officials are saying that the number of new cases has reached a plateau. There are now more than 972,000 Americans infected and close to 55,000 people have died.
The stay-at-home order was no match for the sweltering heat in Southern California. Thousands of people packed the beaches in Ventura and Orange counties. Further north in L.A., beaches are still closed. Officials there opened cooling centers to help beat the heat. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is offering some optimism. Mnuchin says that the trillion dollars in government spending will pay off and help spur growth. As states continue to reopen, he expects the economy to bounce back from July to September. A community comes together to honor a fallen soldier. 34-year-old Marine Gunnery Sergeant Diego Pongo was killed in Iraq. Coronavirus restrictions stopped his family from holding a funeral, so residents of Simi Valley held a drive-by parade instead. California Governor Gavin Newsom is helping the nearly 6 million seniors in the Golden State by launching a program that delivers three warm meals to at-risk seniors every day of the week. Participating restaurants will get reimbursed. About one-third of all states have already begun easing restrictions or are planning to, but the White House says social distancing will be the norm for the next few months. Here's Dan Sheneman. In Georgia, there are open-for-business signs in many windows, including nail salons and barber shops. I mean, we clean up after every chair, every customer gets out of the chair. We wear gloves. Nearly 20 states are allowing shops to open their doors or allowing stay-at-home orders to expire. In states where restrictions are still in place, protesters continue to plead with authorities. I believe the quarantine should have applied to the sick, the elderly, those at risk, those that take care of them. And it would have left a lot more money and supplies to take care of those people instead of all of us, you know, scrambling just to keep a roof over our heads. Vice President Mike Pence suggested social distancing could be over by Memorial Day. But a top White House official disagrees. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another as we move through these phases. Dr. Deborah Burke says she is concerned about states opening before meeting federal guidelines of two weeks of declining cases. She also hopes there will soon be a better way to test Americans. We have to have a breakthrough innovation in testing. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly exp- trying to detect the actual live virus. But Dr. Burks warns such a breakthrough may not happen for months. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis, spurring the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. And despite warnings from health experts, some states are barreling ahead with plans to reopen. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us now with the very latest. And Tracy, several states are loosening restrictions today. Yeah, members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force are concerned uh, that some of these states may be moving too fast. About a third of our states, as you noted, will be easing restrictions at some point this week. And the federal government is urging them to heed the guidelines, wait until these cases drop 14 days in a row and not to reopen too soon. Each state is different, and the reason we made the guidelines and gating criteria very specific was also, and I'm sure a lot of people have missed the asterisk, and it said to look not only statewide, but also county by county. The policies are working. We're now looking at a relatively short period of time, 14 days of decline. If you don't have 14 days of decline, nobody would say, uh, be reckless and open anyway. Now, some of these states trying to hold on financially uh, with business pretty much at a standstill and pushing back, though, on Senator Mitch McConnell's suggestion that states declare bankruptcy instead of waiting for a federal bailout. Back to you. That's a big decision for those companies to make. All right, Tracy, thank you so much. Airline employees are sounding the alarm. They say their lives are at risk and they're now calling for a temporary ban on vacation travel. Here's Erin McLaughlin. Flying in the time of COVID-19, empty planes, falling prices, and an industry in crisis. The flight attendants it depends on, vulnerable and feeling forgotten. We are risking our lives too every time we come to work. This week, United Airlines joined JetBlue as the first major U.S. carriers to require flight attendants wear masks. Still, no such requirement for passengers and other employees. I do hope that it gets to the point where if you are not willing to wear a mask, you can't travel. Same as if you didn't bring your driver's license. Earlier this month, on my way to Seattle for an assignment. I boarded the flight, and as expected, the situation's pretty empty. 
But on the return, a stark contrast. More passengers, many without masks, and no guidance on how to safely social distance. Across the country, similar stories. The Association of Flight Attendants is now pushing for all leisure travel to end until the virus is contained. They're also demanding legislation mandating masks for crew, employees and passengers. Just asking flight attendants to wear a mask is not enough. Uh, but the bottom line is it reduces your risk of getting infected on the airplane if everybody is wearing a mask. United Airlines released a statement recognizing for flight attendants social distancing's challenging, saying they've added masks on flights to ensure attendants have one mask each per duty day. Delta's CEO says masks are encouraged. Our frontline staff are encouraged to wear them. We do have masks for customers if they don't bring them. American Airlines with no mask requirement for passengers or crew. Their website notes the CDC does not require passengers to wear masks. We know we're playing a vital role in the infrastructure. This weekend, the U.S. Treasury Department released billions more in aid to U.S. carriers. Airlines consider critical, but the workers feeling unprotected. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. The speculation, rumors and confusion continue to grow out about the health and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after he reportedly hasn't been seen in public for almost two weeks. U.S. officials say he may be ill after undergoing surgery. South Korea says Kim is alive and well, while North Korea state media, well, they've been completely silent. To help us sort all of this out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry joining us live in London. Cal, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Philip. So the rumors were that he had some kind of cardiovascular issue, maybe a surgery. That all started on April the 15th when Kim missed what would have been his grandfather's 108th birthday. That is a national holiday. He is the man who founded North Korea. So that is what started all of this speculation. Now, adding to the rumors is this satellite footage, satellite images showing the train of Kim Jong-un in the eastern part of the country in the town of Wosan. That is where he goes on vacation. It is an elite part of the country. There were some rumors that he had actually penned a few letters to the United Nations thanking them for doing some construction in that area. All of this really serves a point to show that we still don't have a good grasp of what is going on inside North Korea. When you look at the coronavirus and how that is spread across Asia, the WHO begging the North Koreans for information, not getting any. It gives you a sign of how that country really still remains a mystery. Adding to the mystery this morning, the Chinese saying they believe that Kim is well, that he is doing fine, that he is in that eastern part of the country, probably taking some time off, guys. Philip, Corey. A lot of secrecy out there. All right, Cal Perry from London. Thank you, Cal. Let's turn it to a check of the weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb on your Monday. Janessa, good morning. Happy Monday, you two. Good morning, everyone. We continue to see a storm system that's barreling actually across the northeast. You see my banner. It says winter radar, and that should not be the case. But we do have winter weather that's running through northern New England, also interior New York. We are seeing winter weather advisories, unfortunately, for these sections of the country. And that'll last until your early morning hours before more rain starts to push in that area. Also watching our next big severe weather weather risk that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow for the Southern Plains. So pretty quiet start to the week, but that severe weather will ramp up by tomorrow afternoon into your evening. This will be kind of a wet week with accumulation from Ohio Valley to the Northeast up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So warm air is still for Grand Rapids to Chicago. We're seeing that warm front push up towards the north, 62 degrees today. But if you need the heat, man, going to be sweating in Phoenix today, triple digit territory. We're late April, Phoenix, 103 degrees. So records going to be shattered this week across the southwest. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Ooh. All right, I want you to check out how this town came together to celebrate a very special birthday. We have such great neighbors, and uh, I get a tear up here, but I don't care. Uh, kids, an old man cries once in a while. Darn right. <laughs> that is a renowned trumpeter, Bobby Baird. He's performed for presidents and international crowds, so it was only fitting for his neighbors to salute him on his 90th birthday. He got a few notes, as well as a parade. The caravan of cars was so long, Baird says he lost count. <laughs> the best way to do it. It's beautiful. 
99 year old captain Tom Moore. He has broken two Guinness World Records and he achieved that record for the title for the most money raised by an individual charity walk by raising over $34 million. Yeah, the World War II veteran also became the oldest person to reach number one on the UK music charts with his hit single, You'll Never Walk Alone. Moore says he is honored to receive the recognition and is thankful to those who donated. So not only did he raise the most amount mm -hmm. of money, he then followed it up with a number one hit single. I mean, he's he's having an incredible time right now. Yeah. I, I, there are the Royal Mail, which is the equivalent to the Postal mm -hmm. Service here there on his birthday is coming up this Thursday. He'll be 100. They're going to have a special postmark just for him. That's perfect. He deserves yeah. it, right? Yeah, there we go. Collect. All right, as this virus spreads across the country, it is disproportionately killing minorities in poorer communities. Steve Patterson takes a closer look at why. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads to every corner of the U.S., these are especially dark days for communities of color. COVID-19 is an opportunistic killer, most dangerous to people with underlying conditions, like Ravi Turman, who beat uterine cancer 10 years ago. I actually didn't find out I was positive until after I came out of the coma. Ravi spent 10 days on a ventilator at University of Colorado Hospital, but survived. If you do get the diagnosis, you can beat it. It is beatable, despite the fact that you may be black or you may have pre-existing conditions. African-American and Hispanic communities have been hit hard by the virus because hotspots like New York, Chicago and New Orleans have outsized minority populations. It isn't genetic. That's nonsense to say it's genetic. Dr. Anthony Fauci joined a popular urban radio show to explain genetic. the particular danger to, to listeners. African-Americans have a higher degree of hypertension, obesity, asthma, all of those kinds of things that are preconditions that if you do get infected, you wind up having a worse outcome. The threat is now spread from city centers to the most remote areas, like the Navajo Nation, which has seen more than 1,200 cases per capita that would be the third highest infection rate of any state. When one family member um, contracts or, or is exposed to the virus, they have the potential of exposing most, if not all, of their family to it because of their close family structure. Roughly 50 people have died here, and with the elderly at elevated risk, an entire culture is at stake. Some of our oral traditions are going to be lost because of COVID-19, because those are the keepers of the stories, the keepers of our histories and, and our cultural practices are held within these uh, older populations. A pandemic that knows no race or color or class, yet threatens all of them. Oh, thanks to Steve Patterson for that reporting. In today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for a gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down by more than a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have volunteered to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor says they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers will kick off Tuesday at noon. Where we kick off another week on Wall Street where small businesses will get another crack at the new batch of government stimulus, plus a whole lot more. CNBC's Jeff Cutmore joining us now on that and some novel ideas on just what to do with the millions and millions of dollars worth of expired beer. Jeff, please explain. Uh, I don't think you want to drink it, Philip. Let me just talk you through the market story first, and then I'll tell you about the beer. So the market's likely to open in positive territory. The early look at the U.S. futures indicate a good start to the session here with European markets higher at this point. And that would obviously follow on from what was a, a weaker close. Uh, we were 1 percent down on the Dow and the S&P last week, even though we saw Friday's close positive for both of those markets. Big issue for the week. 50% of S&P companies report first quarter earnings this week. So we'll be watching the earnings and we'll be watching very closely the Federal Reserve meeting Wednesday to see if there's any fresh stimulus announcement to tackle coronavirus. 
Talking of tackling coronavirus, Boston Beer, and let's get on to the beer story. They've had about $5.8 million worth of beer and kegs returned because restaurants and bars are closed. Now, instead of just pouring this down the drain, the company planning to recycle that by turning it into ethanol to use then in hand sanitizer, which would be a very useful thing to put into the market right now, given that clearly it is difficult to sell some of this beer in bars and restaurants. Just one point to finish on, while we're talking about beer, Nielsen out with some numbers about how we're all managing this crisis. Apparently beer sales for the week ending April 11th up 11.5%. So it seems some people are choosing to drink their way through these lockdowns. Back to you. A lot of people making that choice. I don't judge them for a minute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just don't drink the expired beer. That's right. I didn't. I never let it sit in the fridge long enough for that to happen, so I wouldn't know. I don't know. Not a concern. <laughs> it's not. Jeff, thank you so much. I got two questions for you really quickly. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, sanitizer will be sudsy? Nick? It could be. Is whatever. If it works, it's all good. I'd and say. do you think they'll hop right on it? No, look at and her. Look at her. <laughs> all right. Hi, everyone. Let's give you your regional update. You're seeing a major spike on Saturday, but that's just because we had more testing across the Northeast, been consistent at about 4%. We'll be right back. You know, boredom in quarantine has a lot of families getting creative. Parents are reconnecting with their young adult children by reenacting their past. Jose diaz Pilar has more. It's called I'm Just a Kid Challenge, inspired by the 2002 song by Simple Plan. I'm just a kid. Families are reenacting old photos on the social media platform TikTok, often with hilarious results. This was then. This is now. An easy balancing act then, a much bigger challenge now. For the Metcalf family outside Atlanta, now with three kids back home, making these new memories has been a blessing. The grocery bill has doubled, of course, but it, it's fun and it's a great time to kind of reconnect, a great time to bond again, talking about things that we probably wouldn't have because we've had like short sessions with them since they all went to college. Reuniting over family activities, and making TikTok magic. We had the staircase right there and uh, uh, trying to get everybody to squeeze in tight like they were when we originally took it was a little difficult, but outside of that, uh, a great shot, I think. Tom Craig used the time home from Virginia Tech to recreate this snap with his dad 20 years later. Good thing dad still had the same shirt. I just kicked up into a handstand and, and he held me up. It took a couple of tries. Yeah. It took a couple of tries. No, I never fell on my head. He's pretty strong. A similar challenge for the fully grown Swagger sisters in Pennsylvania. It took like a couple tries. After a couple of tries, I think we got it. So it pretty it matched pretty good, I think. Creative ways to pass the pandemic. This has just been a great a great distraction during a, a you know trying time for everybody. And reflect on old memories. Because at the end of the day, no matter how grown up those kids get, for parents, they'll always be just their baby. Always. All right. Thank you to Jose for that story there. Okay. Speaking of music, after dropping a new single just days ago, the Rolling Stones living in a ghost town tops the charts. All right, it's the sound of the times. The song is number one on iTunes in 20 countries. It is their first number one hit in 40 years. Yeah, they haven't put out any new music in about eight years. Now, if we can just get the concerts back, then we can get to see the Stones on tour. It's been on my bucket list my At whole life. At least a virtual concert for now. Something, something. Have a great Monday. Thanks for waking up with early today. I'm Corey Coppin. And I'm Philip Mena. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. 
There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. A major week ahead kicks off today with restaurants in Georgia opening up, a plan for New York to get moving again, and the strategy to increase testing on a massive scale. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another okay. as we move through these phases. The White House Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator predicting some form of social distancing will be needed all summer. As the Vice President is pushing for a Memorial Day opening up, but are things moving too quickly right now? We'll introduce you to some medical students who were rushed through graduation and fast-tracked right into hospital hot zones. What's really behind the medical mystery surrounding the condition and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un? And our Dr. John Torres and the new high-tech house calls being treated without ever leaving home. Early Today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. It's Monday, April 27th, and the beginning of the first week back to work for some Americans. As more states ease coronavirus restrictions, the U.S. will likely pass the 1 million mark for confirmed cases early this week. We are currently at more than 970,000 confirmed cases as of this morning, and nearly 55,000 souls have been lost due to COVID-19 in this country. New York, where the virus has taken a devastating toll, could be begin a gradual reopening next month. Governor Andrew Cuomo says some low-risk construction projects and manufacturing jobs could resume May 15th. The plan will only move forward if the number of hospitalizations keeps declining. The last patient on board, the USNS Comfort, has been discharged. The Navy hospital ship was sent to New York to help relieve stress on the medical system. It's expected to return to its home port in Virginia by the end of the month. The spike in cases may be easing in some hot spots, but social distancing will likely be the new normal for at least a few months. White House Coronavirus Coordinator Dr. Deborah Birch says the U.S. needs a breakthrough on testing before rules can be relaxed. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has a hopeful prediction for the summer. He believes that as more businesses reopen in May and June, the economy will rebound in July, August and September. Many governors agree that the key to getting people back to work is widespread testing. We're seeing many states ramp up their efforts to get testing centers to some of the hardest hit and most underserved areas. And for more on this, we are joined now by NBC's Kathy Park. Kathy, good morning. Philip, good morning. The good news is that the virus appears to be slowing down in some hot spots, but we also track some troubling trends this weekend in places like Maryland. Meantime, here in New York, testing is at the forefront and pharmacies will now be playing a bigger role. The outbreak isn't slowing fast enough in Maryland, which marked its deadliest day Saturday, bringing the death toll near 800. We have dramatically uh, flattened and lengthened that curve and lowered the numbers, uh, but unfortunately that, may, that means we we're also a little bit behind and now those numbers are coming up. Massachusetts remains in its surge, with cases topping more than 54,000. Death notices stretching 21 pages in the Boston Globe reflect the growing number of victims in the battle against COVID-19. And out west, a troubling trend. NBC's Steve Patterson is in Los Angeles. COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in L.A. County, and communities of color are disproportionately affected. There's a toxic mix of underlying health conditions, a higher percentage of essential workers, and lower availability to testing. Testing deserts are something the state health department director says she wants to fix immediately by opening up dozens more sites. 
In hard-hit New York, the governor issued an executive order expanding the reach of COVID-19 testing, giving all frontline workers priority access, setting a goal of 40,000 daily tests, and unlocking 5,000 pharmacies as testing locations. We're going to authorize all the independent pharmacists in the state to be collection sites for testing. Some of them have already been doing it, some of the larger national chains, but if uh, your local drugstore can now become a collection site, people could go to their local drugstore. In the Bronx, where infections per capita top all other boroughs, this neighborhood pharmacy is waiting for the state health department to roll out the rules about getting tests and administering them to New Yorkers. Say myself, I want to come to your pharmacy and get tested for COVID right now. Can I do that? No. We're waiting for that guidance and we hope it's forthcoming. Public health experts say New York is proving to be a strong leader by laying out an aggressive strategy, but it's not enough. We're going to have to make diagnostics for COVID-19 as available as, say, a pregnancy test or a drug kit at, say, a pharmacy. Dr. Anthony Fauci reinforcing the need for ramped up testing as states make plans to reopen. Right now, you know, we're doing about 1.52 million per week. We probably should get up to twice that as we get into the next several weeks, and I think we will. Right now, some of the major chains like CVS and Walgreens have testing available for those who qualify in places like Connecticut, Michigan and Oregon. Here in New York, the governor's office says that they're still finalizing some of the guidelines for these independent pharmacies, and those guidelines should be issued soon. Philip? All right, Kathy, thank you. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis, spurring the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. And despite warnings from health experts, some states are barreling ahead with plans to reopen. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. Now, Tracy, several states are loosening the restrictions today. Hi, Corey. Good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, several states like Tennessee reopening restaurants. Uh, we saw several last week. About a third of the states uh, are reopening or easing restrictions in some way starting this week. Some say they are not ready yet. And the federal government is urging caution, saying that any reopening needs to happen gradually. Each state is different, and the reason we made the guidelines and gating criteria very specific was also, and I'm sure a lot of people have missed the asterisk, and it's said to look not only statewide, but also county by county. The policies are working. We're now looking at a relatively short period of time, 14 days of decline. If you don't have 14 days of decline, nobody would say, uh, be reckless and open anyway. Now, there is growing pressure on these states. We're seeing protests. We saw them over the weekend in Nevada from people who want to go back to work and also pushback from some governors like Michigan's governor on the suggestion from Senator Mitch McConnell that states having financial problems should declare bankruptcy instead of waiting for a federal bailout. Corey? Thank you. From the classroom straight to the front lines, some courageous med students who graduated early have fast-tracked their way into hospitals to help aid in the fight against coronavirus. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. Good morning. It's about 6.30 and I've just gotten to the hospital. They are the latest recruits in the coronavirus battle. Placing my mask. I'm ready to go. It's a little uncomfortable, but... It's worth it. <laughs> New doctors, 30-year-old Bronx native Kathleen Lozada and 25-year-old Olamide Omideli from Houston. If you look at this chest x-ray. Two of the fourth-year students who graduated early from medical schools to serve. You know, once we took our oath before, you know, joining our class I and mean, being a medical doctor, I think we agreed to step up whenever the hospital, you know, had a need. I couldn't have imagined where I would be now. It was like a surreal feeling, honestly. Graduation Sinai early graduation starting 90 seconds was virtual. <laughs> but the crisis at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is all too real. Four days on the job, how many of your patients have died? So I think we've had maybe three or four patients pass away in the last four days. 
How are you dealing with those deaths? It's really hard. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really dealing with them yet. You know, uh, it's, it's challenging. There's really not enough time in the day to really, really think about and reflect about the deaths, which is tough for sure. Savoring the little victories. I was able to get my patient an iPhone charger, so we are charging her phone now. Hopefully she'll be able to FaceTime with her family in the next couple of hours, um, which will be really nice for them. At New York Presbyterian, Peter Novak is researching patient data associated with coronavirus deaths from home. The purpose of the work I'm doing is still the same, and that's to help patients uh, in whatever way I can. Satisfaction hard won. Today was actually a good day on our unit. Um, We didn't have any patients pass away today, and we were able to discharge two of them, so I'd consider that a really good day. Baptized by fire, ready to help save more lives. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. All right, let's get a check of your Monday forecast. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb has a look at your day ahead. Hey, good morning, you two. So brave of those new doctors. Uh, Just so happy that they're getting out and helping people. Let's take a look at what's happening weather-wise. You're not smiling about this weather if you're across the Northeast. We're in a spring pattern. You'll see dry day, then rain and storms. They will continue to pop up for the rest of the week. But this morning, we are talking about winter weather advisories that are sparking across interior New York, also northern New England, where they could see up to at least one to three inches. Also watching the severe weather threat that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow afternoon across the southern plains. Look at this widespread of rain up to one to two inches across the Ohio Valley into the northeast. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So still warm air across Indianapolis, 64 degrees drying out for Ohio to the Columbus area this afternoon. If you need the heat, get to the southwest El Paso today, 94 degrees. Looking for vacation weather, need to get to the southwest, excessive heat advisories in place in that area, guys. All right. We can just get this uh, coronavirus restrictions to lift and we can be on our way. these days. <laughs> All right. All right, Janessa, Great. thank you so much. Uh, in today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for a uh, gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down over a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have a volunteer to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor saying they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and the Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers kick off Tuesday at noon. I Distance is no mark for patriotism. Well, a moment of unity from New York, a four-year-old boy bringing his family and his friends together, even strangers together every day to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I mean, while there is a cloud of speculation that just continues to grow around the status and health of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, rumors have been swirling over the last week or so about the 36-year-old after he reportedly disappeared from public view after undergoing surgery. North Korea has been silent. South Korea says... Kim is well, and U.S. officials say that he may be ill. Uh, To help us sort it all out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry. Cal, good morning. Hey, Philip, good morning. So you can add China to the list of countries that are silent on what has happened to Kim Jong-un. Now, all of this started on April the 15th. Uh, When the dear leader, as he's called in North Korea, missed the most important yearly celebration, that the birthday of his grandfather who founded the country, this would have been his 108th birthday. Now, there has been some satellite imagery released of what we believe to be the train of Kim Jong-un, an 820-foot luxury train in the east of the country. This is in the town of Wosan. This is where uh, the, the Kim Jong-un goes on his sort of vacation. There was some letters put around uh, in the area that were believed to have been written by him, which is sort of adding to the idea that maybe he's fine. Now, South Korean TV this morning has said that they believe he's probably fine, that this was a rumor. But it just goes to show you, Philip, even in the year 2020, how little we know about North Korea and what's happening inside North Korea. For example, the WHO has been looking for any information that they can get on the coronavirus, No information coming out of North Korea and no information as of right now 
on the leader of North Korea, though it does appear as though those rumors are starting to subside. Philip? You inside that little box there, <laughs> but we heard you loud and clear. Mm-hmm. Cal Perry, thank you so much for the update. Comes with the technology sometimes. There you go. Stuck with my fam, I can't get out. For like two months, been on my couch. It's quarantine in my house. I'm done with selfies, so don't even ask. Staying in the house in an underwear mask. Only bit my dog with a baseball mitt. Making my own bread and it tastes like Stuck with my fam, I can't. Saturday Night Live did it again. They brought fans some smiles from self-quarantine. This time, comedians Adam Sandler and Pete Davidson teamed up for that really funny duet there they put together uh, with the help of their families, of course, and they ended it all with a special thank you to first responders. All right, let's stay on this train here. Dave Chappelle helping raise over $100,000 for struggling comics during the coronavirus pandemic. The comedian, along with Bill Burr, Whitney Cummings, and many others, teamed up with the famous Los Angeles comedy venue, The Comedy store for a live three-part podcast benefit. Chappelle reunited with some of his former Chappelle Show co-stars during his segment, The Money Raised, helps benefit to support those comics tied to the venue as well as staff with the venue. So that's great. Those are uh, some of my favorite comics we just saw on the board there. there All in go. one space. Bill Burr, Dave Chappelle, my favorite, Neil Brennan, uh, who's underrated, helped create the mm-hmm. Chappelle Show. Uh, I can't wait to find that podcast. I actually had trying to send somebody a link uh, to me so that I can see it. Two things now on your list. Saturday Night Live, if you haven't seen it yet, and now that Chappelle special. I've, I've checked that one out, so now I just need that podcast. All right, there is a family in Arkansas who did not let this pandemic stop them from adopting their son. It was done completely online. A two-year-old Jaden found his friend forever home with the Wenicke family. They'd been already fostering Jaden for a year now. They decided to officially adopt him as their own. Even though their court hearing couldn't be held in person, they finalized his adoption over what else these days, a Zoom video call. I love how more and more people are just not letting the social distancing and and having to stay at home stop them from being able to live their best lives. We got to keep doing something. Keep it going. Uh, This next one, talk show host Andy Cohen is speaking out after he says he was told he could not give plasma because of his sexuality. Cohen, who recently recovered from COVID-19, said in a video posted to social media that he wanted to donate his plasma for antibody trials, which would be used for people who have the virus. Well, he went on to say that he was first told by the program he sounded like a perfect candidate. But the 51-year-old says he was then told he could not give the plasma after revealing that he's gay. FDA restrictions currently only allow gay men to give blood after abstaining from sex for three months. Hi everyone, we continue to watch our regional growth rate and you can see a big time spike happen on Saturday. Please do not be alarmed. We're seeing an increase in cases that were being reported on Saturday for New York City. Also, about 47,000 more people got tested compared to the last few weeks where we've only seen about 25,000. So that is great news and we continue to be very consistent in my region. Yes. More testing, more testing. All right, Janessa, thank you. Coronavirus is helping to usher in the future of medicine. With so many routine medical and dental visits off limits now, doctors are finding new ways to treat their patients. Dr. John Torres has more. With hospitals across the country, now the front lines in the battle against COVID-19, fear of catching coronavirus is keeping other patients away. And now, more than ever, they're turning to healthcare consultations of a different type. It's Dr. McGee. How are you doing? It's called telemedicine, virtual visits on computers, even smartphones. It's not new, but the advancement and availability of technology has pushed it into overdrive. We've done over 5,000 visits over the past uh, over the past month. That's up from just 20 a month before COVID hit. An astonishing increase for Dr. Michael Main and his colleagues at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to do is to innovate Their priority, protecting both their staff and vulnerable patients like 89-year-old stroke survivor Carl Hines. Having any problems with uh, chest pain? No. And at a time when medical resources are stretched thin and so many of us are staying home, these routine virtual visits are a lifeline for heart patient Gail Collette. Have you had any episodes of those palpitations? Uh, Well, actually, I did. Checking in about medications, symptoms, and solutions. I felt it was very beneficial and very reassuring. 
reassuring for doctors too, like New York City primary care physician, Arthi Reddy. Staying connected with her patients from a desk in her boy's bedroom. She says figuring out which in-person visits can and cannot wait during the COVID crisis depends on each patient. Right now we are holding off on any screening, um, colonoscopies, mammograms, even yearly blood work. Um, if, unless the patient's presenting with something concerning, we're not doing those. But what can't wait? Visit your doctor or the ER if you have shortness of breath or signs of a heart attack or stroke, a broken bone or large cut that won't stop bleeding, and problems with a pregnancy. And even though most dentist offices are closed for routine procedures, there are exceptions. Anything with pain or anything that uh, decreases the quality of life you know, for the patient, and so obviously infections, uh, abscesses, severe decay, uh, any broken teeth. Handled with care? in taking extreme precautions. We're not just protecting the patients and the community, we're also protecting ourselves. Very true, our thanks to Dr. Torres for that report. You know, as, uh, as unprepared as we were for this, mm -hmm. I'm just grateful that we live in a time where we're able to do something like this and this technology is adapt. available. It yeah. is interesting. Thanks for starting your week with Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Menico. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. Oh we got God. our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Oh. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening? With Chris Hayes, subscribe now. It's Monday, April 27th, and we're being warned that social distancing will last through the summer as many states begin to ease restrictions on local businesses starting today. The White House works to set the record straight on coronavirus guidelines as members of the task force hit the Sunday shows and President Trump takes to the Twitter sphere. Then to the millions of missed milestones from graduations to proms and everything in between. How to talk to your teens as we kick off our Monday. Early today starts right now. And good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. With summer just a few weeks away, can Americans keep up this social distancing? That as state and federal leaders continue to debate when and how to reopen their states. Here's what you need to know at this hour Start to start off your week. The top health officials say that the number of new cases has reached a plateau. There are now more than 972,000 Americans infected and close to 55,000 people have died. The White House says social distancing will be the norm for the next few months. Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator Dr. De Dr. Deborah Burke said that the current ways of testing will work through the spring and summer, but the U.S. needs a, quote, breakthrough on testing to reopen. 
Faced with a growing backlog, the IRS is bringing back thousands of employees. The initial wave includes 10,000 employees at locations 10 nationwide. Employees were told to bring their own face masks or face coverings. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is back on Downing Street. After being hospitalized in the ICU by the virus a few weeks ago, he will now be leading Britain's response to this. Johnson has yet to reveal a plan for lifting the lockdown. Boston is targeting some of the hardest hit areas. They are partnering with the Massachusetts General Hospital to test 1,000 residents for antibodies. They'll focus on areas in East Boston, Roslindale, and Dorchester. We are beginning a crucial week as more states start the process of easing restrictions. In California, the warm weather had people hitting the beach this weekend. People not quite social distancing there. Beaches and parks have seen and been some of the first spaces to reopen. But now more businesses are considering opening their doors. For more on this, we're joined by NBC's Sam Brock. Sam, good morning. Corey, at movie theaters and restaurants all over the state of Georgia, a question this morning to open or not open. It's something that many states are weighing right now as they try to figure out how to revive their stagnant economies. As more states across the country prepare to open their doors for business, the stark warning from a top White House coronavirus official. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another okay. as we move through these phases. Dr. Deborah Burks contradicting a suggestion from Vice President Pence that the coronavirus could be behind us by Memorial Day. Dr. Burks also says she's concerned about states coming back online without meeting federal guidelines of two weeks of declining cases. We're doing hand sanitizers for all of our guests. In Georgia, restaurants and movie theaters have the right to reopen, like Jay Christopher, with at least five locations offering dine-in services. We've got sanitizers for the table, different buckets that we use for top tabletops as well as chairs. And then we also have tables x off, which means you can't sit there, and we're seating every other table in the restaurant. But most owners we spoke with are not, like Anthony DiNardo of Atlanta's famed Henri's, who's keeping seating areas empty. I think people are going to wait and kind of take a wait and see approach um, and see how things progress over the next week or two. And I think everyone will make uh, a decision that's, based, that's best for their own business. Instead, he's donating lunches to first responders and sticking to takeout. As for movie theaters. We have 1% of Georgians tested, if that. Uh, we're nowhere in a state where anyone feels safe going into an indoor space and being around a bunch of other people. The Plaza Theater in Atlanta hasn't been closed for more than a few days since before World War II. I have 10 employees who are relying on me and this theater for their livelihood, but I'm not going to try and make them choose between their livelihood and their lives. Across the U.S., 18 states are opening shop doors or watching a stay-at-home order expire. In Tennessee, restaurants have the green light, though Nashville's busy city center remains bare. The NBA is allowing teams in some states to practice, and states like Colorado are getting more creative with curbside retail. But there continues to be some defiance. We're not hiding anymore. This Louisiana pastor defying house arrest for ignoring stay-at-home orders, preaching to his congregation anyway. Rules broken as others looking to reopen the right way. Back to theaters and the largest one in the entire country, AMC, with 600 plus locations, says it may not be opening again until June or July. As for this historic theater behind me in Atlanta, they don't have a timeline to reopen, but they are going to be doing private screenings for first responders with their families in groups of 10 or less starting this Friday. Corey, back to you. All right, Sam, thank you. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis. That's the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. And today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. It comes after a string of controversies for the president. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell has more. Often at the president's side, but Dr. Deborah Burks is in an uneasy position. I think I made it very clear and how I interpreted that. Distancing herself from the president's public brainstorming. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And Opining heat. about would-be remedies fewer. involving UV light and Fuel disinfectant chemicals remedies, that are harmful if ingested. Really Two governors said their state's poison control hotlines lit up after the president's comments. By injection inside or, or 
almost a cleaning. I also made it very clear, and so has Dr. Fauci and everyone associated with the task force and their clarity around this is not a treatment. But Burke says move on from that controversy to focus on COVID-19's puzzling unknowns, like strokes in some younger victims. We should be having that dialogue about this unique clotting that we're seeing. From health to hardship, the Paycheck Protection Program, round two. Tomorrow morning will be open for business. Taking new applications with an additional $322 billion to help small businesses retain their workers. The original fund was quickly drained by high demand, leaving many mom and pop style owners empty handed. We've been applying for the PPP loan, um, have been told we're in a queue. In Phoenix, Cindy Dash hopes for a second chance to save her Changing Hands bookstore that had employed 60 workers. We had to start laying off a third of our employees, and these are colleagues and friends and family, and that has just been devastating. The money going out in these two phases is expected to keep paychecks flowing for an estimated 60 million Americans. The Treasury Secretary expects this next batch to go quickly as well, but he said getting the money out in communities to keep people on payroll is exactly the point. Philip? All right, Kelly, thank you. While cases of coronavirus continue to grow in the United States, some states are looking past the pandemic and restarting their shuttered economies. Happening later today, the governor of Texas is expected to release more details on a plan to reopen the Lone Star State's businesses following COVID-19 restrictions. Here's NBC's Priscilla Thompson. Well, Philip and Corey, the governor here in Texas has been teasing that upcoming announcement for the past week. He's mentioned the possibility of massive reopenings of businesses here. Everything from restaurants and movie theaters to retailers and nail salons, even churches. But the thing to remember is that Texas is a very large state. There are more than 250 counties here. And while some have seen outbreaks, there are others that don't have any cases at all. And so he has said that he's going to be very focused on a county by county basis in terms of looking at solutions for how to begin to reopen this economy. Now, I also spoke to a number of business owners who tell me that they are very excited about the prospect of reopening, but are also going to be looking for that timing on Monday. And that's another thing that we're going to be watching very closely. Not so much what his announcement is going to be in terms of if that stay at home order will lift and if those businesses will reopen, but the how. What is the timeline going to be and what are the safety measures that are going to be put in place to ensure that another, if another outbreak happens, the city and the state is prepared to handle it? Yeah, that'll take about two weeks. Priscilla, thank you. The speculation, rumors, and confusion continue to grow about the health and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after he reportedly hasn't been seen in public for almost two weeks. U.S. officials say he may be ill after undergoing surgery. South Korea says Kim is alive and well, while North Korea state media has been completely silent. To help us sort all this out is uh, NBC's Cal Perry joining us now live from London. Hi, Cal. Good morning. Hey, Philip, good morning to you. So what happened, really, the thing that set this all off was on April the 15th, the North Korean leader missed what is a national holiday. It is the commemoration of his grandfather's birthday. He founded the country. It was the 108th commemoration. He hasn't missed it since 2011 when he took over. That's what started this speculation, both in South Korea and in the United States, when we heard from some intelligence officials. Now, Pouring cold water on all of this is recent satellite images of the leader's train, with at least what is believed to be his train, an 820-foot train in the eastern city of Wosan. That is an elite area where we know that he goes on vacation. So those satellite images leading many people to believe that the rumors were not true. They were cardiovascular rumors. There was a rumor that he had undergone surgery. But as you said, the South Koreans, specifically this morning, again saying that they don't believe that there's anything wrong with them, that North Korea has not changed their posture. North Korean state television as well, continuing on with their normal programming, something that you would not expect if the dear leader, as they put it, um, had fallen ill or had died. All of this goes to show that we still know very, very little about what happens inside North Korea. The WHO was hoping for some coronavirus information out of that country. It is just an information blackout, guys. Philip. Corey? Yeah, almost impossible to get any accurate information on there that we can rely on here. All right, Cal Perry, joining us from London. Thank you, Cal. All right, let's turn to your Monday forecast. Let's get a first check of that forecast with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb. Janessa, good morning.
Hey, good morning, you two. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Hopefully you are staying dry this morning because we continue to be in this wet pattern across two thirds of the nation. And it's really a spring pattern that continues to set up. We'll be dry for one day and then another storm system starts to make its way in. So you can start to see the snow that is already falling across northern New England with winter weather advisories currently in place for interior New York all the way into the Pittsburgh area where we could see possibly possibility of at least an inch of snow with that wet pattern going to continue to stay in place for at least the next 24 hours. Let's look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So still warm air across Grand Rapids. That's that warm front lifting. We're still in the lower 60s and the heat really continues to build. We're seeing excessive heat alerts across portions of the Southwest. Completely different weather pattern happening across the southwest with temperatures near 100 degrees this week, guys. Hard to imagine in this corner of the country. Yeah. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Uh, kids in New York are helping to lift the spirits of first responders. Handwritten letters and drawings, they were all delivered to the Levittown Volunteer Fire Department. Children of all ages joined the letters to our Heroes campaign to say thank you. The first responder said that these words of encouragement go a long way during this difficult time. The youngest letter they've received from a two-year-old. So sweet. Talented kids. A special moment from St. Louis, a hospital staff gathering outside to cheer on a police officer who was discharged after a month-long battle with coronavirus. He left the hospital and walked straight into the arms of his wife there. First priority right there. Well, millions of students are missing out on rites of passages because of the pandemic. While families across the country have found their own special ways to make their memory special for their kids, it's hard not to think about what should have been. Sarah Dolliff looks at how students are coping. Amelia Leahy's senior year has been cut short, her prom dress going unworn. The dance is off, so is the rest of lacrosse season. I was about 50 saves away from breaking a 20-year-old probably record. She understands why, but is disappointed. Because it's been such a big, impactful part of my life and such a good part of my life that I don't want to see it as over. It's not just seniors. Coronavirus is canceling rites of passage for students of all ages, like saying goodbye to friends and teachers, moving to new grades or schools, parents facing tough questions about what's to come. Not being able to give answers is very difficult. It's, it's very hard. The first thing is to answer honestly. Dr. Melissa Gilliam, an adolescent behavior expert at the University of Chicago, says parents shouldn't be afraid to say, I don't know, or use storytelling to get at the emotions driving questions. You can say, you know, this virus, this pandemic, it reminds me of another story of what it feels like to be really scared, and this is how I managed it. Playing games or puzzles gives teens and kids the chance to open dialogues. While we play something or do something, we're focused, we're together. And it's often in those moments that these questions arise that may not otherwise have a space to happen. Families can recognize or recreate missed milestones. Kayla Grace McSwain's family brought prom to their front yard. I'm so excited that my parents did this for me. Making those memories in unexpected ways. Sarah Dolliff, NBC News. Anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. Okay. A couple of things. I don't know if I would describe the test as beautiful. Unless your idea of beauty is having a cotton swab tickle your brain. Also, when he said everyone can get a test, what he meant was almost no one. But until then... Weeks after Dr. Anthony Fauci jokingly said that Brad Pitt should play him on Saturday Night Live, the show delivered. The actor hosted the second stay-at-home edition of SNL and kicked off the show's cold open as Dr. Fauci. This was the impersonation we never knew we needed. You know, Dr. Fauci deserves to have someone like Brad Pitt. Yes. <laughs> His interpretation of him, I love it. So good. <laughs> and the little bit at the end there that you saw, watch it all the way through. It was a really, yeah. really good little ending. All right, the NFL's first ever virtual draft brought the stars of tomorrow to the league, but it also brought donations to COVID relief efforts. The league announced its draft-a-thon raised more than $100 million over three days. That'll go to various charities like American Red Cross, Meals on Wheels, and the CDC Foundation. 
99-year-old Captain Tom Moore has broken two Guinness World Records. He achieved the record for the most money raised by an individual charity walk, raising over $34 million. The World War II veteran also became the oldest person to reach number one on the UK music charts with his hit single, You'll Never Walk Alone. His achievements have earned him the front cover of Guinness World Records 2021. He says that he's honored to receive the recognition and thankful to those who have donated. We cannot get enough of him. He's so great. Thursday Day is his April 100th birthday. What? There you go. Hi everyone, I want to keep you updated on our regional growth rate of COVID-19 and please do not be alarmed by this graph. You're seeing a major spike on Saturday. The good news about this, we had about 47,000 people get tested in New York City compared to 25,000. So we saw that increase in the cases of Saturday, but we've been pretty consistent for the last five days, guys. Sure have. All right, Janessa, thank you. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen how the power of music can connect us all. And this weekend, two big stars led their own sing-alongs. NBC's Kate Snow has the story. In San Francisco, a crowd, or what passes for one in the time of coronavirus, gathered at a statue of the legendary Tony Bennett. I love you, San Francisco. Let's sing our song. He had called them there to pay tribute to the city's healthcare workers, tirelessly fighting the pandemic. Seems somehow sadly gay. San Franciscans came out or stayed in to join the song. Terribly alone. And for you could hear the love letter to the city at Grace Cathedral, inside fire stations, and outside once bustling cafes. Working musicians deprived of a stage joined in and the voices of the San Francisco Opera brought it all together. Ringo Starr of the Beatles wanted people to come together too. For those of you missing singing together, I've got good news. So we say love to the sun. As the animated film Yellow Submarine played on YouTube Saturday, 70,000 people tuned in to sing along to Beatles hits. Young girls getting into character. Ringo sharing this Buddhist monk's rendition of the chorus. And in a time of crisis, there's really only one thing we all need. Just the best. Celebrate it. Music helps us celebrate, heal, remember, forget mm -hmm. all the feelings. The next one I want from Tony Bennett, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come? I don't think I've heard that yet. So here we go. Good one. I got that on deck. All right. Animal Control in South Carolina. They had their hands full. They had an aggressive alligator. Check it out here. The snappy gator was biting at the fire pit in a family's home as a crew tried to ease it away. Animal Control, they had to hose the big guy down with four security guards guiding that gator back home to his lagoon. You can Ooh. see the gator choosing the stop drop and roll method to get home there. As quickly as possible. All right, stay safe on this Monday. Thanks for watching. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. Coming up on the Today Show, Magic Johnson is live to talk about ESPN's latest hit Michael Jordan documentary, The Last Dance. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. White terrorism and white supremacist terrorism in this country is not some weird analog to Al Qaeda or ISIS. It's not some foreign thing that looks like something that we've been fighting in the war on terror. It's actually fundamentally as American as anything. And it is an existential threat to the multiracial, pluralistic, equal, an open democracy that we've been fighting for in this country since people died on the battlefield in the Civil War. Hey everybody, Steve Kornacki back here at the big board. It's more than numbers. These are the states that are gonna winnow the field. They're probably gonna create a front runner. It's what those numbers mean. Ideologically, 
you're seeing in this first wave a very similar electorate to what you saw in 2016. But age-wise, this is the big variable. This is why we don't allow Steve Kornacki to leave the building this time of year. Nobody breaks it down like Kornacki. Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Something new from Meet the Press, the Chuck Todd cast. An insider's take on politics and more with some of my favorite reporters. Get it for free wherever you get your podcasts. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings. And we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, they grow excessively tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now. Manchester, Washington. Why should your judgment be valued? I'd stake my judgment against anyone out there. Is party unity your concern right now, or is simply winning as many states as you well, can? Well, it's both. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Oh, we have our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful, shining faces. How sweet is that? A major week ahead kicks off today with restaurants in Georgia opening up, a plan for New York to get moving again, and the strategy to increase testing on a massive scale. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one okay. another as we move through these phases. The White House Coronavirus Task Force Coordinator predicting some form of social distancing will be needed all summer. As the Vice President is pushing for a Memorial Day opening up, but are things moving too quickly right now? We'll introduce you to some medical students who were rushed through graduation and fast-tracked right into hospital hot zones. What's really behind the medical mystery surrounding the condition and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un? And our Dr. John Torres and the new high-tech house calls being treated without ever leaving home. Early Today starts right now. Good morning, I'm Philip Mena. And I'm Corey Coffin. It's Monday, April 27th, and the beginning of the first week back to work for some Americans. As more states ease coronavirus restrictions, the U.S. will likely pass the 1 million mark for confirmed cases early this week. We are currently at more than 970,000 confirmed cases as of this morning, and nearly 55,000 souls have been lost due to COVID-19 in this country. New York, where the virus has taken a devastating toll, could be begin a gradual reopening next month. Governor Andrew Cuomo says some low-risk construction projects and manufacturing jobs could resume May 15th. The plan will only move forward if the number of hospitalizations keeps declining. The last patient on board, the USNS Comfort, has been discharged. The Navy hospital ship was sent to New York to help relieve stress on the medical system. It's expected to return to its home port in Virginia by the end of the month. The spike in cases may be easing in some hot spots, but social distancing will likely be the new normal for at least a few months. White House Coronavirus Coordinator Dr. Deborah Birch says the U.S. needs a breakthrough on testing before rules can be relaxed. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has a hopeful prediction for the summer. He believes that as more businesses reopen in May and June, the economy will rebound in July, August and September. Many governors agree that the key to getting people back to work is widespread testing. We're seeing many states ramp up their efforts to get testing centers to some of the hardest hit and most underserved areas. And for more on this, we are joined now by NBC's Kathy Park. Kathy, good morning. 
Philip, good morning. The good news is that the virus appears to be slowing down in some hot spots, but we also track some troubling trends this weekend in places like Maryland. Meantime, here in New York, testing is at the forefront and pharmacies will now be playing a bigger role. The outbreak isn't slowing fast enough in Maryland, which marked its deadliest day Saturday, bringing the death toll near 800. We have dramatically uh, flattened and lengthened that curve and lowered the numbers, uh, but unfortunately that, may, that means we we're also a little bit behind and now those numbers are coming up. Massachusetts remains in its surge, with cases topping more than 54,000. Death notices stretching 21 pages in the Boston Globe reflect the growing number of victims in the battle against COVID-19. And out west, a troubling trend. NBC's Steve Patterson is in Los Angeles. COVID-19 is now the leading cause of death in L.A. County, and communities of color are disproportionately affected. There's a toxic mix of underlying health conditions, a higher percentage of essential workers, and lower availability to testing. Testing deserts are something the state health department director says she wants to fix immediately by opening up dozens more sites. In hard-hit New York, the governor issued an executive order expanding the reach of COVID-19 testing, giving all frontline workers priority access, setting a goal of 40 thousand daily tests and unlocking 5,000 pharmacies as testing locations. We're going to authorize all the independent pharmacists in the state to be collection sites for testing. Some of them have already been doing it, some of the larger national chains, but if uh, your local drugstore can now become a collection site, People could go to their local drugstore. In the Bronx, where infections per capita top all other boroughs, this neighborhood pharmacy is waiting for the state health department to roll out the rules about getting tests and administering them to New Yorkers. Say myself, I want to come to your pharmacy and get tested for COVID right now. Can I do that? No. We're waiting for that guidance and we hope it's forthcoming. Public health experts say New York is proving to be a strong leader by laying out an aggressive strategy, but it's not enough. We're going to have to make diagnostics for COVID-19 as available as, say, a pregnancy test or a drug kit at, say, a pharmacy. Dr. Anthony Fauci reinforcing the need for ramped up testing as states make plans to reopen. Right now, you know, we're doing about 1.52 million per week. We probably should get up to twice that as we get into the next several weeks, and I think we will. Right now, some of the major chains like CVS and Walgreens have testing available for those who qualify in places like Connecticut, Michigan, and Oregon. Here in New York, the governor's office says that they're still finalizing some of the guidelines for these independent pharmacies, and those guidelines should be issued soon. Philip? All right, Kathy, thank you. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis, spurring the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. And despite warnings from health experts, some states are barreling ahead with plans to reopen. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joins us with the latest. Now, Tracy, several states are loosening the restrictions today. Hi, Corey. Good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, several states like Tennessee reopening restaurants. Uh, we saw several last week. About a third of the states uh, are reopening or easing restrictions in some way starting this week. Some say they are not ready yet. And the federal government is urging caution, saying that any reopening needs to happen gradually. Each state is different, and the reason we made the guidelines and gating criteria very specific was also, and I'm sure a lot of people have missed the asterisk, and it's said to look not only statewide, but also county by county. The policies are working. We're now looking at a relatively short period of time, 14 days of decline. If you don't have 14 days of decline, nobody would say, uh, be reckless and open anyway. Now, there is growing pressure on these states. We're seeing protests. We saw them over the weekend in Nevada from people who want to go back to work and also pushback from some governors like Michigan's governor on the suggestion from Senator Mitch McConnell that states having financial problems should declare bankruptcy instead of waiting for a federal bailout. Corey? Thank you. 
From the classroom straight to the front lines, some courageous med students who graduated early have fast-tracked their way into hospitals to help aid in the fight against coronavirus. Here's NBC's Ann Thompson. Good morning. It's about 6.30 and I've just gotten to the hospital. They are the latest recruits in the coronavirus battle. Placing my mask. I'm ready to go. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's worth it. New doctors, 30-year-old Bronx native Kathleen Lozada and 25-year-old Olamide Omideli from Houston. You look at this chest x-ray. Two of the fourth-year students who graduated early from medical schools to serve. You know, once we took our oath before, you know, joining our class and being a medical doctor, I think we agreed to step up whenever the hospital, you know, had a need. I couldn't have imagined where I would be now. It was like a surreal feeling, honestly. Graduation. Sinai, early graduation will start in 90 seconds. Was virtual. <laughs> but the crisis at New York's Mount Sinai Hospital is all too real. Four days on the job, how many of your patients have died? So I think we've had maybe three or four patients pass away in the last four days. How are you dealing with those deaths? It's really hard. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really dealing with them yet. You know, uh, it's, it's challenging. There's really not enough time in the day to really, really think about and reflect about the deaths, which is tough for sure savoring the little victories. I was able to get my patient an iPhone charger, so we are charging her phone now. Hopefully she'll be able to FaceTime with her family in the next couple of hours, um, which will be really nice for them. At New York Presbyterian, Peter Novak is researching patient data associated with coronavirus deaths from home. The purpose of the work I'm doing is still the same, and that's to help patients uh, in whatever way I can. Satisfaction hard won. Today was actually a good day on our unit. Um, we didn't have any patients pass away today, and we were able to discharge two of them, so I'd consider that a really good day. Baptized by fire, ready to help save more lives. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. All right, let's get a check of your Monday forecast. NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb has a look at your day ahead. Hey, good morning, you two. So brave of those new doctors. Uh, just so happy that they're getting out and helping people. Let's take a look at what's happening weather-wise. You're not smiling about this weather if you're across the Northeast. We're in a spring pattern. You'll see dry day, then rain and storms. They will continue to pop up for the rest of the week. But this morning, we are talking about winter weather advisories that are sparking across interior New York, also northern New England, where they could see up to at least one to three inches. Also watching the severe weather threat that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow afternoon across the southern plains. But look at this widespread of rain up to one to two inches across the Ohio Valley into the northeast. That's a look at the big weather story of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So still warm air across Indianapolis, 64 degrees drying out for Ohio to the Columbus area this afternoon. If you need the heat to get to the southwest, El Paso today, 94 degrees. Looking for vacation weather, need to get to the southwest, excessive heat advisories in place in that area, guys. All right. We can just get this uh, coronavirus restrictions to lift and we can be on our way. To travel. <laughs> All right. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Uh, in today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for a uh, gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down over a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have volunteered to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor saying they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and the Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers kick off Tuesday at noon. Distance is no mark for patriotism. Well, a moment of unity from New York, a four-year-old boy bringing his family and his friends together, even strangers together every day to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. 
I mean, while there is a cloud of speculation that just continues to grow around the status and health of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, rumors have been swirling over the last week or so about the 36-year-old after he reportedly disappeared from public view after undergoing surgery. North Korea has been silent. South Korea says Kim is well, and U.S. officials say that he may be ill. Uh, to help us sort it all out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry. Cal, good morning. Hey, Philip, good morning. So you can add China to the list of countries that are silent on what has happened to Kim Jong-un. Now, all of this started on April the 15th uh, when the dear leader, as he's called in North Korea, missed the most important yearly celebration, that the birthday of his grandfather who founded the country. This would have been his 108th birthday. Now, there has been some satellite imagery released of what we believe to be the train of Kim Jong-un, an 820-foot luxury train in the east of the country. This is in the town of Wosan. This is where uh, the, the Kim Jong-un goes on his sort of vacation. There was some letters put around uh, in the area that were believed to have been written by him, which is sort of adding to the idea that maybe he's fine. Now, South Korean TV this morning has said that they believe he's probably fine, that this was a rumor. But it just goes to show you, Philip, even in the year 2020, how little we know about North Korea and what's happening inside North Korea. For example, the WHO has been looking for any information that they can get on the coronavirus, no information coming out of North Korea and no information as of right now on the leader of North Korea, though it does appear as though those rumors are starting to subside. Philip. You inside that little box there, <laughs> but we heard you loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Cal Perry, thank you so much for the update. Stuck with my fam, I can't get out. Selfies, so don't even ask. Staying in the house in an underwear mask. Only bet my dog with a baseball mitt. Making my own brand, and it tastes like stuck with my fam. Saturday Night Live did it again. They brought fans some smiles from self-quarantine. This time, comedians Adam Sandler and Pete Davidson teamed up for that really funny duet there they put together <laughs> uh, with the help of their families, of course, and they ended it all with a special thank you to first responders. All right, let's stay on this train here. Dave Chappelle helping raise over $100,000 for struggling comics during the coronavirus pandemic. The comedian, along with Bill Burr, Whitney Cummings, and many others teamed up with the famous Los Angeles comedy venue, The Comedy store for a live three-part podcast benefit. Chappelle reunited with some of his former Chappelle show co-stars during his segment. The money raised helps benefit to support those comics tied to the venue as well as staff with the venue. So that's great. Those are uh, some of my favorite comics we just saw on the board there. there All in one space. Bill Burr, Dave Chappelle, my favorite, Neil Brennan, uh, who's underrated, helped create the mm -hmm. Chappelle show. Uh, I can't wait to find that podcast. I actually had trying to send somebody a link uh, to me so that I can see it. Two things now on your list. Saturday Night Live, if you haven't seen it yet, and now that Chappelle special. I've, I've checked that one out, so now I just need that podcast. All right, there is a family in Arkansas who did not let this pandemic stop them from adopting their son. It was done completely online. A two-year-old Jaden found his first Forever home with the Wenicke family. They'd been already fostering Jaden for a year now. They decided to officially adopt him as their own. Even though their court hearing couldn't be held in person, they finalized his adoption over what else these days? A Zoom video call. I love how more and more people are just not letting the social distancing and, and having to stay at home stop them from being able to live their best lives. We got to keep doing something. Keep it going. Uh, this next one, talk show host Andy Cohen is speaking out after he says he was told he could not give plasma because of his sexuality. Cohen, who recently recovered from COVID-19, said in a video posted to social media that he wanted to donate his plasma for antibody trials, which would be used for people who have the virus. Well, he went on to say that he was first told by the program that he sounded like a perfect candidate. But the 51-year-old says he was then told he could not give the plasma after revealing that he's gay. FDA restrictions currently only allow gay men to give blood after abstaining from sex for three months. Hi everyone, we continue to watch our regional growth rate and you can see a big time spike happen on Saturday. Please do not be alarmed. We're seeing an increase in cases that were being reported on Saturday for New York City. Also, about 47,000 more people got tested compared to the last few weeks where we've only seen about 25,000. So that is great news and we continue to be very consistent in our region. Guys. More testing, more testing. All right, Janessa, thank you. 
Coronavirus is helping to usher in the future of medicine with so many routine medical and dental visits off limits now. Doctors are finding new ways to treat their patients. Dr. John Torres has more. With hospitals across the country, now the front lines in the battle against COVID-19, fear of catching coronavirus is keeping other patients away. And now, more than ever, they're turning to healthcare consultations of a different type. It's Dr. McGee. How are you doing? It's called telemedicine, virtual visits on computers, even smartphones. It's not new, but the advancement and availability of technology has pushed it into overdrive. We've done over 5,000 visits over the past uh, over the past month. That's up from just 20 a month before COVID hit. An astonishing increase for Dr. Michael Main and his colleagues at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to do is to innovate their priority, protecting both their staff and vulnerable patients like 89-year-old stroke survivor Carl Hines. Having any problems with uh, chest pain? No. And at a time when medical resources are stretched thin and so many of us are staying home, these routine virtual visits are a lifeline for heart patient Gail Collette. Have you had any episodes of those palpitations? Uh, well, actually, I did. Checking in about medications, symptoms, and solutions. I thought it was very beneficial and very reassuring. Reassuring for doctors, too, like New York City primary care physician Arthi Reddy. Get up. Staying connected with her patients from a desk in her boy's bedroom. She says figuring out which in-person visits can and cannot wait during the COVID crisis depends on each patient. Right now we are holding off on any screening, um, colonoscopies, mammograms, even yearly blood work. Um, if, unless the patient's presenting with something concerning, we're not doing those. But what can't wait? Visit your doctor or the ER if you have shortness of breath or signs of a heart attack or stroke, a broken bone or large cut that won't stop bleeding, and problems with a pregnancy. And even though most dentist offices are closed for routine procedures, there are exceptions. Anything with pain or anything that uh, decreases the quality of life you know, for the patient. And so obviously infections, uh, abscesses, severe decay, uh, any broken teeth. Handled with care? in taking extreme precautions. We're not just protecting the patients and the community, we're also protecting ourselves. There you are. Thanks to Dr. Torres for that report. You know, as, uh, as unprepared as we were for this, mm -hmm. I'm just grateful that we live in a time where we're able to do something like this and this technology is adapt. available. It yeah. is interesting. Thanks for starting your week with Early Today. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Menick. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Good afternoon from the spin It's room. news made for your streaming world. NBC News Now. We get to have our very own Today Family Getaway. It's so exciting to be here. We are serving up a Today Cafe special. Universal Orlando Resort is the place. We have just loved seeing your beautiful shining faces. How sweet is that? Need your true crime fix on the go? Dateline episodes are available as podcasts. Mysteries with a twist from the true crime original. Wow. Listen to Dateline wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. This is all I've got left. Who brought more to the caucuses? It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, 3 to 11 p.m. Eastern. We've got this fundamental thing about human beings, and then we've got the way that we constitute our politics. And the danger is that if our politics grow too tribal, then we'll lose this sort of way of talking. Why is this happening with Chris Hayes? Subscribe now.
Today, more states will begin loosening restrictions on businesses, parks, and other locations as demand for more testing grows. To air travel, where flight attendants are calling for a temporary ban on vacation travel, saying their lives are at risk in the age of coronavirus. And then we will take you back to the future for a group of families who are getting creative to recreate some favorite family photos. It's Monday. Early today starts right now. With that, we say good morning to you. I'm Corey Coffin. And I'm Philip Mena. With summer just a few weeks away, can Americans keep up social distancing? That as state and federal leaders continue to debate when and how to reopen their states. Here's what you need to know to start the week. Top health officials are saying that the number of new cases has reached a plateau. There are now more than 972,000 Americans infected and close to 55,000 people have died. The stay-at-home order was no match for the sweltering heat in Southern California. Thousands of people packed the beaches in Ventura and Orange Counties. Further north in L.A., beaches are still closed. Officials there opened cooling centers to help beat the heat. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is offering some optimism. Mnuchin says that the trillion dollars in government spending will pay off and help spur growth. As states continue to reopen, he expects the economy to bounce back from July to September. A community comes together to honor a fallen soldier. 34-year-old Marine Gunnery Sergeant Diego Pongo was killed in Iraq. Coronavirus restrictions stopped his family from holding a funeral, so residents of Simi Valley held a drive-by parade instead. California Governor Gavin Newsom is helping the nearly 6 million seniors in the Golden State by launching a program that delivers three warm meals to at-risk seniors every day of the week. Participating restaurants will get reimbursed. About one-third of all states have already begun easing restrictions or are planning to. But the White House says social distancing will be the norm for the next few months. Here's Dan Sheneman. In Georgia, there are open for business signs in many windows, including nail salons and barber shops. I mean, we clean up after every chair, every customer gets out of the chair. We wear gloves. Nearly 20 states are allowing shops to open their doors or allowing stay-at-home orders to expire. In states where restrictions are still in place, protesters continue to plead with authorities. I believe the quarantine should have applied to the sick, the elderly, those at risk, those that take care of them. And it would have left a lot more money and supplies to take care of those people instead of all of us, you know, scrambling just to keep a roof over our heads. Vice President Mike Pence suggested social distancing could be over by Memorial Day. But a top White House official disagrees. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another as we move through these phases. Dr. Deborah Burke says she is concerned about states opening before meeting federal guidelines of two weeks of declining cases. She also hopes there will soon be a better way to test Americans. We have to have a breakthrough innovation in testing. We have to be able to detect antigen rather than constantly trying to detect the actual live virus. But Dr. Birx warns such a breakthrough may not happen for months. Dan Sheneman, NBC News. One in six American workers have lost their jobs since the start of this crisis, spurring the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Today, President Trump and the nation's governors will talk about the economic revival. And despite warnings from health experts, some states are barreling ahead with plans to reopen. Our Capitol Hill correspondent Tracy Potts joining us now with the very latest. And Tracy, several states are loosening restrictions today. Yeah, members of the White House Coronavirus Task Force are concerned uh, that some of these states may be moving too fast. About a third of our states, as you noted, will be easing restrictions at some point this week. And the federal government is urging them to heed the guidelines, wait until these cases drop 14 days in a row and not to reopen too soon. Each state is different, and the reason we made the guidelines and gating criteria very specific was also, and I'm sure a lot of people have missed the asterisk, and it's said to look not only statewide, but also county by county. The policies are working. We're now looking at a relatively short period of time, 14 days of decline. If you don't have 14 days of decline, nobody would say, uh, be reckless and open anyway. Now, some of these states trying to hold on financially uh, with business pretty much at a standstill and pushing back, though, on Senator Mitch McConnell's suggestion that states declare bankruptcy instead of waiting for a federal bailout. Back to you. That's a big decision for those companies to make. All right, Tracy, thank you so much.
Airline employees are sounding the alarm. They say their lives are at risk and they're now calling for a temporary ban on vacation travel. Here's Erin McLaughlin. Flying in the time of COVID-19, empty planes, falling prices, and an industry in crisis. The flight attendants it depends on, vulnerable and feeling forgotten. We are risking our lives too every time we come to work. This week, United Airlines joined JetBlue as the first major U.S. carriers to require flight attendants wear masks. Still, no such requirement for passengers and other employees. I do hope that it gets to the point where if you are not willing to wear a mask, you can't travel. Same as if you didn't bring your driver's license. Earlier this month, on my way to Seattle for an assignment. I boarded the flight, and as expected, the situation's pretty empty. But on the return, a stark contrast. More passengers, many without masks, and no guidance on how to safely social distance. Across the country, similar stories. The Association of Flight Attendants is now pushing for all leisure travel to end until the virus is contained. They're also demanding legislation mandating masks for crew, employees and passengers. Just asking flight attendants to wear a mask is not enough. Uh, but the bottom line is it reduces your risk of getting infected on the airplane if everybody is wearing a mask. United Airlines released a statement recognizing for flight attendants social distancing's challenging, saying they've added masks on flights to ensure attendants have one mask each per duty day. Delta's CEO says masks are encouraged. Our frontline staff are encouraged to wear them. We do have masks for customers that they don't bring them. American Airlines with no mask requirement for passengers or crew. Their website notes the CDC does not require passengers to wear masks. We know we're playing a vital role in the infrastructure. This weekend, the U.S. Treasury Department released billions more in aid to U.S. carriers. Airlines considered critical, but the workers feeling unprotected. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. The speculation, rumors and confusion continue to grow out about the health and whereabouts of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un after he reportedly hasn't been seen in public for almost two weeks. U.S. officials say he may be ill after undergoing surgery. South Korea says Kim is alive and well, while North Korea state media, well, they've been completely silent. To help us sort all of this out, we turn now to NBC's Cal Perry joining us live in London. Cal, good morning. Hey, good morning to you, Philip. So the rumors were that he had some kind of cardiovascular issue, maybe a surgery. That all started on April the 15th when Kim missed what would have been his grandfather's 108th birthday. That is a national holiday. He is the man who founded North Korea. So that is what started all of this speculation. Now, adding to the rumors is this satellite footage, satellite images showing the train of Kim Jong-un in the eastern part of the country in the town of Wosan. That is where he goes on vacation. It is an elite part of the country. There were some rumors that he had actually penned a few letters to the United Nations thanking them for doing some construction in that area. All of this really serves a point to show that we still don't have a good grasp of what is going on inside North Korea. When you look at the coronavirus and how that is spread across Asia, the WHO begging the North Koreans for information, not getting any. It gives you a sign of how that country really still remains a mystery. Adding to the mystery this morning, the Chinese saying they believe that Kim is well, that he is doing fine, that he is in that eastern part of the country, probably taking some time off, guys. Philip, Corey. A lot of secrecy out there. All right, Cal Perry from London. Thank you, Cal. Let's turn it to a check of the weather with NBC meteorologist Janessa Webb on your Monday. Janessa, good morning. Happy Monday, you too. Good morning, everyone. We continue to see a storm system that's barreling actually across the northeast. You see my banner. It says winter radar, and that should not be the case. But we do have winter weather that's running through northern New England, also interior New York. We are seeing winter weather advisories, unfortunately, for these sections of the country. And that'll last until your early morning hours before more rain starts to push in that area. Also watching our next big severe weather weather risk that's going to be enhanced for tomorrow for the Southern Plains. So pretty quiet start to the week, but that severe weather will ramp up by tomorrow afternoon into your evening. This will be kind of a wet week with accumulation from Ohio Valley to the Northeast up to one to two inches. That's a look at the big weather start of the day. Here's a closer look at your day ahead. So warm air is still for Grand Rapids to Chicago. We're seeing that warm front push up towards the north. 62 degrees today, but if you need the heat, man, going to be sweating in Phoenix today. Triple-digit territory. 
for late April. Phoenix, 103 degrees, so record's going to be shattered this week across the southwest. All right, Janessa, thank you so much. Ooh. All right, mm -hmm. I want you to check out how this town came together to celebrate a very special birthday. We have such great neighbors, and uh, I get a tear up here, but I don't care. Uh, kids, an old man cries once in a while. Darn right. <laughs> that is a renowned trumpeter, Bobby Baird. He's performed for presidents and international crowds, so it was only fitting for his neighbors to salute him on his 90th birthday. He got a few notes, as well as a parade. The caravan of cars was so long, Baird says he lost count. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. It's beautiful. We've 99 year old Captain Tom Moore, he has broken two Guinness World Records and he achieved that record for the title for the most money raised by an individual charity walk by raising over $34 million. Yeah, the World War II veteran also became the oldest person to reach number one on the UK music charts with his hit single, You'll Never Walk Alone. Moore says he is honored to receive the recognition and is thankful to those who donated. So not only did he raise the most amount mm -hmm. of money, he then followed it up with a number one hit single. I mean, he's he's having an incredible time right now. I, yeah. I, there are the Royal Mail, which is the equivalent to the Postal mm -hmm. Service here. There on his birthday is coming up this Thursday. He'll be a hundred. They're going to have a special postmark just for him. That's perfect. He deserves yeah. it, right? Yeah, there we go. Collect. All right. As this virus spreads across the country, it is disproportionately killing minorities in poorer communities. Steve Patterson takes a closer look at why. As the coronavirus pandemic spreads to every corner of the U.S., these are especially dark days for communities of color. COVID-19 is an opportunistic killer, most dangerous to people with underlying conditions, like Ravi Terman, who beat uterine cancer 10 years ago. I actually didn't find out I was positive until after I came out of the coma. Ravi spent 10 days on a ventilator at University of Colorado Hospital, but survived. If you do get the diagnosis, you can beat it. It is beatable, despite the fact that you may be black or you may have pre-existing conditions. African-American and Hispanic communities have been hit hard by the virus because hotspots like New York, Chicago and New Orleans have outsized minority populations. It isn't genetic. That's nonsense to say it's genetic. Dr. Anthony Fauci joined a popular urban radio show to explain the particular danger to, to listeners. African-Americans have a higher degree of hypertension obesity, asthma, all of those kinds of things that are preconditions that if you do get infected, you wind up having a worse outcome. The threat is now spread from city centers to the most remote areas, like the Navajo Nation, which has seen more than 1,200 cases per capita that would be the third highest infection rate of any state. When one family member um, contracts or, or is exposed to the virus, they have the potential of exposing most, if not all, of their family to it because of their close family structure. Roughly 50 people have died here, and with the elderly at elevated risk, an entire culture is at stake. Some of our oral traditions are going to be lost because of COVID-19, because those are the keepers of the stories, the keepers of our histories and, and our cultural practices are held within these uh, older populations. A pandemic that knows no race or color or class, yet threatens all of them. Oh, thanks to Steve Patterson for that reporting. In today's quick hits, gas prices are going down. According to AAA, the national average for a gallon of gas is $1.78, which is down by more than a dollar from last year's average. Following their battle with COVID-19, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson have volunteered to donate their blood for vaccine research. The actor says they're giving blood to the places that are working on the Hanks scene. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels and Air Force Thunderbirds will soar above New York City in honor of frontline workers fighting the coronavirus. The flyovers will kick off Tuesday at noon. Right, we kick off another week on Wall Street where small businesses will get another crack at the new batch of government stimulus, plus a whole lot more. CNBC's Jeff Cutmore joining us now on that and some novel ideas on just what to do with the millions and millions of dollars worth of expired beer. Jeff, please explain. 
I don't think you want to drink it, Philip. Let me just talk you through the market story first, and then I'll tell you about the beer. So the market's slightly to open in positive territory. The early look at the U.S. futures indicate a good start to the session here with European markets higher at this point. And that would obviously follow on from what was a, a weaker close. Uh, we were 1 percent down on the Dow and the S&P last week, even though we saw Friday's close positive for both of those markets. Big issue for the week. 50% of S&P companies report first quarter earnings this week. So we'll be watching the earnings and we'll be watching very closely the Federal Reserve meeting Wednesday to see if there's any fresh stimulus announcement to tackle coronavirus. Talking of tackling coronavirus, Boston Beer, and let's get on to the beer story. They've had about $5.8 million worth of beer and kegs returned because restaurants and bars are closed. Now, instead of just pouring this down the drain, the company planning to recycle that by turning it into ethanol to use then in hand sanitizer, which would be a very useful thing to put into the market right now, given that clearly it is difficult to sell some of this beer in bars and restaurants. Just one point to finish on. While we're talking about beer, Nielsen out with some numbers about how we're all managing this crisis. Apparently beer sales for the week ending April 11th up 11.5%. So it seems some people are choosing to drink their way through these lockdowns. Back to you. A lot of people making that choice. I don't judge them for a minute. All right. <laughs> Just don't drink the expired beer. That's right. I didn't. I never let it sit in the fridge long enough for that to happen. So I wouldn't know. I don't know. Not a concern. <laughs> it's not. Jeff, thank you so much. I got two questions for you really quickly. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, sanitizer will be sudsy? Nick. It could be, but whatever. If it works, it's all good. I'd and say. do you think they'll hop right on it? Oh, look at her. Look at her. <laughs> all right. Hi everyone, let's give you your regional update. You're seeing a major spike on Saturday, but that's just because we had more testing across the Northeast, been consistent at about 4%. We'll be right back. You know, boredom and quarantine has a lot of families getting creative. Parents are reconnecting with their young adult children by reenacting their past. Well, said Diaz Pilart has more. So I'm happy to give you some good news to start your week. Um, it's important to think about this whole fight we're in the middle of and how many times we've had to emphasize that it's a long battle, there are no shortcuts to get where we need to get to really beat this disease back is a long, intense process that everyone has to participate in. So the good news I'm going to give you in a moment is about how we make that easier for all of us. Everyone's been doing a great job. I, every time I'm going to say thank you to all of you for everything you're doing to practice social distancing, to shelter in place, to help each other. It's been absolutely outstanding. But it's not easy, and it's taking a long time. Everyone wants more certainty. One of the most frustrating parts of this whole experience has been how many things aren't known, how many things aren't known about this disease. We constantly feel like we're fighting an invisible en enemy, but not only an invisible enemy, an invisible enemy that we just don't have enough information about. But the thing we all want to know the most is about what's happening to our own families, what's happening in our own lives. Have we been exposed to this virus or not? Are we still vulnerable? These are the questions that people want answered and want to know what it means for their own safety and everyone they love. And we know the question has always been from the very beginning, this goes back to when we first talked about COVID-19 back in January, the question has always been testing, testing, testing. How are we going to get the testing? How are we going to be able to get answers? Even with this difficult adversary, this mysterious adversary, how do we at least get less mystery about our own lives and get answers through testing? So testing is the way forward. And it's been a long fight just to get the testing we need, the ability to give the tests. But today we have good news. Today we are beginning to see an easier process for testing. And I'm going to talk about it by putting it in context of what I experienced Saturday in the Bronx at the Health and Hospitals Gotham 
Community Testing Center in Morrisania. I went up there to see how the testing was being done, to see how our extraordinary healthcare workers at the front line are giving people answers, helping them get clarity, figuring out with them what they're gonna do next based on the results of the test, making a lot more testing available in the places hit the hardest like the South Bronx. So we all know that a few weeks ago, we were just trying to save our hospitals, save lives. We couldn't put together the, the personnel and the PPEs and the test kits and all to do community testing, but now we were able to over this last week or more. And so as of this morning, there will be eight health and hospitals, community testing sites around the city, open for business. And since we started this initiative a couple of weeks ago, even less than a couple of weeks ago, uh, there have been now over 5,000 tests at the H&H &H sites, another more than 2,600 tests at the sites we've sponsored with local 1199 SEIU, the Healthcare Workers Union, and One Medical. That number is substantial, but now we're going to be taking it up. It'll be 10,000 tests per week or more at these community-based sites, and we want to keep ramping that up. But the challenge has been, and I saw this with my own eyes on Saturday, that the test process we've known up to now, the test kits that were used, which had a specific long swab and it required a trained medical professional to administer the test, not fun and easy, very long swab, had to go way up into someone's nose, had to be handled a certain way, kept in a certain uh, environment to be sent on to the lab. This was a more elaborate process and not only slower, more elaborate for the patient, but for the healthcare worker, a challenge in many ways. And our healthcare workers have gone through so much already. But realize, even in the testing process, how much they had to do. A healthcare worker, even to do one test, had to put on, if you will, their body armor. They had to put on the whole PPE ensemble, the face shield, the, the N95, or whatever type of mask was appropriate, the gloves, gown, a whole specific plan to keep them safe because the problem was with the test we've been using up to now, a lot of times it made the patient sneeze. And obviously it might be someone with COVID-19 and that was going to expose the healthcare worker. So it was a laborious, careful process. But of course, a process done with someone who might be infected with a disease that might therefore infect the healthcare worker. So we had to take real precautions and that was every single patient, every single person being tested, hour after hour, day after day. And it was a slow process and a process that came with real exposure for the healthcare workers who've been through so much. We have been working to confirm for weeks now that there was a better way to do this. And the good news I have today is there is a better way. There is a better way to do testing. There is an easier way to do testing, and there is a safer way to do testing, and we're gonna start that this week at our health and hospitals clinics right here in New York City. So we're calling it, just to make it simple, straightforward, self-swab tests. What does it mean? It means when you go to one of the community testing sites, instead of the healthcare worker having to be all prepared with all the PPEs and then take that very long swab and administer the test. No, this is a whole different thing. This means the healthcare worker explains to the person there for the test how to administer the test themselves. They go into another room for privacy and the patient takes something that's basically a sterile Q-tip, puts that in their nose. They don't have to go way deep, just enough to get a sample. They, forgive my bluntness, they spit into a cup. And that, those two samples provide enough information for the testing to be done. Much simpler, uh, much easier for everyone involved. No chance to cause the same kind of sneezing that that long swab way up the nose does. Uh, simpler, but also safer, especially for that healthcare worker so many of whom have been putting their lives on the line now for weeks and weeks. So when that's done, just like we've all experienced, many of us at least at doctor's offices, you hand a sample over to a doctor, a nurse, a healthcare worker, you do the same here, the clinic or the healthcare provider sends it 
off to the lab to get the results. Now, this is simpler, this is better. This is something we're gonna start using now aggressively because it'll improve the situation for everyone. We need partnership from the private labs that do the processing. We're engaged in these conversations with them already. We need them to step up. What our healthcare leadership here in New York City have told us is it's a very similar process to what they would do with the current samples. It doesn't take a lot of modification, but we need the private labs to agree immediately to do this on a wide scale. We have enough to get started, but we want to make sure we do this on a wide scale. So I'm asking the private labs step up, make the small alterations necessary to be able to take these simpler tests, and I think that will be a step forward for everyone. For healthcare workers, this will be a simpler, better reality. Also think about the PPEs that will now be saved in this process. They've been precious up to now, that personal protective equipment. We know it's been a fight week after week to make sure we had enough. This will mean we'll be able to conserve our supply a lot more and make sure we have it for everyone who needs it when they need it. So there's a lot of virtues here. It will also just take fewer healthcare workers to administer this kind of test because we'll get more done in the time we have. So just it helps on so many levels and allows more healthcare workers to be at the front line where they're still needed so deeply. Now, it's faster, as I said. Right now at an H&H &H site, because you have to process each individual and explain what's going to happen and administer the test and everything has to be done very methodically, they can do about 15 tests per hour for each healthcare worker taking the tests. But the, I'm sorry, 15, I shouldn't say per person, per site, 15 tests per hour. With this new approach, that will go up immediately to 20 tests per hour, and then we'll keep expanding from there. Again, we need help. The private labs, we need them to really get with this new approach quickly, help move it forward, because this will make everyone's lives easier and faster, and this will give more people answers, and it will simplify and clarify our steps forward as we move into that test and trace period in the month of May. But we also still need the federal government. I don't want anyone for a moment to think this means the federal government doesn't have responsibility. They still do. And the big question now, and again, testing has been the big Achilles heel of the federal government from the beginning, but here's a chance to get it right. Use all the tools of the federal government to expand lab capacity so we can help New Yorkers, and this is needed all over the country. We need the supplies that go to those labs to make them work, particularly what's called reagents, which are part of the process of doing the actual analysis of each sample. There is still a crisis of supply affecting the labs. We still don't see the federal government owning this problem to the extent they need to. It's been the same story from the beginning, not focusing on testing when we needed them to, and then even when everyone became clear that testing was the answer, we don't see the federal government using all its powers, all its tools to secure the supply chain to make sure the test kits originally and the lab capacity is there. That needs to be fixed immediately so we can take a big step forward in May. Now remember, the more tests you do, the faster you move towards low level transmission of this disease. It all starts to come together. Expand testing rapidly, more and more of the contact tracing, more and more getting people to isolation who need it. That's what May is going to look like, but this is actually going to help us speed that up markedly to be able to do a simpler kind of test. One day, and I think it is possible, we'll be able to test everyone we need to. Again, we cannot do it without federal help. But one day, if we do this right, we'll be able to reach everyone we need to on any given day. And you'll see an extraordinary correlation of how every step towards that day connects with pushing back this disease. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. I'm not saying it's always going to go in a perfect straight line. You've seen with our indicators, and we'll get to them in a minute, things go up, things go down. Sometimes we'll have setbacks. That's part of life. But so far, New Yorkers have done an extraordinary job pushing back this disease. 
and now the testing is starting to come into play, if we do it right, it may not be a perfect straight line, but it will be regular, consistent progress. The more testing, the more progress. This will help us achieve more testing. It's simple as that. So, of course, once you have the testing more and more widespread, you need that ability to trace the contacts of everyone who tests positive. And as we've talked about before, when we were tragically seeing the disease spread and spread and spread, we weren't able to do the contact tracing. We were trying to save lives, protect hospitals, deal with the most basic needs of people, but we couldn't build a whole contract, contact tracing network that we wanted for something of this size. Now, the good news is we can. And that's what we're going to build in the month of May. A contact tracing network in this city, like it's never been seen before on a vast scale. So every time someone tests positive, immediately we can swing into action, figure out who were their close contacts, get those people tested to isolate anyone who needs isolation. So I'm announcing today that we are hiring. We are looking for talented, experienced health workers. So anyone out there listening to me now, watching this or anyone who hears about this, if you have experience in the healthcare field, if you're ready to lend your talents this fight, we need you and we need you right away. We are hiring immediately and we'll be hiring throughout the month of May. City of New York plans to hire 1,000 contact tracers immediately. They will be working uh, with all the healthcare personnel we have already and people we will train from a variety of city agencies to complement this work as well. But right now we need 1,000 new contact tracers. Uh, we're getting great help from our fund for public health and I want to thank everyone at the fund for public health for the great work you do and all the people who support you and have donated to the fund for public health. You're going to see uh, that support come alive in a powerful way now as we fight back this disease here in the epicenter. But we want to get the word out to everyone uh, that we need to hire up right away as this work begins. What will they do? The contact tracers, literally, they'll do the interviews to determine uh, who were those key contacts. They'll follow up with those contacts. They'll arrange for each of them to be tested. Folks who need isolation, they'll make sure they're getting it. They'll help make sure that the steps that are needed are glued together. And they'll ask the questions that are needed and that training will be so important to understand if there's anyone who needs that follow-up. Talked about disease detectives before. This is a variation on that, but it's the same concept of knowing how to ask the right questions, knowing how to search for the clues of the people in someone's life who tested positive that need to be contacted, need to be followed up on, need to be tested. So again, we'll start immediately. And anyone interested should go to the Fund for Public Health website. It's fphnyc.org. Again, fphnyc.org. Very, very important, please. We need you to come forward right away so we can get you into this battle and help save lives here in this city. Let me switch to a couple of other important topics before I talk about the daily indicators. First of all, something so many New Yorkers ask about and care about, and it's important to everyday life, alternate side parking. Alternate side parking, uh, in this crisis, we've seen something very unusual. There have been so many fewer people out, and obviously businesses closed, et cetera, that the reality why we need alternate side parking to begin with has been altered fundamentally. So we've been watching regularly. Our sanitation department is monitoring communities to make sure we don't want to see communities get dirty. We don't want to see anything that would undermine the hygiene of this city in the middle of a pandemic. Been very pleased by what we're seeing. Streets are staying generally clean. I know a lot of everyday New Yorkers are helping to make that happen. And I thank you for that. So as we continue to see progress, we can continue to pull back on alternate side parking. We've been doing it two weeks at a time. We're going to keep doing that for the foreseeable future, and we're going to judge each time what makes sense. But I am here to announce that we will suspend alternate side parking for the next two weeks, and that will take us to Tuesday, May 12th. Again, as we get close to that point, uh, we'll have another update. Very important update I want to give now, and it's something that's been worked on for the last few days. 
Um, the weather has been getting warmer slowly but surely. We've talked about the changes that when it gets warmer, there'll be more and more people outside. Gotten a lot of good questions from everyday New Yorkers and from the media and from elected officials. How are we going to balance this? Well, we're going to have a bigger plan for the truly warm weather in summer. But in the here and now, we can predict in the next few weeks, as we go through May, it will get warmer and warmer, more people out, more challenges. A lot of folks have asked good questions about what can we do differently. And I've said consistently we want to see if there's new approaches, but we have to make sure they're safe and we have to make sure there can be enforcement. City Council came forward, uh, I think it was Wednesday, with a vision of how we could come up with a plan to open up more streets, uh, do it over time, and do it in a way that was responsive to the core concerns we've heard from the NYPD, for example, about safety and enforcement. Uh, we've been engaging the City Council over the last few days with a very positive spirit because, as I said a few days ago, uh, when you look at the history of the relationship between both sides of City Hall, we always come together in the end and find a solution. There's been a collegial, positive spirit, always, but particularly during this pandemic. And we share a lot of the same values. So the City Council has been absolutely right to say, let's keep looking for solutions here. And I want to thank them for that. I think it's been right to say, let's find a solution that helps open up space, but absolutely keeps people safe, because the first job here is to protect people's safety. So I want to announce today that we have reached an agreement with Speaker Johnson and the City Council. And over the next month, we will create a minimum of 40 miles of open streets. Uh, and then the goal during the duration of the COVID crisis, and we don't know how long that is, obviously, but as this crisis continues, we're going to all work hard to keep it as short as possible. But during this crisis, the goal is to get up to 100 miles of those open streets. And the way we will do it, we're going to focus first on streets in and around our parks. Uh, very concerned about the streets on the outside of parks that oftentimes uh, we're seeing that immediate area getting very crowded. That's an obvious uh, opportunity. Those streets adjacent to parks are an obvious opportunity to open up more space. So we're going to work together to figure out how to do that. Uh, some places will be able to expand sidewalks, use the example of what we did over the holidays around Rockefeller Center, where you just open up the sidewalk space into the street more, but with the proper kind of barricades. Uh, some streets will be more local uh, areas that aren't necessarily where you have a major attraction like a park, but they are places where we can safely open up some space and have it be enforced. And another important piece of this discussion is early action bike lanes, where we see an opportunity to do more with bike lanes. Done some of that already in this crisis. We want to do more. So the focus here will be to focus, of course, same as we're doing with so many other things, where the need is greatest. So, so many communities that we already have identified have been very hard hit by COVID. We want to be particularly sensitive to implementing these kind of steps working with the city council, working with uh, the police department, transportation department, sanitation department, uh, parks department, uh, figuring out all the right places we can do this. Um, but first priority on the places hardest hit. And then of course, figuring out where they'll have the biggest impact where the most people are. So that's good news uh, from the good work we've all been doing together with the council over the last few days. Now, let me go into the indicators for the day. And I think today's indicators are broadly good. It's not the perfect thing we want all down in the same direction, but broadly good. Uh, and we keep making progress in one form or another. I want to see more, and I want to see steadier progress for us to really be able to make some of the bigger moves we all would like to make. So the first indicator today. Daily number of people admitted to hospitals for suspected COVID-19. This is obviously the root of everything. This one's down meaningfully from 144 to 122. That's very good. Uh, daily number of people in ICUs across our health and hospitals, public hospitals for suspected COVID-19. That's down, but only a little, 768 to 766. Percentage of people who tested positive for COVID-19 citywide stable. Not going in the wrong direction, at least, but stable at 
The one place that was not so good, the public health lab tests, went up 46% to 55%. Uh, that is, again, an uh, important measure, but it's a measure of a smaller group of people. When you composite the day, progress, but not enough progress, but it's a reminder, everything we're doing is affecting these indicators. Let's keep doing it. So, as I conclude, and I'll say a few words in Spanish, but first, say, look, the test and trace plan we talked about a few days ago, this is really the key. It's going to be very aggressive. It's going to be large scale. This is how we take the good work that all of you have done. We supercharge it by finally getting testing on a wide scale, tracing people, isolating everyone who needs it. Doing that is the path forward. But we knew the testing piece of the equation was a challenge because we've always struggled to have the testing capacity we needed from the very beginning of this crisis. Finally, we see something simpler, having an approach to testing that will protect our healthcare workers more, save time, allow a simpler process, a process that's easier for the person being tested as well as for the healthcare worker. And the fact that it will speed things up and require less personnel over time is a huge, huge benefit. So the goal here is to test as many people as possible. This is another step toward that. It's a good way to start the week with some good news. And it makes us even more ready to go into May with that aggressive test and trace strategy that I think is going to be a game changer for New York City. Just a few words in Spanish. Nuestros trabajadores de salud están haciendo un trabajo heroico en nuestros centros de prueba. Y les debemos cada forma de protección posible. Con el auto examen les daremos alivio y vamos a seguir ampliando la capacidad de hacer pruebas para más neoyorquinos. Cada día estamos poniendo más piezas en lugar para lo que viene. Y mi promesa a los neoyorquinos es que vamos a estar preparados. With that, we will turn to questions from our colleagues in the media. And as usual, tell me the name and the outlet of the journalists calling in. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we have Dr. Daskalikas, Dr. Barbeau, Dr. Katz, and Senior Advisor Jay Varma all also on the line. The first question today goes to Bridget from WNYC. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have some questions uh, related to the election. Tomorrow would have been the presidential primary here in New York. Um, so just a few questions first. The governor announced in an executive order last week um, that the state, state board elections wants municipalities to mail absentee ballot applications to all voters. Just interested in your reaction to that, along with keeping poll sites open. Do you have any concerns there? Um, he also canceled the special elections for Queensborough president and city council. And I'm wondering um, your thoughts on that. And then finally, the State Board of Elections is meeting today um, and may cancel the presidential primary here in New York, um, given that you are a supporter of Senator Sanders. I'm wondering about your thoughts on that. Thank you, Bridget. Um, so uh, I think the absentee ballot approach is a, very much a step in the right direction. And look, uh, Bridget, you've been very, very deeply uh, involved reporting on these issues for years now. This state was way behind the country for a long time. Last year, we saw extraordinary reforms and change. It was a moment a lot of us have been waiting for for decades, where New York State finally caught up with the rest of America in terms of a lot of crucial reforms to make voting easier and to protect the voting process. Um, in this crisis, to me, the first question is health and safety. I uh, care deeply about the sanctity of our elections, but the first question is health and safety. Uh, so I think the absentee ballot approach is the smart way to go. And in fact, you know, it's teaching us for the future if mail-in ballots might be uh, part of uh, yet another piece of a strategy 
which some states use very widely already, not just because of this crisis, to make it easier for people to vote uh, and encourage more people to vote. So I'm very happy uh, that that approach is being used here. I think we could go a lot farther with that, potentially. Uh, I think the absentee approach is what everyone should do. So my advice to everyone involved is let's just focus on folks mailing in. It's the safest approach. It's so long as it's being made widely available and it will be uh, handled benevolently, meaning, you know, for years and years, you know, there was kind of a burden of proof on the voter. If my assumption and my hope here is that every absentee ballot application will be regarded as automatically valid. In that case, that's the way to go. That's where the energy should be focused on. Certainly don't want to see people out and about who don't have to be. Uh, on the other issues, uh, I t honestly, compared to all the other concerns out there, none of this registers to me as something I'm particularly worried about, respect the decisions that the state has made. Um, I was a proud supporter of uh, Senator Sanders. He obviously made the decision to leave the race and support Vice President Biden. I think, you know, that matter is closed. So I, I think keeping the election activity to a minimum in this environment makes sense. What I'm looking forward to is uh, getting through this recovery the right way and getting our whole society back to normal and having elections again um, as an indicator of our renaissance, of our resurgence. But I think that's something that obviously is going to happen in the fall, not now. Next question goes to Andrew from WNBC. How are you? Good morning. Hey, Andrew. How are you doing? Good. I was wondering if you had seen some of the studies which show that outdoor transmission of this virus is extremely low. And as a result of that, are you considering assisting restaurants by closing some of the streets like Ninth Avenue to when they ultimately reopen, essentially create sort of the maximum amount of outdoor restaurant space in New York City? Have you begun discussions on that, and do you think it can happen? Yeah, Andrew, I think that's a very interesting idea. Um, you know, as we've thought about, and we have begun discussions, but as I say, when we have firm plans, step by step, we'll unveil them. But there's something elegant about that solution. We know that when the right time comes for restaurants to reopen, there's still going to be real questions about how much distancing how you protect customers, how you protect the folks who work in the restaurant. And clearly, there could be advantages to having more of it be outdoors. You still have to have those precautions thought through and acted on. But there's something appealing about shifting more of the activity outdoors and adjusting accordingly, obviously, in terms of how we handle streets and sidewalks. So there's something very, very interesting there. Now, I have not read that particular study, to be fair, and I think one of the things we can say about COVID-19 is we get new information all the time uh, and a lot of unknowns. But I'm very intrigued by the idea, and I want to see if it's something we can act on as we think about uh, that piece of the reopening. I don't know if any of the uh, doctors wants to comment further. Doctors, anyone? Sir, I'll just add that uh, my team and I actually have begun those conversations to talk about ways in which we can provide uh, clear guidance to New Yorkers with regards to maintaining distance while we are able to lift uh, early the, the, some of the layers of social distancing and certainly maximizing our use of outdoor space is one of those potential options especially when it comes to restaurants. Okay. Next question is Jen Peltz from the AP. Hi, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Good, Jen. How are you doing? Uh, fine, thanks. I had just some questions a little bit about the uh, self-swab testing that you uh, mentioned earlier. One was... Could you explain a little bit further about why there are two samples being collected here, one nasally and one uh, from saliva, uh, and also a little bit of more about how come this reduces the need for personal protective equipment? I'm going to start as the layman here and then pass to the doctors. 
So Jen, the so it is two um, samples, two different samples from the same human at the same time, and that actually is helpful in terms of cross-checking and, and helping with ensuring the validity of the outcome of the test. But the other thing is just to try and, I'll, I'll try and be clear without being overly graphic. So why is it safer? Because, so, so when I was there at Morrisania in the Bronx, they, they took out the actual test kit and here's the swab. And the swab, I, I don't know, I can get the exact length. One of the doctors probably knows exact, but it's a long swab. It's not a, think about a Q-tip, it looks like most of twice that size. And the idea is to put it really deep into your nose in a way that a human being would have trouble doing themselves, but a medical professional can uh, perform. But the problem is, it also causes for a lot of people a kind of impulse, sudden impulse to sneeze. So you got a certain number of people who are going to be COVID positive. They're there with a healthcare worker, and their healthcare worker is right up close to them performing this test, and then the immediate reaction is someone sneezes right at the healthcare worker because they're right there in front of them. So that's not great. It's been what we've had. It's been the, the only option that appeared to be truly consistent and viable. And that required a healthcare worker, think about it, the face shield, the PPEs, everything. This ain't that. This is, you know, like many of us have experienced at a doctor's office. They give you your instructions and here's the sample cup that you spit into and you put the cover on and here's the Q-tip and you know, bring it back and hand it over, and then they can package it and send it for processing. So it just takes away that, that close contact, that sneeze, the things that would create vulnerability for the healthcare worker. It's also, from what I've heard at least, has not been done to me, but from what I've heard, a lot more comfortable for the patient to not go through that deeper uh, procedure. Doctors, that was my attempt to put it into plain English. You take it from there. Thank you. I think it did really well, Mr. Mayor. Uh, everyone who has the nasopharyngeal culture done, the one up their nose, almost always coughs and sneezes on the healthcare worker because it's so uncomfortable. So um, new methods are really needed. Um, in terms of the multiple specimens, uh, in some cases, we may be able to do it just with a nasal swab, uh, just swabbing. Uh, the front of the nose, something that the patient can do under the supervision of the healthcare worker. Um, as you keep uh, saying and teaching people, we're learning new things about the disease all the time. We may find that uh, adding uh, uh, sputum spitting does improve the test characteristics or doesn't make it uh, different enough. Uh, so we may just be doing the swabs. Um, but I think the big point, which you've made so well, is that this will be safer testing, it'll be more comfortable testing for um, the patients. Uh, it will enable us to do more testing and reach your goal of being able to open the city safely with enough data to be sure that we don't have uh, large outbreaks in the future. Okay. Next question is Christina from Chalkbeat. Hi, Mayor. Uh, we have seen some reporting that the DOE is considering a grading policy that many advocates advocates um, think is unacceptable. They don't want to see any grades for high school, and they want assurances that um, every student will graduate from high school this year. Just curious whether the DOE is taking that feedback when we can expect a, an official policy to come out and, um, and what the holdup is. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Um, now, look, the focus has been over these last few weeks to really get the distance learning uh, moving to the extent that we need it to and to try and consolidate the education of our kids right now under the most adverse possible circumstances. 1.1 million kids spread out over a whole city, not a single one of them you know, in a classroom in the traditional sense, although some are at the enrichment centers, it's still not the classrooms that we knew, you know, and the school structure we knew. So that's been the focus at the DOE, get that piece right and start building for the future, for the summer and for beyond in different ways. This week we'll have an update on the grading policy. I've had detailed conversations with the chancellor and his team. 
we'll have an update for you. I will say, of course, the voices of the advocates and, and every stakeholder is listened to. And we want to be fair and we want to be really respectful of uh, students and families in this moment. We also want to strike a balance. Um, I think it is important at, with everything in life uh, that there be uh, some real standards. Uh, I think it helps people to have some clear standards. Uh, and we think we can do that in a fair way that accounts for how difficult this experience has been. Clearly want to see as many seniors as possible move on um, at the end of this school year the right way. But we have to structure uh, that in a smart way. And again, we'll have the details this week. Next question is Henry from Bloomberg. Mr. Mayor, how are you doing today? Good, Henry, how are you doing? Um, okay, let me ask you this. I, I'm, have you, I don't know whether you've ever spoken about this, but why do you think New York City has been such an epicenter for this pandemic, uh, way beyond other cities that are densely populated and act as international gateways? Well, it's a profound question, Henry. I've spoken a little bit to it, and I think we're going to keep researching that question going forward, but I would say you're on the right track. Uh, international gateway in a way that very few cities on earth are. I mean, I think we have to understand New York City, you know, who we are, what we are, how we uh, compare to the rest of our country, how do we compare to the rest of the world. We are one of the most international cities in the world uh, with a handful of cities as uh, the true international capitals. That obviously in a pandemic makes us more vulnerable. Um, we have you know, the greatest diversity in the world. So we have people traveling back and forth from every part of the world. And we saw this pandemic growing from different parts of the world and I think as we look at it more and more, we'll see that some of that came in from more than one location. And that was more of a vulnerability for us than it might have been for some other places. Yes, there are densely populated cities in this country, but there's nothing that compares New York City. There's just no city that's laid out the way we are that concentrates anywhere near as many people. Um, that's a huge part of the equation. Uh, when you think of the second biggest city in the country, Los Angeles, it's structured entirely differently. It's spread out over a vast area. You have many, many fewer people concentrated in big buildings. There's many, many reasons why um, it made sense very sadly, and the, and the human cost has been profound and painful. But there's many reasons why we were particularly in the crosshairs of this disease. A lot more we'll say about over time. I think the other interesting question will be examined over time is, you know, when all those challenges added up and this disease manifested so intensely, I mean, we never seen anything like it. I mean, again, the only parallel is 100 years ago. Thank God this city long ago devoted itself to having a very strong public health apparatus, Department of Health, health and hospitals, community-based clinics, and that is part of what saved us here because our hospital system was strained deeply, but it never broke. Uh, a lot of other places, if they had gone through the kind of uh, overwhelming growth of the disease that we've gone through, their hospital systems would never have been able to handle it. Ours held, so that's something all New Yorkers should be proud of, and obviously the healthcare workers were the heroes. But those are some initial thoughts, Henry, but I think we'll all be doing a lot more research as we get more information. Next is Gersh from Streets Blog. Hello, Mr. Mayor, how are you? I'm good, Gersh, how are you doing? Great, I appreciate that. Um, so I do wanna obviously talk about this massive open streets announcement you just made. Um, you did uh, use the term enforcement, so I need to understand a little about what's different now between what you're going to do and what the NYPD was doing with the original open space pilot. Have you accepted the council's position that open streets can be done with far fewer cops and with more trust in drivers to stay out of areas where they don't belong? So I would say it this way. The, I mentioned, I think, in one of these settings, it may even have been in answer to one of your questions, I had a long conversation a few days back with Commissioner Shea and Commissioner Trottenberg, and we, we went deeply into the question of 
looking at each of the plans from around the country, something you and others have asked, Oakland, Minneapolis, et cetera, things happening around the world, and our comparison to New York City and what it would take here. And I think there is, you know, um, an assumption in everything we do, and it gets back to Vision Zero, that we want to be very cautious about making sure drivers are constantly given the message, slow down, drive safely, recognize the ramifications of what it means to drive a vehicle and your responsibilities. So that worldview, Gersh, makes us very cautious when it comes to trusting that if you create a situation where there are not uh, protections and there's not enforcement, that you could put people in danger. And obviously the goal of an open street or safe street kind of structure is that people can enjoy it and experience the virtue of it and the social distancing without having a new danger from vehicles. So we've always had a concern about enforcement, we continue to, but the, the council, discussions with the council, I think were kindred in the sense that we could come up with places to open. I think the areas around parks are a great example, where by opening them up, you're gonna capture the natural flow of people. One of the things, many of the questions I've gotten from all of you uh, in the media, but beyond is, one of the most important places to open might be where a lot of people are going anyway and just give them more space since more and more people will go there when it gets warmer. That also is actually a more straightforward enforcement dynamic than if you're trying to open a bunch of places all over. So it was sort of a focus on where the need was greatest, both in terms of where people would go and obviously communities most affected, using some of the enforcement we were already devoting to those areas in an efficient way, and then more and more of the conversation revolved. This is something the council felt deeply, and actually, as we looked at it more, we felt this was a very important piece uh, revolved around community partners that could be relied upon to create uh, structures that, you know, if you were going to have a place closed off, there would be a constant effort to monitor it, to make sure it was safe, if there was any problem, uh, to get NYPD over there quickly. Something with a little more structure than, for example, what we saw in Oakland. Uh, so I think there's been a really good consensus that we can do something substantial while keeping the health and safety issues up front and ensuring the right kind of enforcement, more work with trusted community partners. But I would not go so far as to say forgetting what we learned from Vision Zero, which is to always keep our guard up against the problems of people who drive irresponsibly and making sure we're protecting pedestrians at all times. Next is Sean from the Daily News. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, share some more details about the street closure plan. I mean, to start with, can you sort of help New Yorkers visualize what the plan will look like? Will there be barricades, police cars, officers enforcing? Also, can you say exactly who's going to be picking the streets? Will that be DOT or the council or somewhere else? And maybe last but not least, um, do you know at this stage what the first streets will be? Uh, parts of Manhattan, Bronx, et cetera, anything like that? Okay. Um, so we're all gonna work together on the selection. Uh, council, mayor's office, NYPD, DOT, everyone's gonna work to figure out the places that make the sense immediately. Again, I think it's gonna be a combination. I think, assume first and foremost, those streets around parks, where that natural ability to expand, if you will, the park space and the places where a lot of people are gonna be congregating as it gets warmer. I think in May we're gonna see you know, steady warming and more and more people. So let's get ahead of that, expand out around the parks. We'll figure out together uh, where to focus. It's one part where you're gonna see the most activity, another part where you're gonna see the most need in terms of the health reality. So that's obviously a lot of the communities that have been afflicted the most. Um, Yes, there will be enforcement. I think everything you said could, you know, can and will be a part of it, meaning in some places barricades, but one of the open questions is, you know, how permanent for the, for the duration of this crisis the barricades need to be or how temporary they can be, what will be effective. Yes, there has to be enforcement attached. Depending on the location, it might be more enforcement. Other places, it might be less, so long as, again, there were trusted partners Bids have come forward as one example. Uh, certain uh, neighborhood entities that work very closely with the NYPD, this is an idea that uh, Commissioner Shea put forward, 
if the NYPD has a working relationship with an organization and knows that they can rely upon them to manage something and keep in touch if there's a problem, that makes sense. So, um, and timeline to move obviously as quickly as possible through the month of May, but to start where we think there will be the most activity and then build from there. Details will be announced. You know, we have to deepen this process with the council and with the agencies as we have the first tranche of the places it will occur, we'll announce that. Next is Yoav from the city. Hi, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to ask you about the three indicators the city is tracking. For the percentage of people tested who are positive for COVID-19, why, why are you guys separating out the public health lab? Uh, my understanding is that that's a very small subset. Um, I guess if you can tell me how many tests the public health lab is conducting and is that a special group of people? I, I, I'm just trying to understand why it's being separated out. That's a great question. Appreciate it, Yoav. So the indicators, uh, I'll start and I'll turn to uh, Dr. Daskalakis and Dr. Varma to speak about this. The indicators were developed because we wanted everyone to be able to see in common where we were going, but there was real concern that, and I think this is playing out in certain states right now in a very troubling way, that if you either didn't have clear transparent indicators or you used the wrong ones uh, or you didn't give them enough time to develop, you could really set up that horrible boomerang scenario where the disease reasserts. And the disease reasserts, you know, I, I have no words for how much of a problem that would be if it reasserted in a strong way, both in terms of the people who would be in danger and the lives that might be lost, but also setting back any effort to get to normalcy. I've said we're not going to be in a perfect straight line on our path back, but we need to keep it as tight as humanly possible. So having these indicators, it was a conservative act to choose three indicators. Again, Yoav, you'll appreciate this. On this matter of how and when to reopen, I'm a conservative. I'm a proud conservative in this matter only. But uh, the getting it right, being cautious, being smart, looking for the correlation of the indicators, that was the underlying uh, value. Yes, the public health lab is sort of a rarefied slice in my layman's terms. It's a high bar, but we thought it was right to have it there um, because we wanted a high bar. We wanted to make sure we were really cross-checking all our indicators and seeing something consistent. Uh, we're going to see how it plays out. Uh, we always have the option to reevaluate down the line, but so far I think what we've been seeing tracks with what I believe is happening which is we are getting steadily better, but we're far from out of the woods. Look at the number of new cases every day. Look at the number, tragically, of New Yorkers who we're losing every day. It's better than what it was you know, a month ago or, or a few weeks ago, but it's nowhere near what we want it to be and need it to be. So I think the indicators are doing their job right now. But Dr. Daskalakis, Dr. Varma, why don't you jump in? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, um, the public health lab actually uh, focuses on testing inpatients. So it's the sickest New Yorkers who are being tested. The uh, indicator, the reason that they're together in a graph is because we want to look at them in combination of sort of the sickest folks who are being tested as well as just the general population who's being tested. So we think it gives a pretty robust view. And again, like uh, the mayor said, um, you know, we really um, will be able to adjust these further if necessary. But uh, the most important message is that the trend is definitely down in both. So day-to-day -day variations to be expected, especially since we test fewer folks in the public health lab. But again, since the trend is down, we are going in the right direction and does provide for some cautious optimism. Dr. Varma, you want to add? I guess he doesn't want to add. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Next is Gloria from New York One. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I have two questions for you. The first, um, I understand what the doctors have explained about how this test is easier to administer, but is there anything they can say about how you eliminate or prevent the possibility of a person not self-administering this test correctly if they do it wrong? then is there a possibility that the test might get a wrong result? How do you monitor that if the idea is to send the person off into another space to administer the test? 
And my second question is about the streets plan. Um, I, I thought much of the discussion around this had been about giving people who don't have, who might not have access to say a park or a large area of open space uh, options. So why start with places that are near parks? Why not focus in places where people might not have immediate access to, to a green space or a place to, to spread out and take a walk? So I'm going to speak to that one and then I'll turn to the doctors on the self swab issue. And I think a very good question you're asking about how do you make sure the tests are accurate? Um, I think the cr crucial question here, Gloria, is about health and safety. So when you think about social distancing and the ability to help people do it effectively, and you know, New Yorkers have been amazing, but obviously space is something we are all challenged by here in general, even when we're not doing social distancing. It stands to reason the first concern from a health and safety perspective is where are the most people going to be? Uh, and how do we help address that? And of course, the warm weather coming on, and this is something we talked a lot about with the city council, that the warm weather is gonna change the dynamic. It's gonna make it more challenging. So the notion of going where the people will be, which we know will be a lot of the places they'll be attracted to, we're already seeing that on a few nice days we've had, that's about maximizing the impact to protect people, uh, to give the most people the most opportunity to socially distance. Again, there'll be a focus on making sure we can do it the right way and enforce it, and there is an efficiency to focusing on the places we're already doing a lot of enforcement and just building them out more, if you will. And as I said, there's gonna be a real focus on the communities that have been hardest hit. Um, every community in New York City has some kind of place for recreation. It's by no means uh, even and equal, but every place has some places and folks do congregate all over the city, every kind of community in those places. So it makes sense to focus there. I think as we think about expanding outward, it'll all come back to where can we find those local partnerships that we can trust to make sure that people are safe. Um, again, different from the Oakland model, which was, I think, a more uh, honor system kind of model, as I said, we want something more backed up by a structure and by monitoring and then by enforcement when it's needed. But we can do that in a number of communities, obviously, so that'll be an option as well. But I think the, the first concern should be uh, to think about where the most people are gonna be, how quickly they're gonna be there, and try and get there first, and that's around the parks but we'll do these other pieces as well. We're talking about a substantial amount of space that'll be addressed, and we'll work with the council on those priorities for sure. Uh, let me turn to the doctors on how you make sure the self-swab test is done accurately. Uh, Mitch, you wanna start? Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, at least in the beginning, we will not be asking people to go into a separate room. What we'll be doing is setting it up so that they're looking into a mirror and the healthcare worker is behind them, thereby protected from them, the healthcare worker being sneezed at or coughed on, uh, but they'll be able to observe in the mirror and help to instruct the person on how to do it. Uh, we may uh, be using for healthcare workers who need to be tested and who are therefore very familiar with the procedure, we may allow them to go into a separate room. And as you keep saying, as we learn more and more about these diseases and these technologies, uh, we may be able to liberalize it. But I think in the beginning, it is appropriate that a healthcare worker be observing it, but way less risk to that healthcare worker. Mr. Mayor, I'll just build on what Dr. Katz said, and if Dr. Daskalakis wants to weigh in, I would say that, Gloria, there are other situations where we work with patients for them to do self-collection. So, for example, in our Chelsea clinic, we have uh, a clinic where patients can self-collect uh, samples to do testing for sexually transmitted infections. We provide uh, patient education materials that easily walk them through step-by-step step how to conduct the self-collection to make sure that we have samples that we can test uh, accurately. Good. Okay. Next is Nolan from The Post. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you... 
Let's turn to NBC's medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, good morning. I'm sure a lot of people who saw this sentence from the World Health Organization saying there's no evidence yet that people who have these antibodies are in fact immune from getting sick again. I'm sure a lot of people were disturbed by that. What does that mean? Is the WHO just being really careful in its language? And Savannah, I think you're right. I think a lot of people are waking up, getting very concerned, thinking they might get coronavirus a second time. That is not what the World Health Organization said. What the World Health Organization said is, we don't know what happens if you have antibodies. We don't know how long those antibodies will protect you, if at all, because we simply don't have enough information about this virus. But their main emphasis was about the antibody tests themselves, saying, number one, we're not sure of their reliability because they have been pushed out so fast and so quickly. And number two, that passport people are talking about, the certificate of immunity. They're very concerned about that because they think people might be using those erroneously and that could give people a false sense of security that they don't want people to have. They still want them to do all the social distancing and everything else to make sure they stay protected, not going out thinking, I have immunity, I can do whatever I want. But back to the primary point there, we don't have the studies yet to show that there's some immunity after somebody has had this virus. But there, is there any reason to think that this wouldn't track with other viruses so that there's some level of immunity? Yeah, at this point, there's no reason to think it won't be like other coronaviruses where you do get a level of immunity. But what they don't know is what level of antibodies do you actually need to get some of that immunity and how long will that immunity last? What they have found out is that some people have high levels of antibodies. Other people who had infections, verified infections, aren't showing much levels of antibodies at all. They're not exactly sure what that means at this point. It's going to take years to figure that out. And so, again, they're trying to make sure that people don't have that false sense of security, having a positive test saying, I have antibodies. Therefore, I can do whatever I want and I don't have to necessarily take the precautions. They're saying, number one, again, the tests aren't that accurate. And number two, they want to make sure that people aren't getting each other infected by doing that. Just real quickly, why have the antibody tests been such a problem? They seem to be inaccurate, leading to some false positives. There's a bunch of different types. There seems to be a black market out there. I mean, why, why is this such a, a confusing area? And it's not just a confusing area here in the U.S., it's around the world. If you remember the U.K., they ordered antibody tests from China. Now they're asking for refunds because those tests weren't that good. So it's one of those things that this virus has come on so fast and so quickly, it's hard to get a test that quick and that accurate at the same time. And plus, there have been some stumbles along the way from different authorities trying to look at validating these tests and whether they can validate them as quickly as they'd like to. So they're pushing them out faster than probably a lot of scientists are saying they should. So that combination, I think, is giving us these tests out there that aren't necessarily the tests we want or need, but that's going to take years to get. So in the meantime, these tests can help a little bit, but they're not as accurate and as reliable as we'd like them to be. All right. Makes sense. Dr. Torres, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. California's golden beaches for weeks vacant in the midst of this public health crisis are suddenly social. Normally we'd be going to church, but now we're just kind of feeling the presence of God here in, in, uh, on the beach. On the other side of the country, crowds gathered on Long Island shores were stretched out at Piedmont Park in Atlanta, tossing frisbees and exchanging high fives. This is something that I don't think anybody, even our grandparents, could relate to in their lifetime being told to not go outside. While this video of a house party reportedly taken in Chicago this weekend is going viral, the city's mayor calling it reckless and utterly unacceptable. You can't even move. A new study from the University of Maryland says increasingly more people aren't staying home. What we see right now is that individual Americans, many of them are deciding on their own that they are going to reopen uh, themselves to go out more. Dr. Lei Zhang calls it quarantine fatigue, a combination of warmer weather, looser state rules, and weeks of being cooped up inside turning the tide in the wrong direction, with his social distancing index dropping by 3% overall, equating to millions of people out and about. Last week, we saw for the first time nationwide a reduction in our social distancing index, which indicates that people are going outside of the home more, they're traveling more. So it's just a major shift in momentum as the nation fights the pandemic. Although 44 states in the study slipped, the worst offenders were largely in the South, with Louisiana, the Carolinas, and Tennessee leading the way. Governors like California's Gavin Newsom reacting to the renewed beach activity, 
tweeting in part, I know it's going to be nice out this weekend, and many are tired of staying home, but we must continue to take this seriously. Hashtag stay home, save lives. For this circle of friends, who used to meet every week at a neighborhood bar. This group, we respect each other, we keep our distance. I can only be responsible for myself, and I have to do what I'm comfortable with. They say their behavior is proof you can be outside responsibly. But with a bit of cautiousness, because you're only going to trust the people that you think are practicing social distance. And here in Georgia, according to the study, this state had one of the top 10 biggest drops in social distancing. And Hoda, Savannah, what's interesting this morning, the areas that were actually considered to be doing really well here, like New York and D.C., even they saw some regression. We can't break our country over this. We have to get going. What we reopen will be better than what we had before. As the debate over when to reopen and restart the country rages, more questions. What will our lives look like? Can fans gather at sporting events, theaters? What about busy workplaces? Some, including New York City's mayor, say part of the new normal should involve health screenings. The important thing to recognize with the temperature checks, they absolutely have a role to play. This device may play a role in getting the country going again. It's called the Symptom Sense Medical Evaluation Gateway. The manufacturer says it can screen up to 600 people an hour for signs of illness. Company CEO Derek Peterson showed me how the technology works at their lab on Long Island, New York. Okay, Vicki, come on through. Okay. As you walk through, face this way and put okay. your feet on the yellow pads. As I walk in, Peterson says this sensor uses ultrasound to measure my height so the machine can adjust. Now we're going to calculate your body temperature and we're also going to look at your heart rate, resting heart rate and oxygen level by this sensor right directly aimed at your chest area. In less than 10 seconds, this screen tells the operator my external temperature, respiration rate, blood oxygen level and heart rate. So you're looking at these vital signs. What can that actually tell you about someone's health? Through our combination of looking at these four vitals, we could tell if somebody's well or not well. Peterson says because this is not a medical device, it doesn't require FDA approval. The machine doesn't collect data, and he says the technology to measure these vital signs is non-invasive. We're using a technology called millimeter wave technology to be able to scan the body for respiration rate and heart rate. We're also using our own proprietary technology for determining temperature. We validate against known equipment in the industry that can verify what we're doing. Let's be clear, this cannot tell me if I have coronavirus. Absolutely not. I can't tell you if you have the coronavirus, but what I can tell you is that you're maybe sick. It might detect vital sign differences that are consistent with coronavirus, but up to 50% of people People with coronavirus are going to have normal vital signs, no symptoms whatsoever. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres says this device is not a magic solution to detecting coronavirus. How important are these vital signs to determining a baseline if someone may or may not be ill? Vital signs are one tool we use to look to see if somebody is sick, but it's not the only tool. People with normal vital signs, if they have other complaints, they still might have a disease. What do you say to critics who say this might give people a false sense of security about whether or not they're healthy? It's just another tool trying to help people understand in a quick way if they're healthy or not. This is not the end no behold. But who decides what to do with this data? Tech ethicist David Polgar says it will be up to the organizations that use this technology to figure out how they respond. Do you think tools like this are helpful and do you think they will become commonplace? Yes, I do think that they, they can be helpful. We are in an extraordinary situation where I think a lot of people are looking at how do we balance our individual freedoms with more of a collective need for, for society. He compares the new technology to airport screenings after 9-11. I think a lot of us are talking about tools like this and other forms of technology that might have seemed unusual a year ago might be part of our future. Well, as for the symptom sense, the company says it's received interest from thousands of companies and governments, including Major League Sports. The Greek government just ordered several of these devices, but it's unclear how to where they're going to use them. Yeah, and you did just talk about asymptomatic people being up to 50 percent, so that'll be tough. But the question is, it may help a little, so what does it cost and when could it get on the market? They are not cheap. They're about $35,000 a piece. The company is also working to incorporate a metal detector based on feedback early from sports leagues, so this can be more of an all-in-one screening tool, and they do expect to start shipping these devices in about one month. Okay. All right, Vicki. Thank you for the update. You're watching NBC News Now.
The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulations. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. If they did, who, which actor would you want to play you? Um, here are some suggestions that I've heard. Ben Stiller, Brad Pitt. Which one? <laughs> oh, Brad Pitt, of course. <laughs> We're back. Dr. Yeah, Anthony course. Fauci, remember when he joked a few weeks ago that if he was going to have anyone play him on SNL, he'd want it to be Brad Pitt, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. And as Carson joins us here, Mr. Daly, the, the show made the doctor's dream a reality. That's right. Asking You Shall Receive. Over the weekend, SNL returned with their second episode produced and performed completely from home. And their open featured their portrayal of Dr. Fauci. Good evening. I'm Dr. Anthony Fauci. First, I'd like to thank all the older women in America who have sent me supportive, inspiring, and sometimes graphic emails. Now, there is a rumor that the president is going to fire me. Let's see what he said about that. Today I walk in, I hear I'm going to fire him. I'm not firing him. I think he's a wonderful guy. So, yeah, I'm getting fired. <laughs> that, of course... Was Brad Pitt donning his Brooklyn accent to give Dr. Fauci his wish? As good as the impression was, Pitt would go on to take off the wig and thank first responders. And those heartfelt words were really something special there at the end of that tribute, guys. Yeah. The episode all around, by the way, Carson, I thought was, was, was pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been impressive what they've been able to uh, do in just a couple of weeks from home to gather all the stuff. All the people on SNL are producing that at home. So it's been some good stuff. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final. Streets all across Spain this morning filled once more with the sounds of overjoyed children. <laughs> For the first time in six weeks. <laughs> Two-year-old Devrim finally out and about yeah. after the country eased its home confinement rules Sunday, allowing children under the age of 14 to be outside again. I think we're on 40 days now or something, 45 or something yeah. like that. You lose track. <laughs> Devrim's making up for all that lost time by exploring Is it a stone? and moving a lot. The minute you're out the door, he just wants to run. His parents, Americans who now live in Spain, are struggling with the lockdown, but understand its importance. Once we were all seeing the numbers go up and how, by how much and the very quick increase, I think people took it seriously. In mid-March, Spain's daily death toll started to spike, hitting a high of almost 1,000. Now slowing to 288 on Sunday, the coronavirus here has killed more than 23,000 people. The horrific figures inside Spain's big cities have meant authorities are taking baby steps out of lockdown. And so for weeks, even months, playgrounds like this one could remain off limits. Who's there? Elias and Sam Block celebrated their refound freedom with Dad Neil. It was just fresh air. Today's fun has a one hour time limit and must take place well within a mile of their front door. But even that beats being stuck at home. Has your brother been annoying? Has your dad been annoying? Like what's been the worst bit? Um, like being with the same people all the time. Your family? Yeah. <laughs> And what makes this end of lockdown on kids so interesting here is that originally the government announced that they would only allow children outside the home to go to the pharmacy or the grocery store with their parents. There was a huge public backlash. The authorities caved in and they said kids could go outside. They could play for no purpose other, Craig, than to have fun. 
This morning in Georgia, it's round two of the state's reopening with some salons, barbershops, gyms and more already up and running. Now, movie theaters and dine-in restaurants will also be allowed to open their doors. I mean, to put it mildly, we've been going through hell. The White House recommends two weeks of downward trend in new COVID-19 cases before loosening restrictions, a threshold Georgia currently does not meet. Governor Brian Kemp has said his decision is informed by data and public health recommendations, but it's drawn intense criticism from mayors around Georgia. It's not a time to lift the restrictions. It's absolutely premature in my mind. I think that it is putting all of us at risk. This week is ushering in a new wave of reopenings across the country. In much of Tennessee, restaurants and stores free to welcome customers this week at 50% capacity, but the most populated areas like Nashville still shuttered. In Ohio, the state's stay at home order is set to end on Friday. It's going to be a very slow, gradual transitioning uh, and gradual reopening. And in New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a gradual plan to reopen some parts of the state, starting with construction and manufacturing in less populated areas. The regions that would be more likely able to open sooner would be the upstate regions. Even the NBA allowing players to resume individual workouts at team facilities, but only if their city has reopened. The White House's coronavirus response coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks, braced the nation for a long battle ahead. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another. Okay. But for Gary Leak, whose new restaurant setup includes disposable plates and menus and spaced out tables, getting back to business is a matter of survival. How important is it for you to reopen tomorrow? God, more than you can imagine. We're opening just for the sake of getting the wheels greased up to go forward. We just can't give up. Now, guys, of course, in addition to dine-in restaurants, movie theaters also welcome to open their doors today. But as for AMC, the chain told The Hollywood Reporter that they don't plan to open any theaters until sometime in July when there are new movies to release. As some states start to reopen, this morning, many cities are taking new steps to ramp up testing. New York's governor is now allowing all independent pharmacies in the state, more than 5,000, to conduct diagnostic COVID-19 tests. Testing is what we are compulsively, obsessively focused on now. With hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and deaths dropping at the nation's coronavirus epicenter, there's also an urgent push for more antibody tests to check for possible immunity. But now, a new warning, you may be able to get the virus more than once. The World Health Organization says there is currently no evidence that people who have recovered from COVID-19 and have antibodies are protected from a second infection. Still, Dr. Anthony Fauci is emphasizing the need for more testing. Right now, you know, we're doing about 1.52 million per week. We probably should get up to twice that as we get into the next several weeks. California has more than 42,000 confirmed cases. Officials there are working to dramatically ramp up testing efforts. We averaged about 2,000 tests a day uh, through the end of March. Uh, we hope to be averaging 25,000 tests a day by the end of this month. In Massachusetts, where cases are surging, one town is testing essential workers without symptoms. Nearby Boston, a thousand residents will be randomly picked for voluntary antibody testing. All efforts to trace the spread and potentially asymptomatic carriers. Back in New York, first responders, healthcare workers, and all essential employees are now eligible for coronavirus testing. Okay, la fila. Pharmacist Roger Paginelli is waiting for the state health department to roll out the rules about getting tests and administering them. We're ready when the tests are ready, and we're ready when the Department of Health says go. We're ready to put our gloves on, get our protective equipment on, and do what's best for our patients. Now, the governor has already announced antibody tests at four New York City hospitals. For now, those tests will be focused on health care workers. Let's turn to NBC's medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, good morning. I'm sure a lot of people who saw this sentence from the World Health Organization saying there's no evidence yet that people who have these antibodies are, in fact, immune from getting sick again. I'm sure a lot of people were disturbed by that. What does that mean? Is the WHO just being really careful in its language? 
And Savannah, I think you're right. I think a lot of people are waking up, getting very concerned, thinking they might get coronavirus a second time. That is not what the World Health Organization said. What the World Health Organization said is we don't know what happens if you have antibodies. We don't know how long those antibodies will protect you, if at all, because we simply don't have enough information about this virus. But their main emphasis was about the antibody tests themselves, saying, number one, we're not sure of their reliability because they have been pushed out so fast and so quickly. And number two, that passport people are talking about, the certificate of immunity, Community. They're very concerned about that because they think people might be using those erroneously and that could give people a false sense of security that they don't want people to have. They still want them to do all the social distancing and everything else to make sure they stay protected, not going out thinking, I have immunity, I can do whatever I want. But back to the primary point there, we don't have the studies yet to show that there's some immunity after somebody has had this virus. But there, is there any reason to think that this wouldn't track with other viruses so that there's some level of immunity? Yeah, at this point, there's no reason to think it won't be like other coronaviruses where you do get a level of immunity. But what they don't know is what level of antibodies do you actually need to get some of that immunity and how long will that immunity last? What they have found out is that some people have high levels of antibodies. Other people who had infections, verified infections, aren't showing much levels of antibodies at all. They're not exactly sure what that means at this point. It's going to take years to figure that out. And so, again, they're trying to make sure that people don't have that false sense of security, having a positive test saying, I have antibodies. Bodies, therefore, I can do whatever I want and I don't have to necessarily take the precautions. They're saying, number one, again, the tests aren't that accurate. And number two, they want to make sure that people aren't getting each other infected by doing that. Just real quickly, why have the antibody tests been such a problem? They seem to be inaccurate, leading to some false positives. There's a bunch of different types. There seems to be a black market out there. I mean, why, why is this such a, a confusing area? And it's not just a confusing area here in the U.S., it's around the world. If you remember the U.K., they ordered antibody tests from China. Now they're asking for refunds because those tests weren't that good. So it's one of those things that this virus has come on so fast and so quickly, it's hard to get a test that quick and that accurate at the same time. And plus, there have been some stumbles along the way from different authorities trying to look at validating these tests and whether they can validate them as quickly as they'd like to. So they're pushing them out faster than probably a lot of scientists are saying they should. So that combination, I think, is giving us these tests out there that aren't necessarily the tests we want or need, but that's going to take years to get. So in the meantime, these tests can help a little bit, but they're not as accurate and as reliable as we'd like them to be. All right. Makes sense. Dr. Torres, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Kim Jong-un has not been seen in public for more than two weeks. These images are thought to show the Supreme Leader's train near the North Korean coast at a luxury compound. But on Saturday, Kim skipped his second major event, Army Day. It's a deepening mystery with rumors about his poor health and possible demise, making headlines around the globe. Reuters reporting a team including medics flew into North Korea from China. One well-connected Chinese commentator posting to millions of followers, some wait for the official announcement. Suit yourself. Her posts later deleted, but not by her, she claims. But I'd be shocked if U.S. Senator dead. Lindsey Graham saying over the weekend, I'd be shocked if he's not dead, like though admitting he does not have any direct knowledge. South Korea still insisting its intelligence shows nothing unusual. A North Korean newspaper claiming Kim even sent a letter. How closely guarded is Kim Jong-un? How many people around him would know that something is wrong? That would be a very small circle of people. The rumors on the ground are probably people on the outside. When today made a rare trip to the world's most isolated dictatorship, we found Kim Jong-un's image everywhere. So you, you thank Kim Jong-un for this? Yes. Yes. Talk. Whatever the truth, this woman may be central behind the scenes. Kim Jong-un's sister represented him at the Winter Olympics and accompanied him during his two summits with President Trump. Now, it's possible, of course, that Kim Jong-un is in lockdown over the coronavirus. But, Savannah, it's so important because, remember, North Korea is a nuclear-armed nation. If it lost its leader, a weakened world would face another crisis. Savannah? California's golden beaches, for weeks vacant in the midst of this public health crisis, are suddenly social. Normally, we'd be going to church, but now we're just kind of feeling the presence of God here in, in, uh, on the beach. On the other side of the country, crowds gathered on Long Island shores were stretched out at Piedmont Park in Atlanta, tossing frisbees and exchanging high fives. This is something that I don't think anybody 
even our grandparents could relate to in their lifetime being told to not go outside. While this video of a house party reportedly taken in Chicago this weekend is going viral, the city's mayor calling it reckless and utterly unacceptable. You can't even move. A new study from the University of Maryland says increasingly more people aren't staying home. What we see right now is that individual Americans, many of them are deciding on their own that they are going to reopen uh, themselves to go out more. Dr. Lei Zhang calls it quarantine fatigue, a combination of warmer weather, looser state rules, and weeks of being cooped up inside. Turning the tide in the wrong direction, with his social distancing index dropping by 3% overall, equating to millions of people out and about. Last week, we saw for the first time nationwide a reduction in our social distancing index, which indicates that people are going outside of the home more, they're traveling more. So it's just a major shift uh, in momentum as the nation fights the pandemic. Although 44 states in the study slipped, the worst offenders were largely in the South, with Louisiana, the Carolinas, and Tennessee leading the way. Governors like California's Gavin Newsom reacting to the renewed beach activity, tweeting in part, I know it's going to be nice out this weekend, and many are tired of staying home, but we must continue to take this seriously. Hashtag stay home, save lives. For this circle of friends, who used to meet every week at a neighborhood bar, this group, we respect each other, we keep our distance. I can only be responsible for myself, and I have to do what I'm comfortable with. They say their behavior is proof you can be outside responsibly. But with a bit of cautiousness, because you're only going to trust the people that you think are practicing social distance. And here in Georgia, according to the study, this state had one of the top 10 biggest drops in social distancing. And Hoda, Savannah, what's interesting this morning, the areas that were actually considered to be doing really well here, like New York and D.C., even they saw some regression. We can't break our country over this. We have to get going. What we reopen will be better than what we had before. As the debate over when to reopen and restart the country rages, more questions. What will our lives look like? Can fans gather at sporting events, theaters, what about busy workplaces? Some, including New York City's mayor, say part of the new normal should involve health screenings. The important thing to recognize with the temperature checks, they absolutely have a role to play. This device may play a role in getting the country going again. It's called the Symptom Sense Medical Evaluation Gateway. The manufacturer says it can screen up to 600 people an hour for signs of illness. Company CEO Derek Peterson showed me how the technology works at their lab on Long Island, New York. Okay, Vicki, come on through. Okay. As you walk through, face this way and put okay. your feet on the yellow pads. As I walk in, Peterson says this sensor uses ultrasound to measure my height so the machine can adjust. Now we're going to calculate your body temperature and we're also going to look at your heart rate, resting heart rate, and oxygen level by this sensor right directly aimed at your chest area. In less than 10 seconds, this screen tells the operator my external temperature, respiration rate, blood oxygen level, and heart rate. So you're looking at these vital signs. What can that actually tell you about someone's health? Through our combination of looking at these four vitals, we could tell if somebody's well or not well. Peterson says because this is not a medical device, it doesn't require FDA approval. The machine doesn't collect data, and he says the technology to measure these vital signs is non-invasive. We're using a technology called millimeter wave technology to be able to scan the body for respiration rate and heart rate. We're also using our own proprietary technology for determining temperature. We validate against known equipment in the industry that can verify what we're doing. Let's be clear, this cannot tell me if I have coronavirus. Absolutely not. I can't tell you if you have the coronavirus, but what I can tell you is that you're may be sick. It might detect vital sign differences that are consistent with coronavirus, but up to 50% of people People with coronavirus are going to have normal vital signs, no symptoms whatsoever. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres says this device is not a magic solution to detecting coronavirus. How important are these vital signs to determining a baseline if someone may or may not be ill? Vital signs are one tool we use to look to see if somebody is sick, but it's not the only tool. People with normal vital signs, if they have other complaints, they still might have a disease. What do you say to critics who say this might give people a false sense of security about whether or not they're healthy? It's just another tool trying to help people understand in a quick way 
if they're healthy or not. This is not the end no behold. But who decides what to do with this data? Tech ethicist David Polgar says it will be up to the organizations that use this technology to figure out how they respond. Do you think tools like this are helpful and do you think they will become commonplace? Yes, I do think that they, they can be helpful. We are in an extraordinary situation where I think a lot of people are looking at how do we balance our individual freedoms with more of a collective need for, for society. He compares the new technology to airport screenings after 9-11. I think a lot of us are talking about tools like this and other forms of technology that might have seemed unusual a year ago might be part of our future. Well, as for the symptom sense, the company says it's received interest from thousands of companies and governments, including Major League Sports. The Greek government just ordered several of these devices, but it's unclear how to where they're going to use them. Yeah, and you did just talk about asymptomatic people being up to 50 percent, so that'll be tough. But the question is, it may help a little. So what does it cost and when could it get on the market? They are not cheap. They're about $35,000 a piece. The company is also working to incorporate a metal detector based on feedback early from sports leagues, so this can be more of an all-in-one screening tool, and they do expect to start shipping these devices in about one month. Okay. All right, Vicki. Thank you for the update. Streets all across Spain this morning filled once more with the sounds of overjoyed children. For the first time in six weeks. Two-year-old Devrim finally out and about yeah. after the country eased its home confinement rules Sunday, allowing children under the age of 14 to be outside again. I think we're on 40 days now or something, 45 or something yeah, like that. He lose track. Devrim's making up for all that lost time by exploring... Is it a stone? ...and moving a lot. The minute you're out the door, he just wants to run. His parents, Americans who now live in Spain, are struggling with the lockdown, but understand its importance. Once we were all seeing the numbers go up and how, by how much and the very quick increase, I think people took it seriously. In mid-March, Spain's daily death toll started to spike, hitting a high of almost 1,000. Now slowing to 288 on Sunday, the coronavirus here has killed more than 23,000 people. The horrific figures inside Spain's big cities have meant authorities are taking baby steps out of lockdown. And so for weeks, even months, playgrounds like this one could remain off limits. Who's there? Elias and Sam Block celebrated their refound freedom with Dad Neil. It was just fresh air. Today's fun has a one hour time limit and must take place well within a mile of their front door. But even that beats being stuck at home. Has your brother been annoying? Has your dad been annoying? Like, what's been the worst bit? Um, like being with the same people all the time. Your family? Yeah. <laughs> and what makes this end of lockdown on kids so interesting here is that originally the government announced that they would only allow children outside the home to go to the pharmacy or the grocery store with their parents. There was a huge public backlash. The authorities caved in and they said kids could go outside, they could play, for no purpose other, Craig, than to have fun. Round two of the Paycheck Protection Program gets underway this morning. The Small Business Administration will again start accepting applications. The program is designed to help small businesses keep workers on their payroll. The original $349 billion fund was drained quickly because there was so much demand. And since then, Congress appropriated $322 billion in additional money. Joining us now with all of this in what small businesses can do to stay afloat right now, NBC's senior business course. Correspondent Stephanie Rule. Steph, good morning. I know a lot of small business owners are waiting for this day. So if you haven't applied at all, can you get in on it? And what if you already had an application in that was denied? All right, let's walk through this because you and I both know how important this money is. According to the Small Business Association, every hour a small business closes. So we got to get the money out. So let's walk through it. Today, the portal's open again. If you have already applied, you must contact your bank. Find out where you are in the process because there's a huge, huge backlog. Some of the biggest banks out there, JP Morgan, PNC, they're not even accepting new applications. They've got hundreds of thousands in process ready to go. So if you've applied with them, what you need to do today is pick up the phone and say, what other information do you need about me? I'm here to do that. Now, let's say you haven't. You shouldn't give up because the opportunity is there. You said there's over 300 
$1.5 billion in new funds available. Call local banks. The government has set aside $60 billion for smaller lenders, community banks. Call around. You're allowed to apply with one or more institution. So don't think, oh my goodness, could I be committing fraud here? I'm calling multiples. Absolutely not. Apply wherever you can. And there's also some non-traditionals like a PayPal or a Square. But even if you're a very small business and you say, I don't have a sophisticated payroll system, you need to. You're going to have to have your payroll, your utilities, your bank statement. If you don't provide this information, you won't have access to the money. Okay, so there's that, this program, the PPP program. There's also the Federal Reserve talking about some loans to Main Street businesses. What is that about? And it's obviously separate. How do you get in on that? Okay, that isn't happening just yet. But think about this. Over the last week, there's been all this pushback. Why were so many bigger businesses in this program? And, and the government realized, well, Savannah, if you run a business with two people, should you be competing for the same pot of money as me, who has a company of 500? So now what they're looking to do is create a Main Street lending program for those mid-sized businesses. That's going to come. We should be on the lookout in the next few weeks. It's not going to be a forgivable loan like PPP, but it'll help some of those bigger businesses. And I want to remind our audience, those who want to get PPP, because it is forgivable, that's awesome, you don't have to pay it back, it's only forgivable if you keep all of your employees on. Now, I realize that's really tricky. Imagine, Savannah, if you ran a local restaurant. As these days are passing and you're shut down, you're likely to lay those employees off. Well, if you want to get this money, you're going to need to bring them back on. So if, you, you, if you've already had to lay people off, but you want to get in on this money, you could rehire them and still have access to the loan. I, I want to, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I also want to mention what you just alluded to, that some of these bigger businesses, household names, had gotten some of this first round of funding from the PPP. What's happening with that? Are they cracking down on that this next round? They are, but it's really tricky, Savannah, because you could argue what in the world were they doing in there to begin with. They shouldn't have. But if you ran a business and you had access to the money, there's a good chance you would apply. Now, they changed some of the rules, so some of the more financial-focused businesses, hedge funds, private equity firms, they can't apply. But some of those bigger companies, AutoNation, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, Shake Shack, they already gave their money back. But there's a lot of other publicly traded companies that are still in there. The Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, said companies that are in there that shouldn't be will face serious consequences. But the issue is, Savannah, a lot of them were allowed to be in the program. And the truth is, any business, with the exception of pharmaceuticals, some big retailers like an Amazon, any business, Savannah, is suffering. And they're going to be over the next few months. And the one other thing I would bring up, this money is going to go very quickly. There's $320 billion in the new program. But just yesterday, the CEO of Bank America said the government needs to put more money in this. Savannah, we're preparing ourselves from a health perspective to possibly deal with this for the next year. But from a financial perspective, we're only thinking about it for the next couple of months. I'm right now in New Jersey, kind of on a, on a Jersey shore town. If these businesses are, are closed for four months, we're going to lose this whole region. So if the government doesn't start looking at what this is going to do for a much longer period of time, we could be in trouble. But for today, any small yeah. business out there, we've got to help them. It is time to apply. PPP, this is your day. Yeah, don't delay. Stephanie, thank you so much. The food supply chain is breaking. That's the warning in a full-page ad from Tyson Foods, released in the New York Times on Sunday. It comes after one of the country's largest meat processors closed a massive pork processing plant in Iowa because of a coronavirus outbreak. The letter from Tyson's president going on to say, there will be limited supply of our products available in grocery stores until we're able to reopen our facilities that are currently closed. Ambulances start coming to our plant. People start being uh, carried out of there. And so we, we were always asking our supervisors, basically, what is it that's going on here? NBC News talked to one Tyson worker at that Iowa plant who concealed their identity. They didn't have enough uh, material or masks and things like that to provide to us. So they would start giving us different types of rags and stuff that they had, that, that they had washed to clean. 
Tyson responding, telling NBC News, we've been working diligently to protect our team members. Early on, we allowed workers to bring their own masks, and we even supplied some until we could secure surgical-style coverings, which we now require all team members to wear. Adding, we aren't aware of any ambulance visits to the plant for COVID-19-related reasons. NBC News has not been able to independently confirm ambulances at the Tyson plant. Tyson's Waterloo plant, one of several closed across the country, shut down by beef, pork and poultry companies trying to contain virus outbreaks. The CEO of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association says he fears things are only going to get worse. If we start to see panic buying much like we did the first two weeks of this pandemic, then yes, we are going to have an issue on our hands. There's no doubt about it. Meat suppliers, the processors say in their freezers, they do have a supply of beef, pork and chicken. But the longer that the processing plants are closed, the faster the nation's meat supply will dwindle. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. I want people to realize that um, there is hope, um, that there is, there, there's the sun still shining, and we're going to come out of this, and I believe that uh, nations all over the world, we're going to be stronger because of it. They called my family and said I had less than a 50% chance of coming off. Uh, my vitals were dropping. Uh, the ventilator settings were turned up. My body, uh, the fever was spiking again. They couldn't explain it. They were looking for a second infection. And really, I had about a 30% chance to live if you look at the statistics. Uh, but miraculously, sometime between Friday night and Saturday morning, um, I truly believe that God healed me. I'm a man of faith. Uh, so faith is what I hold on to. 
the doctors and the nurses, they couldn't explain it Saturday. Uh, of course, they were happy. They said, you're a miracle. Uh, I had nurses who would literally just walk into my ICU room. They'd have to put all their, their gear on, which takes quite a while. And they would just come in just to, just to look at me, which normally is pretty creepy. Uh, but they did it because they just wanted to see a miracle. My wife received the, the plasma treatment. Um, she received it on the Friday before Easter. I also had the virus also. I'm the one that contracted it first. I spent six days in the hospital. I got out at uh, two o'clock that afternoon. She came into the hospital at 10 a.m. It was innovated right away. It doesn't matter what it costs to me. I told them I'll sell my house. I'll sell everything I own to save my wife. Um, right now, she has, uh, we're going on day 26. I'm amazed actually, Lewis, that you're talking to us. Um, you know, the what love you must have for your wife to be oh, able to I raise that awareness for, yeah, I'm in awe, absolute awe, and I will add her to our church's prayer list. One of the the healthcare assistants who cannulated me and took my blood, a gentleman called Barry, um, I'll remember him forever. He was just so wonderful. He, I kept saying, don't come near me, you know, let me cough, let me turn away, don't breathe the same air. I was so panicked about infecting others. And he just looked at me in the eye and he said, don't worry, I've got nobody else at home. It's just me. And I was like, what a selfless act of kindness that this man was, he was taking all of the suspect coronavirus, all of those suspected COVID-19 cases to protect his, his colleagues. I didn't want the children to see me and run at me and then potentially contaminate them because I was infectious. And when I was allowed out of my bedroom and out of isolation, they came just running in. And it was, honestly, it was so much better than Christmas morning. And it was the most heartwarming moment and I will cherish it forever. It really makes you not take anything for granted anymore. Mm -hmm. Even the small things. Every, every moment I get with my husband, I just... Maybe a reaction to the weekend, Sunday, Sunday discharges may be down. But we have the same question, how fast and how steady is the decline? We don't want to see flat, we want to see an increasing decline. And we want to see how fast that decline goes and how low does the decline go, right? When does that hospitalization rate get down to a truly manageable number? Uh, when does the incoming case number get down to a manageable number? You see again, overall hospitalization rate is on the decline. Again, yesterday, a little less than we would like to see. But hopefully it was a Sunday anomaly because of the weekend. Intubations is down. Number of new cases, still 1,000 new COVID cases every day, puts it in perspective. Down a tad from where it was, but again, these weekend numbers sometimes are a little strange. Number of lives lost, 337, uh, still tragically high. Uh, but on the decline, if you look at it over the past few days, not that that does any, gives any solace to 337 families who are suffering today. On testing, uh, this has been a big topic, increasing testing. It's been a scramble for all the states. We're doing well on it. The testing tells you where we are, right? Uh, and whether the infection rate is going up or going down. We've now tested 7,500 people statewide. So that's a very significant number. Uh, and it gives us a snapshot of where we are. It's just a snapshot. But snapshot, 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 you look at the different pictures and you have a movie at one point and you can track what is happening. So with 7,500 people, the uh, percent statewide that's positive is 14.9. When we tested five days ago, it was 13.9. 13.9 to 14.9, one point. Statistically, it's in the margin of error. I'd like to see the margin go the other way, but uh, male, female, they both went up a point. 
men are still more likely to have the virus than women by a couple of points. Whatever that bespeaks, I care not to speculate. These are the uh, regional numbers in broad strokes. Long Island 14, New York City is up a couple of points. Westchester Rockland is up a couple of points. The rest of the state is basically flat. This is the infection rate by region. People hear New York, they think New York City. Yes, we have New York City. We also have upstate New York, North Country, which is uh, predominantly rural or suburban. And you see uh, different situations across this state. This is not a homogenous state. So the Mohawk Valley, 2.6%. North Country, it's 1.2%. Capital District 2.1, Hudson Valley 10%, but that has Westchester and Rockland in it. Central New York 1.3, Southern Tier, Finger Lakes, Western New York 7.1. Western New York is the high point upstate. Hudson Valley, again, has Westchester, Rockland. We had a significant problem in Westchester, less so in Rockland, so I think that would skews that number. But when you see 1.2% uh, in the North Country, 2.6 Mohawk Valley, Capital District. You see a much different situation than you're looking at in New York City where you're in the 20s, right? So different situations, different strategy going forward. We're coordinating as a state, we're coordinating with our neighboring states, but you still have to take into consideration the variations across the state. And that's what we're trying to navigate. Uh, by race, you see the uh, percent for Asians is ticked up. African Americans actually down. Latinos went up 10%. Nobody can explain uh, what caused that jump in this survey. And it's something we're going to watch. And we're doing more testing in lower income communities and African American and uh, Latino communities, as we discussed. And the age breakdown uh, is fairly consistent with where it was. So that's where we are today in New York. Uh, New York City, obviously, high point in the number of cases in the country, higher than some uh, countries globally and upstate New York, a very different reality. Big question is reopening, especially for those places with less of an issue to begin with or places that have reduced their problems. And I get a lot of local officials who are calling me. We want to talk about reopening, reopening, reopening. Uh, know what you are doing before you do it. Those are words to live by. I don't know who said it, but it is a true axiom. So we want to unpause. May 15th is when the pause regulations uh, expire statewide. I will extend them in many parts of the state. Uh, but in some parts of the state, some regions, you could make the case that we should unpause on May 15th. But you have to be smart about it. We all have to be smart about it. As we said, there is no light switch where you flick a switch and everybody goes back to doing what they're doing. Uh, we have to take these circumstances into consideration. We have to learn the lessons. We have to move forward. And we have to be smart because if you are not smart, you will see that infection rate go right back to where it was. We'll be right back to where we were 58 days ago. And nobody wants to do that. So what I want to say to my regional colleagues is be smart. Well, we want to reopen. Well, have you thought through reopening? And we have a couple of weeks, but start thinking through what it means to reopen. Uh, first question is, do we meet the CDC guidelines that say you reopen when you've seen a decline in numbers for 14 days? Second, we talked about on the reopening, bringing back construction and manufacturing as the first two industries. But how do you bring them back? And what precautions are going to be in place? 
what precautions do you want those businesses to institute when they start? And part of this is on business. You know your business. I don't know your business. I don't know how you do business. How do you incorporate into how you do your business and where you do your business the precautions that we want to take going forward? How do you do social distancing? How do you do monitoring? Are you going to take the temperature of people who walk in the door, uh, et cetera? And that's for government, but it's also a question for government, for business. Healthcare capacity, you want to reopen a region, what is the healthcare capacity in that region? How many beds will you have available if that number goes up? How many ICU beds will you have available? And are you contemplating what's going to happen when the flu season kicks in in September, where we could potentially now be, be dealing with COVID cases on top of flu cases? You have to test for both and possibly have hospital capacity for both. Do we have testing in place? And is testing ready to go? Because testing is one of the main monitors, right? Do we have a tracing system in place? We all talk about taste, testing, tracing, isolating. That has to be in place. Test people, you then trace the contacts, you find the positive people, and you isolate them. But you need a tracing system. And this is something we've never done before, right? So that system has to be in place. When we isolate people, where do they go? Isolation, once you find the person who's positive, basically you can say to the person, look, you can go home, uh, but then you run the risk of infecting those people in your house, or we could put you in an isolation facility. We have a hotel, et cetera, that we can put you in for two weeks. But you have to, you have to locate uh, those facilities first. We have to coordinate as a region. There is no one county in a region, it's a region. Uh, and these are the Regional Economic Development Council regions that have worked together. But we have to coordinate that region. So everybody in that region has to have the same policy when it comes to schools, when it comes to transportation, when it comes to testing, when it comes to tracing. And that region's plan has to fit in to our overall multi-state plan. No attractive nuisances. Attractive nuisance is a legal concept where uh, you have uh, a potentially dangerous situation that actually attracts people, normally children, to it. We can't open an attraction that might bring many people from outside the region and then overwhelm people in that region. You have a lot of pent-up demand. And we have seen this before, where when we're not coordinated, we have New York people going to Connecticut because Connecticut has parks or waterside access that's open. We don't want to create a situation where people flood an area because uh, they're looking for something to do. And then we need a regional control room, I call it. We have to be monitoring what happens when we start to reopen. And that entire region has to have a control room function where we're watching what's happening. For those friends who are more graphic, we're gonna turn the valve on reopening, turn it a little bit, start to reopen, and then you watch the dials. What are the dials? Hospitalization rate, which we know now, we've been watching that. What does the antibody testing tell you? Antibody testing is important because it tells you the people who were infected, the infection rate, and now resolved because they have antibodies. What does the diagnostic testing, which is a different type of testing, tell you? Positive and negative, but what's happening on the diagnostic testing? Those dials will give you the fourth dial, which is the infection rate, what's called the RT rate, the rate of transmission. So, Turn that valve a little bit for a region. Watch those four gauges very carefully every day. See what's happening on those gauges. You can either close the valve, open the valve a little bit more, or leave the valve where it is. But when I talk about the regional control room, 
Uh, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, getting that data in to one central place where everybody agrees on the numbers and everybody agrees on what we do the next step. We have medical centers that were built. I spoke to uh, President Trump about this this morning. When we were worried about the lack of capacity in the hospital system, uh, the federal government was good enough to send in the Army Corps of Engineers. They did a phenomenal job in building beds quickly. We built a number of facilities. We're now talking about a possibility of a second wave of the COVID virus or COVID combining with the regular flu season in September, which could be problematic again for the hospital capacity. Uh, so the facilities that were built, I spoke to the president about leaving them in place until we get through the flu season. God forbid we need extra capacity again. Uh, I don't want to have built, ask the federal government to build capacity, then take it down, and then wind up in another problem area. Uh, Javits Center, we have to think about because the Javits Center is in the Javits Convention Center. It has 2,500 beds, so it's a great facility, but it's also in the convention center. You can't reopen the convention center, obviously, uh, as when it's with the hospital beds in it. Westchester County Center, the same issue. It's also the Westchester Convention Center. So question mark on those facilities when we take them down uh, or how we take them down. I'm going to speak to the county executive in Westchester County, George Latimer, about that. Uh, but Javits will be on hold for both those facilities now until we decide. Uh, but again, anticipate an issue in the future and make sure we're ready. But I want to thank, again, the Army Corps of Engineers did a fantastic job. Uh, and President Trump got it done, and he got it done very quickly. Uh, so those facilities, Javits, you know, over 1,000 people went through Javits. We didn't need the whole facility, but 1,000 people is a large number of people. On Saturday, as you know, we expanded our diagnostic testing criteria for frontline workers, essential workers, et cetera. We'll be opening additional drive-through testing sites uh, for those uh, people this week. Uh, people can't just show up at a drive-through center. You have to call first, make an appointment, so we can handle uh, the flow we're also very concerned about making sure we get testing to our essential workers and our frontline workers. We're going to be doing a survey of uh, New York City Fire Department and New York City Police Department. Uh, this week, 1,000 and 1,000 respectively, uh, just to find out again with the antibody testing, what is the infection rate? NYPD was out there every day, and they paid a terrible toll. Uh, the attendance rate is now uh, good again. Uh, many were out sick, but we want to know exactly where those frontline workers are. If they have been infected, we want to make sure people are getting help, and we want to know exactly what happened. We'll also, we'll also be doing 3,000 healthcare workers. These are hospital staff, nursing staff, doctors who are in the emergency rooms to find out uh, their situation. And we'll be doing 1,000 transit workers. These are the bus drivers, the train operators uh, who keep the public transit system working. And we want to do testing to find out how they're doing. We're seeing a tremendous demand in food banks which is predictable in some ways, uh, but the numbers are very, very high, and we need to address it. 200% uh, increase in Westchester, 100% increase in New York City, 40% on Long Island, 40 to 60% across upstate New York. So we're going to commit $25 million for emergency funding for those food banks. I'm also asking philanthropies to help. Many philanthropies said they wanted to help. Uh, and step up. This is a, I would say, the number one thing they can do to help. Uh, and if they're interested, please let us know, and we'll supplement the state funding with uh, philanthropies funding. 
We also have an issue across upstate where, because the markets are so roiled, uh, some farm cooperatives are actually dumping milk because the market can't consume it. Uh, this uh, is just total waste to me. We have people downstate who need food. We have farmers upstate who can't sell their product. We have to put those two things together. It's just common sense, but we have to make that marriage between product upstate and need downstate. And we're going to launch a special initiative to do that. We're also immediately to stop this dumping of milk, uh, going to work with industries in our state who can use the milk and get it to people who need it. So I want to thank these companies who will be uh, working with us to buy the excess milk, yogurt, cheese, sour cream, cream cheese, and then we'll give it to the food banks that are downstate. When it comes to reopening, and I talked about what I'm going to speak with the regions about, but I don't want to just do reopening. We have to use this moment to reimagine and be smart and grow. This is one of those moments, if you look back in history, sometimes it takes a crisis to wake people up, and it takes a crisis to change the uh, body politic, to actually accept change, because change is hard to make. And if you look at the instances in the past where we've had significant problems, you'll see we were normally smart enough to learn and to grow from them. So reimagine New York means don't replace what was, build it back better. And we've done that in the past. Chicago Fire, 1871, uh, killed 300 people, but we learned stricter fire safety laws, San Francisco earthquake, 1906, the same thing, uh, was devastating, but that led to better construction and earthquake standards. Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire here in New York, 1911, started a whole workers' rights movement and safety in the workplace. Mississippi flood, 1927, that's when the Flood Control Act started and we woke up and started building levees and dams, et cetera. Great Depression, FDR pivoted from that crisis to an entire new economic structure. We went through 9-11, and we are better and safer as a society for it. Department of Homeland Security was formed on the federal side, which was, has been the single largest innovation in the federal government. Uh, even Superstorm Sandy that we went through 2012, I was part of that. It was devastating, but New York is better for it. We have a power grid that's now better. We raised all our electric stations. We changed our infrastructure along the waterfront. We built houses back to different codes. So it's that process that we have to go through here. What did we learn? How do we change? How do we improve? Uh, we talked about teleeducation. Yeah, uh, we went through it. We had to go through it, but it didn't go as well as it could have gone. We didn't have any notice, but let's learn the lessons. Let's do better. Telemedicine showed great potential. You don't have to go to the doctor's office. You can do a lot by telemedicine. How do we learn that? Public transportation, we're still learning. Uh, how do we clean and disinfect a public transportation system on a daily basis? I mean, just think about the scale of that undertaking. How do you do it? And we're still trying to figure it out. And then how do you have a bu better public health system? Because we were not ready for this. Our health system was not ready for any public health crisis that would demand more capacity or more coordination. Uh, so let's learn from that, and let's uh, have a society that is more social equity. You look at the people who paid the highest price for this crisis. They were the people who were in the least uh, good position to pay. The poorest among us always pay the highest price. Why is that? 
Why do the lower income communities uh, see this disease in higher proportions? Uh, why were the essential workers who had to show up uh, disproportionately African American Latino? So, is life going to be different? Yes, life is going to be different. But different in this case can mean better if we're smart about it. And when we're finished going through this, we should be tougher and smarter and more resilient and more unified and better than before. Last point, A.J. Parkinson, great quote. I respect elected officials who aren't typical politicians. Elected official does not have to be a politician. Politician has bad connotations to politicians, the word politician. Uh, you can be an elected official who's not a typical politician not a go-along, get-along kind of guy, you know, not a make-no-waves kind of guy. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir stood up, said to his senior senator in the state, Mitch McConnell, that Mitch McConnell was wrong on saying he wouldn't provide funding to state and local governments and wrong in saying states should go bankrupt. It is hard for a governor, especially Andy, who is a relatively new governor to stand up to a senior official and speak truth to power. That is hard, takes guts, takes courage. And you don't get that from a typical politician. So it warms my heart to see an elected official who is not a typical politician. Thank you, Governor. Questions, comments? Um, governor, are you confident that the President will use the Defense Production Act to make more chemical reagents and swabs? Um, I don't w know exactly where, what the President has said about using the Defense Production Act. I know he's used it in some situations. I don't know if he said that he'll use it for swabs or reagents. What do you make of the models um, that appear to have overestimated hospitalizations, but appear to have sadly been more accurate when it comes to lives lost, particularly when it comes to New York? The, look, we've said all along, every projection model showed uh, many more people being infected. CDC model, Coronavirus White House Task Force model, Cornell Weill model, Columbia model, McKinsey model, they all showed a higher projection rate. They were not wrong. We changed reality. We changed reality. They said the curve was going to go like this. We changed reality. We shut down, we closed schools, we closed everything, and the reality was the number was much, much lower, which is a beautiful thing and a good thing, and a testament to the intelligence of the people of this state and this country. So were they wrong? No, you changed reality. And the reality was much more beneficial and hundreds of thousands of people who they projected would get infected if we did nothing, was basically their projection, weren't infected. I was talking specifically about the 16,000, um, you know, there were estimates that that's how many lives New York would lose. You know, that seems to have been accurate. I was just wondering what you Yeah, I have not studied those projections, so I just don't know. Governor, uh, Mayor de Blasio today said that uh, the city is going to be opening up about 40 miles of streets uh, near parks as well. Just wondering what your reaction was to that idea. Yeah, I had said early on that, you know, you have to be realistic about the situation of people. You have people in a very dense urban environment and will stay at home, stay at home, but you can go out, go for a walk, get some air, et cetera. Go out for a walk in New York City but social distance, this is almost an oxymoron, right? Uh, it's very hard to walk down a sidewalk in New York City and maintain social distancing. So I had said uh, New York City should open streets because remember, New York City, the traffic is way down, way, way, way down. I don't know the percentage, but it's like night and day. You look at pictures of New York City, you see one or two cars going. So open streets. Uh, I know the, uh, and I spoke to uh, the city council speaker uh, about it and the mayor, and they were, we did open streets, and there was a program that was operational. 
apparently they have a disagreement about how it works. I said, figure it out. If they can't figure it out, I'll get involved. But you need to have streets that are open. You have less traffic. You need streets open so people can walk and social, socially distance. You can't do that on the sidewalk. And there has to be a way to close streets because you have no cars. You have no cars, you don't need as many streets. This is a direct proportionality. Governor, you said you spoke to Donald Trump this morning, the president, correct? Yes, sir. About what time was that, ballpark? Oh, I don't know. I, don't I, ask, I, I ask because at about, 10, about an hour ago, he, he posited a, uh, about poorly run states, in all cases Democrat run and managed, looking for bailout help. Did you discuss, first of all, federal monies coming down to the state of New York? And second of all, how do you feel about him referring to that as a bailout? Uh, no, I didn't discuss that with the president. Look, uh, first, I believe, and I said at the time, I was consistent, the last bill that they passed that only did small business help, and everybody supported small business help, should have included state and local. Now, when you say state and local, there's no personality to state and local. I get that. Don't say state and local. Say what the state and local governments fund. Police, fire, teachers, hospital workers. Fund small business, but also fund police, fire, school teachers, and hospital workers. How can you exclude them when you're talking about priorities? Yes, small business is a priority. So are police, fire, school teachers, and hospital workers. I don't know why they passed the bill without including that at the time. And I said that. I said it to my congressional delegation. Everybody said, oh, don't worry, don't worry, that'll be in the next bill. Yeah, but that was the third time they said that'll be in the next bill. Uh, and pardon me for being suspicious about uh, Washington politicians, but uh, don't worry, don't worry. When I hear them say don't worry, I worry deep inside. So they passed the small business bill. As soon as they pass it, by the way, before they even pass it, they turn around and say, oh, and I don't want to do state and local. Uh, and forget the police and forget the fire and forget the school teachers and forget uh, the healthcare workers, which is a totally different tune than they said just two days before when they're actually trying to pass the bill. Because if they, if they had said that before, they would have never passed the bill. So we are where we are now. Uh, bailout. This is not the time to be talking about uh, dollars and cents among members of a community that are trying to be mutually supportive and help each other because helping each other is, is the way we actually all advance, right? Uh, so this is not the time to be saying, well, you put in a dollar more than I did or I put in $5 more than you did, right? It's, it's uh, anachronistic to the concept of community and sharing and mutuality and sharing benefits and burdens, right? I'm wearing a mask to protect you. You're wearing a mask to protect me. That kind of sharing and mutuality is repugnant to this bail out, you got this much, I got this much. But if you wanna go to who's getting bailed out and who paid what, nobody would be bailing out New York State. New York State has been bailing them out every year for decades. If you want to do an analysis of who is a giver and who is a taker, we are the number one giver the number one giver. Nobody puts more money into the pot than the state of New York. We're the number one donor state. 
And if you want to look at who happened to be the donor states, who, who are the giver states, they are the same states that they're talking about now. Who were the taker states? Kentucky, southeast part of the country. And by the way, I understand we're one nation. You put into the pot what you need. I put in what I need. You take what you need. You take what you need. Uh, and that's the way it's always been. But if you actually want to call for an accounting, which I think is repugnant to this time, and I don't think it's constructive, and I don't think it's healthy, but if you want to call for an accounting, you're making a mistake because you lose if we do an accounting. You lose. And you happen to be 180 degrees wrong in what you're suggesting. So that phrase, bailout, is not helpful, you would, you would say? I would say, first, at this moment in time, when people are working together and people are sharing and people are sending ventilators across the nation to be helpful and 60,000 people are volunteering to help New York State and they're showing love and they're showing unity and they're showing mutuality and community. That is such a beautiful moment, right? And it tends to happen after a crisis. We saw it after 9-11. People just come together. We're Americans first. We're not Democrats. We're not Republicans. We're not East Coast. We're not West Coast. We're not Northern. We're not Southern. We're just Americans. That is such a beautiful, special moment. To now say in the middle of that moment, uh, who owes what to whom? What? You want to talk about money now? This is not about money. It's about uh, working together and helping and sharing and people are dying and it's about grief and it's about comfort. It's not about money. But if you want to make it, make it about money, you're making a mistake because you're going to lose on a tally sheet. And it's not even going to be close. But you want to tally up who owes what to whom? Go ahead. It's not even close. Turn around from what he said last week. Let's go next. Governor, Governor where are casinos fit on uh, phase reopening? Would you consider those an attractive nuisance? Casinos, uh, you'd have to look at the industry and how they're going to conduct their business. You'd have to do social distancing. You'd have to have monitoring. It's going to be difficult in the context of a casino, but depending on the casino, not impossible, but you'd have to look at it on an individual basis. Governor, we're hearing about a security breach at the Department of Labor regarding unemployment benefits. Some people are messaging me saying that they've received mail with other people's information, including social security numbers, and I'm seeing this in other parts of the state as well. Uh, do you not, know of the breach? And I've not heard about that. At all? Has anyone heard about that? So there were, I think it was three dozen people who, and it was a human error, it wasn't malicious, where two pieces of paper were stuck together and sent. Those people have been contacted. The ones who have not yet will be contacted today. They're going to receive for free uh, credit reporting and surveillance for a year, and they're making sure to process those claims as a priority. But yes, it was, it was human error, it was not malicious, and it's being dealt with. Employment, uh, Governor, I'm, I'm curious, as time goes on, uh, I mean, every day we're getting message from people who are losing their jobs because of this. Um, does this state have the money? Do we have enough money to keep paying out unemployment as more and more and more people become unemployed during the pandemic? No. That's why the federal government has to provide funding, because we don't have the money. What do we need for unemployment? Well, it depends how many people moving forward uh, ask for unemployment benefits and how long it goes on. But it's in the billions of dollars. There's no doubt about that. Governor, what's the current testing capacity in nursing homes, and how does a nursing home go ahead? Because last week you said that they are doing testing in nursing homes. How do, how do they request the testing? And then also, you were talking about isolating um, certain facilities 
regarding the reopening process, will that be available for nursing home operators to send patients that are COVID positive? A few other states like Connecticut and Massachusetts have started doing COVID only patients to take the burden off of nursing homes. So yeah, one we, on the testing and then two yeah, on the isolating. We do that already, right? If a nursing home has a patient that they can't handle, COVID or whatever the reason, they must refer that patient out of that facility. They must. If they cannot handle, if they cannot provide uh, appropriate care, they must transfer that person. Either they can transfer the person on their own, or they call the Department of Health, and Department of Health will transfer that person. Department of Health can transfer for that person to a COVID only facility, which we have. But it has to start with the nursing home that is the primary care provider saying, I can't provide care for this person for any one of a number of reasons. I don't have the staff, I don't have the PPE, I don't have the ability to quarantine them, I have too many COVID patients, I'm too tired. It can be any reason. If they can't provide the care, then they must transfer that person. Department of Health can put the person in a COVID-only facility or whatever facility they have that's appropriate for that person. So where are these COVID-only facilities? Because last week, that wasn't an option. It didn't seem like. Yeah, we have had COVID facilities. Yeah. We have COVID-only hospitals. Downstate is a COVID-only hospital. We Is, but uh, mobile is definitely is. And uh, we believe as a government that uh, we can get a lot of insights. You're looking at a demonstration of a new program called Fleming. Sick people will have red color indication and healthy individuals should have a blue uh, mark. Developed by the Israeli cyber intelligence firm NSO, it uses cell phone and public health data to identify where people infected with the coronavirus are and who they're coming in contact with. What you see on the screen is someone who's sick stayed in a location long enough, so that location itself is regarded as infected. Information that could be vital to help governments contain any outbreaks. But for it to work, everyone has to provide their cell phone number and allow the government to track their location. Tell, tell people this. How can you, uh, can you guarantee that the government that you provide this software to will not have the power to extract even more information from user cell phones? We've been able uh, to build an algorithm that it's only focused on COVID-19. We, we use the pandemic specialists that help us design those algorithms, and those algorithms uh, actually providing results just for the pandemic. So uh, there is always a risk of government using it for different purposes, uh, although in this specific case, we've been able to take this risk to, to barely minimum. I think that any new surveillance technology to deal with COVID should be of great concern to the public, and ideas to, to mandate uh, new apps should be frightening. People should resist. Uh, ideas about uh, location tracking, which is both privacy invasive and not COVID effective, should be uh, refused. 
Fleming is the latest evolution in tracking software to pit public health against privacy. In South Korea, the government is using cell phones and credit card purchases to track its citizens, then notify them if they've been in contact with someone who is infected. In China, contact tracing apps on cell phones are mandatory. I'm Janice Mackey Freyer in Beijing, where this is your passport for everything. It's a health code generated by your phone that proves you're virus free and you need it to book a train ticket, get into a grocery store, even to go to a coffee shop. Even in Westport, Connecticut, police were set to deploy a drone that could monitor people's temperatures. NSO won't disclose which countries are using its software, but NBC News has confirmed NSO is marketing Fleming in the U.S. The company previously developed Pegasus, a program critics say was used to hack into cell phones of journalists and human rights activists. Shalev, what do you say to critics who say NSO technology has been used to spy on people by governments? And here you are again providing technology to governments that you will later have no control over. The tools that uh, we are now providing to government is only analytical tool. It cannot spy on people. Privacy experts warn the proof is in their transparency and whether users have the freedom to opt in. What kinds of privacies should we be willing to compromise in your opinion? I think that's a great question and it's the kind of question that has to be addressed extremely transparently. The exact opposite of what NSO is doing, which is requesting to scoop up the personal information of everyone's cell phone. Now they may claim that they're doing this only to get big picture information, but the big picture is composed of 100 million people's personal secrets. When you give up your privacy, you can't put that back in the tube. Once you provide that kind of information. Google and Apple say by mid-May, they'll release their software that would allow developers to build contact tracing apps for health officials in the US. It would be up to users to opt into that system. With hospitals across the country, now the front lines in the battle against COVID-19, fear of catching coronavirus is keeping other patients away. And now, more than ever, they're turning to healthcare consultations of a different type. It's Dr. McGee. How are you doing? It's called telemedicine, virtual visits on computers, even smartphones. It's not new, but the advancement and availability of technology has pushed it into overdrive. We've done over 5,000 visits over the past uh, over the past month. That's up from just 20 a month before COVID hit. An astonishing increase for Dr. Michael Main and his colleagues at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City. And what the COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to do is to innovate. Their priority? Protecting both their staff and vulnerable patients like 89-year-old stroke survivor Carl Hines. Having any problems with uh, chest pain? No. And at a time when medical resources are stretched thin and so many of us are staying home, these routine virtual visits are a lifeline for heart patient Gail Collette. We've never deployed that. And uh, I don't know what that was really going to do for you anyway, because what percent, you actually made this point a couple of weeks ago, what percent are actually going to have the, had the infection? And can you really restart an economy on that smaller number? And now it's saying, if you believe the World Health Organization, you can't even say for sure those people won't get reinfected. So the point is not necessarily that people with antibodies would be able necessarily return back to work. No. That theory is not operational anymore. No. I mean, there's a theory, it'll go person by person, but you'd have to make your own calculated risk. You had it, you have the antibodies. My brother Chris, he had the antibodies. Maybe you're immune. Yeah. Maybe you're not immune. Governor, the State Board of Elections today, just now, has voted to cancel the presidential primary, removing Bernie Sanders from the ballot. Was this the correct move? The, uh, I'm not going to second guess the Board of Elections. There are a number of, I know there are a lot of election employees, employees of boards of elections, who are nervous about conducting elections. But I'll leave it up to the Board of Elections. Okay. How has the science evolved on wearing a facial covering in recent days? We went in a fairly short period from uh, facial coverings, man inconclusive, to a mandate and it being one of the better things you can do. So if the science does support it and has evolved, is the state indirectly responsible for the spread by not issuing that mandate maybe 30 days earlier when we started response? Look, 
when you when we do the retrospective, uh, all of these things, you could argue, why didn't we do them a long time before? Why were we shaking hands? Spread all sorts of viruses and diseases shaking hands. Why didn't you wear a mask starting last year? Used to see pictures of all the people in China wearing masks, right? Why didn't we do it? I mean, it helps with the flu, it helps with the common cold, it helps with everything. Uh, and we did it more aggressively than just about any other state. We mandated it. As soon as people said, well, if you remember when it started, everybody was ambivalent, CDC, all the experts, right? We have a whole world of experts. All the experts were ambivalent about a mask early on. And then they said, basically, a mask couldn't hurt. Well, I said, a mask couldn't hurt, and it might help. So why not do it? Uh, and now they're even more emphatic that a mask helps. So I'm glad we did what we did. once they lose a patient. Are you saying that nursing homes are more interested in their profits than taking care of their residents? No, not at all. So can you elaborate as to what you're thinking is behind that remark? No, those are just the facts of the situation. If they can't care for a patient, they have to transfer the patient. Governor reports that golf courses, golf clubs, are allowing golfers out on the course while driving carts. Are you concerned about that? And we've even heard reports that there are newspaper advertisements that are offering um, greens fees with carts. Should there be more monitoring? Should there be fines? I thought we said no carts. Does anybody we remember? We said no carts, that's right. And so if people are violating the guidelines, then it should be reported up to ESD for um, enforcement. And if they're- We're arguing that somebody report that. They're not supposed to be using cards, and if they are doing it in violation of the directive, it should be reported, and there can be civil penalties. And if they're doing it in an advertisement, that is really not smart. Governor, Bill's training camp starts in July. Given the multi-phase plan that you have now, is holding an event like that in July in Western New York feasible? I'll tell you the end of June. <laughs> God, let's take one more. Go ahead. Is there a possibility that having those temporary hospitals at Stony Brook and Old Westbury will make students more reluctant to either attend or return to campus, knowing that maybe they'd be used at some point? No, I don't think so. Are there any in terms of unemployment? Do you know when we would be out of money? Do you know when we, when we would need the federal help just I, for unemployment? We are out of money now. Are, are there, we are now running a 10 to $15 billion deficit. And just so for, we're out of money now. And for your context, we paid out as of Friday $3.1 billion in unemployment already as of this past Friday. Flying in the time of COVID-19, empty planes, falling prices, and an industry in crisis. The flight attendants it depends on, vulnerable and feeling forgotten. We are risking our lives too every time we come to work. This week, United Airlines joined JetBlue as the first major U.S. carriers to require flight attendants wear masks. Still, no such requirement for passengers and other employees. I do hope that it gets to the point where if you are not willing to wear a mask, you can't travel. Same as if you didn't bring your driver's license. Earlier this month, on my way to Seattle for an assignment. I boarded the flight, and as expected, the situation's pretty empty. But on the return, a stark contrast. More passengers, many without masks, and no guidance on how to safely social distance. Across the country, similar stories. The Association of Flight Attendants is now pushing for all leisure travel to end until the virus is contained. They're also demanding legislation mandating masks for crew, employees and passengers. Just asking flight attendants to wear a mask is not enough. Uh, but the bottom line is it reduces your risk of getting infected on the airplane if everybody is wearing a mask. 
United Airlines released a statement recognizing for flight attendants social distancing's challenging, saying they've added masks on flights to ensure attendants have one mask each per duty day. Delta's CEO says masks are encouraged. Our frontline staff are encouraged to wear them. We do have masks for customers that they don't bring them. American Airlines with no mask requirement for passengers or crew. Their website notes the CDC does not require passengers to wear masks. We know we're playing a vital role in the infrastructure. This weekend, the U.S. Treasury Department released billions more in aid to U.S. carriers. Airlines considered critical, but the workers feeling unprotected. Aaron McLaughlin, NBC News, Los Angeles. Good morning. It's about 6.30 and I've just gotten to the hospital. They are the latest recruits in the coronavirus battle. To place my mask. I'm ready to go. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's worth it. New doctors, 30-year-old Bronx native Kathleen Lozada and 25-year-old Olamide Omideli from Houston. You look at this chest x-ray. Two of the fourth-year students who graduated early from medical schools to serve. You know, once we took our oath before, you know, joining our class and being a medical doctor, I think we agreed to step up whenever the hospital, you know, had it. A need. I couldn't have imagined where I would be now. It was like a surreal feeling, honestly. More important member or members of our community than our federal delegation in both the Senate and in the House, across the aisle. We have as good as it gets anywhere in America, and as great an example of that delegation is with us today. Please help me welcome. So I think we've had maybe three or four patients pass away in the last four days. How are you dealing with those deaths? It's really hard. Um, I'm not sure if I'm really dealing with them yet. You know, uh, it's, it's challenging. There's really not enough time in the day to really, really think about and reflect about the deaths, which is tough for sure. Savoring the little victories. I was able to get my patient an iPhone charger, so we are charging her phone now. Hopefully she'll be able to FaceTime with her family in the next couple of hours. Um, which will be really nice for them. At New York Presbyterian, Peter Novak is researching patient data. Associated effort that Americans have undertaken against a common enemy in certainly in, in my lifetime. And despite all of the things that we may still be arguing about, the overwhelming majority of Americans and the overwhelming majority of New Jerseyans believe that we are doing the right thing. The overwhelming majority have been willing to make great personal sacrifices over the last few weeks to make sure that their families, their neighbors, and their communities are healthy. When I hear from folks in my district, um, of course they want to see the economy reopen, but they are not looking for a date. They are looking for a plan, a plan like the one that you just laid out here today, Governor. They, they understand that the reopening is not something that a governor can make happen by waving a magic wand. It can only happen when all of us have the confidence to step out and go out to a restaurant, to go back to work, to go back to a mall. It's not one person making a decision. It has to be based on a plan that's based on science and on sound public health advice. And that's what we are working on here together today. Our job, our fe your federal partners, our job is to make sure that as we make these sacrifices as a state and as individual New Jerseyans, there are resources that make it economically possible for us to do this. That's what we've been working on through the CARES One Act, which we passed several weeks ago, and then several days ago with what we called an interim package. Interim because we know we need to do much more. Now here's the good news. The good news is that today, the Paycheck Protection Program, this vital lifeline for our small business owners in New Jersey and around the country is back in business. So for all of those small business owners who have been trying to hold on, who were frustrated in the first couple of weeks of this program because the banks were not returning your calls, because the loans were not coming through, that program is back in business today. So all of those who had applications in and who were waiting, I hope that over the next few days, you will hear good news. And if you don't and you still have frustrations and you live in my district, please call my office. We will call the banks for you. We will try to see what's going on. And I'm sure every member of our, of our federal delegation, congressional delegation, will 
do the same. Now, there's a lot more we need to do to fix that program. Um, one thing that we did in the bill that we just passed was to set aside a large share of the money for our smaller community-based banks and credit unions, banks that make a habit of dealing with the smallest businesses in our community. We've all seen the frustrating, infuriating stories about larger publicly traded companies that did not need this money, that got in the front of the line, and unfortunately the banks favored their existing loan customers. That is not what we intended, that is not what the bill said, but that is unfortunately what happened. So we are setting aside more of the money for small businesses. Unfortunately, we still have a frustrating refusal on the part of the administration and the Senate to fix the eligibility criteria for that program, and we're gonna have to deal with that in the next bill that we pass. The other issue that we have been working on, and this has also been intensely frustrating over the last couple of weeks, is the need to get relief for our state governments, including our state government in New Jersey and for our local and county government. In the first CARES bill, we approved a fund of $150 billion for our state and local governments. And we did this because we understood not only that states would be taking on new expenses to fight this disease, but that they would be seeing a dramatic loss in revenue for obvious reasons, because the economy is virtually shut down. We absolutely intended this money to be helpful to the states that are dealing with this loss of revenue. We felt that we had an explicit commitment from the Trump administration that that would be the case. Unfortunately, it has not been the case because the state of New Jersey and all other states have received guidance telling them for some reason that they cannot use this money to compensate for lost revenues due to the COVID-19 epidemic. I was on the phone last night with Speaker Pelosi talking about this very issue. She felt as if we had uh, had a commitment that was betrayed, um, and we are going to go back as often it takes to the Trump administration to make sure that that first $150 billion is freed up. Right now, as I think we've heard from the governor, a lot of that money is not usable by the states um, and other local entities that, um, that qualified for it. Um, the second thing we need to do is to enhance that fund and make sure it's available for governments, whether they are large states or, or small towns. And you've heard how this has gotten partisan in Washington over the last several days. This will be the main issue we are debating in the next CARES bill that we will be introducing in the House of Representatives shortly. We believe this is necessary. We've heard uh, some very divisive rhetoric from Leader McConnell um, in the United S States Senate regarding, um, well, his attitude about what he called a, quote, blue state bailout. It is irresponsible, and in my view, also unsustainable. Irresponsible because, after all, it is states like New Jersey that create the economic wealth of the United States, including by paying for most of the things that states like Kentucky and Tennessee and Alabama and Indiana do to take care of their people in education and in health. We get in New Jersey 90 cents back from the federal government for every dollar that we pay in taxes. The average resident of Kentucky gets $2.41 back. It is outrageous to suggest that somehow we are asking for a bailout. It's responsible because if we end up, and if states and local governments end up having to lay off, teachers and firefighters and police officers and other state and local employees, guess what happens? They collect unemployment. Guess who pays? The federal government. For businesses, we have set up a plan deliberately to encourage continued employment. We don't want people to go on unemployment. Why should it not be the same for state and local government employees? And finally, it is unsustainable because we are not just talking about employees of states. We're talking about state and local government down to the township level in the United States of America. I represent a district, the seventh district in New Jersey, that has not one single town with more than 50,000 people in it. Every single one of my towns is hurting right now. Every single one is seeing tax revenue dry up. Every single one is debating how long they can continue 
to pay those school teachers, those cops, and those firefighters. This is about the survival of small town America. And at the end of the day, I'm not sure if Mitch McConnell wants to be the person who is responsible for telling small town America to go to hell. That's what he's doing right now. Well, in my district today, we are gonna be releasing a letter that's gonna be signed that right now we have 45 or 50 mayors and freeholders. About half of them are Republicans to our congressional leadership saying, please approve this relief money. It is not a bailout. It is to enable state and local government in the United States of America to exist through this crisis. And I think that is a bipartisan call that you are going to see coming from state governments, county governments, local governments from across this country. I know a number of my colleagues in the House are generating similar letters. It's gotten partisan in Washington. It is completely nonpartisan in state capitals and in small town America. And we are going to make that argument, and I believe we are going to win that argument in the next bill that passes, the, certainly the House of Representatives, but I believe the next bill that will go to the President for his signature. We owe this to everybody who is making a sacrifice right now, to everybody who has been lost, to everybody who's putting their own self-interest to one side until our community and our state and our country is healthy again. Thank you very much. Tom, thank you for your leadership. Um, to take the, the uh, cents and dollars and turn it into the total numbers uh, consistent with what you've just said, we send uh, over $70 billion more to Washington, the federal government, than we receive. Kentucky gets back almost $150 billion more than they put in. Talk about reading from your own book, right? Yeah, I mean, every state generated as much, um, gave as much as New Jersey. There would be a massive surplus yeah. in the federal budget, not a deficit. So we do need, I just want to reiterate, thank you, Tom, for everything you're doing. And, and you made a point about the mayors and freeholders. This is not a partisan point right now. This is overwhelmingly doing what's right for our state, for our people, for our country. And, and I said what I said last week, I would, I would have said it if, if Mitch McConnell were a Democrat. It's just completely irresponsible. Uh, and just to use this as a, we had a very good uh, call this morning, I thought, with the congressional delegation. Uh, both senators as well as uh, the, the full delegation in the House. And, um, and I repeat now what I've said several times in this room, but also on the call, uh, Senator Bob Menendez in the Senate uh, has got a $500 billion bill co-sponsored by Senator Cassidy, a Republican from Louisiana, which does exactly what Tom is referring to. And there's a chance, it sounds like, that the House may have a bill that is similar, if not even larger. And that's what the doctor ordered right now, right? Yes, that's... Actually, my bill. That's your bill. <laughs> uh, and also bipartisan. So again, the key is we have about 140 co-sponsors, um, a number of Republicans uh, in that list. I think every member is hearing this from their hometowns, from their state governments. This is not partisan back home. It has been made partisan for reasons that are mysterious to me by a few people in Washington, D.C. That is what we will have to overcome over the coming days. Amen. Thank you again for that and for everything, Tom. It is a real treat to have my partner in government back with us today. Um, she has been extraordinary, uh, as always, particularly in this crisis, not just as lieutenant governor, but also in running the Department of Community Affairs, which, which touches every, speaking of small towns, touches every single one of them in every corner of this state, and would love to ask uh, her to say a few words. Please help me welcome the lieutenant governor of the great state of New Jersey the one, the only, the singular, Sheila Oliver. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Um, you know, I think that uh, you and Congressman Malinowski hit the nail on the head. Um, we have to prioritize health, public health. And I think, Governor, the road back is reflective of the sentiment of the people of New Jersey. Um, in a very short period of time, uh, the, our, our people in New Jersey have had to learn with intensity about a disease no one ever knew existed. And in a short period of time, as we have seen what has happened in our part of the uh, Northeast Corridor, 
New Jersey being number two behind the state of New York in the number of people who have become infected and the number of people who have been hospitalized and the number of people that we have lost. I think that uh, New Jerseyans understand we cannot just tomorrow flip a switch and go back to life as normal. Uh, life is not going to be normal uh, pre-COVID-19. And I think that if you travel around the state, if you go into the various counties, if you visit some of the cities, you will see that people already are beginning to reorient themselves and focus on health. Um, you know, for those of you that have uh, elder grandmothers or you remember some of your elder uncles and aunts, they always told you when you were young, if you don't have health, you don't have anything. I think the road back is very measured. I think it is tempering and it is combining the needs of getting our economy, our economy back on track, but at the same time, prioritizing health, wellness, and sustaining life in this state. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. At the Department of Community Affairs, we deal with all 565 municipalities. We have been on the phones constantly in the past month and a half with mayors, with city council people, um, with freeholders, with uh, people who chair various boards and authorities across the state. And I think that what has been shown uh, through the leadership of the governor, it has created a real unity between and amongst people from one state to the other, from one end of the state to the other. And Congressman Malinowski pointed out the divisiveness that you see on Capitol Hill in Washington. Uh, we are not seeing that in the state of New Jersey. I think that this shared experience, COVID knows no neighborhood, it knows no zip code, it knows no socioeconomic status. And I think it has snapped us back into reality in this state about the role of government, what government can do in the lives of people. And uh, Governor, I just want to tell you that our mayors and our local elected officials are pleased with the leadership you have brought to this experience that we are having and could not be more pleased that you are taking the deliberate steps that you are taking. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you for everything you're doing. And you look at what we've got in terms of rental relief and folks dealing with mortgages and evictions and whatnot. So much of that runs through the Department of Community Affairs. I can't thank you enough. You've You've never, uh, you've been working morning, noon, and night, and you've been an extraordinary partner uh, in, in, as a, in peacetime and now in war. So bless you and thank you. You, you, you make a fair point. I was actually, I didn't agree with uh, everything he stood for by a long shot, but I always admired Ronald Reagan as a guy who could seize the moment. But I, I got to call him out on this. When he, when he said government is not the answer, government is the problem, that is not the case today, uh, with all due respect to the president. Uh, we need government now more than ever before, and we're reminded in this awful tragedy of the role that's indispensable that government can play. Uh, and our job is to deliver as much of that cons as consistently and as comprehensively as possible. And back to Tom's point, we can't do that without the back and fill of a lot of federal money to allow us to continue to deliver for our residents. Sheila, thank you for everything. Um, I'm, I'm not used to having Judy Persichelli so far from me. Uh, after two months, I feel like we're always cheek to jowl, as they say. But please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor and Lieutenant Governor Congressman Malinowski. Um, as the Governor shared, our hospitals reported 6,407 hospitalizations, uh, of which 1,801 uh, individuals uh, are in critical care and 70 per, 72 percent of those individuals are on ventilators. 
uh, we're actually seeing slight decline in our hospitalizations in the northern part of the state and a flattening in the central part of the state uh, and a slight uptick in the southern part of the state. Uh, last evening, there were five hospitals uh, that were on divert for portions of the evening and night. Three of them were from central New Jersey, uh, two of them uh, from uh, North Jersey, none from the south. Uh, today, we're reporting 2,146 new cases from 10 p.m. Uh, last uh, evening. Um, I just want to remind you that means it's not comparable to what we've been reporting in the past as we try to collect this data in the morning. Uh, but the hospital data is from 10 p.m. the night before. So uh, uh, combining that uh, seems to make a little bit um, more uh, sense at this point. Um, Along with the governor, we're, we, we at the Department of Health are sad to report 106 uh, new uh, deaths for a total of 6,044 fatalities in, in our state. Uh, the breakdown of deaths by race and ethnicity is as follows. White, 53.2%. Black, 20.3%. Hispanic, 16.3%. Asian, 5.1% and other 5%. We have also uh, looked at hospital discharge destination. That's been a question at uh, some of our prior conferences. A sample of 773 cases reveals that 24.7% of those cases were discharged to a skilled nursing facility, 3% to a rehab facility, 1.8% to hospice, 10.8% are among individuals who have expired, 0.9% left against medical advice, 2.98% were discharged to another facility type, and 50.32% were discharged home. There are 476 long-term care facilities in the state now reporting uh, cases of COVID-19 for a total of over 16,277 cases in our long-term facilities. The state's veterans' homes are now reporting 263 residents positive, and sadly, 97 residents have expired from their total census of 714. Our state psychiatric hospitals uh, are reporting 152 patients have tested positive, and they have reported nine deaths, and that has stayed steady for the last number of days. Our field medical stations have treated a total of 346 individuals and have discharged 270 of them. According to lab data from this morning of the lab sending us their COVID-19 results, 204,651 individuals have been tested with 88,064 testing positive for a positivity rate of 43%. That ends my report. Stay connected, stay safe, and stay healthy. Thank you. Judy, thank you. The positivity rate, just for folks watching at home who may be watching maybe just today or others who have been watching every day, that has slowly begun to drift down over the past week. Um, uh, either you or Ed, any, any color on that particular trend, uh, which I assume is a positive one. Uh, Ed, do you have a mic on you or not? You do. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's definitely a positive trend. As you've mentioned, we're seeing these positivity rates gradually decline, and what you've been talking about here is our cumulative positivity rates, which means you're having hundreds of thousands of tests. It takes a long time to move that gradually down. We also look at the positivity rates on any given day, meaning daily over time, and that moves faster, as well as we do some additional looking at the different uh, areas in New Jersey to see what's happening. You know, so for example, at its peak in Bergen County, about 60% of all their tests were coming up positive. At this point, they're down to about 30% or so of all yep. their tests becoming positive. So that's a, a huge difference as far as that goes. As the commissioner mentioned, we are seeing some increases in the south, uh, but overall the state is definitely trending in the right way when it comes to those positivity numbers. 
Sorry to make you get un, uh, unmasked there. Um, so that's an important point for folks who may have missed that. It's not just that the number cumulatively is trending down, but the snapshots of recent moments is meaningfully down from peaks. Uh, and that's a sort of, that's on the list of trends that we're going to be watching very carefully to get back to the, where that road, of, road to recovery goes. Counties, uh, uh, Judy, staying the, the same in terms of the positive test results. These still, these six counties still overwhelmingly have the highest concentration. Uh, there's positive test results and sadly fatalities in all 21 counties. But in order, Bergen, Hudson, Essex, Union, Passaic, and Middlesex continue to have the big bulk of them. The racial data is consistent and troubling uh, as it has been since we've been reporting it. And I, for one, was encouraged that 50 plus percent of people are walking out of the hospital and going home, uh, which, is a, uh, which is another uh, data point that I think we can take some comfort in. The folks who are beating this, at least in 50 percent of the cases, are beating it so much so that they can go home. And in some cases, uh, I'm sure with a visiting physical therapist or a, a visiting nurse, but the fact of the matter is they're going home. So thank you to each of you for that. Pat, um, I, I said I wouldn't necessarily call on you just because our program is so thick and we got a lot of reporters here. And by the way, folks, we're going to start over here, but I'm going to ask you to limit your questions to one or two at most just because we got a big crowd and we have to go to the White House uh, virtually. Talk, if you could, Pat, off subject, but importantly, one of your guys was shot last night and just give us a quick sense of how he's doing. He's doing well, Governor. I, I had the ability to talk to him this morning. Uh, he'll probably be in there for a week or so. Uh, very lucky. Uh, the investigation is ongoing, and the Attorney General and I plan to uh, stream live tomorrow morning from The Rock the details of what we've found so far. So uh, I, to everybody who's reached out to both him and his family, uh, greatly appreciated, um, and he's doing well. I, I spoke, I, I, uh, Pat let, let us know uh, late, or I guess early Saturday morning, that this had transpired. I had the honor on Sunday morning, so yesterday, to speak not just with Pat, but with his mom. Not your mom, but the trooper's mom. Uh, and I don't want to get him engaged inadvertently. Was it his girlfriend? Or it was his say? girlfriend. His girlfriend, so I don't want to jump the gun there. But any <laughs> any event, as you can imagine, it was a pretty traumatic, uh, and it sounds like he's lucky, a lucky guy and a great guy. I'm going to speak to him later on this afternoon, and I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, thanks to everybody who is uh, up here with me. We're going to start over here. And again, I'd ask you to keep, uh, as a favor today, to keep it fairly short. Nikita. Um, I might not be able to grant you that favor. Uh, so we reported this weekend that some mail-in ballots uh, delivered to apartment buildings are simply being left in the lobbies and not actually delivered to mailboxes or voters' doors. Uh, do you have any plans to address these issues with the Postal Service? Do you have any concerns? that uh, ballots for tenants living, uh, the majority of whom live in apartment buildings as opposed to single family homes are being treated differently in this regard. Do you have any concerns about uh, the all VBM elections in May being compromised by this sort of activity? And do you have any concerns about voter fraud given that large numbers of ballots are being left in public places? One more, please. Uh, sure, and then I have one more for me, and then I'll, I also have one, one for One more, AP. please. Uh, any timeline on July 7 and all VBM, and is that still on the table? Um, I, I don't have, given the gravity of what we're talking about, I don't, I don't have uh, crisp answers uh, uh, for you. I, I will get my and let's get the team to follow up with you on the mail-in ballots being left in lobbies. I actually didn't see that story. That's obviously not what we want. Uh, we want, you know, w while we're fighting this war, democracy, uh, and other things have to go on, so we take that very seriously, but it's, I, I, I'll have to, have to come back to you. There's no update on July 7th, and we'll give you an update, I promise you, as soon as we get it. Thank you, though. Please. Hi. Um, I was curious, the, the long-term care facility numbers, I know there had been a reconciliation going on with those. Do those that we see on the dashboard now include only residents or still residents and staff? And then... Um, Governor, all of the benchmarks and, and kind of goals and ideas that you mentioned today, can you give us any insight into your priorities on what industries or business might come back online first and any best guess on time frame for this? And just one more, um, I know there's a priority on testing vulnerable populations. What's the plan for prisons? As far as I know, there's no testing being done in the facilities now. Um, 
So I wonder if we'll see any of that before people are released back to their homes. Can you okay. Uh, Judy, I'll start and maybe ask you to come in um, behind that. Um, I think, could you pull up, Mahan, the, 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 uh, the risk, low risk uh, chart? Yeah, so I, I, I think you should probably assume that we will, this is not up here just for our health, but this is something that will, will guide us. I think it's a mistake that we would, and I want to caution folks, uh, don't expect a, for you accountants out there, don't expect a LIFO strategy here. Uh, in other words, last in, first out. In other words, a reversal of what we did. Um, that's not necessarily going to be, it might be, but it won't necessarily be consistent um, with, uh, with what we would do. Uh, but it's going to be the workplaces uh, and other venues where we can be, we have a high degree of confidence that social distancing and other related norms can be effectively executed. So, and uh, by the way, I, I love music, I love going to concerts, Concerts are, 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 are not going to be any time soon, as an example, where there's a high, high amount of de density, meaning the risk is high. You, you, you're up in that, low, you're, you're in that lower right-hand corner. Uh, you're in the lower right-hand corner uh, where it's high risk. And uh, I love music, so don't take this the wrong way, but it's not essential. The stuff we want to have is the essential stuff coming back online, uh, food chain, other essential elements where we can... Uh, properly and folks can properly adjudicate and, 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 and also defend and, and exhibit that they're actually social distancing, mask policies. Again, I'm a big mask. I've become a big mask uh, person. Um, I hope I, I've, I've gotten pinged even just sitting here. Uh, respectfully, I might add, I, I, I love the, the level of respect, but I hope sooner than later, uh, assuming folks can do it right, we can get to things like parks. Um, which some would say is non-essential. I would say for mental health and other reasons, there's another set of arguments that we're hearing all the time that they are essential, and we respect, we respect that, but with, it's got to be done the right way. Um, with that, uh, I believe we are testing in prisons, by the way. Uh, that, I don't think the premise of that last question is accurate. Is that right? Well, we're implementing a plan to test everyone who's being furloughed pursuant to your executive order, and with the commissioner, we're working on a broader plan for the prison population and staff. I think that's going to be on the list, so uh, I'm confusing the folks who may be considered for furlough with the, fo the, the overall population. Uh, I, I mentioned vulnerable communities, and that certainly is going to be on the list of priorities. Judy, anything on that as well as uh, on recon reconciling long-term care numbers? The long-term care numbers are still being reconciled. We hope to finish that by the end of the week. Um, so some of it is clean. Some of it still has uh, uh, employees and uh, residents. And vulnerable populations, uh, we, do d we do determine uh, that corrections uh, is on that list. Um, and um, we have a testing strategy task force. We're looking at uh, refining the definition of vulnerable populations and also priority populations. Thank you. you. You guys, either of you gentlemen know? Ma'am, hold on one sec. Hi. Uh, on the reopening plan, as you make decisions about what's going to reopen when, will that apply to the state across the board, or will it be a decision made county by county or region by region, since, as several people mentioned, there are different situations in north, central, and south um, for, for uh various measures. And also, uh, yesterday there was an outage in the unemployment site. Online applications were down. Uh, from what I understand, it is back up. But can you address what the problem was and if anything's being done to prevent that outage from happening again? Um, I realize I didn't, you asked me about when. I, I don't know when. I think it's measured in weeks. But that assumes that everybody is doing their job. And so everybody, folks, the, the most, if, if you want to get back to some semblance of normal, the most important thing you can do right now is to keep doing what you're doing. Stay at home, stay away from each other. That is job number one and the extent to which that is that continues to, to succeed, it allows us to start going down that road. Um, too early to tell on, on regional versus, uh, uh, versus statewide. I've used this example before, um, but I, it, it must be uh, referred to again because it's a good example. Some counties have said, hey, wait a minute, 
uh, we're less dense, we have um, fewer people, uh, fewer visitors normally to our parks. Uh, here's the problem, and this is, you know, unintended consequences here are very much in our mind, that that may be true, but the minute you open up two or three parks, uh, either a county park or a state park in those counties, you get the rest of the counties, if not the rest of the region, showing up on a good weather weekend day in particular in those parks. And that scared the heck out of us. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I think it was on April 4th and 5th, if my memory serves me, uh, that it was the first warm weather weekend. And we surveyed with Pat and his folks and the uh, park police surveyed the parks and they had congregations and a lot of out-of-state plates. So now having said that, I mentioned this uh, within the past couple of days, we have had successful regional steps taken, the most important of which is Judy's regionalizing the healthcare realities into the north, central, and south. And that's been hugely effective um, as we built out capacity, as we realized we needed to move assets around, whether they be ventilators or beds or even hospitals on divert and they had to move patients. Uh, that worked really well. So I would, I would never say never, uh, but my bias will, tr will be leaning toward making state decisions, statewide decisions, unless we see a real unique reason to do otherwise, or unless we see a really bifurcated reality uh, in terms of the virus and, and its impact on the state. I can't, re did I answer your questions, I, th I think? Yeah. Unemployment had crashed, I don't, I don't know why it crashed, uh, but it did crash and it was back up, I was told at 6 p.m. last night. Um, and so they're still chopping through, and I know folks out there are frustrated. I don't blame you. Uh, we had this conversation on the call with Tom and his colleagues this morning. Uh, this, will make, this will not make anyone feel any better, uh, but we are leagues ahead of virtually every other state, but there's still a backlog. I know folks are still frustrated. You won't lose one penny, I promise you, including of your federal plus up. Thank you for that. We'll come down to Matt in the front here, Matt. So thank you, Governor. I understand your apprehension about wanting to give a date, um, but it appears in some of the stuff that you laid out, you talked about testing doubling maybe by the end of May. Uh, it looks like some of those other measures that you implemented could take a couple of weeks or additional months. I'm just curious how you square that then maybe with things like opening up schools possibly in the middle of May um, and, and maybe just some sort of clarity if there's any light at the end of the tunnel for New Jerseyans. Uh, on unemployment, gov curious, when will unemployment system be able to handle gig workers and self-employers? And also, if you can give an update on the, the number of backlog, backlog at uh, the Department of Labor for Unemployment Claims. And okay. just lastly, um, you know, why can't more businesses, there's another question from readers, why can't more businesses that consider non-essential open for curbside and delivery and things like that? Is that something that you can, um, would you consider expanding the, the sort of uh, businesses that can be open or closed at this time? Do you have an, an example? Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Okay. But I mean, just, you know, like basically, I guess, uh, you know, if, if it's a store that might sell like a equipment, farm okay. equipment or something like that. Um, some of this I don't have, uh, and we'll get you the, what the backlog looks like, but I was told the backlog this morning, I think, is back to what they have, uh, have normally been dealing with pre-crisis. Did you hear the same thing, Matt? Yeah. Uh, but we'll get you more information on the backlog. Mahan, help me out here. Backlog, uh, where it stands today on unemployment, as well as specifics on gig workers and self-employed. And those were the independent contractors you you rightfully raise was a particular challenge. Um, so we'll come back to you. Uh, yeah, I think this is weeks. I'm not sure it's months, Matt. If, if, and and, I, and um, I don't want to be accused of not giving light at the end of the tunnel. I think we've been very clear on both sides, and I think we have to continue to be clear on both sides. You have to continue to stay home until we say otherwise. I know it's frustrating. I know it's the, as the weather someday will get better uh, is going to really get to folks, and I get that completely, uh, but it's working, and this is the number one weapon we have in this fight, uh, but it is working. So you could say both of those things. You could see the hospitalization numbers. They are coming down. We have to continue to see them coming down. Um, and, and, and so uh, I, I'd love to say uh, that it's tomorrow, but I don't want folks, it isn't, but I also don't want folks to lose their hope because we're winning this and we will get through this. Sadly, not without casualty, but we will get through this. Um, but I think it's a number of weeks, uh, and, I, and I mean that. I've, I've, I've sort of led the witness. I mentioned that we, 
we believe we'll be able to at least double our testing by the end of May. So that's basically five weeks from now um, to, to, put a, to put that on it. Um, so I, I'll, I would not say it's a number of months, but I also would remind folks that these viruses come back, even if we do it exactly right. Judy and Ed will tell us they come back, uh, no matter how good we might be. Nothing new on schools. We'll promise an answer by May 15th, and we will abide by that. Uh, and that's, that's, where I, that's where I'd be on all that. Thank you for that. We'll come back to you on the unemployment insurance as well as the gig and the, uh, and the uh, self-employed. Real quick. Because the other day we heard that the Rutgers, Rutgers spit testing, we were talking about 10,000 maybe in a week or two. How, how did this change to double the testing capacity now to the end of May? It, it, it seemed like that was... Yeah, because it, there, there's, different, there's different parts of the food chain. There's the actual testing materials you need, depending on which test you're doing. Uh, if it's a viral test, you still need the healthcare worker and the PPE. Uh, how quick is the turnaround? Uh, the reagents? Uh, so the answer is, you know, I I'm also not going to overpromise and underdeliver. How's that? Uh, maybe that helps square it. Thank you, sir. Two for you, Governor. Uh, people want to know why there is no response from your phone number. They're saying it's either busy or the voicemail is full. And also, you stated that testing will be doubled by the end of May, but current tests are hitting a rough ceiling of 3,000 to 4,000 over the last two weeks. Are you concerned that current testing presents an incomplete picture of the outbreak in New Jersey, and how do you know that anything other than extensive asymptomatic testing will give you the data that you need? I have no I idea what your, the answer to your question about my phone is, is, is ringing busy. I, I, Th this phone, by the way, is literally, as I sit here, exploding. Uh, so um, I don't know. I can't give you a good answer on that. Uh, I, but e if I feel like certain days, every 9 million folks in New Jersey have my number. So I've got a little bit of an opposite feel. And I welcome that, by the way. Um, I'll let Ed and Judy answer the latter. But I don't think three or 4,000 is the number that we're looking at. We, we were, I think, Ed, you had said we were seven to 9,000. And that was two weeks ago. And we're up from there. Um, there may be a question of when they're being, how long it's taking to process them. Remember, we've said two things about testing. We need a lot more of it, and we need a, a rapid response, because otherwise, what good is it if we think we've eliminated community spread? Uh, I come in from out of state, I test positive, but I don't know that for a week. Uh, what good is it? At that point, the cat's, you know, the horse is out of the barn. So, um, but the question, Ed, in particular, um, uh, how do you address the question of how, do you, uh, uh, how comfortable can we, how confident we, can we be in the absence of complete asymptomatic testing of asymptomatic folks around the state? Yes, uh, again, in a perfect world, we'd essentially test everybody to know exactly what was happening, and we all know that that isn't possible. Uh, yes, our tests are increasing, not decreasing. We talked a couple weeks ago at about seven to 9,000 tests, and now I'd say we're probably about 2,000 tests or so more over that every day on average. So we're probably in the nine to 11,000, but don't quote me on, a, on an exact number. It does vary from day to day. Uh, part of what happens when you're talking about trying to get a sense of what's happening in, in a broader population, in an asymptomatic population, or to know what's happened in the past, then you're talking not only about the test to detect the virus, which is the um, nasal swab or, or the spit test or so forth. Then you begin talking about doing the blood test to look for the antibodies to get a sense about what's happened in the population in, in a broader sense. And we are moving forward together with Rutgers to do some of that testing to get a sense about what's been happening in, in uh, broader swaths of, of New Jersey as well. So while our picture will never be completely complete, we'll never have as much information as we absolutely want, we're definitely working more and more towards that picture every day. I'm going to say as a non-medical professional, and then do you have a question in the back, sir? We'll go to the back there. As a non-medical professional, I would say I'm going to predict the following. Never mind the, the end of May, in which we've put a marker out in terms of when we believe we will at least be able to double based on all the conversations that I'm a part of and our team's a part of, I think we will be in a dramatically different place as a state and perhaps as a country on testing three months from now. I'm just going to pick that number. Uh, there's, there's just so much happening right now, and a lot of it, I'm happy to say, is happening right here in New Jersey. You mentioned Rutgers. That's the best example, but it's not the only example. The fact that we're a big healthcare 
biopharmaceutical state with great institutions of higher education. Uh, boy, is that coming home to roost for us right now, and that's a good thing. Sir. Good afternoon, Governor. Bill Andrews, New Jersey News Network. Uh, really quick, uh, as of today, how would you envision Memorial Day moving forward? And your thoughts on out-of-state residents taking advantage of Jersey Shore rentals and going back and forth in this climate? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I've got a crisp answer for you on Memorial Day. I know what it normally is, and I love it, and I hope it can be some some form of that. Um, that is, uh, you know, it starts in, in uh, Memorial Day is what, five weeks, four weeks, pardon me, from today. Um, I, I can't give you a, a full answer. I, I hope, as I've said many times, that we have some semblance of norm uh, on the shore this summer, but it will be some semblance. It, 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 I just don't envision being in tight spaces uh, without real restrictions on capacity and social distancing, and frankly, even on, on, on the beach. I just don't see it. Whether or not we're at a better place four weeks from today, I sure as heck hope we are. Um, I think there's a shot. I, I think we've got a shot. If, again, if everybody keeps doing what they're doing, if we let our guard down, all bets are off. That, that heat map, which we didn't show you today just because we had a lot of slides, well, Mahan, let's get that back up tomorrow. Um, that map, that map has shown largely really good progress, but it slipped the past couple of days. There was a Washington Post heat map over the weekend that showed that we had slipped a hair, uh, a, a hair. We cannot let that happen. And the extent to which folks keep doing what they're doing, to put it in the positive, we increase our, our chances meaningfully of getting that, that semblance of norm on the shore sooner than later, and I ho I will, I'll be the happiest guy in Jersey, if not America, if that semblance of norm comes in uh, by Memorial Day. I, I worry about out-of-state stuff, and I'm, I, I, we're, I, I want us to be open for business. Um, the good news is folks who travel to New Jersey uh, on the shore and rent uh, or even own a second home are overwhelmingly either New Jerseyans or from the region. There are some folks who come from outside the region for sure, uh, and in a normal time, I'd want more of them. Uh, but, but for this time, for this purposes at least, they tend to be in the region. My word at this moment, sitting here on April uh, whatever it is, is, however, we want folks to be in their primary residence. The, the shore community, particularly in the off-season, does not have the health care infrastructure to support the challenges that this virus has uh, put upon us. So I would hope that folks continue to adhere to that. Whether or not we're four weeks from now we're in a some kind of a more normal reality where folks can continue to do, again, particularly if they may be coming from the region that is consistent with the, the, the seven state council that we've established, where while we're not doing things exactly alike, we're doing things broadly in a similar fashion, that would give some comfort, but for the time being at least, we need folks to stay in their primary homes. Thank you, and I promise you we'll update as we have something. Sir, I didn't recognize you there. I think you got a different. Hairdo inspired by you. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for the <laughs> uh, Governor. I hope you're inspired by someone else's cut other than mine, but thank you. Uh, Governor, any reaction to Mayor Fulop opening up uh, some of Jersey City's parks? And uh, can you give us an update on New Jersey's uh, furloughing of prisoners? Uh, how many are planned to be released? When do we have a timeline for their release? Uh, and why furlough and not commute sentences as other states have done in the region? Uh, and can you clarify what's included in the total number of cases, uh, Judy? Um, is that, that's done by county, but do we know if that's more in healthcare or in the general public? Total number of positive cases, so, so the 111,180, okay. Judy, you come back to that. Um, um, Matt's gonna get, come on center stage here and join me, but um, we had an exchange earlier today. Uh, 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 we gave mayors the ability to manage their own parks, openings and closings, so that was the case from the outset. I just needed to confirm with Matt, and in fact was the case that it wasn't a county park or a state park. Um, I would say this, we're okay with that, assuming, assuming, and this is a big assumption, that social distancing, masks, 
all of that's being enforced. So I can't say for sure because I haven't seen it with my own eyes or photographs, but that's something that I'm sure the mayor is paying attention to. He's a, he's a ter terrific mayor. We just need him to do that and, and need to enforce that. Um, uh, Matt, on both furloughing prisons, prisoners, pardon me, where do we stand and why furlough versus commutation? Do you mind hitting both of those? Uh, sure. The commissioner uh, has approved, I don't have the exact number, but it's more than 50 furloughs through the weekend. He's approving them on a rolling basis each day. Uh, these started with the list of um, uh, prisoners who are both over 60 and have underlying medical condition. He's now working through a list of people who are either over 60 or have an underlying medical condition, as well as the list of uh, parolees who are approved for parole but haven't hit their parole date yet. Um, uh, with respect to why furlough and not commutation, the furlough is a uh, process that is in statute for the commissioner. Um, it is uh, on, for medical, it, it's a medical furlough process. Um, it, 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 we felt it was a better way to go in part because it kept them under DOC custody, um, given that if the pandemic abates, uh, these are folks who will be coming back in. Um, as opposed to a commutation, given the time period and the number of people we had to review the number of files we would have to do for a commutation, it just wasn't practical. Judy, do you mind addressing the question of what, what, what do the total cases include? Thank the you. total cases are those that are reported directly into the communicable disease uh, service system, either directly from the labs or also from the local health departments. for us to tell whether it's the general populace seeing less cases or it's healthcare workers being more likely to be infected. Anything we can delve from the data or no? Uh, I don't think so. Ed, do you? It's, um... I'll give you while Ed's getting his mask off. I think the least reliable trend line, even though we like it when it flattens, is this one, the positive test results, because of the fact, it, it, we've said this now for weeks, it does not reflect the denominator. We just know that. We don't know what the denominator is. I don't think anyone does, anyone in the country or pr pr probably in the world, but we know that number does not reflect it. It is a proxy, and that's why we pay attention to it. But I, beyond that, Ed, any other, anything else you want to add? No, well, we certainly know that far too many healthcare workers are becoming infected, and that is certainly great concern for, for a lot of different reasons. There's no easy way for us to tease out the information since this is largely self reported until an investigation happens, and with so many cases, investigations take a long time. So I there cannot reliably tell you how many, what percentage of those reports coming in are from healthcare workers or not. May I say one other thing? The number associated with that, which we hit earlier, that I think does matter, and again, I'm practicing without a license, is the positivity rate. Not just the cumulative positivity rate, but Ed's point earlier that I think you said in Bergen County, the most recent data is 30% positive. That's down half from uh, what it was. That does matter. Um, and remember, we, we've, this is not entirely a symptomatic universe, but it's overwhelmingly a symptomatic universe, which means by definition, it's sicker than the average person in the population. There's kind of a murderer's row here, so we're going to start down front here with Dave, and, uh, and, and if you could, if you guys could go quickly through it, would be great. Sure, Governor. Hi. Hi. Um, so as the weather starts to get better, you've mentioned this, and we had one nice weekend day. Um, are you concerned that it's going to get harder and harder to continue to really encourage people to uh, stay away from each other and stay home? I noticed myself that the social distancing fatigue seems to be now kicking in. I saw uh, somebody in a supermarket, they had a mask on, but it was under their chin. And I mentioned something and I was told, well, we're all gonna die at some point. So there seems to be a little bit of fatigue generally in the population that is starting. Are you concerned about that? And my second and last question is with regards to the road back, you have the um, principle number one here demonstrate sustained reductions in new COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations. Obviously, the hospitalizations is important, but as Ed has just mentioned and others as well, we keep increasing the number of tests we're doing and they're only for positive people with symptoms. So obviously, it would seem that number is going to continue to rise. So how can we really use that 
as a metric to try to measure this? Yeah, we, we expected that question, it's a good one, and we discussed it earlier, and Judy can tackle it, and Ed can come in uh, behind. Again, I'm going to hang my hat on the positivity rates associated with those positive uh, tests. Uh, I am worried about fatigue, 100%, particularly with better weather, which it looks like this week we won't have a whole lot of. Um, and at one level, Sheila and I and the rest of us completely appreciate and understand it. There's just no, there's no, um, there's no other way to put it. I mean, folks have been incredibly compliant. They've stayed inside. They've stayed at home. They've either worked from home or they've uh, schooled from home. Uh, you look at the polling results, you've got an overwhelming amount of people who actually believe in what they're doing, by definition, many of whom have lost their job, which makes it even more remarkable. Um, and so it, it's been an extraordinary show of force and, and teamwork by uh, oh, the overwhelming nine million of us, but fatigue does concern us. Having said that, on the other side of the coin, we know what human nature, how, how it impacts the modeling. We know exactly what will happen if folks let their guard down as it relates to infections, hospitalizations, ICU beds, ventilator use, and sadly, fatalities. So while it stinks, and I'll use a PG, Way, a word to describe it, um, the alternative is worse. And I think folks who don't see it that way uh, could run the risk, uh, not just for the rest of us, but for themselves, we'll begin with them, uh, of inadvertently, based on some theory, some myth, inadvertently uh, let their own guard down and therefore let the guard down of the rest of us. We just can't allow that to happen. And so, folks, we get it. We're in a war. There's no other way to put it. We didn't say it would end overnight, and it isn't going to end overnight. I, I do repeat, we're putting, a, we're, we've, we've discussed, however, today, a road back to some sort of normalcy. And that, it's not a question of if that will happen. That will happen. I just can't hang my hat on when. Um, I, I would just say, I, I, at the risk of time and not repeating myself, the positive test case curve is the one that has the, yours truly, the least usefulness because it's not hard numbers, who's hospitalized, who's in an ICU, who's on a ventilator, and sadly, who has passed. Uh, but the positivity uh, of that curve, which has started to drift down to me, and Ed's point, that in, if you do more snapshots, that's a cumulative number, that that is, that is of value. Judy, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, we have a 43% positivity rate for the over 100,000 individuals that have been tested, but remember they were all symptomatic. As we start to uh, increase asymptomatic testing, um, hopefully what we're, what we're expecting is that that rate will come down. And you definitely want it to come down, uh, as the World Health Organization says, to that 10%. The positivity. Yep. So watch that space. Again, largely symptomatic folks so far. That will, if, 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 if I'm right and we're right, as we expand over the next number of weeks, testing capabilities meaningfully, you're going to begin to bring in, whether it's through a testing of a particular community, we discuss prison population or long-term care or health care workers, or in sort of blind, statistically significant testing, we will increasingly have asymmetric asymptomatic people in that process, and that will begin to hopefully change that number dramatically. Thank you. Daniel, welcome back. Nice Hi, to see Governor. you. Nice to see you. Um, what, what in this plan do you expect to differ from the neighboring states, Pennsylvania and New York, um, and what, what do you expect from this plan will be in common with those neighboring states? Um, on quarantine and self-isolation, how is the state going to be enforcing that? Is it going to be sort of a mandatory uh, at one, a central location, or is it going to be an ur being urged to self-isolate at one's residence, as is what's being done now? Um, less, uh, lastly, is there going to be restrictions still coming in, people coming in from elsewhere in the country, states that perhaps rolled back the re restrictions too quickly or didn't have them as expansive in the first place, and there isn't a second outbreak? Okay. Um, 
just real quick on, on relative to our neighboring states, I'd say we want to be largely in harmony, um, but there, th th we, we will never necessarily take every step, step exactly the same way at the same time. In fact, some of these states, if I'm not mistaken, have already made decisions on the balance of the school year, which we have not yet made, so that's one area which may be different. I'll be very surprised if a restaurant in Jersey City has a different protocol than one in the lower west side of Manhattan. Uh, we, we cannot have unintended consequences where you swing things dramatically one way or the other. So that's an example of something I would suspect would be in harmony. I think it's too early on the self-isolation piece, but I think you should, you should assume it, will, it, it would not be necessarily centrally lo located and think, uh, lo think overwhelmingly hotels uh, would be, at least in my mind, again, we're, we're establishing a, a, a commission uh, whose members will be made public tomorrow. They're going to be an extraordinary group of folks. You know, these are decisions that we have to still, working with our team, come to conclusion on. But that will be my guess. Thank you. Up back. Thanks, Governor. Uh, the principles you rolled out today rely on the acquisition of healthcare resources like testing materials and medical personnel for contact tracing that have been hard to come by the last few weeks. In line with Dan's question, how do you maintain harmony in the timing of a regional reopening when the inputs dictating that reopening are variable and being pursued by separate state governments on separate tracks? And then a uh, second question for Commissioner. Uh, principle six is resiliency. I'm just curious what resiliency looks like in the context of long-term care facilities and the department's ability to regulate and oversee those facilities. And what does that look like compared to DOH's current resources for looking after those facilities? May I jump in first, Judy, and then uh, go to you? Um, raw materials, you're absolutely right. Um, you know. We've got, particularly with Rutgers and other private sector players, we have the increasingly the capacity. What's been missing is the supply chain, the actual testing uh, material itself, the reagents, the PPE, if it's a viral test for healthcare workers or others who are taking the test. Um, I wouldn't have said what we've said today unless we had the confidence, we have the confidence right now that we're going to be able to get that solved. Uh, both in New Jersey in working with our regional partners and importantly, you probably heard me say this, with the White House. So the White House is deeply involved uh, in, our, our, in, in, in our conviction to be able to say by the end of May, and that includes all elements of what we would need to get the testing done. I think, let me, let me if I may. Um, uh, secondly, uh, Judy will address long-term care, but let there be no doubt, and I think we'll probably do this long before the commission has done its good work, and I could not be more excited about this group. Um, but we are, we're not waiting for that. Uh, we've already begun processes, and in fact, I think sooner than later, maybe even someday this week, we may be sitting here talking to you about sort of how we're going to see adding new rigor standards, um, uh, policies, and protocols to the long-term care industry as a general matter. Judy, anything you want to add? No, I think that, I mean, the bottom line is the, the situations like this shows the vulnerabilities in uh, systems and uh, what we've uh, identified is that there is very little resiliency uh, in long-term care. Uh, and we need to look at that because the fall will be here before we know it. And we will not only be dealing with the flu season, we may also be dealing with the resurgence of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so way before um, that time comes, we need to uh, shore up uh, long-term care. So we're, we are, again, Judy's taken a whole range of steps already. I don't know it'll be this week, but it, just as today we've devoted um, the, the large part of our comments, other than the overnight numbers and blessed lives lost, to the road to recovery. I think we're going to, you should assume sooner than later, we're going to have a long-term care facility heavy um, a day with you in one of these sessions. Do you have something very quick? I don't want to monopolize, uh, but when you said you're confident with May because you've been talking to your regional partners here, does that include like consortia or consortium buying of those materials? It, uh, to that, the best, because that, that came up a couple of weeks ago. The, yeah, the to list. the best of my knowledge, right now it does not. But okay. but 
but I wouldn't be saying what I'm saying today if we didn't have the confidence. I meant to say this earlier to all our environmental friends who reached out to us over the past few weeks and rightfully complained about plastic water bottles. We agreed with you, and I think landing man on the moon was easier than getting these box waters, but I want the record to show that we got them. Uh, Elise, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What tech companies have con come forward and what are they offering in terms of contact tracing or other expertise? And for the congressman, you indicated that the CARES money can be used for budget purposes. Can you elaborate on that? Tom, I'll jump in on the first and you hit the second. Is that all right? Um, at least we're talking to a handful. Um, uh, uh, Google's on that list, salesforce.com, Bloomberg Philanthropies to pick three, and, and there's more than, more than uh, those three. And I mentioned the ultimate architecture of what contact tracing in New Jersey looks like is going to be some combination, and Judy will, will correct the record if I get this wrong, some combination of boots on the ground and technology. Uh, and I think we could say pretty safely if there's, a, if there's a really good technological match, and by the way, we're the densest state in America, and that's a good thing in this case. It's a bad thing for the virus. It's a good thing uh, as it relates to technology. We'll be more toward that 15 person per 100,000, and if there's not a technology that we think uh, can aid and abet our efforts, it'll be up closer to that 81 per 100,000. Is that fair to say? Tom. Thanks. Uh, the CARES one, the bill that we already passed, uh, provided or intended to provide $150 billion for states and other governments, counties, cities with a population of over 500,000. And it was certainly our intention that this money be available to compensate for revenues lost due to the coronavirus crisis. But the administration has issued guidance completely contrary to that, contrary to what we thought was a commitment that the money would be allowed um, for that purpose. And so what we've heard from the governor and I think other states uh, around the country is that the, the, the money as, as currently offered is largely unusable. It can only be used to cover, um, you know, if, if the state buys PPE, um, that's the, the federal government acknowledges that's coronavirus related, so they allow us to use that money for that purpose, but not to make up for the massive shortfall in revenue that all of these state and local entities are going to be experiencing. So what we want to do in the next bill um, is number one, if we haven't resolved it through guidance, through hammering at the administration to keep their commitment, we want to free up that first $150 billion, that's number one. And number two, we want to provide additional funding, um, not limited um, obviously to states, but not limited to the states and the very large cities but also available for our smaller counties and municipalities, which are hurting in exactly the same way. Tom, if I may add two points to that. Um, I mentioned I had a good conversation with Secretary Mnuchin on Thursday, which is true. We're still working this, right? So what is, what is important, uh, several things that the Congressman just said were important. Number one, no matter what, reven lost revenues do not factor into this, no matter how much progress we've made, no matter how hard we try, in the original CARES Act, that's just not on the table. Uh, and, and, and Tom knows this better than anybody, that the next big bucket has got to include provisions for that. We are making some progress on definition of expenditures, uh, again, not in the end zone yet, and we'll let folks know when we get there. Tom mentioned also buying PPE. Um, now, the good news is uh, that's identifiable, as you rightfully point out. Right now, we've got a, a cost share arrangement with the federal government where they pay 75% of stuff like that. We pay 25%. I want to give Tom a shout out here. We've been pounding the table. I think we were the first state. I'm looking at Matt. I believe we were the first state to ask that that go to 100 zero for the, the, the duration of this, quote unquote, of this duration of this incident. Um, we're not there yet, but I want to thank Tom and his colleagues because they're pounding away on that as well. So when you get to that direct expense, we had to buy ventilators. We, got, we had to buy testing kits for a virus that we didn't uh, know existed until six months ago. Uh, that's something, again, I want to thank you for your help in getting that needle shifted from 75-25. We're not there yet. We need to keep pounding away, and I, I thank your leadership for that. So, at least thank you. Last one, please. 
Thank you, Governor. Um, is there anything that you've picked up from other states, anything you've been looking to copy or maybe avoid in developing this you know, road back plan? And then second, and more specifically, in regards to the new Lisbon uh, Development Built Center, dis it discontinued its ambulance service in 2016, and the mayor of Woodland is reporting that their volunteer EMS is strained given the outbreak at the facility. Is there any consideration at all to, um, for DHS in bringing back their EMS transportation service uh, for this facility? I got no color on the second question. We can follow up with you if you can bear with us on that. Um, on the first, listen, we there are a lot of great role models out there. Um, and so I can't say that we necessarily uh, picked the, one from column A, one from column B. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've tried to come up with something which, again, every step of the way is based on science and data and facts. Um, and that's got to be the way we handle both how we shut it down and how we God willing, recover sooner than later. Um, and so we're, we're money ball on, the, on that front and will continue to be. I'm not sure what other states are necessarily money ball. Mahan has literally reviewed every single one of them. He may be able to give you a little bit more color. Um, I like the broad outlines that Gavin Newsom in California had laid out. Uh, somebody said to me there was a, re a green, yellow, red uh, color scheme from other states. Uh, um, so Listen, we're, we're shameless. If we see a good idea being used somewhere else, we'll, we'll take it uh, for here. But it's also got to be, again, fact-based, but it's got to work for here. So it's got to be something that is not just as general conceptual, at a conceptual level, is a smart element, but it's got to work for us. Um, and so, again, we're the densest state in the nation. Huge reliance on biopharmaceutical um, industry. Uh, a very high-end innovation economy, um, 21 counties with each one of them with positive cases and sadly with fatalities, but very different dimensions. If you compare Essex County, Sheila, to a Salem County, you get a very different dimension, and so you've got to have a plan that, that can encompass that. Um, and so that's, and we'll come back to you on the Woodland question privately, because I don't have, I literally don't know, uh, nothing to add there. So as I remask, I want to thank everybody, beginning with my partner in government, the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of New Jersey, Sheila Oliver, an extraordinary representative of our state in Washington from the 7th District, the guy to my left, Congressman Tom Malinowski, the woman to the far right who needs no introduction, either coming into this room or leaving it, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli, and I want to thank Dr. Ed Lifshitz for being with us as well. Superintendent Colonel Pat Callahan, thank you, and God bless your trooper. Jared and Matt, thank you. So a couple of housekeeping. We'll be here tomorrow almost certainly at 1 p.m., um, and I'll be shocked if that is shifted otherwise, so we'll see you back here. Uh, we will be announcing formally uh, the members of the commission that I alluded to today at tomorrow's event, and uh, it's an extraordinary group. Um, and I would just ask folks, as I do every day, on behalf of Sheila and myself and the rest of our teams, please keep doing what you're doing because it's working. And if folks are looking for hope and light at the end of the tunnel, um, it's in your hands. And so far, New Jersey has performed not just better than average, we were talking about average a month ago, better than any American state. Better than any American state. And the extent to which that continues, that will begin to answer the the very good questions of what's Memorial Day look like? What's the end of the school year look like? When can you open parks? When can you uh, allow any, of, any amount of other decisions to be reassessed? So folks, thank you. Keep up the great work. God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow. If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together.
I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Ah, spring. The time of year when single people shake off the cobwebs of winter, step outside, and hope that love will bloom alongside the cherry trees. Stay home and don't go outside. With many singletons forced to stay inside, dating is looking, well, a lot different these days. Dating apps like Tinder and Bumble have seen usage surge. Conversations on the platforms are up 19 to 26 percent since mid-March. Ileana Valdez, a junior at Yale, co-founded OKZoomer OK in March to give daters a way to meet virtually over video chatting sites like Zoom. In two days, 2,000 people signed up. We're three weeks old, so I can't tell you that anyone's like gotten married off of our platform yet, but I'm hopeful for the future. <laughs> but meeting in person? For that, daters are getting creative. While others are putting their courtships out there for the world to see with the new Instagram-based show, Insta Date Live, hosted by Young Me Mayor and Entreat Tran. There's the blind factor, then there's mm -hmm. the fact that it's live, and you have an audience. Yeah, it definitely like makes people really nervous, I found, which makes a lot of sense. And I feel like first dates in general, they're already pretty nervous. And nervous. Exactly. All these other layers. Yeah. Well, I think that it kind of makes it more fun. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Misha and Michelle were set up last week. So when someone asks you, hey, uh, I need you to go on a date with a stranger and oh, by the way, it's going to be live for an audience. What did you think? Um, of course I was a little bit nervous. It's so sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Tech problems, the stuck in traffic of virtual dating. Do you think that there's a chance that you'll meet Michelle in person? <laughs> She's like three blocks away from me. There's a chance. A socially distant first date, just another new normal for love in the time of coronavirus. Human beings are, are, are very social. We're looking to find people that we vibe with, no matter where you are, what the circumstances are. For today, Savannah Sellers, NBC News, New York. There's good news tonight that you can go home again. Parents reconnecting with their young adult children by reenacting their pasts. It's called I'm Just a Kid Challenge, inspired by the 2002 song by Simple Plan. Families are reenacting old photos on the social media platform TikTok, often with hilarious results. This was then. This is now. An easy balancing act then, a much bigger challenge now. For the Metcalf family outside Atlanta, now with three kids back home, making these new memories has been a blessing. The grocery bill has doubled, of course. But it, it's fun, and it's a great time to kind of reconnect, a great time to bond again talking about things that we probably wouldn't have because we've had like short sessions with them since they all went to college. Reuniting over family activities and making TikTok magic. We had the staircase right there and uh, uh, trying to get everybody to squeeze in tight like they were when we originally took it was a little difficult, but outside of that, uh, a great shot, I think. 
Tom Craig used the time home from Virginia Tech to recreate this snap with his dad 20 years later. Good thing dad still had the same shirt. I just kicked up into a handstand and, and he held me up. It took a couple tries. Yeah. It took a couple tries. No, I never fell on my head. He's pretty strong. A similar challenge for the fully grown Swagger sisters in Pennsylvania. It took like a couple tries. After a couple tries, I think we got it. So it pretty it matched pretty good, I think. Creative ways to pass the pandemic. This has just been a great a great distraction during a, a you know trying time for everybody. And reflect on old memories. Because at the end of the day, no matter how grown up those kids get, for parents, they'll always be just their baby. The coronavirus, um, particularly in the opera world and the classical world, has been devastating. And with the news of this virus and corona, it was suddenly like, oh my gosh. It has forced creative people to get extra creative. As the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing theaters and clubs across the country to close, creatives are figuring out new ways to reach their audiences. From music workshops and yoga classes to improv comedy and shows, artists are taking their talents online. A lot of opera companies are um, non-for-profit and they rely on donations. The virus has stopped all of that. And we, we all, including myself, are all feeling the effects of not getting, you know, paid. In the meantime, Joshua is putting on virtual concerts with his organization, Opera Space, to raise money through donations for artists out of work because of the coronavirus. It's a part of a national fundraiser called the Artist Relief Tree. It became this like beautiful beast and it went from to 10,000 to 25,000 to 100,000 that is raised. They're not the only theater putting shows online. For improv, that's especially tricky because you can't do it without other people. Really quickly, people in the magnet community were like, this isn't going to stop us. Uh, all I need is a face and another person. And technology, uh, fortunately, is, was ready to deliver. Um, we're going to need uh, one of you to tell us the title of tonight's show by clickety-clackety into, into the box. I think the words are over there. Magnet's online shows are free to watch on Twitch, but viewers can donate to the theater by buying virtual tickets. We ended up having a, you know, far, far more people see a single one of our shows than we've ever been able to achieve live. The numbers of the people who are tuning in is just like skyrocketing because I think everyone's just like at home and looking for something positive. Uh, I originally moved to New York to be in the house band uh, for the late show with Stephen Colbert. Now I'm getting into a much more regular live streaming, holding online workshops, um, you know, upping my game, selling my merch, because now there has to be a whole new mindset of, okay, live shows is no longer my primary income at this time with the uh, virus. So what are the other things that I can be strengthening within my business? And I think it's a great opportunity, actually. So um, in a time of crisis, I feel that artists really have an opportunity to connect people and to almost be their emotional um, pillowcases. <laughs> and I think we all really, really need it. Let's welcome in the man himself, Irvin Magic Johnson. Magic, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Craig. How you doing? Doing well. Doing well. And by the way, I'd like to point out that only Magic Johnson would go full suit and tie at 530 <laughs> in the morning from California for us. So you, you, you look fantastic. So, Magic, last night, I know you were watching in real time like, like the rest of us. Looking back on that hog in the tunnel between the two locker rooms back in 91, and, and Mike is crying, and, and, and you, you, you're probably crying. And that embrace, did you know that the torch was being passed? Oh, for sure, Craig. You know, um, we knew that that was probably going to be our last run at trying to win a championship. And we knew that the Bulls, that was the start of their really dynasty, you know, because in 91 when they beat us, they dominated the 90s just like the Lakers. We dominated Showtime Lakers. We dominated the 80s. So uh, I remember, you know, 
on the Dream Team bus, and he said to Larry and I, hey, it's a new sheriff in town. That's me and the Bulls. <laughs> so we had to start laughing and said, Michael, you're right. You, you, you are the new king, and uh, good luck. And, man, he did not disappoint either. You mentioned the Dream Team. That, that apparently is going to be uh, part of the focus of, of the next episode. That 92 team, arguably the best sports team ever assembled, regardless of sports. You and Larry and Michael Jordan and David Robinson and Barkley and all these guys. Before that, you hadn't played with, with Mike. When you played with him in 92, how did that change your view of Michael Jordan? Well, um, it started really our friendship. And um, we really started, we played cards every night together. We worked out in terms of when we had practice. I shot with him, uh, whether it was jump shots or free throws. And, and, and it really brought us closer together as friends. And then, Craig, you know, when you, when you can have Michael Jordan on your right-hand side, man, <laughs> on, on the fast break, I, I could throw it anywhere. He was going to go get it and dunk it, man. The highlight reels that he, he provided, all those moves that he did it, on the Dream Team, was unbelievable. And he's the first athlete I'd ever seen the opponent. Now, the opponent started crying when Michael Jordan <laughs> fouled him. He started crying. I can't believe it. Michael fouled him. Oh, my God. Right in the middle of the game. It was crazy. That's how the impact of the Dream Team was unbelievable. Magic, one of the things that, that struck me about last night's episode and I'm sure it struck you too. They're showing Michael, they're showing Jordan this this video of Isaiah Thomas uh, talking about the '91 Finals and explaining why that Pistons <laughs> team didn't shake, didn't shake like Michael's hand. And, and 30 years later, Michael Jordan is still visibly angry, visibly angry about this this handshake. <laughs> It's, it's always going to happen like that, you know. Um, they hate the Pistons. <laughs> still. I mean, still today, that was a bitter rivalry uh, with Michael and his Bulls and Isaiah and his Pistons. And, you know, you first of all, you got to give the Pistons credit because they learn from the Celtics, right? You have to learn how to win a championship before you can actually win one. And so... The Bulls kept trying to go through the Pistons, and Isaiah and them denied them three or four times. But it made the Bulls the championship team that they were, right? And so because the, the, the Pistons were so physical, and, and, and they took a lot of cheap shots too. So I can understand why Michael was so upset because even when I, we played against them twice, uh, the Showtime Lakers against the Pistons in the finals, and, you know, they took a lot of cheap shots, and that's, but that's how they played. They were a rough, tough team, one of the best defensive teams that's ever played. But, uh, Michael, that was a bitter rivalry for both those teams, and even today they still hate each other. But the great thing is I think the Pistons made Michael Jordan be the GOAT, right? He, he, he went to look, and last night we saw him say, hey, I got to get stronger. So he started lifting weights. That's right. And so that's, that's the reason why he became the GOAT is because he had to go through the Pistons, beat them. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, we all have bitter rivals. We still hate the Celtics, I mean the <laughs> Lakers. So that's how it goes. You know, you're going to hate your rivals. And, and, but I'm, I'm friends with Larry. <laughs> and so the Isaiah and Michael, they're not friends, but I'm Clearly. friends with Larry. Hey, Magic, before I let you go really quickly, I mean, you're part owner of, of three different sports franchises. A lot of folks in this country right now um, realizing just how much we need sports in our lives. How do we get back to, to professional sports in this country? What does that look like? I, th I think it looks like in the beginning, uh, no fans. Uh, because you got to keep the players safe. And then first you got to test all the players as well as those who work within those teams, the staff, the members uh, of the team. And then I think it's going to start without fans in the beginning. But I think all of us will take that because if we're at home and we get to see sports, that's all we want in the beginning. We just need something to make us feel good 
and to give us some uh, hope and uh, we can laugh or cheer for our team and, and yell at the, the TV screen. We need that right now. And uh, I just want to say God bless the whole country and, and, and then our first responders and everybody who risking their lives for all of us and all of these people who work at these grocery stores so we can keep eating. And, uh, man, this is just a hard thing for all of us. But we need sports to come back, and I hope that happens. Mm -hmm. Magic Johnson. Uh, always good to see you, sir. Thank you, you too, for Craig. your time. I love the cookie. Take care of yourself. All right. Take care. What a great guy, by the way. And also just his humility when he's talking about Michael and passing the torch. Yes. He was like, yeah, he was the best. It was his time. Yeah. It was his time. Uh, and for folks who haven't watched the, yeah. the, 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 the episode so far, I would encourage them. To yeah. Do it. it's, if you can't get live sports right now, it's the best yeah. thing. This morning in Georgia, it's round two of the state's reopening with some salons, barber shops, gyms and more already up and running. Now, movie theaters and dine in restaurants will also be allowed to open their doors. I mean, to put it mildly, we've been going through hell. The White House recommends two weeks of downward trend in new COVID-19 cases before loosening restrictions, a threshold Georgia currently does not meet. Governor Brian Kemp has said his decision is informed by data and public health recommendations, but it's drawn intense criticism from mayors around Georgia. It's not a time to lift the restrictions. It's absolutely premature in my mind. I think that it is putting all of us at risk. This week is ushering in a new wave of reopenings across the country. In much of Tennessee, restaurants and stores free to welcome customers this week at 50% capacity, but the most populated areas like Nashville still shuttered. In Ohio, the state's stay at home order is set to end on Friday. It's gonna be a very slow, gradual transitioning uh, and gradual reopening. And in New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a gradual plan to reopen some parts of the state, starting with construction and manufacturing in less populated areas. The regions that would be more likely able to open sooner would be the upstate regions. Even the NBA allowing players to resume individual workouts at team facilities, but only if their city has reopened. The White House's coronavirus response coordinator, Dr. Deborah Burks, braced the nation for a long battle ahead. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one okay. another. But for Gary Leak, whose new restaurant setup includes disposable plates and menus and spaced out tables, getting back to business is a matter of survival. How important is it for you to reopen tomorrow? God, more than you can imagine. We're opening just for the sake of getting the wheels greased up to go forward. We just can't give up. Now, guys, of course, in addition to dine-in restaurants, movie theaters also welcome to open their doors today. But as for AMC, the chain told The Hollywood Reporter that they don't plan to open any theaters until sometime in July when there are new movies to release. As some states start to reopen, this morning, many cities are taking new steps to ramp up testing. New York's governor is now allowing all independent pharmacies in the state, more than 5,000, to conduct diagnostic COVID-19 tests. Testing is what we are compulsively, obsessively focused on now. With hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and deaths dropping at the nation's coronavirus epicenter, there's also an urgent push for more antibody tests to check for possible immunity. But now, a new warning, you may be able to get the virus more than once. The World Health Organization says there is currently no evidence that people who have recovered from COVID-19 and have antibodies are protected from a second infection. Still, Dr. Anthony Fauci is emphasizing the need for more testing. Right now, you know, we're doing about 1.52 million per week. We probably should get up to twice that as we get into the next several weeks. California has more than 42,000 confirmed cases. Officials there are working to dramatically ramp up testing efforts. We averaged about 2,000 tests a day uh, through the end of March. Uh, we hope to be averaging 25,000 tests a day by the end of this month. In Massachusetts, where cases are surging, one town is testing essential workers without symptoms. Nearby Boston, a thousand residents will be randomly picked for voluntary antibody testing. All efforts to trace the spread and potentially asymptomatic carriers. 
Back in New York, first responders, healthcare workers, and all essential employees are now eligible for coronavirus testing. Okay, la fever. Pharmacist Roger Paginelli is waiting for the state health department to roll out the rules about getting tests and administering them. We're ready when the tests are ready, and we're ready when the Department of Health says go. We're ready to put our gloves on, get our protective equipment on, and do what's best for our patients. Now, the governor has already announced antibody tests at four New York City hospitals. For now, those tests will be focused on health care workers. Let's turn to NBC's medical correspondent, Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, good morning. I'm sure a lot of people who saw this sentence from the World Health Organization saying there's no evidence yet that people who have these antibodies are, in fact, immune from getting sick again. I'm sure a lot of people were disturbed by that. What does that mean? Is the WHO just being really careful in its language? And Savannah, I think you're right. I think a lot of people are waking up, getting very concerned, thinking they might get coronavirus a second time. That is not what the World Health Organization said. What the World Health Organization said is, we don't know what happens if you have antibodies. We don't know how long those antibodies will protect you, if at all, because we simply don't have enough information about this virus. But their main emphasis was about the antibody tests themselves, saying, number one, we're not sure of their reliability because they have been pushed out so fast and so quickly. And number two, that passport people are talking about, the certificate of immunity. They're very concerned about that because they think people might be using those erroneously and that could give people a false sense of security that they don't want people to have. They still want them to do all the social distancing and everything else to make sure they stay protected, not going out thinking, I have immunity, I can do whatever I want. But back to the primary point there, we don't have the studies yet to show that there's some immunity after somebody has had this virus. But there, is there any reason to think that this wouldn't track with other viruses so that there's some level of immunity? Yeah, at this point, there's no reason to think it won't be like other coronaviruses where you do get a level of immunity. But what they don't know is what level of antibodies do you actually need to get some of that immunity and how long will that immunity last? What they have found out is that some people have high levels of antibodies. Other people who had infections, verified infections, aren't showing much levels of antibodies at all. They're not exactly sure what that means at this point. It's going to take years to figure that out. And so, again, they're trying to make sure that people don't have that false sense of security, having a positive test saying, I have antibodies. Therefore, I can do whatever I want and I don't have to necessarily take the precautions. They're saying, number one, again, the tests aren't that accurate. Number two, they want to make sure that people aren't getting each other infected by doing that. Just real quickly, why have the antibody tests been such a problem? They seem to be inaccurate, leading to some false positives. There's a bunch of different types. There seems to be a black market out there. I mean, why, why is this such a, a confusing area? And it's not just a confusing area here in the U.S., it's around the world. If you remember the U.K., they ordered antibody tests from China. Now they're asking for refunds because those tests weren't that good. So it's one of those things that this virus has come on so fast and so quickly, it's hard to get a test that quick and that accurate at the same time. And plus, there have been some stumbles along the way from different authorities trying to look at validating these tests and whether they can validate them as quickly as they'd like to so they're pushing them out faster than probably a lot of scientists are saying they should. So that combination, I think, is giving us these tests out there that aren't necessarily the tests we want or need, but that's going to take years to get. So in the meantime, these tests can help a little bit, but they're not as accurate and as reliable as we'd like them to be. All right. Makes sense. Dr. Torres, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Kim Jong-un has not been seen in public for more than two weeks. These images are thought to show the Supreme Leader's train near the North Korean coast at a luxury compound. But on Saturday, Kim skipped his second major event, Army Day. It's a deepening mystery with rumors about his poor health and possible demise, making headlines around the globe. Reuters reporting a team including medics flew into North Korea from China. One well-connected Chinese commentator posting to millions of followers, some wait for the official announcement. Suit yourself. Her posts later deleted, but not by her, she claims. But I'd be shocked if U.S. Senator there, Lindsey Graham saying over the weekend, I'd be shocked if he's not dead, though admitting he does not have any direct cancer. knowledge. South Korea still insisting its intelligence shows nothing unusual. A North Korean newspaper claiming Kim even sent a letter. How closely guarded is Kim Jong-un? How many people around him would know that something is wrong?
that would be a very small circle of people. The rumors on the ground are probably people on the outside. When today made a rare trip to the world's most isolated dictatorship, we found Kim Jong-un's image everywhere. So you, you thank Kim Jong-un for this? Yes. Yes, talk. Whatever the truth, this woman may be central behind the scenes. Kim Jong-un's sister represented him at the Winter Olympics and accompanied him during his two summits with President Trump. Now, it's possible, of course, that Kim Jong-un is in lockdown over the coronavirus. But, Savannah, it's so important because, remember, North Korea is a nuclear-armed nation. If it lost its leader, a weakened world would face another crisis. Savannah? California's golden beaches, for weeks vacant in the midst of this public health crisis, are suddenly social. Normally we'd be going to church, but now we're just kind of feeling the presence of God here in, in, uh, on the beach. On the other side of the country, crowds gathered on Long Island shores were stretched out at Piedmont Park in Atlanta, tossing frisbees and exchanging high fives. This is something that I don't think anybody, even our grandparents, could relate to in their lifetime being told to not go outside. While this video of a house party reportedly taken in Chicago this weekend is going viral, the city's mayor calling it reckless and utterly unacceptable. You can't even move. A new study from the University of Maryland says increasingly more people aren't staying. Calls it quarantine fatigue, a combination of warmer weather, looser state rules, and weeks of being cooped up inside. Turning the tide in the wrong direction, with his social distancing index dropping by 3% overall, equating to millions of people out and about. Last week, we saw for the first time nationwide a reduction in our social distancing index, which indicates that right now is that individual Americans, many of them are deciding on that people are going outside of the home more, they're traveling more. So it's just a major shift. Their own that they are going to reopen uh, themselves to go out more. Dr. Lejean as the nation fights the pandemic. Although 44 states in the study slipped, the worst offenders were largely in the South, with Louisiana, the Carolinas, and Tennessee leading the way. Governors like California's Gavin Newsom reacting to the renewed beach activity, tweeting in part, I know it's going to be nice out this weekend, and many are tired of staying home, but we must continue to take this seriously. Hashtag stay home, save lives. For this circle of friends, who used to meet every week at a neighborhood bar. This group, we respect each other, we keep our distance. I can only be responsible for myself, and I have to do what I'm comfortable with. They say their behavior is proof you can be outside responsibly. But with a bit of cautiousness, because you're only going to trust the people that you think are practicing social distance. And here in Georgia, according to the study, this state had one of the top 10 biggest drops in social distancing and Hoda, Savannah, what's interesting this morning, the areas that were actually considered to be doing really well here, like New York and D.C., even they saw some regression. We can't break our country over this. We have to get going. What we reopen will be better than what we had before. As the debate over when to reopen and restart the country rages, more questions. What will our lives look like? Can fans gather at sporting events, theaters, what about busy workplaces? Some, including New York City's mayor, say part of the new normal should involve health screenings. The important thing to recognize with the temperature checks, they absolutely have a role to play. This device may play a role in getting the country going again. It's called the Symptom Sense Medical Evaluation Gateway. The manufacturer says it can screen up to 600 people an hour for signs of illness. Company CEO Derek Peterson showed me how the technology works at their lab on Long Island, New York. Okay, Vicki, come on through. Okay. As you walk through, face this way and put okay. your feet on the yellow pads. As I walk in, Peterson says this sensor uses ultrasound to measure my height so the machine can adjust. Now we're going to calculate your body temperature and we're also going to look at your heart rate, resting heart rate, and oxygen level by this sensor right directly aimed at your chest area. In less than 10 seconds, this screen tells the operator my external temperature, respiration rate, blood oxygen level, and heart rate. So you're looking at these vital signs. What can that actually tell you about someone's health? Through our combination of looking at these four vitals, we could tell if somebody's well or not well. Peterson says because this is not a medical device, it doesn't require FDA approval. The machine doesn't collect data, and he says the technology to measure these vital signs is non-invasive. We're using a technology called millimeter wave technology, 
to be able to scan the body for respiration rate and heart rate. We're also using our own proprietary technology for determining temperature. We validate against known equipment in the industry that can verify what we're doing. Let's be clear, this cannot tell me if I have coronavirus. Absolutely not. I can't tell you if you have the coronavirus, but what I can tell you is that you're may be sick. It might detect vital sign differences that are consistent with coronavirus, but up to 50% of people with coronavirus are going to have normal vital signs, no symptoms whatsoever. NBC so News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres says this device is not a magic solution to detecting coronavirus. How important are these vital signs to determining a baseline if someone may or may not be ill? Vital signs are one tool we use to look to see if somebody is sick, but it's not the only tool. People with normal vital signs, if they have other complaints, they still might have a disease. What do you say to critics who say this might give people a false sense of security about whether or not they're healthy? It's just another tool trying to help people understand in a quick way if they're healthy or not. This is not the end, no behold. But who decides what to do with this data? Tech ethicist David Polgar says it will be up to the organizations that use this technology to figure out how they respond. Do you think tools like this are helpful and do you think they will become commonplace? Yes, I do think that they, they can be helpful. We are in an extraordinary situation where I think a lot of people are looking at how do we balance our individual freedoms with more of a collective need for, for society. He compares the new technology to airport screenings after 9-11. I think a lot of us are talking about tools like this and other forms of technology that might have seemed unusual a year ago might be part of our future. Well, as for the symptom sense, the company says it's received interest from thousands of companies and governments, including Major League Sports. The Greek government just ordered several of these devices, but it's unclear how to where they're going to use them. Yeah, and you did just talk about asymptomatic people being up to 50 percent, so that'll be tough. But the question is, it may help a little. So what does it cost and when could it get on the market? They are not cheap. They're about $35,000 a piece. The company is also working to incorporate a metal detector based on feedback early from sports leagues. So this can be more of an all-in-one screening tool, and they do expect to start shipping these devices in about one month. Okay. All right, Vicki. Thank you for the update. Streets all across Spain this morning filled once more with the sounds of overjoyed children. For the first time in six weeks. Two-year-old Devrim finally out and about yeah. after the country eased its home confinement rules Sunday, allowing children under the age of 14 to be outside again. I think we're on 40 days now or something, 45 or something yeah. like that. <laughs> you lose track. Devrim's making up for all that lost time by exploring. Is it a stone? And moving a lot. The minute you're out the door, he just wants to run. His parents, Americans who now live in Spain, are struggling with the lockdown, but understand its importance. Once we were all seeing the numbers go up and how, by how much and the very quick increase, I think people took it seriously. In mid-March, Spain's daily death toll started to spike, hitting a high of almost 1,000. Now slowing to 288 on Sunday, the coronavirus here has killed more than 23,000 people. The horrific figures inside Spain's big cities have meant authorities are taking baby steps out of lockdown. And so for weeks, even months, playgrounds like this one could remain off limits. Who's there? Elias and Sam Block celebrated their refound freedom with Dad Neil. It was just fresh air. Today's fun has a one-hour time limit and must take place well within a mile of their front door. But even that beats being stuck at home. Has your brother been annoying? Has your dad been annoying? Like, what's been the worst bit? Um, like being with the same people all the time. Your family? Yeah. <laughs> And what makes this end of lockdown on kids so interesting here is that originally the government announced that they would only allow children outside the home to go to the pharmacy or the grocery store with their parents. There was a huge public backlash. The authorities caved in and they said kids could go outside. They could play for no purpose other, Craig, than to have fun.
Round two of the Paycheck Protection Program gets underway this morning. The Small Business Administration will again start accepting applications. The program is designed to help small businesses keep workers on their payroll. The original $349 billion fund was drained quickly because there was so much demand. And since then, Congress appropriated $322 billion in additional money. Joining us now with all of this in what small businesses can do to stay afloat right now, NBC Senior Business Corps. Correspondent Stephanie Rule. Steph, good morning. I know a lot of small business owners are waiting for this day. So if you haven't applied at all, can you get in on it? And what if you already had an application in that was denied? All right, let's walk through this because you and I both know how important this money is. According to the Small Business Association, every hour a small business closes. So we got to get the money out. So let's walk through it. Today, the portals open again. If you have already applied, you must contact your bank. Find out where you are in the process because there's a huge, huge backlog. Some of the biggest banks out there, JP Morgan, PNC, they're not even accepting new applications. They've got hundreds of thousands in process ready to go. So if you've applied with them, what you need to do today is pick up the phone and say, what other information do you need about me? I'm here to do that. Now, let's say you haven't. You shouldn't give up because the opportunity is there. You said there's over 300 billion in new funds available. Call local banks. The government has set aside $60 billion for smaller lenders, community banks. Call around. You're allowed to apply with one or more institution. So don't think, oh my goodness, could I be committing fraud here? I'm calling multiples. Absolutely not. Apply wherever you can. And there's also some non-traditionals like a PayPal or a Square. But even if you're a very small business and you say, I don't have a sophisticated payroll system, you need to. You're going to have to have your payroll, your utilities, your bank statement. If you don't provide this information, you won't have access to the money. Okay, so there's that, this program, the PPP program. There's also the Federal Reserve talking about some loans to Main Street businesses. What is that about? And it's obviously separate. How do you get in on that? Okay, that isn't happening just yet, but think about this. Over the last week, there's been all this pushback. Why were so many bigger businesses in this program? And, and the government realized, well, Savannah, if you run a business with two people, should you be competing for the same pot of money as me, who has a company of 500? So now what they're looking to do is create a Main Street lending program for those mid-sized businesses. That's going to come. We should be on the lookout in the next few weeks. It's not going to be a forgivable loan like PPP, but it'll help some of those bigger businesses. And I want to remind our audience, those who want to get PPP, because it is forgivable, that's awesome, you don't have to pay it back, it's only forgivable if you keep all of your employees on. Now, I realize that's really tricky. Imagine, Savannah, if you ran a local restaurant. As these days are passing and you're shut down, you're likely to lay those employees off. Well, if you want to get this money, you're going to need to bring them back on. So if, you, you, if you've already had to lay people off, but you want to get in on this money, you could rehire them and still have access to the loan. I, I want to, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I also want to mention what you just alluded to, that some of these bigger businesses, household names, had gotten some of this first round of funding from the PPP. What's happening with that? Are they cracking down on that this next round? They are, but it's really tricky, Savannah, because you could argue what in the world were they doing in there to begin with? They shouldn't have. But if you ran a business and you had access to the money, there's a good chance you would apply. Now, they changed some of the rules, so some of the more financial-focused businesses, hedge funds, private equity firms, they can't apply. But some of those bigger companies, AutoNation, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, Shake Shack, they already gave their money back. But there's a lot of other publicly traded companies that are still in there. The Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin said companies that are in there that shouldn't be will face serious consequences. But the issue is, Savannah, a lot of them were allowed to be in the program. And the truth is, any business, with the exception of pharmaceuticals, some big retailers like an Amazon, any business, Savannah, is suffering. And they're going to be over the next few months. And the one other thing I would bring up, this money is going to go very quickly. There's $320 billion in the new program. But just yesterday, the CEO of Bank America said the government needs to put more money in this. Savannah, we're preparing ourselves from a health perspective to possibly deal with this for the next year. But from a financial perspective, we're only thinking about it for the next couple 
couple of months. I'm right now in New Jersey, kind of on a, on a Jersey Shore town. If these businesses are, are closed for four months, we're going to lose this whole region. So if the government doesn't start looking at what this is going to do for a much longer period of time, we could be in trouble. But for today, any small yeah. business out there, we've got to help them. It is time to apply. PPP, this is your day. Yeah, don't delay. Stephanie, thank you so much. The food supply chain is breaking. That's the warning in a full-page ad from Tyson Foods, released in the New York Times on Sunday. It comes after one of the country's largest meat processors closed a massive pork processing plant in Iowa because of a coronavirus outbreak. The letter from Tyson's president going on to say, there will be limited supply of our products available in grocery stores until we're able to reopen our facilities that are currently closed. Ambulances start coming to our plant. People start being uh, carried out of there. And so we, we were always asking our supervisors, basically, what is it that's going on here? NBC News talked to one Tyson worker at that Iowa plant who concealed their identity. They didn't have enough uh, material or masks and things like that to provide to us. So they would start giving us different types of rags and stuff that they had, that, that they had washed it clean. Tyson responding, telling NBC News, we've been working diligently to protect our team members. Early on, we allowed workers to bring their own masks, and we even supplied some until we could secure surgical-style coverings, which we now require all team members to wear. Adding, we aren't aware of any ambulance visits to the plant for COVID-19-related reasons. NBC News has not been able to independently confirm ambulances at the Tyson plant. Tyson's Waterloo plant, one of several closed across the country, shut down by beef, pork, and poultry companies trying to contain virus outbreaks. The CEO of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association says he fears things are only going to get worse. If we start to see panic buying, much like we did the first two weeks of this pandemic, then yes, we are going to have uh, an issue on our hands. There's no doubt about it. Meat suppliers, the processors say in their freezers, they do have a supply of beef, pork, and chicken. But the longer that the processing plants are closed, the faster the nation's meat supply will dwindle. Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. News now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up 
We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage. Answers to your questions. Insight from medical experts. And up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Welcome back to the third hour of today. Parenting is no easy task, and especially right now, it's even more challenging. Joining us now is Dr. Robin Berman. She's a psychiatrist and author of the book, Permission to Parent. She's with us to talk about some ways we can navigate family life during these unprecedented times. Dr. Berman, thank you for talking with us today. Thank you for having me. Hello from Los Angeles. <laughs> you know, I was talking to one of my producers who was also a parent, and we all admitted, you know, at first we thought maybe this would last maybe two, three weeks. Now a lot of us are going on five to six weeks, and all of the things that we thought we had built, right, a routine, you know, some sense of normalcy, all of that is out of the window at this point. I know you say it's hard, but do you think we should still try to have some kind of routine for the kids? Yes, definitely yes. Yes routine with flexibility so like you say at the beginning there was almost like wow this is cool i can handle this and then there's like people calling me i'm crying in my closet so i would say a structure and a routine and then growing the practice a muscle the kids have never had go play go figure it out those kind of things that we never got to give our kids because we were so busy racing them are how you create imagination, play, creativity, innovative thinkers. And at the end of the day, those are great life skills. I wanna ask you because we have some people who have younger children and some people who have older children. Even my younger kids now know that something is up. There are a lot of parents who wanna kind of shelter their kids and like try to keep them in a happy place. I tried that at first, but I think it's the the truth, don't we? A hundred percent. You are so spot on because kids are little, they they're, they vibe off our energy. They have bionic ears. They have bionic eyes. They feel what we're feeling. So it doesn't make sense to say you're so fragile. Mm-hmm. I have to protect you from reality. The more fragile we treat our kids, the more fragile they stay. So it's all about how calmly you deliver the truth. But the truth has to be delivered. They're not going to the birthday party. They're not seeing their friends. They're not going to school. You want want to hear the cliff note tip of the day? In order to have a happy kid, you have to make, you have to tolerate them feeling sad. Telling the truth, I'm all for always telling the truth. And particularly now, it's a way to grow some cool, kind kids with character. You know what? Amen to that. You are so good. Really quickly, is there any advice you can give to help our kids um, if they feel anxious? My daughter the other day, I was running around the house and she said, Mommy, can I show you what we learned in class? And she put her hand up and she said, for every finger, you take a breath. And she went, one. I love it. You know, so she gave me that and it really works. But is there anything else before we run out of time that you think we can offer our kids or ourselves? For kids, don't avoid don't avoid whatever they're scared about. Walk right down in. Don't. And then when they get really nervous and really fearful, you you separate your thoughts are just they're not facts. They're just thoughts. Oh, that's just my kooky brain. That's just my worry brain. Beep, get lost. Scram. Teach them tools to talk back to their own inner narrative. It creates a much calmer brain. I've heard so much advice as a parent, but there are so many things you just said that, that will stick with me. Thoughts are, are not facts. Good stuff. Thank Can you I ask so one much. Can with one uplifting story? Absolutely. I did too. When I was in medical school, I've been thinking a lot recently about a patient I sat with when he was dying, he was 80 years old. And I said, what are you thinking right now? And he said, I miss my mom. Mm-hmm. I'm really thinking about my mom and how much love she gave me and the lullaby she used to sing. And here, here's a guy moments away from death thinking about the time he had with his mom. So super powerful to remember that school and getting school right, there is no right. This is a new world. Keeping the bond and the love intact. So I'm holding up this picture. I don't know if you can see it, but when I um, did wrote permission for and I went around interviewing the kids and this one kid I said oh is that your baby sister he said no that's actually my mom and I'm like 
wow, you seem so big. And he said, well, we're really close. You see how we're touching? And my mom, she looks at me with hearts in her eyes. Oh, my goodness. So I always think if we could just look at our kids with those hearts in our eyes and everyone we love during this time. And thank you so much for having me. You are so my cup of tea. You are. Listen, we're going to be besties. I'm going to we're going to have you back soon. Dr. Robin Berman, thank you. You you helped a lot of parents today. Thank Thank you. you so much. That was the intention. Dr. Berman will be answering some of your parenting questions. Just head on over to our Instagram page at third hour today. President Trump says he was being sarcastic when he suggested looking into disinfectants or UV light as possible coronavirus treatments. But the manufacturer of Lysol took it pretty seriously. They released a warning last night that read in part, quote, we must be clear that under no circumstance should our disinfectant products be administered into the human body through injection, ingestion or any other route. But this isn't the first time that bleach has been floated as a miracle cure. NBC News reporter Ben Collins is joining me now. And Ben, let's start with the basics here. I just read that response from Lysol. What are doctors, health experts, what are they saying about the notion that disinfectants could treat the coronavirus? It can't in in this way. Uh, You know, from what we can tell, there is a DHS report that was going around that got picked up, that was leaked by Yahoo, It got picked up by a lot of uh, sites and right wing in Internet that brought up the efficacy of bleach on saliva. Now, it wasn't about drinking bleach in this space, but, it, you know, it, it brought up the idea in kill uh, when, you know, uh, on surfaces, which is true. On surfaces is very different than injection or anything like that. Uh, the problem is in these spaces on places like Facebook and Reddit, there are people selling bleach for internal ingestion. Uh, people who sell this thing called MMS, oh. which is, uh, I know, a miracle mineral solution. Uh, it's not a miracle. Oh. It's a, it's the opposite. It's bleach. People are drinking bleach to try to cure their kids of things like autism. Uh, it's a, it's an offshoot of the anti-vax movement. So since this has already sort of been yeah, in the air generally, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, good. No, no, I just wanted to ask if you could take us back a little bit, because it's not just about uh, a coronavirus potential remedy or treatment, uh, as you were kind of alluding to there. This is something that people have been talking about online uh, for a while now for a range of different issues. Yeah, I mean, th- th- this is people a, a few a few months ago, Brandy Zadrozny, my colleague, uh, did this story about how people were mm-hmm. giving MMS to kids, sorts of diseases. Like they, they believe that this is literally a miracle for several different kinds of diseases. Now, the DOJ last week, six days ago, actually, started cracking down on this cure of coronavirus. Um, this has been in the ether. And in, in, in fact, I would say this has been making people a ton of money in the far right internet space for a long time. People who distrust the government, people who distrust science, like have decided that, you know, instead maybe we have a better solution uh, that we've made up for ourselves. So uh, when you take that sort of anti-government sentiment, combine it with a product uh, and, you know, take this thing that sounds like it could work, uh, even though it clearly does not, you get people selling bleach in the internet and then that sort of filters up through that ecosystem. So Ben, I got to ask, uh, are the tech companies doing anything to try to stop this kind of misinformation online? Because unfortunately, it's true. People see these things, whether it's on Facebook or in chat groups or in other places, uh, and, and sometimes they believe that there's truth to it or, or they're willing to give something a try. Uh, is there anything that's, that they're doing to crack down on this? Yeah. So, you know, Facebook said that they would take down any sort of miracle cure style thing, but that's a really broad based definition. For example, you know, last right. week before all this stuff happened with the president talking about ultraviolet rays and stuff yesterday, there were people selling small handheld devices that claimed uh, that they were UV light disinfectants that killed off coronavirus or killed off the 1% that is not killed by antibacterial soap. Now, one of those things that snuck through the Facebook sensors for a long period of time there. Um, so these the social networks are trying to stop it, but they're just too big and they can't get to everything. And that's how you get these sort of wild, you know, galaxy brain ideas like, you know, drinking bleach and stuff like that, because it doesn't even occur to people to look that up if you're a content moderator at Facebook. 
Yeah, it's just wild stuff. Uh, we hope that people obviously are not taking that advice and are not using these types of cleaning products internally. Ben, always great to have you with us. I hope you are staying safe and doing well, and we'll talk to you again soon. You too. This is Main Street Flushing, the most busy street in New York City. For people who don't live here, Flushing is still very busy. But compared with the normal times, this is one twentieth of the usual pedestrian traffic we have. There are all restaurants here on both sides of the street. They are all closed. These restaurants used to employ like thousands of people here. Thousands of jobs are lost. And many of these uh, um, people, because of their status, they cannot get an employment. This is really truly a crisis. You know. We never faced this before in my lifetime. and dynamic community. 60 to 65 percent is Asian Americans here. This virus really kills us, kills the whole economy. In the beginning, people are afraid to come to this area because they think uh, the Asian Americans, they have the virus. We have many nursing homes in this area. They don't have enough staff, uh, even in good times. In the recent weeks, hundreds of patients Die in our local nursing homes. There's a local a charity group called Shushi Foundation. They will go there to donate medical masses because nursing homes is a lot of uh, really, they don't make that much money. So they are short on resources, especially masses and other like PPE. This is a once in a lifetime experience. You know. It's not a good experience, but we all hope we can learn from this. Thank you. God bless. Before COVID-19, we had a really kind and empathic way of sharing custody. We never had any conflict over switching nights. It was fine. We really worked it out well. Deborah Kopakin has shared custody of her 13-year-old son with her ex-husband for more than three years. They felt like model co-parents until the coronavirus pandemic hit the U.S. March 11th rolled around, which was my birthday. I said to my ex-husband, oh, I'd really like him to be at my birthday party. That night, Trump went on TV to talk about the gravity of the situation. So the next morning, I called my ex-husband. I said, you know what? That's it. We're locking down. I'm keeping him home from school. Deborah violated their custody agreement. She thought it was unsafe for her son to commute to his dad's place over an hour away. Using the subway was out of the question. Using Ubers or Lyfts was out of the question. So there literally was no way of transporting our child safely between two homes. What happened to that communication and that relationship with your ex as this dragged on? It completely broke down. I mean, we had just retreated to the adversaries we were when we decided to get divorced in the first place. Once this pandemic hit, we just lost it all. We lost all of that goodwill. We reached out to Deborah's ex-husband and he didn't dispute her story, but added that these kinds of lockdowns can be very hard for the parent who isn't with the child. And they're not the only co-parents going through this. Would you say you're getting more calls than usual these days? We are in different types of calls. Everybody's emotions are a little heightened because there's so much unknowns about COVID-19. So you have the amical parents who are struggling to find the right answer. And then you have parents who are already in high conflict cases who could be using this time as a way to gain leverage and withhold children, especially because a lot of courts are closed. What does that mean for you and for your clients? You have cases that are completely put on hold. Then you 
you have new issues coming up and we're simply unable to get a hearing date until July timeframe in some cases. Wow. What is your biggest piece of advice to, uh, to parents going through this right now? Communicate and focus on the children, right? What what are your individual child's needs? For Deborah, things did eventually turn around, but not before her entire household came down with presumed cases of COVID-19. I couldn't breathe. There was a decision that had to be made whether to go to the hospital. So custody went out the window at that point. But the and irony on his part must have been pretty extreme because you kept your son home to keep him safe and then you all got sick. I mean, how did he react to that? I actually think that my getting the virus allowed us a path back to kindness again because he was empathic with what was happening in the home. How do you think this whole experience is going to impact you, your ex, and your son? I think the effects are all going to be good ones. The first time that my ex came here after my COVID-19 virus seemed to have gone away, he rode his bike. I packed him a lunch. Leo brought it out there and they each sat at separate picnic tables out in the park nearby and then I was walking my dog and I happened to sort of run into them and I sat down with them and it was me 10 feet away, my ex-husband at one picnic table, my 13-year-old son at another picnic table, our 24-year-old son at another picnic table and there we were sort of just chatting from far away from each other and it was kind of both weird and beautiful, right? It was, okay, this is the COVID-19 ex-family trying to communicate and be kind to one another. We're just trying to keep everyone safe. As a doctor who recently graduated um, not less than a year ago from medical school, never did I or any of my friends and colleagues imagined that we would be fighting this pandemic. I'm worried now more about what this world will look like and what my job will look like when things start to open up. So when we start having less social distancing and going back to life as usual, I think everyone on my team knows that life will never be usual again. We're still seeing sick patients that potentially have COVID uh, coming in and everybody around me is talking about opening up uh, the economy and the hospital and, and all of that. I'm not quite sure what to think. It's been great seeing the public support that uh, the doctors and nurses are being given in the media and elsewhere. But I think um, at times we forget that we also have respiratory therapists who are helping us manage the ventilators. We also have sanitation staff who are helping keep us safe in the hospital. We have cafeteria workers who are also helping keeping um, the hospital running. And I think at times we forget about them and we don't acknowledge them and recognize them. As we're here to help. This is what we signed up for. This is our job and this is what we're happy to do. But we need your help and your help has been helping. It's been, we are seeing it, we've been seeing it, and we hope to continue to see it. So whatever comes in the future, um, I hope it includes increased screening. I hope it includes um, universal masking when we're together until we really understand that our community rates are, are negligible and then we're really on the offensive. Uh, right now we've been on the defensive. You're watching NBC News Now. The battle against ISIS is now in its final stages. So you have smugglers using your ranch as a lookout point. There have been report after report of unsanitary and overcrowded conditions. That facility is cleaned every day. State of the Union address. Is anybody really getting much out of this anymore? President Trump became the first sitting U.S. president to set foot in North Korea this weekend. Welcome back to NBC News. Now we've got some breaking news. And all of a sudden, the entire apartment started rocking. NBC News can confirm that Iran seized a British oil tanker. For not following international maritime regulation. Right now, San Juan is at a standstill. The spin room, this will be the center of the political universe. Dehydration, uh, fatigue, malnourishment, a lot of people are simply feeling hopeless for what lies ahead. In the time that you and I have been talking, we've lost at least two football fields worth of the Amazon. It's just a horror story. The Apollo 11 launch was 50 years ago today. I want to dig into our video archive. Liftoff, we have a liftoff.
It's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice, and once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. Dr. Chen Fu is on the front lines in the battle against COVID-19. As a Chinese-American doctor, he feels both celebrated and vilified. I feel an animosity that I've never felt before. On his commute to the hospital, Dr. Fu says he was approached by a stranger. You dirty Chinese. And he just kept saying that over and over again. I've never felt anything like this before. This, just one of many incidents hey, yo, across yo, yo, the country yo, 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 yo. now being reported. Asian Americans targeted for their race. Get out of our country! In Texas, this person Get yelling out. at a Vietnamese Get restaurant owner. Get out! And this man and his two children stabbed at a Sam's Club. The suspect, according to the FBI, thought the family was Chinese and infecting people with the coronavirus. In Minnesota, this note the tenants claim was posted on their door, reading, We're watching you. Take the Chinese virus back to China. In New York City, in just a month, police say they've investigated 11 hate crimes against Asian Americans, compared to three in all of last year. OCA Asian Pacific American Advocates, a nonprofit group that tracks discrimination against Asian Americans, says it has received more than 1,500 COVID-19 related reports of hate incidents since January. We have seen everything from cashiers who will tell somebody, I'm not going to serve you because I don't want to catch coronavirus. We've also seen um, patients who have gone into health clinics who say, I don't want you as a nurse. I want somebody else to help me. Because the nurse was Asian American? Exactly. From mid to late March, President Trump repeatedly referred to the coronavirus as the Chinese virus. The Chinese virus, the fight against the Chinese virus. It comes say from it's China. Racist. It's not racist at all, no. This photo of his speech with the word Chinese replacing corona went viral on social media. I have never seen the Asian American community 
this scared. They're in fear for their life. Gene Wu is a state representative in Texas. Why not call it the Chinese virus? Because it could create harm and has created harm. Now, many are calling for people to rise above the hate. New York Another Mayor Bill de Blasio. Message. We will not tolerate any discrimination. We will not tolerate any hate crimes. Black, Hispanic and Asian congressional leaders uniting to condemn racism. It's important for us to negate the hate, come together as Americans. And celebrities urging fans to stand up for each other. Actor Daniel Day Kim. Please. Please stop the prejudice and senseless violence against Asian people. Social media campaigns wash the hate, racism is a virus, and I am not COVID-19 are spreading. Namaste. Let's wash the hate. Also spotlighting the growing discrimination, multiple op-eds, including mine. While there's more work ahead, some things have changed. After repeatedly calling it the Chinese virus, President Trump appears to have stopped and tweeted in part, It is very important that we totally protect our Asian American community in the United States and all around the world. They are amazing people, and the spreading of the virus is not their fault. And in some of the racist attacks, people stepped in to help. Zach Owens risked his life to save the family attacked in Texas. She saved all our lives. And for Dr. Fu, a stranger jumped in. He defended me, and he said, no, you can't do this. That guy was my hero. Hey, Allison, behind me is the home of Bayern Munich, one of the world's most popular soccer teams, and maybe soon the home of actual live games. That's because the Bundesliga, Germany's soccer league, has put forward a proposal to reopen their season, to get things going again as soon as May 9th. That's pending government approval. If this plan is approved, that would make this the first major European soccer league to come out of lockdown, so to speak. It would also be one of the first major sports leagues in the world to do so. So if this is successful, this could definitely be a model for U.S. sports to get up and running as well. Now, central to this plan are safety and health measures. Of course, social distancing will be in place. That means, in fact, that no fans will be allowed inside. Only around 300 people total will be let inside during matches. That means players, coaches, and and essential personnel only. There'll be no handshake lines. There'll be virtual press conferences. And the biggest key here is testing. Each player in the league will be tested for COVID-19 at least once per week. We're talking about 20,000 tests in total. That part of the plan has proved to be controversial. Critics say, hey, why should players be tested once a week? Nurses don't get that opportunity. Teachers are not being tested once per week. Now, as I mentioned, this needs government approval. Chancellor Angela Merkel and state leaders will be meeting as soon as next week to take a look at this. If it's approved, we could see stadiums like this in Germany with players, but no fans as soon as next month. Allison? As a doctor who recently graduated, um, not less than a year ago from medical school, never did I or any of my friends and colleagues imagine that we would be fighting this pandemic. I'm worried now more about what this world will look like and what my job will look like when things start to open up. So when we start having less social distancing and going back to life as usual, I think everyone on my team knows that life will never be usual again. I'm still seeing sick patients that potentially have COVID uh, coming in and everybody around me is talking about opening up uh, the economy and the hospital and and all that. Not quite sure what to think. It's been great seeing the public support that Uh, the doctors and nurses are being given in the media and elsewhere. But I think um, at times we forget that we also have respiratory therapists who are helping us manage the ventilators. We also have sanitation staff who are helping keep us safe in the hospital. We have cafeteria workers who are also helping keeping um, the hospital running. And I think at times we forget about them and we don't acknowledge them and recognize them. As we're here to help. This is what we signed up for. This is our job and this is what we're happy to do. But we need your help and your help has been helping. It's been, we are seeing it, we've been seeing it, and we hope to continue to see it. So whatever comes in the future, um, I hope it includes increased screening. I hope it includes um, universal masking 
asking when we're together until we really understand that our community rates are, are negligible and then we're really on the offensive. Uh, right now we've been on the defensive. It's a rare sight in the world today. Kids just playing together. Hey guys. Hi. So are you happy to be back? Are you excited? Denmark has reopened schools for students under the age of 12 after a month in lockdown. What did you miss the most? Do you miss your friends? Teacher. Teacher. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's it like being back with all your friends? Great. <laughs> you can hear it. They're having so much fun out there. That's a sound we haven't heard in a while. Show me two meters. But it doesn't look the same. Oh, there we go. And high five. Recess and playtime with the same small groups and new games. So, of course, they're playing tag, but they can't actually touch each other. No, it's no, it's a kind of a tag that we invented on Friday, where they have to tag each other on their shadow instead. Oh, so they have to literally just tap right yeah. the shadows. Yeah, so I can touch your shadow here and say tag. In just a matter of days, schools here build outdoor tents, holding most classes outside. The parents seem happy. The children seem happy. So the kids seem really happy. The that. kids seem really happy. <laughs> really happy. They were just like first day of school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, no yeah, more homeschooling. Exactly. But some parents, including Rian Kim, kept her kids home just for the first day. So what was the conversation among parents? There was a lot of kind of nervousness amongst some of the parents as well. Um, but again, it kind of was this balance between, OK, we've got to do our work. Uh, they're really, really bored. Denmark's Minister of Education says not only are the littlest kids bored, but virtual learning is much easier in the older grades. What do you say to parents who might be nervous? Obviously, everybody would, would get some level of concern when the children uh, re-enter the school. Uh, so what has been important to us is to say that it doesn't matter if we open now or we open in a month time or two months time. Denmark locked down on March 11th when the only other country in Europe doing so was Italy with its hundreds of deaths and more than 12,000 infections. At the time, Denmark had around 500 known cases and no deaths. Now, six weeks later, Denmark has some 8,000 known cases and fewer than 400 deaths. And because of the fast action, Denmark is now in a position to start unlocking. And while they started with schools, hair salons, beauty parlors, even some parks are all reopening this week. Dane's getting back to normal, even the youngest set, slowly, cautiously, <laughs> but one step ahead of the rest of us. Massive unemployment numbers. Another 4.4 million people filed jobless claims last week. The economy is basically grinded to a halt. For college seniors, this should be a time to make memories, celebrate, and look for that first real-world job. But the coronavirus pandemic changed everything. That's about seven times higher than anything we've seen over the Great Recession. To say that the numbers are eye-popping would be an understatement. COVID-19 safety measures have put the nation's economy essentially on pause. Alina Semkina is a senior at Illinois State University. Last November, she received multiple job offers and accepted her favorite one. Were you excited for the, that job? Yeah, I was so excited. I, I was telling all my friends about it constantly. But then came COVID, and her offer was rescinded. 
what was it like to, to get that call letting you know that they just couldn't move forward? I mean, to be honest, I was preparing myself for it, but I knew that I would have to rely on myself and like just be super proactive in order to get myself out of this situation. She had to go back to square one. How different is that that job hunt now amid the, the pandemic? Now you have to do it at 10 times the rate. You have to reach out to double the amount of people, apply to as many positions that you're interested in, because in reality, even some of the positions that are posted aren't necessarily hiring for a very, very long time. I even reached out to the companies that I had received offers at before, and they were telling me that they're in hiring freezes. Over the last five weeks, Americans have filed for unemployment at an alarming rate, bringing the total to 26 million jobless claims. And soon-to-be college graduates are looking at one of the worst job markets in American history. Whether it's going to be delayed starts, remote, I think there's a middle group that says that, that haven't rescinded offers yet. They just don't have an answer for that yet. And then the third group that just doesn't see an option for them, and they're going to pull those offers now. But while many students are left questioning their future, for some, it's come faster than they expected. When was your class supposed to graduate? May 17th, 2020. What is your new graduation date? May 1st, 2020. Catherine Callisti is a senior nursing student at the University of Vermont. Her entire class gets to graduate early with a temporary permit so they can start work immediately before taking their boards. There's a call for nurses to get into the front lines, as people are saying. On the one hand, you are not struggling to find employment right now like so many other people are. On the other hand, the, the field you are going into is maybe more challenging now than it ever was. Yeah. How does that feel? You know, any new grad is going to be nervous. And then you, you know, put on top of this dire situation that is changing the world. It's taken its toll on me. And now I'm just trying to learn, you know, how to live with it. Because I still, at the end of the day, I'm going to be a nurse. And nurses are strong people and they're resilient and show up when they're called on. So it's a good reflection, I think, on what I'm deciding what to do with my life. Hey, everyone, I'm Allison Marsh, you're watching NBC News Now. A very happy Monday to everyone. Hope you had a good and relaxing weekend. Let's go now to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She is, of course, following the latest news and coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, I hope you got a little break this weekend. How about an update? Sure, Allison. So there's lots of news uh, coming out of this weekend. And first from New York, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a plan, a reopening plan over the weekend for his state, which could start as early as May 15th. Now, construction and manufacturing would be the first to reopen in phase one. Phase two would include businesses opening in the order of how essential they are and how much risk they bring. In his press briefing today, Cuomo stressed the importance of monitoring the numbers. But we have the same question, how fast and how steady is the decline? We don't want to see flat. We want to see an increasing decline. And we want to see how fast that decline goes and how low does the decline go, right? When does that hospitalization rate get down to a truly manageable number? Uh, when does the incoming case number get down to a manageable number? Now, the death toll from coronavirus in New York state is over 22,000, according to an NBC News count, and that also includes probable deaths. In an unprecedented move, New York's Board of Elections canceled the presidential primary initially scheduled for June 23rd, following public health concerns. And from NBC's Alicia Fieldstat, quarantine fatigue is real, and as people grow tired of lockdown measures, they're starting to venture outside. Anonymous cell phone data compiled by the University of Maryland shows a nationwide 3% dip in social distancing in compliance. Now, the largest drops in social distancing appeared in southern states, where some governors have already announced reopening measures. And the board chairman of Tyson Foods is warning that the nation's food supply is, quote, breaking as coronavirus forces plants to close. That's from NBC's Daniel Arkin. In a full page ad in three newspapers, John Tyson wrote that, quote, millions of pounds of meat will disappear. And he also warned of limited product in grocery stores until their, fac their facilities are able to fully operate again. Now, the U.S. Department of Agriculture said in a statement that the food supply chain is a, quote, critical industry in America and that they were working with the FDA and CDC 
CDC to ensure that it remains, quote, safe and secure. And lastly, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi formally endorsing former Vice President Joe Biden for president today, calling him a, quote, voice of reason and resilience with a clear path to lead us out of this crisis. Also today, Pelosi saying Democrats would be pushing a vote by mail measure in Congress's next coronavirus relief bill ahead of the 2020 presidential elections. And those are the latest headlines for this hour, keeping you informed at home. We'll be back a little later with more. Allison. All right, Alexa, thank you so much for keeping us informed. We'll check in with you a little bit later. And you can, of course, visit our live blog at NBCNews.com slash coronavirus at any time. We always have the latest updates there. Tennessee is reopening restaurants today. Retail shops will be back in business later this week with some pretty strict guidelines. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber is in Cleveland, Tennessee. And Ellison, first of all, welcome to NBC News Now, your first live hit with us. We are so thrilled to have you. Uh, We know you're outside the little diner there. Tell us a little bit about the rules for reopening restaurants in Tennessee and uh, what employees and customers there are telling you about it. Right. So the governor, Governor Lee's plan for reopening business in this state applies to all but six counties, the biggest, most populated counties, big cities like Nashville and Memphis. They're going to have their own reopening plans. But for the other nine, 89 counties in Tennessee, the governor's stay at home order officially expires on April 30th. As you said, restaurants, they have been allowed to start opening today, though there's a long list of guidelines they are supposed to be following following, like reducing their capacity to 50 percent or less, as well as having all of their employees wear masks, overly sanitizing areas as well as menus whenever they get the chance, at least every two hours. Uh, As you said, retail will then open up uh, on Wednesday. Then we'll see more openings happening uh, on Friday. As for that diner you mentioned, the Little Diner on First, they are a true family-owned diner. They have been hit hard by this pandemic. They have tried to transition to doing takeout, carryout delivery, but they've struggled with that greatly. Today, they opened up their in-person dining at 7 a.m. They didn't have a whole lot of customers, though they had some regulars show up. They said the owner They told me that they were torn. They felt like they were worried about the safety and health of their employees, but they also felt like they needed to give them an opportunity to make money because they really haven't had that opportunity for the last few weeks. Today, they, as well as their employees, they were working on adjusting to a new normal of face masks and social distancing. Listen here. I'm worried for my staff. I'm worried for my customers. Uh, You know, and it's just, it's a tough decision. It really is. It's pretty much our, my normal hangout spot when I come to eat. Uh, so they have great food, just great people, great environment, and I saw a chance to, to support them even more. As of yesterday evening, the Tennessee Department of Health says there are a little over 9,600 positive COVID-19 cases in this state. The governor's office tells me that their day-over-day percentage increase has remained stable the last 14 days and that they have dramatically expanded testing. But still this weekend, this state saw their largest single-day increase of coronavirus coronavirus cases. On Saturday to Sunday, they saw an increase of 500 positive cases. Some people are looking at that number and they're saying perhaps it's too early to open even some counties because then it caused confusion in other counties where they're seeing those increases and still higher numbers of coronavirus cases. Allison. Yeah, Ellison, I mean, it certainly begs the question. I know you spoke with the governor. Uh, mm-hmm. If you saw such a jump over the weekend, why open now? I-, I think a lot of people probably think maybe it's just too soon. Yeah, it's interesting because in this county where we are, it's Bradley County. They, as of Sunday evening, had 43 mm-hmm. positive coronavirus cases. The governor's office will try and tell you that they're opening counties that are in more rural areas where they don't have as many cases. Places like Memphis and Nashville, they're getting to decide what they do mm-hmm. on their own. In the counties where those cities are, they each have over 2,000 cases. But still, even people in this county tell me they feel like it's just too soon and there's concern about this idea of a patchwork and it being confusing for people. And if you have some people in higher uh, areas in high, with higher cases, say Memphis coming to other areas, does it really matter if you wait to reopen in some of those counties, but reopen in all of the others? And on that time, we'll tell.
Yeah. One last question before you go. I know you did mention that retail will open mm-hmm. later this week with restrictions. Do we know yet what the specific restrictions are there uh, or, or are we waiting for later in the week to know more about that rollout? The biggest one is that they, like restaurants, are supposed to keep their capacity, the amount of customers they have in at any time, uh, at 50 percent or below of their normal occupancy. But the thing here to remember with the governor's recommendations is that he has said that they're not going to enforce them. He says he believes that businesses as well as customers and consumers will enforce them. But in terms of any state or police officers enforcing these regulations, that's not going to happen here. Ellison, thank you so much uh, for the report there from Tennessee. And again, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you as part of the NBC family. Hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you. Movie theaters and restaurants in Georgia are back up and running today. It is part of the state's controversial second phase of reopening. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta. Well, Allison, here in Georgia, this is essentially the reopening part two. We know that last week we saw a number of salons, barber shops, even tattoo parlors, bowling alleys free to open their doors across the state. Well, today, movie theaters and restaurants, dine-in restaurants, are going to be joining that number. This is one of the restaurants. It's a Jay Christopher's here in Atlanta. This is something, you know, I spoke with the owner, and they say that they've seen a kind of trickle of customers in throughout the day or so. Typically, around lunchtime especially, this place would be packed, but they've seen only a fraction of the customers that they typically do. Do. Now, for the business owners that I've spoken to, for some of them, it is a difficult decision to reopen. They talk about the fact that for the past six weeks or so, they've had their dining rooms closed. Yes, they've been doing takeout orders or delivery orders, but really, that does not bring in nearly the amount of profit that they usually get when they have people here feel, filling the dining room. In fact, the manager here told me that they've only seen about a third of the profits that they typically do. Here's what she had to say about the decision to reopen. We've had probably about three tables. Um, dine-in service to come in. They were excited to come in, excited that we were open. And, um, you know, I think it's just going to take a little time for everything to get back to normal. You saw three tables today. Compare that to your normal rush. Um, Normal rush is like almost a full house, so at lunchtime. So this is quite a big difference, but I have high hopes we'll be back to normal in no time. And Allison, on the flip side of this, we have seen people who are very strongly opposed to opening, who say that there's no way that they're opening their doors. They say that, yes, they are hurting financially, and yes, they are in dire straits. But when they look at the timing, when they look at the number of cases, they just don't feel comfortable not only opening their doors to the public, but bringing their employees back in. I spoke with one bar owner who tells me that he isn't expecting to open his bar in downtown Atlanta until sometime in June, possibly. So we're getting kind of a mixed reaction for those who say they're ready, they're enthusiastic and those who are very, very hesitant. Now, one thing that we do need to point out, Allison, is that for restaurants to open up, in order to open up, they have to satisfy about 39 different requirements set forth by the governor. That includes social distancing inside. No parties greater than six are allowed to be seated at the same table. Uh, Employees have to wear masks, have to get temperature checks. So those are some of the things that the governor has put in place before any of these restaurants can reopen. We spoke with a number of people, though, who said that they are out fitting their restaurants for what they say could potentially be the policy going forward for some time to come. Allison. After more than five weeks of lockdown, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy has released plans to slowly reopen the state. Stay at home orders will remain until new new case numbers drop. Hospitals are no longer operating in crisis mode and statewide testing rates double. Now, today, five parks in New Jersey's in Jersey City rather reopened with some restrictions. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is joining me live now from Berry Lane Park in Jersey City. And Kathy, first, tell us what it's been like at the park today. I know the weather hasn't exactly been great, but are people taking advantage of the opportunity to be outside, get some fresh air? Hey, Allison. Yeah, the weather hasn't been uh, pleasant at all today. It's been windy. It almost feels like a return to winter. And that's probably why a lot of people have uh, stayed away from this park and they're still kind of hunkered down at home. But we have seen a handful of people coming out. Uh, They are getting in a workout finally, stretching out their legs. We've seen people coming out with their dogs. It's kind of coming out for a a quick stroll and they have their masks on. Gloves um, are also recommended. Um, but on the flip side, you know, there are some critics as well. There was a healthcare worker I spoke with earlier this morning. She kind of stopped in her tracks when she realized what was happening with the reopening of this park. And she 
worries that when the weather does improve and it gets uh, warmer, more people will be out. And this is just asking for trouble. She is concerned that they will see crowds here in the coming weeks um, and people won't be practicing social distancing. So her big concern is, is a potential surge in cases. But, you know, some of the people who we talked to who are getting in that workout, they were just excited to be outdoors. Um, we spoke with a a New Jerseyan uh, Christian who said he was excited to kind of put down the video game and get out and, and play a little soccer today, Allison. Kathy. I think it's time. I think little by little, I think we should start coming out, you know, testing the waters, you know, still social distancing a little bit. Um, but I think uh, I think people get the point by now. If you see it on Instagram, Facebook, all over the place, it's kind of like, yeah, we want to go out outside, like we miss you. <laughs> so you kind of take advantage of the fact that you know the city is allowing this, you know, little by little. Kathy, I think a lot of folks know by now that New Jersey has the second highest number of coronavirus cases and deaths in the country. So why are these parks in Jersey City opening right now? So, Allison, this really comes um, under the direction of the mayor, who felt that after seven weeks of locking down these parks, it was about time that they loosened some of the restrictions. And I do want to point out that uh, not uh, the entire park isn't uh, entirely open. Uh, the tennis court is still closed. Mm -hmm. uh, the playground is also still closed. So there are a lot of restrictions in place, but the mayor felt like, hey, this is really important for the mental health, but also for the, the physical health of the community. So here's a little bit more on our conversation about why he decided it was open up, uh, uh, important to open up today. Take a listen. The reality is that when you know politicians say that um, if people go outside or we open it up anything too soon, things will revert back and there'll be more cases. That's probably true, but the only thing that will change that is a vaccine or a treatment. And so it's not realistic to say that we're going to keep everything closed for 18 months or five months or six months. So you got to incrementally slowly move in a positive direction. So, Allison, there are folks on the ground. We saw a police officer basically monitoring the situation here to make sure that people are still following the rules. You have someone uh, from the city as well passing out masks and gloves. So they are really driving home the point that they want people to practice safety if they do decide to come out here. Kathy, what more can you tell us about the state's reopening plan? It really sounds like the governor is moving slowly and cautiously here uh, and trying to keep New Jerseyans safe. Allison, that is exactly right. I mean, he does not have an exact date when the stay-at-home order will be lifted. He talked about this six-point plan, and I'll give you some of the highlights. Essentially, they will be monitoring the data and the metrics very closely and watching those numbers uh, trend downward, and that's going to be key. And he's going to be following the, the CDC guidelines and making sure those numbers continue to, to fall over a 14-day period. He also highlighted the importance of expanding testing. And he said by the end of May, he hopes to double the amount of testing for the state. He also talked about contact tracing, and he said it will look like a, a combination of things. Technology meets boots on the ground, so people will be collecting that information um, and, and holding on to that information as they look to reopen the state. And then he also talked about uh, securing places for people to self-isolate. So in case there is another surge in cases, they are prepared and they have uh, the proper resources in place for, for those who fall ill. So once all of those benchmarks are uh, working together and they're all in place, then the state can slowly start to, to roll out efforts to reopen the economy, Allison. Kathy, we know New Jersey is working with several other Northeast states to sort of coordinate their reopening efforts. What has the governor been saying this week about how they're doing that and consulting with each other to make all these tough decisions together? Yeah, I, I think it's a sentiment that a lot of the neighboring uh, governors have been echoing for several weeks now. I mean, they want to work in conjunction with the states. Uh, Governor Murphy said he wants to work in harmony, and he gave us an example. He said it doesn't make sense for a restaurant in Jersey City to open up uh, ahead of a restaurant in lower Manhattan. This needs to kind of come together around the same time so people aren't crossing borders because this really wouldn't help uh, slow the spread of the virus, Allison. All right, Kathy Park in Jersey City, thanks so much for being with us. Hope you're staying safe and well. Thanks. 
New York City is closing off 40 miles of streets to cars so that people can walk them instead. Mayor Bill de Blasio saying it'll help people keep a social distance while still getting outside. The city will first focus on closing streets around parks and in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods. The ultimate goal here is to have 100 miles of streets to walk on throughout the city. President Trump wants to pull all U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. That's according to two current and one former senior U.S. official. They say the president is concerned about a major coronavirus outbreak there. NBC News correspondent Carol Lee joins me now. And Carol, what else do we know about these conversations to pull troops from Afghanistan? Well, what we know, according to the sources that we spoke with, is that the president basically brings this up almost every day. And he's the argument is that we've been in Afghanistan for almost two decades and that it's time to to pull troops out. Um, you know, they're still taking on some casualties here and there. The president tried to do a deal with the Taliban that was just intended to then have the Taliban try to cut a deal with the Afghan government so that the U.S. could fully leave eventually a peace plan to end the war, and that's really stalled. That's not having progress in the way that he wants it to. And now you have Afghanistan or this threat of coronavirus with about, I think we have, we're supposed to go down to 8,600 troops by mid-July from the 12, roughly 12,000 that were there. But that's a lot, obviously a lot of U.S. forces, and the president's expressed concern to his advisors that there's a force protection issue, that these troops are exposed uh, on top of already being exposed and us having been mm -hmm. there um, for almost two decades. And so that's kind of the nature of the conversations that have been happening inside the White House for the past few weeks. Yeah, Carol, we know the president campaigned, obviously, in 2016, promising to end foreign wars. You've mentioned we are already drawing down troops in Afghanistan. How likely is a total troop withdrawal? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, Every president since the war in Afghanistan began has struggled with this issue of what to do with Afghanistan, how right. to wind down the war. And President Trump, as you said, he campaigned on ending all and what he calls the endless wars, um, and he's really struggled to do that. And I, and you know, there's some there's different camps. You know, the Pentagon has argued that you can't pull all troops out of Afghanistan because then you create a vacuum that's going to be filled with potential terrorists. Um, the Taliban could resurge in a way that, that the U.S. would not find um, acceptable. Um, and there could all kinds of threats could come, come out of that. So they would like to leave at least a small number of troops in Afghanistan. And I think that now, you know, look, this, this is a president who's completely unpredictable and has sent out a tweet to say all troops are coming over from Syria and completely upended a policy there. So the Pentagon is prepared for this. Um, the likelihood right. of it is, mm -hmm. is, is less so than I think um, the discussions might, might suggest, because what people have told us is that they're more likely that they'll just consolidate the troops that are there once they get down to 8,600 into very specific areas um, in Afghanistan to try to protect them from a coronavirus epidemic. Uh, what's the latest there on the Taliban peace deal? I know we had been talking about that a whole mm -hmm. lot several months ago, and it seems like progress there has really trailed off. Yeah, it kind of has. Uh, you know, they've the, obviously the deal was announced a couple of months ago. Um, there was a lot of mm -hmm. hope that this would work out and they would the Taliban would come down to sit with the Afghan government and they would reach some sort of agreement or at least begin negotiations. But the government in Kabul has really struggled to set aside their own internal differences. Um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo went there recently to try to tell them, look, you need to get it together or else the president's out of here and we're going to cut your aid and we'll pull the troops out. Um, that seems to have had a little bit of effect, but it's still not anywhere near where mm -hmm. the White House would hope that it would be at this point. All right. Carol Lee, thank you so much for bringing us the latest here on the situation in Afghanistan. Hope you're staying safe and well. Thanks. You too. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays, starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
ABC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up we hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together i'm lester holt and for all my colleagues at nbc news take care if it's asking the tough questions would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown if it's asking for accountability respirators and ventilators has the federal government stepped up enough if it's navigating the new normal in america and if it's sunday it's meet the press the coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Small businesses were able to start applying for a second round of coronavirus relief funding today. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard joins me now from a local pizza shop in Glendale, Arizona. And Vaughn, that pizza shop didn't get in on the first round of funding from the Paycheck Protection Program. What is the owner over there telling you about what they're going through and, and how they're doing? Let's be clear, Allison. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of small businesses, truly small businesses across the country, like this Italian restaurant, La Piazza El Forno here in Old Town Glendale. To give you an idea, we're on the west side, kind of west of Phoenix here. And, you know, for my own personal perspective, my grandma went to the high school just two blocks down the road from here. You're talking about communities where families have existed, you know, for in some places in New York for hundreds of years and for here several decades. And right. suddenly you're looking at the real risk of you know, the collapse of businesses. This is one of three establishments that Justin Piazza owns, pizza businesses that he owns. I was just talking just down, two doors down, you can actually see Cheryl Lynn. She is literally packing up today her boutique shop, um, uh, uh, closing this location because they do not have the funding. She did not get PPP funding. She did not get disaster relief funding. Her own stimulus check has not come in, Allison. Uh, this is what these businesses are facing here. That PPP loan that you mentioned, uh, this was that, uh, that pot of money that was intended for small businesses. There was $349 billion in that first round that went out, and today $322 billion was put up. But the issue is that a lot of these small businesses didn't actually get it, and it was others, including many major corporations that did, Allison. Yeah, Vaughn, so what happens now, as you mentioned, there are thousands of small businesses like La Piazza El Forno uh, that were effectively left in the queue after that first round of funding ran out. So what happens now? Are they first in line uh, for round two? Do they have to apply all over again? Do, do they know? No, they did not have to apply again. They were told that they were like Justin Piazza here, the owner here. They were left in the queue by the banks. He was informed by Chase Bank that he was in the queue and his application would be processed if in fact the Congress replenished that Paycheck Protection Program fund, which they have. But the question is, even for those folks that applied for the round one, was there even enough money? Was this 322 billion even enough money? Right. To give you an idea, for that initial $349 billion, just 17% of it, Allison, was doled out in the form of loans that were less than 150,000, meaning most of your local coffee shops or the local bookstore or pizza shop or your local concert venue 
uh, most of those were not the ones that received the benefits uh, of the loan. And when you're looking at here, you know, Justin said he had told his workers, don't file for unemployment, uh, stick with us. PPP funding is on the way. We'll continue to pay you. We'll continue to try to operate our business the best we can. But he has seen 70 to 80 percent drop off in revenue and has been paying his employees and has none of those PPP funds to his name. Vaughn, it's just, uh, I can't even find the words to describe it because it is so upsetting to hear about businesses like that, small businesses doing the right thing, trying to pay their people, when we have also heard so many stories uh, of major, major corporations who got money and now are giving it back. Uh, that was a huge problem the first time around, that these big businesses scooped up a lot of the money. You've been speaking with the yeah. Small Business Administration. Administration. Have they told you what they're doing to prevent that from happening again? Or are we just going to see more of the same, more little guys like Justin uh, getting shut out? Allison, the Small Business Administration in these last weeks since that first round uh, of funds cleared up, they put out additional guidance, essentially a message to some of these bigger companies saying that when you certify that you have no other means to turn to, that means that you are making the claim to the government that you are going to be relying on this small business loan. You've seen several companies like Shake Shack uh, and Ruth's Chris return that money. Uh, the Los Angeles Lakers today, according to ESPN, even returned money. Uh, you know, because yep. they, when you're talking about these a large, a lot of these publicly traded companies, they could potentially draw from other assets that, frankly, places like this pizza shop uh, do not have. There was also $60 billion as part of the second round of funding, Allison, that was dedicated to small banks and credit unions. Mm -hmm. Those those institutions were meant to help a lot of these smaller banks because these bigger institutions had existing loans uh, with some of these bigger companies. And that ultimately was what pushed out a lot of these smaller firms. And I, I want to note, I was just talking with an individual here in Phoenix that works for one of those local credit unions, and he said, that they have struggled today. The SBA website has been down on and off throughout the day. He himself has been working on trying to submit an application, literally one application, since it opened up six hours ago. So, uh, you know, this doesn't appear to be boding well. And we should note, uh, I was talking to a, a former uh, Small Business Administration official, Allison, here over the weekend, and I said, what went wrong here? And he said, a lot of it really came down to the fact that Congress didn't put anything in the law uh, that, you know, this was, what they did put was saying that it's a first come, first serve basis. So those meaning the bigger corporations are most likely to get those funds instead of making it on a need basis. And that is why I think that there's a lot of right. concern here to the extent to which that second round of funding even makes it to these smaller, truly small businesses, Allison. Vaughn, it's infuriating. It is upsetting. And as a country, we should be doing a whole lot better by our small businesses. Uh, I hope that Justin does better this second time around. And I hope you'll let us know uh, if they are able to get some small business help. Vaughn, thank you so much, my friend. Will do. Thanks, my friend. The CDC is expanding its list of coronavirus symptoms beyond fever, cough, and shortness of breath. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. And Dr. John, six new symptoms on the CDC coronavirus list. Six new things for people to worry about. Oh, my goodness, do I have this? Am I sick? What are they? And Allison, it's not so much the worrying about it, but they wanted to add these extra symptoms so people could get an understanding of if they possibly had coronavirus and then if they can get tested. But we also have a better idea of how many numbers are out there. And like you said, fever, cough, shortness of breath, we've been talking about those for at least two or three months as the main symptoms behind coronavirus. Right. We're also finding out that people are having these other symptoms, chills, repeated shaking with chills, shortness of breath is a big one, muscle pain, headaches, sore throat, and then that loss of taste and smell. These are unique symptoms. And if you have these symptoms yes, by themselves, they're saying that it's one of those things, again, that you want to make sure you get checked for coronavirus or at least isolate yourself from other people so you don't pass it on. 
Dr. John, it's so good to know on the flip side, though, you know, there's so many people sitting at home going through the checklist so often wondering uh, if they have the coronavirus because it's just such a scary thing uh, and people just aren't sure. Uh, Something else interesting out today, the World Health Organization saying there's no evidence that having the coronavirus once prevents you from getting it again. There has been so much hope riding on antibodies and potential immunity. What does that announcement from the WHO mean? And Allison, the big thing to know here is they're not saying that people can get coronavirus a second time because I've seen headlines saying that. Instead, what they're saying is we don't know okay. how much protection you get if you have antibodies to coronavirus. You know, once you get sick, the reason you recover Got is it. because your immune system develops antibodies. Those antibodies stick around. The tests do show those antibodies, but we're not sure at what level they're showing them. And we're actually not sure of how long you might have that protection if you do. And we're not sure how much that protection is going to be over the next year or so. Part of that's because it's simply a new virus. We haven't had time to tell that. The other issue is, and the World Health Organization is specifically saying, some of these tests you have to be careful of because they're antibody tests that might not be very accurate. And they're giving you this false sense of security, this false positives, thinking, okay, I tested positive. I'm okay. I can go out and do whatever I want. I don't have to wear a mask for social distance. That's what they're warning against. They're saying, even if you get a positive, still do all the things we're all doing because it could be a false positive. But it is a test that we can use to look at populations and see what's going on, see the things we might be missing. And now we know from these studies they've been doing with the antibody test that there's more coronavirus out there than we thought. So again, they're not saying you can get it a second time. They're saying we simply don't know how long it lasts, if it lasts at all. And it can help us as a tool to to make sure that the population is getting under control as far as getting sick, but it's not something you should rely on if and by itself. A good warning there. Uh, Dr. John, this morning we got the results, or the first results rather, of a clinical trial for the arthritis drug Kevzara as a possible coronavirus treatment. What did that trial show? So, Allison, we've been getting some disappointing news on different drug trials. Hydroxychloroquine is one of them. Yeah. This one as well, the Kizara, it's looking like it's not going to work as well as we thought. It's an arthritis drug. And they thought, okay, okay, one of the things it might do, it might cut down on the inflammation from something called a cytokine storm, which is basically the immune system kind of going into overdrive and causing its own issues. And, and mm-hmm. people die from that, unfortunately. But what they found out, it doesn't really seem to be working for. In a small percentage of population of the people they study who are very sick, it seemed to help them with breathing. But overall, it didn't seem to give the results. But these are small studies still, so they're going to keep looking at it. But I think the message here is that, you know, we're looking at these drugs. We need time to study these drugs. And I know everybody, myself included, wants something right now because this is hitting us so hard and so heavy. But we need to make sure that we're not causing more harm than good by giving drugs that aren't going to work and giving people, again, that false sense of security saying, I can just take these medicines. I don't have to worry about things. Right now, the best thing we can do is social distancing, hand washing, wearing masks, those things we know that work. And eventually we'll start seeing these drugs, the the ones that do pan out. We'll start seeing the vaccine come hopefully 12 to 18 months and we'll get it better under control then. But until now, it's going to be up to us to make sure we get it under control doing the things we know that work. We know Georgia's in its second phase of reopening today, and a few more states are considering opening up some of their businesses, too. Uh, The White House Corona Task Force, though, saying that social distancing is going to be part of our lives for a while. Here's Dr. Burks on Meet the Press this weekend. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one another as we move through these phases. So, Dr. John, what's your take here? Uh, Is social distancing going to be part of our lives for a while now? I think it is going to be part of our lives. And I think what she said kind of took a lot of people by surprise, but it really shouldn't have too much because all along experts have been talking, and I've been even mentioning on your show, that coronavirus is not going to go away this summer. It's going to get better under control. We're going to see less cases, but it's not going to completely go away. And then in the fall, everyone's expecting for it to come back a lot harder than it happened this summer. Not as much as we see now, but definitely more so than the summer. And so what that's telling us is that we need to make sure that we do practice that social distancing, even through the summer, maybe not as intensely as we do now, but certainly keep an ear out for public health officials to to let you know that if you do start seeing cases creep up in your community, in your neighborhood, they might say, hey, it's time to go back inside for a little bit. It's time to get that six foot distancing and maybe even wearing masks while you're outside. The things we know that can help because We're not sure where this is going to go. Remember, novel coronavirus, it's brand new. We don't know a lot about it. We certainly don't even have a year's worth of data, only a few months. 
This can take a few right. years to get an understanding of where this is going to go. So now for the summer, I agree with her. I think social distancing is going to be there. Probably not as intense as it is now, but to some degree, I think we're going to have to do that, Allison. All right, Dr. John, as you've said, still so many questions about the coronavirus. Thank you for helping us answer some of them. You bet. Have a good day. Liquor stores in Pennsylvania are now open for pickup and delivery after being closed since mid-March. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett joins me now from Exton, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philadelphia. Maura, I've lived in Pennsylvania. My husband is from Philly, so we are very familiar with the state liquor laws there. But can you explain for our viewers the liquor shutdown and what folks there now have to do to buy booze? Yeah, Allison, when the rest of the country looks at Pennsylvania, it's kind of a bizarre situation when it comes to buying beer, wine and liquor. You can't buy liquor at the same stores you buy beer at and vice versa. And so when the governor said that these state owned liquor and wine stores didn't qualify as life sustaining, that's why they shut down back in mid-March. And so a lot of people here in Pennsylvania not so happy about that. People actually crossing state lines to go down to Maryland, Delaware, even New Jersey to pick up some liquor and wine. And so today is, is a really welcome day for a lot of people here. We've seen dozens of people come through this store, several people just pulling away. But basically, early this morning, they can start calling in their orders over the phone or ordering it online. And then they get assigned a pickup time to come in and they just pull right up. A lot of people wearing masks today. And then they go to a table that's sitting where the normal entrance of the store is. They give their name. They've already paid by credit card over the phone. And a clerk will come and bring them their order. They put it in the trunk. They drive away. And so it's, it's pretty simple. It's just like we've seen with a lot of delivery and takeout with restaurants. But this is the first time in over a month that people are having access to these types of purchases here. What are folks there telling you about it? How are they how are they dealing with the new rules? Are they OK with it? Yeah, I talked to a couple of people and, you know, some people were really lucky and got through on their first try. But the state liquor board tells me that they're seeing a really high increased demand here. Actually, when they started doing online sales in the recent weeks, they saw more online sales in just three weeks where people were ordering online and then getting deliveries, not coming to physical stores. There was more sales in three weeks than they saw in the entire fiscal year of 2019. And so when people were able to start calling in their orders this morning, we met several people who said that they had to try several times. Allison, I personally tried about 10 times and kept getting the busy signal. And so, <laughs> you know, people have to be very persistent in order to get their alcohol here today. But when it comes to opening other businesses, I was curious if customers think that this is a good first step for the governor to start opening other businesses around the state. And we, we saw some differing opinions. Take a listen to what a couple customers told me. So I think the way they're doing it, uh, which is pretty cautious and conservative, I think it's OK. I think if they were to open up business as usual and just let people come streaming into the store, you know, coming up, getting in the line, check out, uh, that probably would not be good. But I think the way they're doing it here is good. We just don't know enough, I, I don't think. And even if you did have the virus and, you know, you have the antibodies and you're healthy, it, you still shouldn't be out in public because there's other people that might still have it or don't know and could be exposed. So that's the big question here is really how many people are positive. And Allison, I'm standing in this massive parking lot. The other end of it is pretty much empty because the movie theater, a lot of restaurants, workout boutique, fitness studios, stuff like that is all still closed because everything is still under that strict stay at home restriction that the governor put in place about a month and a mm -hmm. half ago now. Maura, you mentioned uh, liquor stores were not considered essential or life-sustaining at the beginning of that statewide closure. Why the change now? Was it all those folks who were crossing state lines? Was that causing concern? That was part of it. Yeah, Allison, obviously, when, when these states issue stay-at-home orders, they're really hoping people literally stay at home, not go into other states and then can spread the virus that way. So that's definitely something people are concerned about. But this is also just kind of a slow rollout as the governor's looking ahead to start reopening certain businesses in coming weeks. This Friday, he's allowing construction projects to start because that was another very strict thing that Pennsylvania had going on that some other states didn't. And then coming up to May 8th, he's really looking to try to ease some of those stay at home restrictions and and see some other businesses, people go back to work. So this this kind of slow rollout of the curbside pickup and delivery is, is just kind of a practice run, if you will. 
Yeah, you mentioned that reopening in phases. Are there specific things that the governor's looking at as he makes that decision to reopen, as you mentioned, construction and manufacturing or bars and restaurants doing uh, more than just takeout delivery? What what specifically is guiding those decisions? Yeah, so the governor has a color-coded map that he's looking at. He said that he's looking at a data-driven mm -hmm. and regional reopening. When he was shutting everything down back in March, he did it county by county. And so the way things will reopen will kind of be okay. similar to that. So the, the color-coded map is a kind of a reverse traffic light. It's red, and then it goes to yellow and then green. And so right now, the entire state is red, which means nothing's ready to reopen as he would like to see it. But he's looking at the ratio in certain regions of positive new cases to compared to population. And he also said he needs to make sure that there's testing and contact tracing programs in place. And right now, he said he doesn't have he doesn't have the funding for these tracing programs or an actual plan to do that. So none of these counties are in yellow yet, but he's looking ahead to maybe that'll be changing in the next couple of weeks so that when May 8th comes around, certain child care facilities can open, people can leave their homes, less stay at home restrictions, and certain people can can go back to work. And then once you get into the green zone, that's kind of the back to normal. But of course, it's our new normal, which means you're still wearing masks, you're still paying attention to social distancing, but hopefully the economy and everything like that can get back fully into motion here in Pennsylvania. But, you know, the state, the, the secretary of health has warned we were supposed to be at the peak here in Pennsylvania around today. Yesterday is when a lot of the models were, were looking at and they're not sure that they've reached the peak yet. They're still seeing an increase in cases, an increase in deaths, and nothing has totally plateaued yet. So so they're not sure if, if the next two weeks are really that feasible. Yeah, a lot of states dealing with similar concerns. More about just outside of Pennsylvania, uh, just outside of Philadelphia, rather. Thanks so much. Hope you're doing well. Thanks, Allison. You too. After six weeks of strict lockdown, Spain is starting to ease its stay-at-home orders. For the Thank first you. time in over a month, children are now allowed to play outside. NBC News correspondent Willa Marks has the latest from Madrid. For little Devrim, this is a big moment. It's not his birthday, but instead his first time outside in a long while. <laughs> That kind of sound has been absent from Spanish streets since March 14th, when millions of kids across the country were placed under strict lockdown. I think around 40 days now or something, 45 or something yeah, like that. You lose track. So Devrim, like many other children, is making up for all that lost time by exploring. Is it a stone? And moving a lot. The minute you're out the door, he just wants to run. Mum, Umut, from New Jersey, and Dad, Thad, from Minnesota, found it tough keeping a two-year-old inside so long, but say it made sense, too. Once we were all seeing the numbers go up and how, by how much and the very quick increase, I think people took it seriously. In mid-March, Spain's daily death toll started to spike, hitting a high of almost 1,000, now slowing to 288 on Sunday, the coronavirus here has killed more than 23,000 people. The horrific figures inside Spain's big cities have meant authorities are taking baby steps out of lockdown. And so for weeks, even months, playgrounds like this one could remain off limits. Who's there? Elias and Sam Block celebrated their refound freedom with Dad Neil. It was just fresh air. Today's fun has a one hour time limit and must take place well within a mile of their front door. But even that, beats being stuck at home. Has your brother been annoying? Has your dad been annoying? Like, what's been the worst bit? Um, like, being with the same people all the time. Your family? Yeah. <laughs> but if you're older than 14, fresh air is still a no-go. So 13-year-old Lorda can walk with her mum. It's so quiet. But her 16-year-old sister, Mariner, cannot. So I'm, like, trying to stay as close as this to the wall, so I'm getting trouble with the police. The streets here remain ringed with checkpoints. This Sunday, after a long absence, they rang out with children's laughter. And that provided some much needed parental relief. And Willem joins me live now. Willem, I have to ask, because these are some of the strictest regulations that they've, we've heard of. Children not allowed outside at all. How did the city uh, enforce that? Well, the weapon that was at the disposal of police here, really, Alison, was fines. And a lot of people we've spoken to over the last few days have talked yeah. about the threat of fines keeping them 
in uh, under control in their door indoors that they need to be. In terms of the actual uh, mechanics of that, you know, I'm four stories up from the street level right now. If I go down to the street and walk a few hundred yards to where I'm staying in the centre of Madrid in a residential neighbourhood, chances are at least one police car will pass me during that time. If you go out on the major roads around the right. city, let alone leaving the city, trying to travel elsewhere in Spain, there are checkpoints everywhere. They want to see your papers, your passport, and they want to hear that you have a valid reason for travelling. Uh, well, and we heard some really delighted and, and very funny children uh, in that piece just talking about being stuck with their family. Uh, but I imagine it, it has been really tough. What are parents telling you about the impact it's had on their kids not being able to be outside for a month? Yeah, it kind of depends on their age to some extent. That little kid we spent time with yesterday, Devrim, very sweet two-year-old. Initially, when he came outside, <laughs> he was incredibly hesitant to be put down by his mum to walk. They said he was much shyer than he had been before oh. the six-week lockdown. Some of the older kids, of course, the challenge for them when they're in their early teens in particular is not spending time physically with their friends at a time when that's super, super important. So a lot of the parents saying that's one of their big concerns, that they're not inside that school environment where they're developing those kind of social skills that are so important. Some of the middle-aged kids, like seven, ten-year-old, let's say, that we spent time with so much pent-up energy and the challenge their parents said was yeah. getting them to sleep early enough because they had so much excess energy. <laughs> oh, well, uh, as someone who needs to get outside every single day to keep my sanity, I completely uh, understand what those families are going through. <laughs> Great to hear that they have a little bit more freedom there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alison. What is going on with Kim Jong-un as the world wonders about his health? The South Korean government says it has intelligence that the North Korean regime is doing business as usual. Here's NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons. The rumors are really swirling now, including one suggesting that Kim Jong-un's surgeon's hands were shaking in fear. Now, U.S. officials have told NBC News of indications that Kim Jong-un has had cardiovascular surgery. But as ever with North Korea, it's really hard to get to the truth. Kim Jong-un has not been seen in public for more than two weeks. These images are thought to show the supreme leader's train near the North Korean coast at a luxury compound. But on Saturday, Kim skipped his second major event, Army Day. It's a deepening mystery with rumors about his poor health and possible demise, making headlines around the globe. Reuters reporting a team including medics flew into North Korea from China. One well-connected Chinese commentator posting to millions of followers, some wait for the official announcement. Suit yourself. Her posts later deleted, but not by her, she claims. South Korea still insisting its intelligence shows nothing unusual. A North Korean newspaper claiming Kim even sent a letter. How closely guarded is Kim Jong-un? How many people around him would know that something is wrong? That would be a very small circle of people. The rumors on the ground are probably people on the outside. When today made a rare trip to the world's most isolated dictatorship, we found Kim Jong-un's image everywhere. So you, you thank Kim Jong-un for this yes. Yes, talk? Yes. Now, it's possible, of course, that Kim Jong-un is simply in lockdown over the coronavirus, but it is so important because, remember, that North Korea is a nuclear-armed nation. If it lost its leader, a weakened world would face another crisis. Keir Simmons, NBC News, London. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
ABC Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. What will it take for the world to get back to work? NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Gwynn has an exclusive look at a, symptom, a new symptom screening technology and how it may play a role in restarting the global economy. We can't break our country over this. We have to get going. What we reopen will be better than what we had before. <laughs> As the debate over when to reopen and restart the country rages, more questions. What will our lives look like? Can fans gather at sporting events, theaters? What about busy workplaces? Some, including New York City's mayor, say part of the new normal should involve health screenings. The important thing to recognize with the temperature checks, they absolutely have a role to play. This device may play a role in getting the country going again. It's called the Symptom Sense Medical Evaluation Gateway. The manufacturer says it can screen up to 600 people an hour for signs of illness. Company CEO Derek Peterson showed me how the technology works at their lab on Long Island, New York. Okay, Vicki, come on through. Okay. As you walk through, face this way and put okay. your feet on the yellow pads. As I walk in, Peterson says this sensor uses ultrasound to measure my height so the machine can adjust. Now we're going to calculate your body temperature and we're also going to look at your heart rate, resting heart rate, and oxygen level by this sensor right directly aimed at your chest area. In less than 10 seconds, this screen tells the operator my external temperature, respiration rate, blood oxygen level, and heart rate. So you're looking at these vital signs. What can that actually tell you about someone's health? Through our combination of looking at these four vitals, we could tell if somebody's well or not well. Peterson says because this is not a medical device, it doesn't require FDA approval. The machine doesn't collect data, and he says the technology to measure these vital signs is non-invasive. We're using a technology called millimeter wave technology to be able to scan the body for respiration rate and heart rate. We're also using our own proprietary technology for determining temperature. We've validated against known equipment in the industry that can verify what we're doing. Let's be clear, this cannot tell me if I have coronavirus. Absolutely not. I can't tell you if you have the coronavirus, but what I can tell you is that you may be sick. It might detect vital sign differences that are consistent with coronavirus, but up to 50% of people People with coronavirus are going to have normal vital signs, no symptoms whatsoever. NBC so News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres says this device is not a magic solution to detecting coronavirus. How important are these vital signs to determining a baseline if someone may or may not be ill? Vital signs are one tool we use to look to see if somebody is sick, but it's not the only tool. People with normal vital signs, if they have other complaints, they still might have a disease. What do you say to critics who say this might give people a false sense of security about what whether or not they're healthy. It's just another tool trying to help people understand in a quick way if they're healthy or not. This is not the end no behold. But who decides what to do with this data? Tech ethicist David Polgar says it will be up to the organizations that use this technology to figure out how they respond. Do you think tools like this are helpful and do you think they will become commonplace? Yes, I do think that they, they can be helpful. We are in an extraordinary situation where I think a lot of people are looking at how do we balance our individual freedoms with more of a collective need for, for society. He compares the new technology to airport screenings after 9-11. I think a lot of us are talking about tools like this and other forms of technology that might have seemed unusual a year ago might be part of our future. And Vicky joins us now. Vicky, I have to ask, what's the price tag on the symptom sense? Uh, I imagine something like this isn't cheap. And where and when might we start seeing it? Yeah, it's not cheap. $35,000 a piece is the selling price wow. right now. The company plans to incorporate a metal detector, too, based on some of the early feedback they've gotten. So if you think about sports stadiums, big companies, theaters, Places where you've got a lot of people who have to enter in a short period of time. They're trying to figure out a way to screen them for both health symptoms and weapons at the same time to try to reduce that and increase the traffic flow. And your second Any question, sense of when it might be something that we see? <laughs> yes. No, 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 they're, saying they're, gonna ship <laughs> they're saying they may start shipping these in about <laughs> a month. The Greek government has confirmed an order of several of these devices, but it's unclear how and where oh, they're cool. going to deploy them. But we're talking major league sports, 
thousands of companies and governments that uh, Symptom Sense says they have interest from at this point. And so this could very well be a part of our future. Very cool. Vicki, thank you so much. Really interesting to see all of the uh, new technology that could be part of our lives very soon. Yeah, and the limitations, too, and the idea of what do you do once you get people's vital signs, that's going to be very important for the organizations that use this technology yeah. to determine. Absolutely. Vicki, great to see you. Thank you so much for being with us again. All right. Take care, Allison. The market's starting off the week on a high note. Investors pretty happy to see that some states are starting to reopen and that others are starting to talk about it. The Dow up well over 300 points today. MSNBC host David Gura joins me now. And David, this decision to start reopening businesses in states like Georgia and Texas and Tennessee has been controversial. Some people think it's just too soon. What are the markets like about it? Yeah, you know, you and I do a little uh, armchair psychology here of investors most days, and, and far be it from <laughs> me to uh, say that I've got it all figured out here when it comes to what investors are, are thinking. But I think that they're seeing some element of confidence here, and it's not a kind of long term thinking about where this might lead, but in the short term, it seems like there are states here who are making a concerted effort to open their economies, investors thinking, that's a good thing, at least for, for the time being. You mentioned a couple of those states. We've got about a half a dozen of them now, Georgia, Mississippi, Oklahoma, uh, and others. And you're right, it has been controversial here. And I guess the big X factor is what happens not in the short term, but what happens in the medium and the long term. You know, By opening up this stuff now, there's the risk that you'd have to shut it down again uh, in a few weeks, a few months, and, and that could have some pretty disastrous effects. I think this dovetails so interestingly with what our colleagues are reporting out of the White House. A big piece out by uh, our co colleagues Carol Lee, Kristen Welker, Monica Alba, and Shannon Pettypiece looking at the White House messaging on this, how the White House is really pivoting away from talking about this as a public health crisis, wanting to talk about this as uh, a chance for economic renewal in this country, making a very concerted effort mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, and today you have a press conference that's going to center on that. The president's going to be speaking out in the, the, the Rose Garden, and that's going to be the focus. It's going to be a focus yep. on, on the economy. I think for investors, they see that shiny object. They, they see this movement away from, from what we've been dealing with for the past week, few weeks and few months. Yeah. David, just when you thought oil couldn't go any lower, we saw prices tank again today. What specifically pushed them lower today? I know the overriding theme here is excessive supply and really weak demand. Yeah, that's the theme, and, and that's the story still. So Cushing, Oklahoma is where a lot of this oil goes. It's priced into WTI futures. It's getting fuller and fuller and fuller, and in a couple of weeks, it's likely that all that capacity is going to be filled up. There's going to be no place to, to put this oil. That's still the story, and it's interesting. When you look at futures a month out and now two months, three months out, you're seeing those futures dropping as well. And what that tells you uh, is that there is a sense that even in a few months' time, this demand issue isn't going to be solved yet, Allison. There's still going to be a, a shortage of, of people wanting to buy oil, needing to buy oil. There's going to be so much oil stuck without being refined. The refinery capacity is something to watch here as well. You take oil, you turn it into gasoline. There are so many refineries in this country just unwilling to do that work to make gasoline because there's so little uh, demand for it. And so, again, that's the major story, as you described it, the, the lack of demand. Uh, you look at the government just trying to figure out what to do here, still talk of maybe putting some of that oil in storage in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Um, there's still talk of maybe the government buying some of that oil uh, while it is so cheaply priced, but no movement on those things. And when you, when you read what analysts are writing about the oil market right now, they say nothing can really change when it comes to pricing until that demand side of the equation is solved. So we're kind of stuck where we have been here for months. David, looking ahead, we have a huge week of earnings kicking off tomorrow. Tech giants, pharmaceuticals, the energy companies, they are all reporting. Uh, what should folks be watching out for here? Yeah, big week for tech, as you mentioned. So Apple reporting, Amazon reporting. Uh, these are companies, of course, that are involved in all of our lives in so many different ways. And sort of what's been buffeting Amazon for so many quarters now has been its cloud computing business. Well, that's now kind of been supplanted by the fact that we're just using it for services much more than we have been uh, in recent times. Facebook is reporting this week. Twitter is reporting this week. Uh, you have Southwest and American Airlines. It'll be interesting to see how those airlines are weathering all of this in terms of the capacity they've had to turn down, um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the, the results that they've, they've experienced in the first quarter. I think what's you know most important to look at as these earnings come across is we're looking at the first few months of this year. That's just the beginning of this story. Uh, now here solidly in the second right. quarter, sort of wondering where things go. 
yeah, things are likely to be bad in that first quarter, but uh, it's really only the beginning chapters of this whole story surrounding the coronavirus, and the expectation is things are going to get a whole lot worse here. I'll highlight one other uh, earning I'm kind of curious about. That's Gilead, the pharmaceutical company. They have a big antiviral yes. drug. There's been some hope that it could be used to treat coronavirus. I think they're reporting on Thursday of this week. Uh, obviously, investors are going to be looking at what new information they have about that, the efficacy of that drug, but also how they could scale up production of a treatment for that uh, for for that antiviral if they needed to. Um, so, yeah, a whole array here between tech, uh, manufacturing, uh, and pharmaceuticals to look forward to this week. I think like 150 S&P 500 companies are reporting this week. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a whole long yeah. list there. David, also on the economic side of things, I know Wednesday's a big day. Federal Reserve is meeting. We're getting first quarter GDP numbers out. Uh, again, what should people be watching for? What are you looking for there? So I mentioned like with earnings, it's the beginning chapters of this story. I think that's true when it comes to GDP uh, as well. We're going to look at first quarter GDP print. It's likely to be bad. I think we're likely to see uh, the, the largest contraction that we've seen in many years. I think the first contraction that we've seen in, in six years. So it's something to watch. And again, it's just like a preview of what's to come, uh, I think. And then you mentioned that Fed meeting. Jay Powell, the, the Fed chairman, has said over and over again that the Fed, the central bank in this country, is willing to do all that it can to keep this economy propped up and, and going. It's unlikely that we're going to see any sort of change to policy announced at this meeting. It's a mm -hmm. two-day meeting, and the, the press conference to follow is going to be a virtual one. It's going to take place on Wednesday. Expectations for that are that he's going to be talking about all the policy tools that we've seen the Fed deploy, all that it's been working on, all that it's been trying to do, perhaps giving us a little bit more color about that. But I don't think that we're going to see the announcement of any new facilities, any new techniques, any new tools that the Fed's trying to deploy here. Uh, but yeah, again, I think when it comes to GDP, it's looking ahead to sort of see mm -hmm. how bad things might get. Uh, and I think with the Fed, it's just reemphasizing the degree to which the Fed is working hard here to keep the economy as strong as it can as it weathers this public health crisis, Allison. Mm -hmm. David, uh, so great to see you. Thanks for being with us. I was so happy to have you here on a Monday that my bookcase and I, we added three whole new books to try to impress you. So few that my producer didn't even notice, but we just wanted to show uh, how delighted that we were to have you here. So it's our little effort on this Monday. Count me impressed, and I promise the bookshelf will make a return when you least expect it. <laughs> we miss it so. <laughs> Talk to you soon. See you soon. Hey, everyone. I'm Allison Mars, watching NBC News Now. A very happy Monday to everyone. Hope you had a good and relaxing weekend. Let's go now to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Liotto. She is, of course, following the latest news and coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, I hope you got a little break this weekend. How about an update? Sure, Allison. So there's lots of news uh, coming out of this weekend. And first from New York, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a plan, a reopening plan over the weekend for his state, which could start as early as May 15th. Now, construction and manufacturing would be the first to reopen in phase one. Phase two would include businesses opening in the order of how essential they are and how much risk they bring. In his press briefing today, Cuomo stressed the importance of monitoring the numbers. But we have the same question, how fast and how steady is the decline? We don't want to see flat. We want to see an increasing decline. And we want to see how fast that decline goes and how low does the decline go, right? When does that hospitalization rate get down to a truly manageable number? Uh, when does the incoming case number get down to a manageable number? Now, the death toll from coronavirus in New York state is over 22,000, according to an NBC News count, and that also includes probable deaths. In an unprecedented move, New York's Board of Elections canceled the presidential primary initially scheduled for June 23rd, following public health concerns. And from NBC's Alicia Fieldstat, quarantine fatigue is real, and as people grow tired of lockdown measures, they're starting to venture outside. Anonymous cell phone data compiled by the University of Maryland shows a nationwide 3% dip in social distancing in compliance. Now, the largest drops in social distancing appeared in southern states, where some governors have already announced reopening measures. And the board chairman of Tyson Foods is warning that the nation's food supply is, quote, breaking as coronavirus forces plants to close. That's from NBC's Daniel Arkin. In a full page ad in three newspapers, John Tyson wrote that, quote, millions of pounds of meat will disappear. And he also warned of limited product in grocery stores until their, fac their facilities are able to fully operate again. Now, the U.S. Department of Agriculture said in a statement that the food supply chain is a, quote, critical industry in America and that they were working with the FDA and CDC 
CDC to ensure that it remains, quote, safe and secure. And lastly, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi formally endorsing former Vice President Joe Biden for president today, calling him a, quote, voice of reason and resilience with a clear path to lead us out of this crisis. Also today, Pelosi saying Democrats would be pushing a vote by mail measure in Congress's next coronavirus relief bill ahead of the 2020 presidential elections. And those are the latest headlines for this hour, keeping you informed at home. We'll be back a little later with more. Allison. All right, Alexa, thank you so much for keeping us informed. We'll check in with you a little bit later. And you can, of course, visit our live blog at NBCNews.com slash coronavirus at any time. We always have the latest updates there. Tennessee is reopening restaurants today. Retail shops will be back in business later this week with some pretty strict guidelines. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber is in Cleveland, Tennessee. And Ellison, first of all, welcome to NBC News Now, your first live hit with us. We are so thrilled to have you. Uh, we know you're outside the little diner there. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the rules for reopening restaurants in Tennessee and uh, what employees and customers there are telling you about it. Right. So the governor, Governor Lee's plan for reopening business in this state applies to all but six counties, the biggest, most populated counties, big cities like Nashville and Memphis. They're going to have their own reopening plans. But for the other nine, 89 counties in Tennessee, the governor's stay at home order officially expires on April 30th. As you said, restaurants, they have been allowed to start opening today, though there's a long list of guidelines they are supposed to be following. Following, like reducing their capacity to 50 percent or less, as well as having all of their employees wear masks, overly sanitizing areas as well as menus whenever they get the chance, at least every two hours. Uh, as you said, retail will then open up uh, on Wednesday. Then we'll see more openings happening uh, on Friday. As for that diner you mentioned, the Little Diner on First, they are a true family-owned diner. They have been hit hard by this pandemic. They have tried to transition to doing takeout, carryout delivery, but they've struggled with that greatly. Today, they opened up their in-person dining at 7 a.m. They didn't have a whole lot of customers, though they had some regulars show up. They said the owner they told me that they were torn. They felt like they were worried about the safety and health of their employees, but they also felt like they needed to give them an opportunity to make money because they really haven't had that opportunity for the last few weeks. Today, they, as well as their employees, they were working on adjusting to a new normal of face masks and social distancing. Listen here. I'm worried for my staff. I'm worried for my customers. Uh, you know, and it's just, it's a tough decision. It really is. It's pretty much our, my normal hangout spot when I come to eat. Uh, they have great food, just great people, great environment. And I saw a chance to, to support them even more. As of yesterday evening, the Tennessee Department of Health says there are a little over 9,600 positive COVID-19 cases in this state. The governor's office tells me that their day-over-day -day percentage increase has remained stable the last 14 days and that they have dramatically expanded testing. But still this weekend, this state saw their largest single-day increase of coronavirus, case, co coronavirus cases. On Saturday to Sunday, they saw an increase of 500 positive cases. Some people are looking at that number and they're saying perhaps it's too early to open even some counties because then it caused confusion in other counties where they're seeing those increases and still higher numbers of coronavirus cases. Allison. Yeah, Ellison, I mean, it certainly begs the question. I know you spoke with the governor. Uh, if you saw such a jump over the weekend, why open now? I, I think a lot of people probably think maybe it's just too soon. Yeah, it's interesting because in this county where we are, it's Bradley County. They, as of Sunday evening, had 43 mm -hmm. positive coronavirus cases. The governor's office will try and tell you that they're opening counties that are in more rural areas where they don't have as many cases. Places like Memphis and Nashville, they're getting to decide what they do mm -hmm. on their own. In the counties where those cities are, they each have over 2,000 cases. But still, even people in this county tell me they feel like it's just too soon. And there's concern about this idea of a patchwork and it being confusing for people. And if you have some people in higher uh, areas in high, with higher cases, say Memphis, coming to other areas, does it really matter if you wait to reopen in some of those counties but reopen in all of the others? And on that time, we'll tell.
Yeah. One last question before you go. I know you did mention that retail will open mm-hmm. later this week with restrictions. Do we know yet what the specific restrictions are there uh, or, or are we waiting for later in the week to know more about that rollout? The biggest one is that they, like restaurants, are supposed to keep their capacity, the amount of customers they have in at any time, uh, at 50 percent or below of their normal occupancy. But the thing here to remember with the governor's recommendations is that he has said that they're not going to enforce them. He says he believes that businesses as well as customers and consumers will enforce them. But in terms of any state or police officers enforcing these regulations, that's not going to happen here. Ellison, thank you so much uh, for the report there from Tennessee. And again, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you as part of the NBC family. Hope to see you very, very soon. Thank you. After more than five weeks of lockdown, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy has released plans to slowly reopen the state. Stay-at-home orders will remain until new, new case numbers drop. Hospitals are no longer operating in crisis mode and statewide testing rates double. Now, today, five parks in New Jersey's in Jersey City rather reopened with some restrictions. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is joining me live now from Berry Lane Park in Jersey City. And Kathy, first, tell us what it's been like at the park today. I know the weather hasn't exactly been great, but are people taking advantage of the opportunity to be outside, get some fresh air? Hey, Allison. Yeah, the weather hasn't been uh, pleasant at all today. It's been windy. It almost feels like a return to winter. And that's probably why a lot of people have uh, stayed away from this park and they're still kind of hunkered down at home. But we have seen a handful of people coming out. Uh, They are getting in a workout finally, stretching out their legs. We've seen people coming out with their dogs. It's kind of coming out for a a quick stroll and they have their masks on. Gloves um, are also recommended. Um, but on the flip side, you know, there are some critics as well. There was a healthcare worker I spoke with earlier this morning. She kind of stopped in her tracks when she realized what was happening with the reopening of this park. And she worries that when the weather does improve and it gets uh, warmer, more people will be out. And this is just asking for trouble. She is concerned that they will see crowds here in the coming weeks um, and people won't be practicing social distancing. So her big concern is, is a potential surge in cases. But You know, some of the people who we talked to who are getting in that workout, they were just excited to be outdoors. Um, We spoke with a a New Jerseyan uh, Christian who said he was excited to kind of put down the video game and get out and and play a little soccer today, Allison. Kathy? I think it's time. I think little by little, I think we should start coming out, you know, testing the waters, you know, still social distancing a little bit. Um, but I think uh, I think people get the point by now. If you see it on Instagram, Facebook, all over the place, it's kind of like, yeah, we want to go out outside, like we miss you. <laughs> so you kind of take advantage of the fact that you know the city is allowing this, you know, little by little. Kathy, I think a lot of folks know by now that New Jersey has the second highest number of coronavirus cases and deaths in the country. So why are these parks in Jersey City opening right now? So, Allison, this really comes um, under the direction of the mayor, who felt that after seven weeks of locking down these parks, it was about time that they loosened some of the restrictions. And I do want to point out that uh, not uh, the entire park isn't uh, entirely open. Uh, The tennis court is still closed. Mm -hmm. Uh, The playground is also still closed. So there are a lot of restrictions in place. But the mayor felt like, hey, this is really important for the mental health, but also for the the physical health of the community. So here's a little bit more on our conversation about why he decided it was open up, uh, uh, important to open up today. Take a listen. The reality is that when, you know, politicians say that um, if people go outside or we open it up anything too soon, things will revert back and there'll be more cases. That's probably true. But the only thing that will change that is a vaccine or a treatment. And so it's not realistic to say that we're going to keep everything closed for 18 months or five months or six months. So you got to incrementally slowly move in a positive direction. So, Allison, there are folks on the ground. We saw a police officer basically monitoring the situation here to make sure that people are still following the rules. You have someone uh, from the city as well passing out masks and gloves. So they are really driving home the point that they want people to practice safety if they do decide to come out here. Kathy, what more can you tell us about the state's reopening plan? It really sounds like the governor is moving slowly and cautiously here uh, and trying to keep New Jerseyans safe. 
Allison, that is exactly right. I mean, he does not have an exact date when the stay-at-home order will be lifted. He talked about this six-point plan, and I'll give you some of the highlights. Essentially, they will be monitoring the data and the metrics very closely and watching those numbers uh, trend downward, and that's going to be key. And he's going to be following the, the CDC guidelines and making sure those numbers continue to, to fall over a 14-day period. He also highlighted the importance of expanding testing, and he said by the end of May, he hopes to double the amount of testing for the state. He also talked about contact tracing, and he said it will look like a combination of things. Technology meets boots on the ground, so people will be collecting that information um, and, and holding on to that information as they look to reopen the state. And then he also talked about uh, securing places for people to self-isolate. So in case there is another surge in cases, they are prepared and they have uh, the proper resources in place for, for those who fall ill. So once all of those benchmarks are uh, working together and they're all in place, then the state can slowly start to, to roll out efforts to reopen the economy, Allison. Kathy, we know New Jersey is working with several other Northeast states to sort of coordinate their reopening efforts. What has the governor been saying this week about how they're doing that and consulting with each other to make all these tough decisions together? Yeah, I, I think it's a sentiment that a lot of the neighboring uh, governors have been echoing for several weeks now. I mean, they want to work in conjunction with the states. Uh, Governor Murphy said he wants to work in harmony, and he gave us an example. He said it doesn't make sense for a restaurant in Jersey City to open up uh, ahead of a restaurant in lower Manhattan. This needs to kind of come together around the same time so people aren't crossing borders because this really wouldn't help uh, slow the spread of the virus, Allison. All right, Kathy Park in Jersey City, thanks so much for being with us. Hope you're staying safe and well. New York City is closing off 40 miles of streets to cars so that people can walk them instead. Mayor Bill de Blasio saying it'll help people keep a social distance while still getting outside. The city will first focus on closing streets around parks and in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods. The ultimate goal here is to have 100 miles of streets to walk on throughout the city. President Trump wants to pull all U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. That's according to two current and one former senior U.S. official. They say the president is concerned about a major coronavirus outbreak there. NBC News correspondent Carol Lee joins me now. And Carol, what else do we know about these conversations to pull troops from Afghanistan? Well, what we know, according to the sources that we spoke with, is that the president basically brings this up almost every day. And he's the argument is that we've been in Afghanistan for almost two decades and that it's time to to pull troops out. Um, you know, they're still taking on some casualties here and there. The president tried to do a deal with the Taliban that was just intended to then have the Taliban try to cut a deal with the Afghan government so that the U.S. could fully leave eventually a peace plan to end the war, and that's really stalled. That's not having progress in the way that he wants it to. And now you have Afghanistan on this threat of coronavirus with about, I think we have, we're supposed to go down to 8,600 troops by mid-July from the 12, roughly 12,000 that were there. But that's a lot, obviously a lot of U.S. forces, and the president's expressed concern to his advisors that there's a force protection issue, that these troops are exposed uh, on top of already being exposed and us having been mm -hmm. there um, for almost two decades. And so that's kind of the nature of the conversations that have been happening inside the White House for the past few weeks. Yeah, Carol, we know the president campaigned, obviously, in 2016, promising to end foreign wars. You've mentioned we are already drawing down troops in Afghanistan. How likely is a total troop withdrawal? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, Every president since the war in Afghanistan began has struggled with this issue of what to do with Afghanistan, how right. to wind down the war. And President Trump, as you said, he campaigned on ending all and what he calls the endless wars, um, and he's really struggled to do that. And I, and you know, there's some there's different camps. You know, the Pentagon has argued that you can't pull all troops out of Afghanistan because then you create a vacuum that's going to be filled with potential terrorists. Um, the Taliban could resurge in a way that, that the U.S. would not find um, acceptable. Um, and there could all kinds of threats could come, come out of that. So they would like to leave at least a small number of troops in Afghanistan. And I think that now, you know, look, this is, this is a president who's completely unpredictable and has 
sent out a tweet to say all troops are coming over from Syria and completely upended a policy there. So I, the Pentagon is prepared for this. Um, the likelihood right. of it is, mm -hmm. is, is less so than I think um, the discussions might, might suggest, because what people have told us is that they're more likely that they'll just consolidate the troops that are there once they get down to 8,600 into very specific areas um, in Afghanistan to try to protect them from a coronavirus epidemic. Uh, what's the latest there on the Taliban peace deal? I know we had been talking about that a whole mm -hmm. lot several months ago, and it seems like progress there has really trailed off. Yeah, it kind of has. Uh, you know, they've the, obviously the deal was announced a couple of months ago. Um, there was a lot of mm -hmm. hope that this would work out and they would the Taliban would come down to sit with the Afghan government and they would reach. They're not spread too far apart, are they? Huh? <laughs> See, they're allowed to. They won't report themselves. Hello, Steve. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm honored to be joined by representatives of many great American retail companies, some of the greatest companies anywhere in the world. And we're talking today about different things, and including distribution and medical diagnostics, etc. You'll see in a second. They're going to say hello. 45 days ago, many of you joined me in the Rose Garden to launch a new partnership with the private sector to dramatically increase and accelerate America's capacity to test for the coronavirus. We've made such strides like it wouldn't even be — you wouldn't even believe it. We just had a call with the governors, and I guess they were just about all on the call, and uh, everybody was very happy. And the testing is going really well, and we're beating — we're doing more than anybody else. Probably some of you are on that call, even though you aren't supposed to be, but I'm sure you were. And the testing itself is going very well. Uh, no complaints. Since then, what we've achieved is really nothing short of amazing. The United States now holds a world record for testing, and by a lot. We've conducted more than 5.4 million tests, more than any other country anywhere in the world. And we're actually growing it very rapidly. You probably heard those numbers just came out. After encouraging governors for several weeks to leverage unused testing capacity in their states, last week we provided contact information for specific labs where they could find additional testing and capacity. Within 48 hours, the number of tests performed across the country began to skyrocket. Early in April, the United States averaged approximately 150,000 tests per day. That's up very, very substantially from a couple of weeks before. And the 150,000 a day has gone to way over 200,000 tests per day since Wednesday. This includes a 122 percent testing increase in Michigan, 124 percent increase in Maryland, and many other locations are right in that vicinity, and some are a little bit higher than that. To provide further guidance and support to the states, today we're releasing our blueprint for state testing plans and rapid response programs. Together, we're accelerating testing for Americans at retail locations across the country, and especially in our African-American and Hispanic communities. We're going very, very strong in those communities. There are currently 73 retail sites, uh, testing sites, and 25 states uh, in, those air in those specific areas. And we're increasing it very substantially. A lot of a lot of progress has been made for African American testing, Hispanic American testing, and Asian American testing. So I look forward to hearing from each of these incredible business people who have worked so strongly with us right from the beginning. I think of it; it was only 45 days ago that we got together, and so much progress has been made. I thought maybe we'd go around the room and uh, let's say just a couple of words, and then we're having a news conference in the Rose Garden because we have. A lot of these folks are going to be joining us, and they'll say something out there. They've got a big gift to our nation and to the uh, people from uh, some of the companies, and I appreciate it. Maybe we'll start off with a very small company, a very small little retailing company known as Walmart, headed by a great guy. Doug, please. Hello. Doug McMillan with Walmart. Nice to see you all. Uh, Larry Marlow, CVS Health. Steve Wisconsin, Quest Diagnostics. Richard Ashworth, uh, Walgreens. Uh, Mark Casper, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Adam Schenker, Rodney McMullen, Kroger. John Nims, U.S. Cotton. Hayward Donegan, Rite Aid. Okay, and we know this gentleman, right? 
So uh, tremendous progress is made, and we'll be talking to you in a little while out at the news conference. Mike, would you have anything to say? Well, just a word of thanks, Mr. President. Um, it's remarkable to think you speak about 45 days ago when we brought many of these uh, retailers together with these remarkable commercial labs. And uh, we build on a public-private partnership that you forged uh, early in the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, Mr. President, when, uh, when we first sat down at your direction with these great commercial labs on March the 4th, uh, our country had conducted uh, roughly 25,000 coronavirus tests. Today, that number is 5.4 million. Uh, and with the support of companies like CVS Health and Walmart, Walgreens, Target, and others, uh, we're now scaling that, working with governors as they implement their testing plans. Uh, and it really is uh, what, what you said early on, Mr. President, this is a whole of America approach. You brought all of America's best together. Uh, our retailers brought together our commercial laboratories and the results speak for themselves. As we heard on the call with the governors today, governors are rapidly expanding testing across the states as they move toward a phased uh, and uh, responsible uh, reopening uh, of their state and this nation's economy. So uh, I'm just uh, I'm glad to be back with this group, Mr. President. I know how grateful you are for the collaboration around this table, and uh, I, I look forward to hearing how we can continue to build even more momentum in, uh, uh, in the progress that we're making as a nation, working with these great retailers and working with these extraordinary commercial labs that have done so much for America in such a short period of time. Thank you very much, Mike. We'll see you outside at the news conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. News now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. was forged in part by shared sacrifice and once again we're called to step up we hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together i'm lester holt and for all my colleagues at nbc news take care
If it's asking the tough questions, would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability, respirators and ventilators, has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America, and if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak, what's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage, answers to your questions, insight from medical experts, and up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. Small businesses were able to start applying for a second round of coronavirus relief funding today. NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard joins me now from a local pizza shop in Glendale, Arizona. And Vaughn, that pizza shop didn't get in on the first round of funding from the Paycheck Protection Program. What is the owner over there telling you about what they're going through and, and how they're doing? Let's be clear, Allison. There are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of small businesses, truly small businesses across the country, like this Italian restaurant, La Piazza El Forno here in Old Town Glendale. To give you an idea, we're on the west side, kind of west of Phoenix here. And, you know, for my own personal perspective, my grandma went to the high school just two blocks down the road from here. You're talking about communities where families have existed, you know, for in some places in New York for hundreds of years and for here several decades. And right. suddenly you're looking at the real risk of you know, the collapse of businesses. This is one of three establishments that Justin Piazza owns, pizza businesses that he owns. I was just talking just down, two doors down, you can actually see Cheryl Lynn. She is literally packing up today her boutique shop, uh, 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 closing this location because they do not have the funding. She did not get PPP funding. She did not get disaster relief funding. Her own stimulus check has not come in, Allison. Uh, this is what these businesses are facing here. That PPP loan that you mentioned, uh, this was that, uh, that pot of money that was intended for small businesses. There was $349 billion in that first round that went out, and today $322 billion was put up. But the issue was that a lot of these small businesses didn't actually get it, and it was others, including many major corporations that did, Allison. Yeah, Vaughn, so what happens now, as you mentioned, there are thousands of small businesses like La Piazza El Forno uh, that were effectively left in the queue after that first round of funding ran out. So what happens now? Are they first in line uh, for round two? Do they have to apply all over again? Do, do they know? No, they did not have to apply again. They were told that they were like Justin Piazza here, the owner here. They were left in the queue by the banks. He was informed by Chase Bank that he was in the queue and his application would be processed if in fact the Congress replenished that Paycheck Protection Program fund, which they have. But the question is, even for those folks that applied for the round one, was there even enough money? Was this 322 billion even enough money? Right. To give you an idea, for that initial $349 billion, just 17% of it, Allison, was doled out in the form of loans that were less than 150000 meaning most of your local coffee shops or the local bookstore or pizza shop or your local concert venue, uh, most of those were not the ones that received the benefits uh, of the loan. And when you were looking at here, you know, Justin said he had told his workers, don't file for unemployment, uh, stick with us. PPP funding is on the way. We'll continue to pay you. We'll continue to try to operate our business the best we can. But... He has seen 70 to 80 percent drop off in revenue and has been paying his employees and has none of those PPP funds to his name. Vaughn, it's just, uh, I can't even find the words to describe it because it is so upsetting to hear about businesses like that, small businesses doing the right thing, trying to pay their people, when we have also heard so many stories uh, of major, major corporations who got money and now are giving it back. Uh, that was a huge problem the first time around, that these big businesses scooped up a lot of the money. You've been speaking with the yeah. Small Business Administration. Have they told you what they're doing to prevent that from happening again? Or are we just going to see more of the same, more little guys like Justin uh, getting shut out? Allison, the Small Business Administration in these last weeks since that first round uh, of funds cleared up, they put out additional guidance, essentially a message to some of these bigger companies saying that when you certify that you have no other means to turn to, that means that you are making the claim to the government that you are going to be relying on this small business loan. You've seen several companies like Shake Shack 
uh, and Ruth's Chris returned that money. Uh, the Los Angeles Lakers today, according to ESPN, even returned money. Uh, you know, because yep. they, when you're talking about these, a, large, a lot of these publicly traded companies, they could potentially draw from other assets that, frankly, places like this pizza shop uh, do not have. There was also $60 billion as part of the second round of funding, Allison, that was dedicated to small banks and credit mm -hmm. unions. That was, those institutions were meant to help a lot of these smaller banks because these bigger institutions had existing loans uh, with some of these bigger companies. And that ultimately was what pushed out a lot of these smaller firms. And I, I want to note, I was just talking with an individual here in Phoenix that works for one of those local credit unions. And he said that they have struggled today. The SBA website has been down on and off throughout the day. He himself has been working on trying to submit an application, literally one application, since it opened up six hours ago. So, uh, you know, this doesn't appear to be boding well. And we should note, uh, I was talking to a, a former uh, Small Business Administration official, Allison, here over the weekend, and I said, what went wrong here? And he said, a lot of it really came down to the fact that Congress didn't put anything in the law uh, that, you know, this was, what they did put was saying that it's a first come, first serve basis. So those meaning the bigger corporations are most likely to get those funds instead of making it on a need basis. And that is why I think that there's a lot of right. concern here to the extent to which that second round of funding even makes it to these smaller, truly small businesses. Allison? Vaughn, it's infuriating, it is upsetting, and as a country, we should be doing a whole lot better by our small businesses. Uh, I hope that Justin does better this second time around, and I hope you'll let us know uh, if they are able to get some small business help. Vaughn, thank you so much, my friend. The CDC is expanding its list of coronavirus symptoms beyond fever, cough, and shortness of breath. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins me now. And Dr. John, six new symptoms on the CDC coronavirus list. Six new things for people to worry about. Oh, my goodness, do I have this? Am I sick? What are they? And Allison, it's not so much the worrying about it, but they wanted to add these extra symptoms so people could get an understanding of if they possibly had coronavirus and then if they can get tested. But we also have a better idea of how many numbers are out there. And like you said, fever, cough, shortness of breath, we've been talking about those for at least two or three months as the main symptoms behind coronavirus. Right. We're also finding out that people are having these other symptoms, chills, repeated shaking with chills, shortness of breath is a big one, muscle pain, headaches, sore throat, and then that loss of taste and smell. These are unique symptoms. And if you have these symptoms yes, by themselves, they're saying that it's one of those things, again, that you want to make sure you get checked for coronavirus or at least isolate yourself from other people so you don't pass it on. Dr. John, it's so good to know. On the flip side, though, you know, there's so many people sitting at home going through the checklist so often wondering uh, if they have the coronavirus because it's just such a scary thing uh, and people just aren't sure. Uh, something else interesting out today, the World Health Organization saying there's no evidence that having the coronavirus once prevents you from getting it again. There has been so much hope riding on antibodies and potential immunity. What does that announcement from the WHO mean? And Allison, the big thing to know here is they're not saying that people can get coronavirus a second time because I've seen headlines saying that. Instead, what they're saying is we don't know okay. how much protection you get if you have antibodies to coronavirus. You know, once you get sick, the reason you recover Got is it. because your immune system develops antibodies. Those antibodies stick around. The tests do show those antibodies, but we're not sure at what level they're showing them. And we're actually not sure of how long you might have that protection if you do. And we're not sure how much that protection is going to be over the next year or so. Part of that's because it's simply a new virus. We haven't had time to tell that. The other issue is, and the World Health Organization is specifically saying, some of these tests you have to be careful of because they're antibody tests that might not be very accurate. And they're giving you this false sense of security, this false positives, thinking, OK, I tested positive. I'm OK. I can go out and do whatever I want. I don't yeah. have to wear a mask or social distance. That's what they're warning against. They're saying, even if you get a positive, still do all the things we're all doing because it could be a false positive. But it is a test that we can use to look at populations and see what's going on, see the things we might be missing. And now we know from these studies I've been doing with the antibody test that there's more coronavirus out there than we thought. So again, they're not saying you can get it a second time. They're saying we simply don't know how long it lasts, if it lasts at all. And it can help us as a tool to, to make sure that the population is getting under control as far as getting sick, but it's not something you should rely on if and by itself. A good warning there. Uh, Dr. John, this morning we got the results, or the first results rather, of a clinical trial for the arthritis drug Kevzara as a possible coronavirus treatment. What did that trial show? 
So, Allison, we've been getting some disappointing news on different drug trials. Hydroxychloroquine is one of them. Yeah. This one as well, the Kizara, it's looking like it's not going to work as well as we thought. It's an arthritis drug. And they thought, okay, okay, one of the things it might do, it might cut down on the inflammation from something called a cytokine storm, which is basically the immune system kind of going into overdrive and causing its own issues. And, and mm -hmm. people die from that, unfortunately. But what they found out, it doesn't really seem to be working for. In a small percentage of population of the people they study who are very sick, it seemed to help them with breathing. But overall, it didn't seem to give the results. But these are small studies still, so they're going to keep looking at it. But I think the message here is that, you know, we're looking at these drugs. We need time to study these drugs. And I know everybody, myself included, wants something right now because this is hitting us so hard and so heavy. But we need to make sure that we're not causing more harm than good by giving drugs that aren't going to work and giving people, again, that false sense of security saying, I can just take these medicines. I don't have to worry about things. Right now, the best thing we can do is social distancing, hand washing, wearing masks, those things we know that work. And eventually we'll start seeing these drugs, that, the ones that do pan out. We'll start seeing the vaccine come hopefully 12 to 18 months and we'll get it better under control then. But until now, it's going to be up to us to make sure we get it under control doing the things we know that work. We know Georgia's in its second phase of reopening today, and a few more states are considering opening up some of their businesses, too. Uh, the White House Corona Task Force, though, saying that social distancing is going to be part of our lives for a while. Here's Dr. Burks on Meet the Press this weekend. Social distancing will be with us through the summer to really ensure that we protect one okay. another as we move through these phases. So, Dr. John, what's your take here? Uh, is social distancing going to be part of our lives for a while now? I think it is going to be part of our lives. And I think what she said kind of took a lot of people by surprise, but it really shouldn't have too much because all along experts have been talking, and I've been even mentioning on your show, that coronavirus is not going to go away this summer. It's going to get better under control. We're going right. to see less cases, but it's not going to completely go away. And then in the fall, everyone's expecting for it to come back a lot harder than it happened this summer. Not as much as we see now, but definitely more so than the summer. And so what that's telling us is that we need to make sure that we do practice that social distancing, even through the summer, maybe not as intensely as we do now, but certainly keep an ear out for public health officials to, to let you know that if you do start seeing cases creep up in your community, in your neighborhood, they might say, hey, it's time to go back inside for a little bit. It's time to get that six foot distancing and maybe even wearing masks while you're outside. The things we know that can help because we're not sure where this is going to go. Remember, novel coronavirus. It's brand new. We don't know a lot about it. We certainly don't even have a year's worth of data, only a few months. And it's going to take a few right. years to get an understanding of where this is going to go. So now for the summer, I agree with her. I think social distancing is going to be there. Probably not as intense as it is now, but to some degree, I think we're going to have to do that, Allison. All right, Dr. John, as you've said, still so many questions about the coronavirus. Thank you for helping us answer some of them. You bet. Have a good day. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. This country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
Nightly News with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. After six weeks of strict lockdown, Spain is starting to ease its stay-at-home orders. For the Thank first you. time in over a month, children are now allowed to play outside. NBC News correspondent Willa Marks has the latest from Madrid. For little Devrim, this is a big moment. It's not his birthday, but instead his first time outside in a long while. <laughs> That kind of sound has been absent from Spanish streets since March 14th, when millions of kids across the country were placed under strict lockdown. I think we're on 40 days now or something, 45 or something yeah, like that. You lose track. So Devrim, like many other children, is making up for all that lost time by exploring... Is it a stone? ..and moving a lot. The minute you're out the door, he just wants to run. Mum, Umut, from New Jersey, and Dad, Thad, from Minnesota, found it tough keeping a two-year-old inside so long, but say it made sense, too. Once we were all seeing the numbers go up and how, by how much and the very quick increase, I think people took it seriously. In mid-March, Spain's daily death toll started to spike, hitting a high of almost 1,000, now slowing to 288 on Sunday, the coronavirus here has killed more than 23,000 people. The horrific figures inside Spain's big cities have meant authorities are taking baby steps out of lockdown. And so for weeks, even months, playgrounds like this one could remain off limits. Who's there? Elias and Sam Block celebrated their refound freedom with Dad Neil. It was just fresh air. Today's fun has a one-hour time limit and must take place well within a mile of their front door. But even that beats being stuck at home. Has your brother been annoying? Has your dad been annoying? Like, what's been the worst bit? Um, like, being with the same people all the time. Your family? Yeah. <laughs> but if you're older than 14, fresh air is still a no-go. So 13-year-old Laura can walk with her mum. It's so quiet. But her 16-year-old sister, Mariner, cannot. So I'm, like, trying to stay as close as this to the wall, so I'm getting trouble with the police. The streets here remain ringed with checkpoints. This Sunday, after a long absence, they rang out with children's laughter. And that provided some much-needed parental relief. And Willem joins me live now. Willem, I have to ask, because these are some of the strictest regulations that they've, we've heard of. Children not allowed outside at all. How did the city uh, enforce that? Well, the weapon that was at the disposal of police here, really, Alison, was fines. And a lot of people we've spoken to over the last few days have talked yeah. about the threat of fines keeping them in, uh, under control in their door, indoors if they need to be. In terms of the actual... Uh, mechanics of that. You know, I'm four stories up from the street level right now. If I go down to the street and walk a few hundred yards to where I'm staying in the centre of Madrid in a residential neighbourhood, chances are at least one police car will pass me during that time. If you go out on the major roads around the right. city, let alone leaving the city, trying to travel elsewhere in Spain, there are checkpoints everywhere. They want to see your papers, your passport, and they want to hear that you have a valid reason for travelling. Uh, Willem, we heard some really delighted and, and very funny children uh, in that piece just talking about being stuck with their family. Uh, but I, I imagine it, it has been really tough. What are parents telling you about the impact it's had on their kids not being able to be outside for a month? Yeah, it kind of depends on their age to some extent. That little kid we spent time with yesterday, Devrim, very sweet two-year-old. Initially, when he came outside, <laughs> he was incredibly hesitant to be put down by his mom to walk they said he was much shyer than he had been before oh. the six-week lockdown. Some of the older kids, of course, the challenge for them when they're in their early teens in particular is not spending time physically with their friends at a time when that's super, super important. So a lot of the parents saying that's one of their big concerns, that they're not inside that school environment where they're developing those kind of social skills that are so important. Some of the middle-aged kids, like seven, ten-year-old, let's say, that we spent time with so much pent-up energy and the challenge their parents said was getting yeah. them to sleep early enough because they had so much excess energy. <laughs> oh, well, uh, as someone who needs to get outside every single day to keep my sanity, I completely uh, understand what those families are going through. <laughs> Great to hear that they have a little bit more freedom there. Thank you so much. 
What is going on with Kim Jong-un as the world wonders about his health? The South Korean government says it has intelligence that the North Korean regime is doing business as usual. Here's NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons. The rumors are really swirling now, including one suggesting that Kim Jong-un's surgeon's hands were shaking in fear. Now, U.S. officials have told NBC News of indications that Kim Jong-un has had cardiovascular surgery. But as ever with North Korea, it's really hard to get to the truth. Kim Jong-un has not been seen in public for more than two weeks. These images are thought to show the supreme leader's train near the North Korean coast at a luxury compound. But on Saturday, Kim skipped his second major event, Army Day. It's a deepening mystery with rumors about his poor health and possible demise, making headlines around the globe. Reuters reporting a team including medics flew into North Korea from China. One well-connected Chinese commentator posting to millions of followers, some wait for the official announcement. Suit yourself. Her posts later deleted, but not by her, she claims. South Korea still insisting its intelligence shows nothing unusual. A North Korean newspaper claiming Kim even sent a letter. How closely guarded is Kim Jong-un? How many people around him would know that something is wrong? That would be a very small circle of people. The rumors on the ground are probably people on the outside. When today made a rare trip to the world's most isolated dictatorship, we found Kim Jong-un's image everywhere. So you, you thank Kim Jong-un for this? Yes. Yes. Talk. Now, it's possible, of course, that Kim Jong-un is simply in lockdown over the coronavirus, but it is so important because, remember, that North Korea is a nuclear-armed nation. If it lost its leader, a weakened world would face another crisis. Keir Simmons, NBC News, London. What will it take for the world to get back to work? NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicky Gwynn has an exclusive look at a, sympt- a new symptom screening technology and how it may play a role in restarting the global economy. We can't break our country over this. We have to get going. What we reopen will be better than what we had before. <laughs> As the debate over when to reopen and restart the country rages, more questions. What will our lives look like? Can fans gather at sporting events, theaters? What about busy workplaces? Some, including New York City's mayor, say part of the new normal should involve health screenings. The important thing to recognize with the temperature checks, they absolutely have a role to play. This device may play a role in getting the country going again. It's called the Symptom Sense Medical Evaluation Gateway. The manufacturer says it can screen up to 600 people an hour for signs of illness. Company CEO Derek Peterson showed me how the technology works at their lab on Long Island, New York. Okay, Vicky, come on through. Okay. As you walk through, face this way, put your okay. feet on the yellow pads. As I walk in, Peterson says this sensor uses ultrasound to measure my height so the machine can adjust. Now we're going to calculate your body temperature and we're also going to look at your heart rate, resting heart rate, and oxygen level by this sensor right directly aimed at your chest area. In less than 10 seconds, this screen tells the operator my external temperature, respiration rate, blood oxygen level, and heart rate. So you're looking at these vital signs. What can that actually tell you about someone's health? Through our combination of looking at these four vitals, we could tell if somebody's well or not well. Peterson says because this is not a medical device, it doesn't require FDA approval. The machine doesn't collect data, and he says the technology to measure these vital signs is non-invasive. We're using a technology called millimeter wave technology to be able to scan the body for respiration rate and heart rate. We're also using our own proprietary technology for determining temperature. We validate against known equipment in the industry that can verify what we're doing. Let's be clear. This cannot tell me if I have coronavirus. Absolutely not. I can't tell you if you have the coronavirus, but what I can tell you is that you're maybe sick. It might detect vital sign differences that are consistent with coronavirus, but up to 50 percent of people People with coronavirus are going to have normal vital signs, no symptoms whatsoever. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres says this device is not a magic solution to detecting coronavirus. How important are these vital signs to determining a baseline if someone may or may not be ill? Vital signs are one tool we use to look to see if somebody is sick, but it's not the only tool. People with normal vital signs, if they have other complaints, they still might have a disease. What do you say to critics who say this might give people a false sense of security about whether or not they're healthy. It's just another tool trying to help people understand in a quick way 
if they're healthy or not. This is not the end no behold. But who decides what to do with this data? Tech ethicist David Polgar says it will be up to the organizations that use this technology to figure out how they respond. Do you think tools like this are helpful and do you think they will become commonplace? Yes, I do think that they, they can be helpful. We are in an extraordinary situation where I think a lot of people are looking at how do we balance our individual freedoms with more of a collective need for, for society. He compares the new technology to airport screenings after 9-11. I think a lot of us are talking about tools like this and other forms of technology that might have seemed unusual a year ago might be part of our future. And Vicky joins us now. Vicky, I have to ask, what's the price tag on the symptoms since uh, I imagine something like this isn't cheap and where and when might we start seeing it? Yeah, it's not cheap. $35,000 a piece is the selling price wow. right now. The company plans to incorporate a metal detector, too, based on some of the early feedback they've gotten. So if you think about sports stadiums, big companies, theaters, places where you've got a lot of people who have to enter in a short period of time, they're trying to figure out a way to screen them for both health symptoms and weapons at the same time to try to reduce that and increase the traffic flow. And your second Any question, sense of remember. when it might be something that we see? <laughs> yes, no, 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 they're, saying they're, gonna ship. <laughs> they're saying they may start shipping these in about <laughs> a month. The Greek government has confirmed an order of several of these devices, but it's unclear how and where oh, cool. they're going to deploy them. But we're talking major league sports, thousands of companies and governments that uh, Symptom Sense says they have interest from at this point. And so this could very well be a part of our future. Very cool. Vicki, thank you so much. Really interesting to see all of the uh, new technology that could be part of our lives very soon. Yeah, and the limitations, too, and the idea of what do you do once you get people's vital signs, that's going to be very important for the organizations that use this technology yeah. to determine. Absolutely. Vicki, great to see you. Thank you so much for being with us again. Hey everyone, I'm Allison Morris. Hope you're having a good Monday. You are watching NBC News Now. Let's head on over to NBC News Now correspondent Alexa Leoto. As you know by now, she follows the latest coronavirus headlines for us from NBCNews.com. Alexa, what have you got in this hour? Hey, Allison. So let's actually start with a numbers update on coronavirus. The number of confirmed coronavirus cases worldwide has now surpassed the 3 million mark. That's according to Johns Hopkins University. And the number of infections in the United States is inching closer to 1 million, with more than 980,000 Americans having tested positive for the virus so far. Now, with more and more doctors seeing and studying coronavirus cases, the CDC has expanded its list of symptoms. That's from NBC's Maura Homan. These include everything from coughing, shortness of breath uh, or difficulty breathing, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell, something we've been hearing a lot about. Now, see, the CDC also says these symptoms can appear within two to 14 days after being exposed to the virus. Now, from NBC's Carol Lee and Courtney Cuby, the president has been urging his military advisors to withdraw American troops from Afghanistan following concerns about a coronavirus outbreak in the country, as well as his impatience with the peace deal with the Taliban. Now, officials told NBC News that his, advi his advisors have made the case to the president that by withdrawing American forces on these grounds, a similar case could be made, for example, for Italy, which has been severely impacted by the virus. Now, the government portal for small businesses to apply for federal assistance reopened for business today, but faced technical difficulties, even crashing several times, according to CNBC. The Small Business Administration began accepting applications for the second round of assistance at 10.30 a.m. Eastern this morning. Soon after came the error messages. The Paycheck Protection Program initially off opened on April 3rd, but in just 13 days ran out of money. After Congress passed its interim aid bill last week, the program has been replenished with $321 billion. Now, the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, some news on the Los Angeles Lakers receiving $4.6 million from the government's Paycheck Protection Program. So that's intended to help struggling small businesses, and they have since returned the money. In a statement, the team said they repaid the loan so that, quote, uh, so that they repaid the loan so that financial support would be directed to those most in need. Now, larger, more profitable corporations have faced mounting pressure to return funds for 
from the program, as many small businesses have yet to receive support. Shake Shack, Sweet Green, and Ruth's Chris Steakhouse are just a few of the companies who have also returned the assistance they were deemed eligible for. And lastly, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell appears to have softened his stance on giving states federal assistance to tackle the fallout from the coronavirus pandemic. That's from NBC's Capitol Hill reporting team. Now, speaking to Fox News Radio, McConnell said, quote, there, will pro there probably will be another state and local funding bill, adding that, quote, we need to make sure that we achieve something that will go beyond just sending out money. McConnell had previously drawn criticism from governors after he made comments suggesting he preferred states declare bankruptcy than to provide hundreds of billions in financial relief. And those are the headlines for this hour. Allison, back to you. All right, Alexa, thank you so much. And if you're looking for even more headlines, you can always visit our live blog. That's NBCNews.com slash coronavirus. We'll have the very latest updates for you there. Restaurants and movie theaters in Georgia back in business today. It's part of the state's second phase of reopening, a reopening that is raising some eyebrows. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock is in Atlanta. Big news in Georgia today. A couple more kinds of businesses given the green light to open movie theaters and restaurants. Behind me, you see one of the most iconic breakfast chains anywhere in the country, Waffle House. The sign says open at 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. for dining services. I can tell you we were here early. There was not a floodgate of people pouring in, probably three or four throughout the entire course of the morning. Other colleagues here in the Atlanta area as well reporting the same thing. The people are approaching this cautiously with some trepidation and that there haven't been huge numbers of people flooding into restaurants. Movie theaters as well right now, at least the local ones are telling me there is no way at this point in time with less than 1% of Georgians being tested for COVID-19 that we're going to let a bunch of people go into a space like a movie theater without knowing who else is there or what sort of testing or precautions they've taken. Now, in terms of diners here at Waffle House, they explained what it was like to actually go in today and why they wanted to return. I just physically watched them wash the doors and the, the handles coming in and out for each client that's come in. So I feel safe about it and happy about it. I, mean, I don't think that there's anything to worry about, I think. <laughs> How about you, William? I found it really um, much more comforting to sit down and eat. Um, the, the social experience between uh, us two and, uh, and the staff and um, I have no worries. In preparation for today, the governor of the state of Georgia, Brian Kemp, came out with a list of 39 regulations that restaurants have to meet if they're going to allow people to eat back inside their premises again. Among those, screening the employees, checking their temperatures, wiping down everything, extra sanitization, staggering shifts, and in some cases, establishments like Waffle House here actually putting red tape out over tables and X's on the ground to show, show social distancing, make sure that clients are respecting that when they come inside to eat. Allison, back to you. Today, Texas Governor Greg Abbott talked through his plan to reopen the state's economy. MSNBC correspondent Garrett Haight joins me now. And Garrett, we know Texas started with retail to go on Friday. What's included in this broader state reopening that the governor outlined today? Well, starting this coming Friday, retail will be one of several businesses that gets a big expansion. Retail establishments, restaurants, libraries, museums uh, will all be able to open completely come Friday, May 1st, if they keep their capacity down below 25 percent. I've talked a couple times with you, Allison, about how different the scenario of COVID-19 has been across Texas. So if you're in a county with fewer than five confirmed coronavirus cases, of which there are about 70 or 80 mm -hmm. counties in Texas, those uh, same establishments can reopen up to 50 percent of their capacity. Um, and then after that, there'll be a little bit of a slower rollout for other industries uh, over the next couple of days. Things like uh, dentists and regular doctors can reopen, sole proprietors proprietorships can reopen. Uh, outdoor sports will be allowed, up to four people playing. Good news if you're a golfer or a doubles tennis player. Uh, but it's actually a fairly slow rollout uh, starting on May 1st with the governor saying he wants to stay in that phase for another two weeks before he makes any other decisions to see if any additional hotspots pop up or if anything changes in the state's overall coronavirus trajectory. He wants to sort of check in uh, in about two weeks uh, and then make decisions about further openings. Garrett, 
What is the demand there like? And I know it's hard to tell because you've only seen some, you know, soft openings with that retail to go on Friday. But are you getting the sense mm-hmm. from people that you're talking to that they are interested in going back to restaurants and malls and movie theaters or maybe hitting the golf course right now? Or are they just not so sure yet? I think in most of the state, demand for something that feels like normalcy is really high. It's spring in Texas. The weather is yeah. gorgeous. It's 75 or 80 degrees every day. This is patio season in oh, Dallas. This is the time when people <laughs> would be out and about at restaurants, at bars, out enjoying the weather here before it gets too hot over the course of the summer. And in the different areas I've been, from the big cities to the suburbs to the more rural communities, again, still in the vast majority of these places, you're far more likely to know somebody who lost their job because of this crisis than you are to know somebody who got particularly sick or who passed away. And so I do think there's an appetite among Texans to get things back to something that looks more like normal. But there's also that concern, I think, especially in the bigger cities, that if you do too much too soon, uh, that Texas cities could end up looking more like East Coast cities than like West Coast cities, which has been the case so far. Uh, People have gotten sick, people have passed away, too many people have passed away, but the hospitals here have not been close to overwhelmed and they would sure like to keep it that way. Yeah, absolutely, Garrett. But again, on the flip side, I do understand you say patio season, and I think a lot of us think, oh, that sounds so great. I know we'll be checking back in with you throughout the week to see how things are going there. Thank you so much, Garrett. Thanks, Allison. The number of new coronavirus cases in the Midwest is up, and there are concerns that people just aren't taking the threat seriously. This video from Chicago over the weekend looks like a crowded house party where people are ignoring social distancing and stay-at-home orders. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster joins me now from Chicago. And Shaq, I definitely don't want to imply that all folks in Chicago are not taking this seriously. We know that many of them are. (laughs) But a few knuckleheads can really do a whole lot of damage. What is the city doing to keep people from breaking orders from doing things like throwing house parties. Yeah, Allison. And, you know, that's the real balance that the the city has to deal with, that many people are obeying these stay at home orders. They're staying inside. Hey, I'm inside right now as I'm talking with you. So you have many people following the rules, but then you have people who are simply ignoring the rules. And that was an example that we saw over the course of the weekend with that house party. Young people on the city's west side apparently were gathered and that was a Facebook live. So they were bragging about the fact that they were having this uh, this event. People had masks on, but they were completely together shoulder to shoulder in that packed apartment there. I'll tell you that what the city they're saying they're not going to rely on the police to issue citations or issue arrests for this. They understand that while they're doing what they've been saying, the city and the state for that matter, they have the power to do that. They understand these stay at home orders are essentially self-enforced. They want people to be responsible, follow the rules, stay inside, practice social distancing. Where there is an absence of that, that example is the video that we saw, or even there was a wedding party that was broken up this weekend, or Mayor uh, Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, she said that she had has had to go around and uh, break up some gatherings that she would see as she's driving around the city. Where that's happening, she says, yes, police will step in and say, hey, break it up if they see it, if they're in a position to stop that. But they're really just relying on pure shame. You had Governor Pritzker over the weekend say that what they were doing was embarrassing. It was a, They were uh, being reckless with their behavior. You also heard Mayor Lori Lightfoot at a press conference earlier today address this issue. Listen a little bit to what Mayor Lightfoot said in the tone she had when talking about this issue. They put themselves at risk, but not only that, every single person there who put themselves at risk puts the next person and the next person that they come into contact with at risk. That's why, for me, that scene is so distressing. Uh, But we'll get to the bottom of it. We'll get to the bottom of it, she says. But, you know, Illinois and specifically Chicago and Chicago's Cook County remains to be the center of the epicenter for this city's or the state's uh, coronavirus outbreak. Most of the cases and most of the deaths are happening here in Chicago. Governor Pritzker had a press conference just about two hours ago now, and he announced new numbers, uh, 50 new deaths with this virus. That's actually down a little bit from what we saw the past couple of days, but about 1,980 new coronavirus virus cases. A lot of that has to do with the fact that there is more testing going
going on in the state of Illinois. Governor Pritzker, for the longest, has said he had he set this testing goal of 10,000 tests a day. The city is now exceeding that, seeing 12,000 at 1.16,000 tests in a day. So when you have more testing, you'll have more cases. Despite that, it also shows that you're having cases and the spread still ongoing uh, in the city and in the state. And that's why when city leaders see scenes, as we saw this weekend with that party, that's why they get so frustrated with this issue. Allison. For sure. Uh, Shaq, we know Illinois is rolling out a modified stay at home order this Friday. What's going to change? Yeah. The biggest change that you'll see is that masks will be required in outdoor settings and, and indoor settings in which uh, social distancing mm-hmm. isn't possible. So think those grocery stores, think any uh, of the essential businesses that are open, mm-hmm. Home Depot, that kind of thing. Uh, people will have to have a mask or a face covering beginning May 1st. I'll, I'll tell you, going around Chicago, people will have largely been abiding by the guidance to wear the mask. Uh, that's something that we heard from the federal level and the CDC uh, about a week and a half to two weeks ago, people have been abiding by that. A lot of people have had the, that on, but at this point, they will be required starting May 1st. There are also some uh, changes. There'll, there'll be a few more essential businesses. Um, so things like nurseries, gardening, gardening centers will be uh, deemed essential. You'll also have businesses that are non-essential. Retailers, for example, they will be allowed to take orders and uh, do deliveries and allow for curbside pickup. So while people won't be able to go into the stores yet, People will be able to order online and then stop by the store and have a curbside pickup system. That's probably a big change that will at least allow some of these businesses, some of the smaller retailers, a way to get back open, a way to start selling their products again. There's also changes to national parks. There'll be a phase reopening of some of this, not national, but state parks uh, throughout the uh, the state. Mm-hmm. So you'll start to see these governors start to dial it back, take step-by-step approaches to see what they can do, what what uh, smaller impacts they can make but as this stay at home order. Remember, the stay at home order in Illinois was extended just last week. It was extended to the end of May. So despite that, you're seeing some modifications and some slight reopenings happening. Allison. All right, Shaq Brewster uh, in Chicago. Thank you so much for bringing us the very latest there. You got it. Warm weather drawing a whole lot of people to the beaches in California. Some of the state's beaches have reopened, but with restrictions. NBC News correspondent Joe Fryer is in Ventura. Hey, Allison, we are in Ventura, one of the beaches in California that is open right now. I'll take a step out of the way and you can take a look and see. They do have some restrictions on people who are choosing to go visit the beach here. They say there's no sitting, there's no sunbathing. They want people to keep moving. And there are some people also out there surfing in the water. It's Monday, so not terribly busy right now. But it was a different story at beaches across California throughout the weekend, especially on Friday and Saturday, with temperatures above average, even record temps in some areas, driving people to the beaches, especially south of here in Orange County. Tens of thousands of people seen at the beaches there, a site that was concerning to some people who are worried about slowing the spread of the virus. In fact, Newport Beach is going to have a meeting on Tuesday to discuss whether beaches there need to be closed over the next three weekends. They just thought maybe too many people showed up there. Folks who did show up say it was good to get out, get some fresh air. They felt it was safe as long as they were able to stay six feet away from other people. But there are worries. Can you keep safe social distance when you're on the beach or in the parking lot or walking from the parking lot to the sand? In L.A. County, totally different story. Beaches there remain closed. L.A. County is the epicenter in California, which did see its deadliest week this past week. So no plans to reopen the beaches there. Allison. As the U.S. closes in on one million coronavirus cases, NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki breaks down how dramatically different COVID-19 looks from state to state, city to city, and even region to region. It may explain why some areas are so eager to reopen, while others still have a long way to go. 
what you're talking about there, the states that are beginning, and again, this doesn't look the same in every state. It doesn't look the same in one part of the state, even as it does in another part of any given state. But these are the states that are beginning to lift in some ways business restrictions. There are some other states that are talking about beginning to do this soon. So this list is probably going to keep growing. The impetus for this, I think, is interesting to look at. You just looked at the economic impact on Main Streets around the country with Vaughn. The other thing you're seeing is some of these states, I think, are looking at their own statistics and saying, we're not getting the brunt of this necessarily right now like they are elsewhere. Here's what I mean. Take a look, for example, South Carolina, a state where some of these restrictions are being eased. This is what the picture looks like, the data picture in South Carolina. And I think you don't have a ton of cases, the rate here, one out of every thousand. You don't have a high rate of hospitalizations. You have a very low death rate. You can compare this to what's been the epicenter here in the United States, New York, and just look at how the statistics in New York dwarf what's being seen on the ground in South Carolina. So I think that might add to the impetus in a state like South Carolina to think about reopening. The one statistic here I think you got to be a little concerned about is this disparity. This is the testing disparity between New York, which obviously has been hardest hit. Look at that, 40 tests for every 1,000 people. That's the testing rate in New York. The testing rate in South Carolina is only 10 out of 1,000. It's just, it's just about 25% there of what New York's is. And again, that's one of the things that's been talked about here in terms of getting states, getting places reopened. It's about having widespread testing, about getting those testing numbers up. So that's the one concerning statistic, certainly, you would see there. And again, this is in, you'll see this in other states. Again, Montana, look at these numbers, how low these cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are, certainly compared to New York. Again, a lower testing rate. You see this in Georgia, you know, a similar story here, again, compared to New York. And you mentioned, even within New York, again, New York City, the New York City metro area, the epicenter of this in the country. Look at the difference between, excuse me, this is Colorado. I wanted to get to New York and show you this one. The difference between outside of New York's, the New York City metro area. This is the rest of New York State, basically. These are the numbers you're looking at and compare that to the New York City metro area. So again, we say New York, New York all the time. The New York metro area has these kinds of numbers. Upstate Western New York has these kinds of numbers. And that's why you're having what you're talking about there, perhaps upstate and Western New York beginning to open before the New York metro area. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern. with Lester Holt, covering coronavirus with facts over fear. Let's talk about ventilators. What should we be conscious of? Walk me through what the symptoms look like. At a time of crisis, turn to the most trusted TV news anchor in America. NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. Expect to see more cases across the United States. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
this country was forged in part by shared sacrifice. And once again, we're called to step up. We hope you'll continue to stay informed and stay engaged as we follow this journey together. I'm Lester Holt, and for all my colleagues at NBC News, take care. If it's asking the tough questions. Would you prefer a 14-day national shutdown? If it's asking for accountability. Respirators and ventilators. Has the federal government stepped up enough? If it's navigating the new normal in America. And if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The coronavirus outbreak. What's next? NBC News has in-depth coverage. Answers to your questions. Insight from medical experts. And up-to-the-minute live blog updates. For continuing coverage, turn to the networks and platforms of NBC News. NBC News has learned the Trump administration is preparing to send all 50 states enough testing materials to screen at least 2% of their residents each month. NBC News and MSNBC medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel is with me now. And Dr. Patel, for weeks we have talked about the need to ramp up testing. Is 2% per state per month enough? No, and here's why, Elson. It's it's not as simple as the same amount across the state. Take, for example, New York, where okay. you would probably need to do a higher percentage. And in fact, all the cities that have been affected at a higher rate, you could, and, and I would argue that you do need higher than 2%. And in fact, some experts estimate you need at least 10% of that state in the beginning to have access to testing. You were part of the Obama administration working on the response to H1N1. As states start to slowly reopen, what kind of measures do you think that the federal government needs to have in place to make sure that everybody is safe? Yeah, and, and this is actually a little bit more straightforward than people might imagine. Testing. Mm -hmm tracing and isolation. And it's yep. not that the federal government okay. is going to do all of that, but they need guidance for it. The World Health Organization said over the weekend that if you get the coronavirus, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't get it again. How should people understand that? What are they saying or what are the implications about immunity there and antibody tests? So a couple of things. Right now, we know that if you have antibodies in your bloodstream, it's because you were exposed to the coronavirus. But we don't know if those antibodies present in your blood actually protect you against reinfection or infection. We think they might based on past behaviors to other viruses, but we just don't know any of that for certain. All it tells you right now is a snapshot in time that you had exposure at some point in the past. Also, we've got some problems with the performance of these antibody tests. These tests are not all the yeah. same, and they're not necessarily 100%. Sweden's ambassador to the U.S. said this weekend that Stockholm is getting close to herd immunity. If you potentially can get coronavirus more than once, is herd immunity possible? Herd immunity, just the concept of herd immunity happens when a large number of the population has either been exposed to the infection itself or has exposure mm -hmm. via va a vaccine. So, so it is possible okay. that if you have enough people exposed that you can have herd immunity. Everybody is looking at Sweden. It's hard to see how the United States gets there without a vaccine. Yeah. I'd love to ask you uh, about some possible treatments. We've been hearing about so many different possibilities, things that are being tested. I know that hospitals in New York right now are testing out a heartburn drug. What is the hope there? Yeah, and that's based on some really interesting data that came from China, where they picked up just honestly, this is all anecdotal. It hasn't been a trial, but in New York, they're conducting a trial where they saw that a certain kind of acid blocker that's very commonly used by many Americans has actually been shown in China to potentially be the factor in why patients recovered from COVID-19. These are extremely high doses than what you can buy on the shelf, so I don't want any American and to hear this and try to run to the pharmacy and do something. It's really meant to be used in the hospital and currently still investigational. But again, it points to the fact that we're learning a lot more and there's some silver linings ahead in certainty around treatments. Great to hear there. Dr. Patel, always wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.
The coronavirus is forcing young doctors to take on greater responsibility than ever. Across the country, Thanks, residents Thanks. who aren't yet fully practicing doctors are treating patients with COVID-19. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders joins me now. And Carrie, how is Broward County in Florida managing this pandemic? And what has it been like for some of the young residents there? Well, Allison, what we're seeing in Broward County, which is second only to Dade County in the number of cases, I mean, statewide, we have 5,010 hospitalized patients with COVID-19. In Broward County, in the Memorial Health System, they currently have 155 coronavirus patients. And in many cases, they are being treated by medical residents. Now, if we're there, we would call them doctor. But as a resident, they are not really fully licensed doctors in the state yet. They're going through that process. It's anywhere from three to five years after medical school that sets them up to be full-fledged doctors. And for the young doctors here who are dealing with this, it is certainly frontline work, not the sort of work that they might have ever expected to see in their entire careers. And here they are dealing with patients and that is very much a one-on-one -on -one dealing with patients and sometimes actually even treating them as if they are the main doctor, as if they are the ones dealing with the bedside manner. And of course, for these doctors, it's a little unnerving because coronavirus itself is sure. contagious. This is what one young doctor had to tell us. You know, initial thoughts are like, you know, you're, there's a little bit of fear, there's a little bit of, you know, you're a little scared. However, then you like, realize that like the answer to that question is very simple it's like when you it depends on how deeply rooted your commitment and your desire towards medicine was and and you know when i when i had when i heard it the first time too and the the initial fear kind of turned into like excitement you know this is what i committed uh my life to go into like a situation like this Dr. Sadiq tells me that his wife is in criminal justice, and they thought that if there was going to be any kind of danger around their family, it would be the job that she has. And instead, he's coming home now from the hospital. Yeah. They have a young child at home, a son. And so they are very <clears throat> super cautious about how he returns to the home. But it's a true understanding of, like you heard him say, he studied medicine. Now he's practicing it. And it's very different when you're right there with patients. Allison? Okay. Carrie, it's just incredible to hear him say that, yeah, I was scared, but you commit your life to this. Uh, it's really so impressive. Uh, have those residents, though, uh, been properly trained? I know going from resident to full doctor, as you've said, is a years long process. Are some of them still learning or, or even just, I guess, gaining experience as they go? I don't want to minimize what they know, but, but I imagine some of them are dealing with things they've never seen before. Absolutely. And in many cases, actually, the veteran doctors, we've seen some actually come out of retirement that have never really dealt with a pandemic. This just does not happen. So what you have is you have the residents there that are doing their hands on work, but there are supervisors. There are 78 medical residents right now in the Memorial Health System in Broward. They're all supervised, but they're also empowered. Of course, they've studied a lot, but it's very different, as we all know from uh, whatever profession we're in, that you learn something maybe in a book, but when you actually do it, it's extremely different. But indeed, yeah. they are supervised, and this is what their academic supervisor had to say. Residency in a time of pandemic is is really a I would say it's a frightening honor, um, but that's that's the situation that we're in, and and we you know we feel privileged to be able to contribute to the clinical care and the education that's going on these days. And what struck me there is when you heard the doctor say it's a frightening honor. So I think everybody is stepping up yeah. to the plate and doing what they're expected to do. But nonetheless, you know, it's one thing to be told what you're going to do. It's a whole other thing to be right there surrounded by it. Allison? Absolutely. C Carrie, before I let you go, one last question for you. If Florida is beginning to flatten the curve, does that mean that medical residents will be returning to more general procedures or is this going to be their work for a little while now? Well, this is going to be their work for a little bit of a while. It does look like Florida is flattening the curve. We currently have 32,138 patients in the state. Uh, in the last 24 hours, we have seen the number of new diagnoses 
cut in more than half down to 535. But, you know, even though we see the dip taking place, uh, it is always possible that we may see it climb back up. A lot of attention on this. And so those residents, I think, are going to find themselves becoming full-blown doctors. I mean, we call them doctors, but they're going to be full-blown doctors through their residency, yeah. and we're likely to still see them dealing with coronavirus because the experts say we are a long way away from seeing an end to this pandemic, even if the numbers come down. Carrie, it is just so impressive, the work that they are doing. Thank you so much for sharing their story with us. Absolutely. Small businesses were able to start applying for the second round of coronavirus relief funds today. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule explains. Allison, you know how devastating the coronavirus has been economically on small businesses across this country. Well, according to the National Association of Small Businesses, every minute one business shuts down. It goes out of business. So today was supposed to be the day when PPP, the small business program, had re-upped its funding after it ran out over the last week, and there was much outrage over some big businesses that got big forgivable loans, yet thousands, in some cases tens of thousands of businesses, got none. Well, today was the day to reapply. Over $300 billion back in the system and ready to go. Well, unfortunately, it was disappointing but expected, the SBA's system crashed. It was like the Department of Motor Vehicles trying to put on the Grand Prix. Throughout the day, their e-trans system, that's their computer system, was up and down, up and back down. The five largest lenders combined had one million loans, totaling over $100 billion ready to go, underwritten and approved. They needed to put it through the system for the SBA to sign off on. All of these loans, all of these applicants were backlogged from the last round, and they couldn't get them in the system. The rate in which the system was moving so slowly, it would take 25 days to process the old loans that already got approved. And you know small businesses don't have that time period. And one of the biggest issues, even for those who do get approved, and we're hoping everyone out there does, this is a two-month solution. Two months plus or minus payroll with a little bit more. Well, two months from now, they're going to have to revisit this. And most likely two months from now, a lot of small businesses will remain closed. Now, conversely, we know there are more lenders. There are fintech lenders like PayPal and Square, more community banks involved, and they have been making some progress. So that's a positive. Unfortunately, it's not enough progress. So the system is moving. As one bank said to me, everyone has the best of intentions. But intentions are sentiment, and sentiment doesn't fix a system that's breaking down. And we've got a system breaking down with an economy that's really hurting. Tennessee is starting to reopen this week. Even though the state saw an increase in cases over the weekend, NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber has the latest on the precautions businesses are taking. Tennessee governor's plan to reopen restaurants and other businesses doesn't apply to every county in the state. It applies to all but six. The counties that are exempt are more populous counties, uh, counties with cities like Nashville and Memphis. Their local officials are coming up with their own reopening plans here in Cleveland, Tennessee, which is in Bradley County. This county has had 43 confirmed COVID-19 cases as of Sunday. If you wanted to go to a restaurant today, you could. We're at uh, the Little Diner on first. They opened at 7 a.m. this morning. They didn't have a ton of customers, but they had a few people who frequently came before they had to close their doors. If you walked in, the first thing you would pass is this table. You could get some hand sanitizer, grab some gloves, and even read up on the guidelines that have been laid out by the governor, things they hope restaurants will do, like have all their staff wear masks and gloves, sanitize every table and chair after it's been used, be extra cautious to sanitize sanitize all of the menus and also throw some out when they can. The owners here say they are doing their best to abide by all of those guidelines. They say it was a difficult choice deciding to reopen their dining room, but they say that it was something they had to do because they've struggled so much financially and they haven't had a whole lot of business with takeout. I'm worried for my staff. I'm worried for my customers. Uh, you know, and it's just, it's a tough decision. 
It really is. This is a true family owned restaurant. The pair who own it, they're married. They said they came here for a long time when it was under previous owners for their regular Tuesday morning date. They decided to buy it two years ago. They say they were just finally starting to do well and the pandemic hit. They had this, a military kitchen that they hook up to the back of their truck. They occasionally used it for different events, weddings, outside events, but they realized as their business was suffering during the pandemic that they could take this around in neighborhoods, cook on the fly, and hopefully get to customers that way. They say this has been their saving grace the last two weeks, really the only option they've had to make money. They say if it becomes too difficult to keep their dining room open, too hard to keep customers and their employees safe, they'll go back to doing this, taking it out to neighborhoods, and hope they can get by that way. But for now, they say best case scenario, it'll take them at least six months, if not a year, to get back to where they were before the first coronavirus case in this state. Allison. Clearview AI is a facial recognition software company that helps law enforcement track down suspected criminals. Now the tech company is in talks with federal and state authorities to help trace the spread of the coronavirus. Here's NBC News technology correspondent Jacob Ward. Provide you with an update in our war against the coronavirus. Thanks to our comprehensive strategy and extraordinary devotion to our citizens, we've had such tremendous support all over. We continue to see encouraging signs of progress. Cases in New York area, New Orleans, Detroit, Boston, and Houston are declining. Denver, Seattle, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Nashville, Indianapolis, and St. Louis are all stable and declining. All parts of the country are either in good shape, getting better, in all cases, getting better. And we're seeing very little that we're going to look at as a superseding hotspot. Uh, things are moving along. Really a uh, horrible situation that we've been confronted with, but they're moving along. As we express our gratitude for these hard-fought gains, however, we continue to mourn with thousands of families across the country whose loved ones have been stolen from us by the invisible enemy. We grieve by their side as one family, this great American family, and we do grieve. We also stand in solidarity with the thousands of Americans who are ill and waging a brave fight against the virus. We're doing everything in our power to heal the sick and to gradually reopen our nation and to safely get our people back to work. They want to get back to work and they want to get back to work soon. There's a hunger for getting our country back and it's happening and it's happening faster than people would think. Ensuring the health of our economy is vital to ensuring the health of our nation. These goals work in tandem. They work side by side. It's clear that our aggressive strategy to slow the spread has been working and is saving countless lives. For those who are infected, we've taken unprecedented action to ensure they have the highest level of care anywhere in the world. The federal government has built more than 11,000 extra beds, shipped or delivered hundreds of millions of pieces of personal protective equipment, as you know. In fact, some of the people here are going to be talking about it, some of our greatest executives, some of the greatest anywhere in the world, and distributed over 10,000 ventilators. And we now have, in a very short period of time, many have been delivered and hundreds of thousands are being built. And frankly, every governor has more ventilators right now than they know what to do with. They're actually shipping them to different locations, and we're shipping some to our allies and others throughout the world because we have ventilators like uh, the job that they've done in getting this very complex piece of equipment built is actually incredible. You don't hear about ventilators anymore except in a positive way. We've launched the most ambitious testing effort likewise on Earth. The United States has now conducted more than 5.4 million tests nearly double the number tested in any other country, more than twice as much as any other country. Think of that. 
Moments ago, I came from a meeting with some of our nation's largest retailers, including Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, and Kroger. We're uh, joined by the leaders of those great companies, and we also have with us the leaders from the world's top medical diagnostics companies and suppliers, Thermo Fisher, LabCorp, Quest, U.S. Cotton, and the American Clinical Laboratory Association. These are great, great companies. Uh, these private sector leaders, along with others such as Roche, Abbott, Becton, Dickinson, Hologic, and Cephahide, have been exceptional partners in an unprecedented drive to expand the state's capabilities and our country's capabilities. The job they've done has been incredible. Uh, the testing that's been developed and, and being developed right now has been truly an amazing thing. Uh, I want to thank Abbott Laboratories for the job they've done. I want to thank Roche, and in particular, those two have really stepped forward. Abbott with a five-minute test that people can take, and in five minutes, they know what the, uh, what the answer is. I'd like to ask, if I could, the executives of these great companies, and uh, they are — they have really helped us a lot over the last 45-day period. We're talking about a 45-day period when many of us met. And since then, what Walmart and the others have done has been nothing short of amazing. So I just want to ask them to come forward and say a few words about their company. Plus, they're going to make a big contribution to our country. Please, come forward, please. Thank you. Come on up. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you for all of you uh, for being here today. And and what we'd like to talk about is the progress we made. The last time we were here was March 13th, and we've made tremendous progress. And none of that progress could be made without the 47,000 people at Quest Diagnostics that are working around the clock, uh, working up the test and running the test and delivering the results that we need. As far as results, we've made uh, tremendous progress. Uh, we are currently at Quest Diagnostics uh, testing about 50,000 test per day. We've been pushed by the task force to bring up that number. By the end of May, we'll have 100,000 tests per day, about 3 million tests. And these are the molecular tests that we do today. We've also brought up serological testing. We started that this past week. And by the end of May, we'll be close to 250,000 a day, about 7,000 a month. So you put those two numbers together, together, it's about 10 million tests by the end of May that we'll be doing at Quest Diagnostics. We're doing that also in a quicker way. Turnaround times were somewhat of an issue. At the early days, we've reduced that to one to two days. Our turnaround time for people in beds, hospital beds, is less than 24 hours. And we're doing that in the same way we've done it with the FDA and with CLIA, delivering the quality that you all expect. And convenience will improve as well with convenient solutions that will be able to swab individuals more easily and also deliver to consumer the ability to have consumers choose a test online with a telehealth provider. So with that, I'd like to offer my colleague the podium as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much for your leadership and for having us all here today. Our scientists and our lab technicians are working day and night in order to do as many tests as we possibly can for the American public and to turn those tests around as quickly as possible. Just 45 days ago, we said we could do several thousand tests a day. We can now do 60,000 tests a day, and we're continuing to expand that capacity every single day. In addition, our scientists are working to make testing more convenient and easier. We have the swabs now that are much smaller than the original ones that we originally launched with, but we also have the Pixel by LabCorp at-home test, that test right now is for healthcare workers on the front line and first responders, but we will be rolling that out much more broadly over the coming weeks. And we're going to roll it out with absolutely no upfront cost for the individual consumers. At the same time, we are building our capacity for serology testing. And we can currently do about 50,000 today, and we'll be able to do several hundred thousand per day by the middle of May. And we're going to be working with the retailers, our colleagues that are here today, to help them as they expand their testing capabilities across the entire country. 
And lastly, Mr. President, we have a rather large drug development business, and we will continue to work with our colleagues in the pharmaceutical and the biotechne biotechnology industry to ensure we do everything we possibly can to enroll clinical trials fast so that we can get new treatments and potential vaccines. Thank you. Mr. President, thank you and thank, uh, and thank uh, the administration for all of the collaboration to enable Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, to be able to produce the test kits that companies like LabCorp and Quest and the public health labs around the world run. Um, we met our original commitments of producing 5 million kits a week, and we're up to uh, scaling that to double that uh, in the coming weeks in terms of supporting testing around the world. Um, I'd like to thank my 75,000 colleagues around the world for their tireless effort. Uh, to make that a reality and supporting all of, all of our customers to have the testing necessary to get America back to work. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm John Nims with U.S. Cotton, and we are the company that is going to produce the swabs to be used in these testing kits. We have about 1,200 people in our company, and in our Cleveland operation, they have pivoted from, as you've said, the Q-tip uh, style swab to a swab that's going to have a plastic stick with a polyester tip so that they can be assembled into these kits. Our Cl Cleveland team has done a wonderful job with this, and I'm very, they're very excited to be able to help in this effort. So thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you very much. Great job. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, I'm Larry Marlow with CVS Health, and it was just over a month ago that we opened up our first uh, drive-through uh, test site. Uh, and since that time, we have opened large-scale testing facilities across five states in partnership with the administration and working with the governors of Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Georgia, uh, and Michigan. And these sites are enabling us to test approximately 1,000 individuals a day with uh, real-time results. We now have a capacity to test about 35,000 uh, individuals each, each week. And this afternoon, we announced plans to expand that capacity even further. Uh, beginning in May, we will install testing capabilities uh, in up to 1,000 CVS pharmacies. We'll be using uh, our drive-throughs and our parking lots with swab testing. Uh, so again, you'll see that coming online uh, you know, in May. And we also recognize uh, the fact that you know, the virus is disproportionately affecting our minority communities. So we're working in partnership with organizations like the National Medical Association uh, to bring testing and care into the traditionally underserved communities. We're also beginning to implement mobile capabilities with which to do that. And as businesses are you know, restarting their workforce, we'll also be looking to assist them you know, as they begin to come back to a normal operation. And finally, as my other colleagues, I just want to thank uh, my CVS colleagues. They have done a phenomenal job in terms of helping people in many different ways all across communities uh, in the country. And they're part of this army of healthcare professionals and you know, front store uh, and you know, first-line supervisors and workers that are doing terrific things to bring our country together. And for that, uh, we owe them a huge amount of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate the, uh, the invitation to be here today. And it was just 45 days ago when we were here. I'm Richard Ashworth. I oversee Walgreens in the U.S. And I just want to start off, Larry, like you, thanking the over 200,000 Walgreen team members who are in stores every day all across America taking care of our patients and our customers, you know, giving them essential daily needs, the prescriptions, obviously, that they need, and even COVID testing uh, while we're here. We also announced today we'll be expanding our testing capabilities across all states, including Puerto Rico. We'll be able to triple uh, the volume that we do now in partnership with our uh, lab uh, partners, and we're excited to be able uh, to do that. Uh, we're really excited with the public-private partnership that we have here because that's what enabling us to do this, and we look forward to working with the additional states uh, to get these sites up and running as fast as possible. As a pharmacist, I just want to say one quick thing. I'm really 
proud to be part of this profession and not just Walgreens pharmacists and, and pharmacy employees, but all of them across grocery, mass, independence. You're really doing what you should be doing and what you went to school for to help patients, counseling them on their medicines and helping them understand the problems that we're facing. You know, pharmacy is right here uh, in it with everyone together in the community. And we look forward to being part of the testing like we are now, serology, whatever that might look like in the future, and eventually treatment when the vaccine does come. So thank you, Mr. President, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. We appreciate all you're doing to get America back to work and doing it safely. I represent Kroger, and my name is Rodney McMullen. And I am so proud of our nearly half a million associates that are doing everything every day to keep customers safe and our associates safe. And one of the things that we were able to do is provide the basic practices we're doing. We call it Blueprint. And it's the things that all of us can learn from on how to get America back working. Uh, we also announced earlier today, uh, continuing to accelerate our practice on testing. Uh, we are actively engaged in six states. Uh, next, in the next couple of weeks, we'll take that to 12 states. And the number of tests that we do continues to grow faster than that. Uh, together, we will win. Together, we will solve this problem and move on. America is always great. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Doug McMillan. I'm a Walmart associate, and I, too, would like to start by thanking our associates for everything that they're doing in our stores, Sam's Clubs, distribution centers, and in our e-commerce fulfillment centers. They've been inspiring and continue to have a can-do attitude and step up. It's much appreciated. Um, we started um, 45 days ago, as did everyone else, and we've been operating sites for a while now. We're now up to 20 sites across 11 states. By the end of next week, we'll be to 45, and by the end of, the May, end of May, we'll be at 100. Um, we also, a few weeks ago, uh, Vice President Pence and I were in a distribution center in Virginia, a food distribution center. He was kind enough to come and thank our associates for us there, which is much appreciated. And the President and Vice President were speaking on the phone about surgical gowns, and the President asked if we could um, put in a, an order for millions of surgical gowns, and um, we don't normally buy those, so I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to do that. But I'd like to thank our apparel team and McKesson in particular for partnering with us. We've been able to, in the month of April, secure an additional two and a half million surgical gowns. Um, and by the end of May, we'll have an additional six million available to help. So thank you for the opportunity to serve and for thank being you. here. Great job, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks to the team for getting this great operation up and running for the benefit of the country. I'm Hayward Donegan with Rite Aid, and we are currently operating 40% of the current test sites in 25 locations across eight states. And we had the, I had the opportunity as I was driving up to stop at our Richmond location and see the testing in action and thank the associates, whether it be security or pharmacy, front end, everybody who's helping with this great effort and um, all of the customers that appreciate this so much. It was really amazing to see. And I want to thank my 50,000 associates also for keeping these retailers.